you are reborn as a desolate planet in the universe. The first thing is to attract an asteroid to collide with itself. But after multiple experiments, you find yourself to be a dead star. Not only is there no atmosphere, even the surface temperature reaches up to 1,500 degrees. So you spend countless years controlling surface volcanoes, erupting all over. A large amount of gas and volcanic ash, forming thick clouds. After accumulating to a certain extent, a global rainfall lasting for 3 million years began. Mountains, rivers, and streams were thus formed. After the original atmosphere formed, even when directly exposed to a red star, the surface temperature of the planet also dropped to around 70 degrees. The polar regions also began to gradually develop ice caps. Only now has it begun to have the basic conditions for the birth of life. At this moment, you can't help but recall a celestial body mentioned on Earth called a dirty snowball. This is a meteorite carrying a large amount of ice and snow mixture. In theory, the various elements they carry can accelerate the birth of Phoenix bacteria. In order to capture more dirty snowballs, you revolved around the mother planet again and again, until a 50-meter diameter meteorite arrived. Passing through the thick atmosphere, it crashed at the boundary between land and sea, and scattered the burnt-out material everywhere. After a short but continuous 300-year downpour, in the minerals, in the chemical solution formed by nuclear carbon and amino acids, the first single-celled organism was born. Your planetary vision can clearly see all of this. Countless single-celled organisms slowly emerge under your observation. Some are even less than a micrometer in size, but they come in all sorts of shapes. These tiny life forms joyfully roam under your gaze. Some are consuming even smaller ones of their kind, while others are undergoing cell division. In the ocean, you also discover light green, semi-transparent single-celled organisms. They aggregate together to form clusters of small green masses drifting motionless in shallow waters, just like extremely tiny seaweed. The previously active single-celled organisms are just the beginning. However, soon you realize, the evolution of the single-celled organisms doesn't seem as rapid as imagined. Even though you circle around Mother Earth again and again, those little things seem to have hardly changed much. Not only has there been no evolution, even the distribution area is only the place where the meteorite hit at first. After thinking about it, you decided to intervene with these little lives. Otherwise, who knows how long we'll have to wait. The next moment, you are using your ability, carrying dozens of water droplets containing countless lives, transporting them to the vicinity of a similar environment near the sea. This is also the safest way. If something happens to the creatures in that area, they would all be wiped out. At least there are some backups. You have repeated this process many times. Actually, you don't want this either. But your size is just too big. Thinking about this, can't help but doubt if you are bigger than the Earth. Emma, this is too tiring. After making thousands of backups, a strong drowsiness sets in, then falls into a deep slumber. In your consciousness, this nap didn't last long, but when you wake up, you are amazed. Those originally simple creatures have undergone quite a transformation. They, originally with simple shapes and features, have now evolved into all sorts of peculiar forms. Almost all creatures' sizes have increased by tens of times. Their translucent bodies have been replaced by various colors. As for the seaweed-like creatures seen before, they have now become even larger, some even reaching nearly one millimeter in size, and their numbers are so vast that they almost cover the nearby sea. And those active single-celled organisms seem to have split into two major groups, the places where the previously seen seaweed-eating organisms are. The vast majority in terms of numbers, the color is also predominantly green. As for the other side, they are small creatures covered in spines. The number of these guys is extremely rare, and they're not particularly good at anything. Their favorite thing is to chase those little creatures that eat seaweed, using their strange mouths to pierce and absorb them, becoming their own biters. Of course, they also seem to engage in cannibalistic behavior among themselves. Even those of the same kind look the same. This seems to be the reason for their extremely rare numbers. You look at these little guys from the two major camps. The first thing that comes to mind is the relationship between wolves and rabbits on the original Earth. The carnivorous and herbivorous factions have already been divided. Continuously watched the dozens of colonies released earlier. They're almost all like this. The only thing that's slightly different is their appearance. You watch him with the posture of an observer. But after watching for a while, it feels a bit lifeless. The next moment, you try to control one of the carnivorous creatures. You skillfully maneuver and kill a carnivorous creature twice your size. From then on, you are filled with joy. You can not only control your own body, but even control the creatures. It's like a third-person video game. Playing with great excitement, you control the little creatures to run around, turning the entire population of creatures upside down. 
Finally, you even discover. It's not just about controlling one creature. As long as you want, you can even control thousands of creatures, making the originally carnivorous creatures graze and roam. After playing for a while, you're lost in thought again. Why not just directly control and accelerate their evolution process? After all, these simple single-celled organisms are just too primitive. According to this schedule, who knows how long it will take for intelligent life to evolve. Most of the knowledge I have is from online sources. It seems to have taken 3.5 billion years from the appearance of life on Earth to the emergence of humans. We can't possibly wait for 3.5 billion years for this vast number. I wonder how many more laps around the mother we'll have to take. You're not one to wait around. So, I started to formulate a plan, not only to control these guys' rapid evolution, but also to prevent any one of them from becoming too powerful upset the balance and we might end up losing everything all life forms would be finished most of the stones are predominantly red and the herbivores are mainly green in color you select the stronger individuals from the red ones then bring along the small greens and enough seaweed after safely transporting them to the new sea area start training a red one probably needs to prey on four small greens to split, but the small greens are almost constantly splitting. Under photosynthesis, the reproduction of seaweed is very fast, and the herbivores also reproduce wildly with abundant food. Moreover, there is cannibalism among the red ones. Under your control, all creatures have been elevated. However, before long, you realize you were wrong under your control. Although the red ones have gained higher attack power, their appearance hasn't changed much. Not only that, the sharpness of the tone is beginning to show. Upon closer inspection, the area hit by the meteorite is becoming larger, and the little green is also undergoing changes in its rapid reproduction. This inevitably makes you think of a story where humans killed the wolves to protect the herd. As a result, the deer herd also began to decline. When a herd is not subject to competition, everything owned will gradually decline. Obviously, you underestimate this concept. Too much intervention only leads to the opposite effect. Fortunately, you have undergone many changes before this quickly began a new experiment, as if knowing you are creating life. More extraterrestrial meteorites visit your surface, until a white meteorite, as big as 55% of you, approaches. This guy must have been attracted by your gravity, but if it hits land or sea, don't mention life. Everything on the whole planet will cease to exist. Just think, you're trying to control your own gravity. Concentrate most of the gravity on one, breaking the original Roche limit. Under your guidance, the white meteor clearly brushes past the atmosphere, passing by your side, watching the white meteor move away from you. Suddenly, the gravitational pull from the rhinoceros nears. The white meteor circles around you. Then the orbit slowly becomes more circular. The rotation also gradually becomes more level, but always facing the sky on one side. The pure white surface reveals a ring of mountains on its equator. From your perspective, it looks like a big bridge. From now on, this planet has become your satellite. When you captured a white asteroid, the surface of the planet underwent a great transformation. The previously calm sea suddenly churned. Violent waves surged in an instant. Dozens of meters high tsunami relentlessly pounded the land. It was only at this moment that you remembered the moon influence. That's right, it's the tidal force. The seawater near the moon rises due to tidal attraction. The entire ocean seemed to come alive. However, you didn't stay happy for long before you started to worry, because this was a catastrophe for the single-celled organisms you had nurtured. Frantically, you used planetary vision to survey over 2,000 biological communities, and found that almost 99% of the single-celled organisms had been destroyed, previously, in order to let them breed on land. You placed all the biological communities relatively close to the shore, affected by tidal forces, swept onto the land by waves as high as several tens of meters. As the tide receded, all the organisms were wiped out. Such a result is also hard for you to accept, although you are the ruler of all things. But what you can do is really very little. In the time that follows, you are searching for life that has survived globally. Fortunately, single-celled organisms that survived were found in a few scattered communities. This time, you didn't intervene too much. Carving a channel on the surface of the planet. After introducing seawater into a meteorite crater, then, 10% of the surviving life was introduced into it. The rest were thrown back into the ocean to fend for themselves. After completing all of this, you feel an irresistible drowsiness coming over you. You close your visual system once again, fall into a trance, and you don't know how many years have passed like this. When you wake up, you find that everything has changed. The originally barren and dark red land has some places near the water source suddenly became a lush greenery. You eagerly bring your sight closer. They have a simple yet chaotic way of growing, growing closely to the ground, continuously spreading in all directions from the growth site, becoming more and more dense. It turns out to be planted. 
plants. You originally thought that seaweed-like thing was the only plant on this planet. But at this point, you didn't expect them to have successfully landed during your own hibernation. After a burst of excitement, you also noticed another change on the land. That's the soil near the river banks and coastlines. This simple soil should be formed by the combined action of river and ocean impact and weathering. It looks extremely barren. Only that kind of moss can barely take root here. But the reason why the moss is short and sparse is precisely because the soil is too barren. The soil on Earth is jointly created through the weathering and transformation of plants over the years. It seems that we really can't be too hasty at the moment. Because all the algae on the entire sphere are gathered into one ball. I estimate they can't even produce one or two pounds. Not to mention covering the entire globe with them to make fertile soil. Then you turned your gaze to the meteorite crater lake. Just a glance, but, you were stunned. A tiny creature, resembling a centipede, is scurrying away. Some flea-like creatures are chasing from behind. Several spherical creatures are watching intently from the side. Their bodies are just a few millimeters long, yet they come in all sorts of shapes. You look on in shock. What's going on? Where did the original red and green ones go? What have I missed during this slumber? Controlling the little creatures, you look around. Goodness, this is actually a multicellular organism. How many years has it been asleep? How did the whole world change so suddenly? The visual system exits the micro world. You look at the entire surface of the planet. The polar ice caps are much larger than before. A thick layer of snow covers the air. The melted water turns into streams of various sizes, continuously flowing into the ocean. The water vapor rising above the sea is carried by air currents to the north and south poles, where it accumulates enough to form precipitation, snowfall. In this way, the water cycle is also formed. The originally low mountains become more towering due to the squeezing of the tectonic plates. The atmosphere also becomes higher and thicker. Even if some small meteorites come close, they will be burned to ashes. Today's planet is similar to Earth, except for too little green. The rest is almost the same as Earth. Everything is going more smoothly than imagined. More advanced. Life may appear in the not too distant future. Not too far in the future. You look up at the almost eternal mother star. It was found that the large red spot caused by the asteroid impact had almost completely disappeared. But in your eyes, those things still seem like they happened just yesterday. It seems like a really long time of sleep. You look at the big foot again. As your moon, this guy seems very diligent. This white guy, whose surface was very smooth when he first arrived. Now it has quite a few craters on its surface. It seems that during its own slumber time, it has withstood the intense bombardment from outer space. The meteorites seem to have had their orbits disrupted by this guy's gravity. At the same time, it also protected your sphere from being attacked. As a result, the hard one biological community was spared from the impact. But you always feel that this guy seems to be much closer to you than before. It's like being gradually drawn towards something, thinking of you like that. Trying to reduce my own gravity. Pushed the orbit of this dumpling-shaped planet outward. The result was unexpected. This thing is getting farther and farther away from you. The orbit also traced a strange arc. You stare at the green mother planet opposite. Immediately knew something had happened to the dumpling. He is constantly being pulled by the gravity of the mother planet. He might become a satellite of the mother planet. You allow this kind of thing to happen. If it weren't for the dumpling, the seawater on the planet would no longer have tidal phenomena. Perhaps it might also affect more things. Damn mother planet. Trying to steal my little brother. The next moment, you increased your own gravity and began to compete with the mother for dominance over the dumpling. This process is exceptionally difficult and lengthy. Under the struggle between mother and you, Dejauzi seems to have a hard time as well. Even a part of the celestial bodies gradually started to crack. The shattered rocks even flew into outer space. It lasted for quite a long time. Perhaps Dejauzi is not that far from oneself. He finally gradually broke free from the strong gravitational pull of the mother and then gradually started to face you and work. Until now, only then did you breathe a sigh of relief. Never thought that just one thought almost lost something so important. You are adjusting the gravity. Did Jiaozi also slowly return to its normal state? You looked at the mother's huge green celestial body. A secret change occurred in the bottom of the heart. Goodness gracious, sooner or later, I will throw you away. However, Zhou Yu was still somewhat surprised. How did the big dumpling get closer and closer to him? What happened? After the surprise subsided, Zhou Yu turned his attention back to the little creatures that had evolved into multicellular organisms. Their safety was his top concern. However, he unexpectedly discovered that the previous saltwater lake had suddenly disappeared. Zhou Yu carefully compared the coordinates of the saltwater lake in his memory and saw that it had been submerged by seawater, turning into a shallow bay. During the process of competing for the big dumpling, a tsunami happened there by coincidence. Damn it! 
It's over. Zhou Yu quickly searched for those multicellular organisms in that area. However, finding those tiny organisms, less than a millimeter in size, was not easy, especially in the vast ocean. Zhou Yu searched almost all the nearby coastlines and only found a small group near the mouth of a river that flowed into the sea. He couldn't find the rest, no matter how hard he looked. They might have been washed up to farther land by the tide and roasted to death by the sun, or perhaps taken to the deep sea by the ocean. He didn't expect that dealing with the big dumpling would have such an impact on himself. Zhou Yu felt that he was actually quite lucky. At least every time such a big accident happened, those little creatures were resilient enough to survive, not easily killed. This was something that made him feel relieved. Looking at the few hundred multicellular organisms existing within a few square meters near the mouth of the river, Zhou Yu also realized that he seemed to have a lot of things to do. The first thing to do was to establish another saltwater lake. This kind of work was not difficult once you had done it before, especially for Zhou Yu. He found a meteorite crater quickly. This meteorite crater was special in that it seemed to be a collapse caused by several meteorite craters connected together, with an area of more than 100 square kilometers. Zhou Yu estimated that this place was about 10 kilometers away from the coastline, which should be safer compared to the previous one. At least it wouldn't be easily destroyed by a tsunami or flood. He quickly opened a wide crack here, gradually leading to the sea, and the surging seawater flowed into the large meteorite crater. Soon, the seawater covered this area, and with the blowing of the strong wind, the azure lake water began to lap against the lake shore. However, Zhou Yu still had some concerns. He adjusted the height of the land outside the lake shore by tens of meters and created an almost 20 meter high airtight stone wall, providing an extra layer of protection for the entire saltwater lake. Then, Zhou Yu brought many rocks from nearby mountains and placed them on the shore. What he wanted to do was to shorten the process of forming the original soil, saving time and providing the basic conditions for plant growth on the lake shore. If he waited for the lake water to erode slowly, who knows how long it would take. Zhou Yu lifted countless boulders and, using his telekinesis, instantly crushed them into sand-like fragments, spreading a thick layer of them on the lake shore. Then, he shifted his focus. After searching for a while, he found some moss on the riverbanks that had not been submerged by the previous tide. These tenacious little lives also needed protection and reproduction, otherwise, who knows when an accident might occur and completely destroy them, after all the effort they made to land. Zhou Yu carefully gathered some moss from several moss-gathering areas, along with the soil, and moved them to the lakeside, planting them at certain distances. This was considered a basic greening effort. After completing this, he gathered the small creatures from the estuary and placed them collectively into the new saltwater lake. The small creatures hardly noticed the change in their habitat and quickly adapted to the lake water, even immediately starting to reproduce. Zhou Yu first noticed the reproduction of a creature that he had seen before, resembling a centipede with a long body and spines on its sides. They seemed to be the largest proportion of the creatures in this group. They mostly lurked around the seaweed, moving slowly and having a large size. Zhou Yu saw that one of the centipedes had moved away from the hunting range of the predators and extended a tentacle towards a relatively secluded area of seaweed. The tentacle extended outward, splitting into five translucent smaller forked tentacles, resembling miniature versions of the centipede creature. As time passed, the forked tentacles gradually grew, almost identical to the appearance of the parent body. Eventually, the connection narrowed and detached from the parent body, sticking to the seaweed. It's somewhat like a form of asexual reproduction, but also somewhat different. What exactly is this? Just as Zhou Yu was contemplating, the parent body suddenly split into two. Then, a small creature with scissor-like sharp mouthparts swooped down several times on the still active segment of the centipede creature, cutting it into pieces. Soon, like sharks smelling blood, many carnivorous creatures that were originally far away swam over and began to feast on the centipede creature's corpse. After a while, Zhou Yu saw these thugs start to cannibalize each other. The once calm and peaceful seaweed area had now become a battlefield, with a terrifying smell permeating the air. As time passed, the carnivorous creatures finally left, and the large centipede creature was completely consumed, leaving only the five small centipede creatures deep within the seaweed. The small centipede creatures grew at a fast pace, quickly consuming the surrounding seaweed and gradually approaching adult size. Occasionally, a few unfortunate ones that ventured out were preyed upon by the carnivores, while the survivors began a new round of reproduction. Zhou Yu watched all of this, feeling the cruelty of nature and a deep sense of awe for the cycle of life. He circled around the mother planet many times. He wanted to accelerate the growth of the lake's ecosystem through the passage of time, as the current progress was insufficient. It was completely inadequate for him to conduct new experiments. Zhou Yu understood very well that if he wanted these little creatures to evolve quickly, he had to intervene effectively, just like last time. 
Otherwise, who knew when they would make progress? After some time, Zhou Yu turned back to look at the saltwater lake. He found that the lakeside, surrounded by towering rocks, had suddenly turned completely green. Zhou Yu's heart quickly leaped with joy, knowing that it was the moss without even needing to say it. He approached and observed carefully. From a distance, it appeared as a green patch, but up close, he realized it wasn't as dense as he had expected. It was almost similar to the kind he had seen on the seashore before, with similar species. He joyfully observed this and checked the global distribution of moss. Zhou Yu spent some time and came to a conclusion. The reproductive ability of this moss seemed quite astonishing. As long as there was water and a connection to the ocean, they could grow and reproduce vigorously, spreading their vibrant green color, even in soil with almost no nutrients. Zhou Yu hopes that these mosses can accelerate their evolution and gradually cover the entire planet with green, forming a layer of fertile soil in the process of reproduction. This requires the magic of time to bring about change. Zhou Yu can intervene with the small red and green ones, but he cannot do anything to the plants. The most he can do is gradually extend their habitat inland. Of course, he still has a lot to do here. For example, turning countless hard rocks into powder to make the most basic infertile soil. While constantly crushing rocks to create soil, Zhou Yu has not forgotten to observe the small creatures in the saltwater lake. They have already reproduced a considerable number of populations during this period. The small point that was originally placed by the lake, which was less than 10 square meters in size, has now grown to control nearly 100 square meters of territory and is still expanding. As for the highly reproductive seaweed, they have even extended their tentacles to the vicinity of the lake center, and their presence floating on the water surface has gradually dyed the azure lake water green. Near the shore of the lake bottom, some needle-like aquatic plants have also grown, dancing with the waves. Zhou Yu even saw that some multicellular organisms were inhabiting here, which was not the case before. Near the lake center, Zhou Yu also discovered a considerable number of single-celled organisms swimming continuously, just like the small green and red ones at the beginning, but the variety seems to be more diverse. Zhou Yu was delighted to see that this small ecosystem seemed to be constantly repairing and growing under the baptism of time, gradually filling the entire saltwater lake with vitality. This is the return he has made after spending so much energy. With a gratified mood, Zhou Yu carefully looked at his main target, those multicellular organisms. The number is already sufficient, and he can start experimenting again to accelerate the process of evolution for these little guys. Unexpectedly, it seems that more types of multicellular organisms have appeared in the lake water. Zhou Yu counted and found that compared to before, there are more than 20 types of carnivorous multicellular organisms, and even if he didn't count them in detail, there are nearly a hundred types of herbivorous multicellular organisms. He was excited, and life seemed to be advancing towards a more prosperous direction. However, this also posed some difficulties for the experiments he had to do. Should he select a small portion for experimentation or include all of them? Zhou Yu hesitated for a while and decided to include all the multicellular organisms together. Collective coevolution can make the entire ecosystem more balanced than individual evolution. He quickly selected two lucky ones, one from the carnivorous multicellular organisms with six tentacles and two spikes on its mouth, Zhou Yu called it, six-legged monster. As for the herbivorous side, Zhou Yu still pursued the advantage of speed this time and found one with a head like a blue sphere and the rest of its body like a ruler, with a strange protrusion on its tail. Its name naturally became Ruler Monster. Okay, the experiment is about to begin, if it goes smoothly. Zhou Yu suppressed his excitement and immediately started the operation. His idea was the same as last time, to use the stirring spirit to make both sides feel a sense of crisis and then start evolving frantically. However, what Zhou Yu didn't expect was that he soon encountered an accident. The ruler monster, under his control, swam to a gathering place of the small red ones and provoked them. When the small red ones surrounded it, just as it was about to swim away, its tail suddenly flashed automatically. Immediately after, the group of small red ones seemed to be completely motionless, as if they were dead. What the hell? Zhou Yu hadn't had time to react yet, and the other little reds who had gathered around began tearing apart the bodies of these seemingly dead little reds. Zhou Yu looked at the strange ruler and controlled it to approach a few more little reds, waiting until they were almost caught. Its tail flashed again, and those little reds became motionless as if they were dead. Now, Zhou Yu finally understood. The tail of the strange ruler automatically releases electricity in times of crisis. When did this evolve? It doesn't make any sense to be electrified, right? He looked at the little greens again, carefully examining each species, and after a thorough inspection, he discovered something remarkable. These guys seemed to have evolved various amazing features. There were those who used camouflage hidden in seaweed, those who grew numerous tentacles for incredible speed, and those with extremely hard exteriors who clashed with the little reds. 
Upon closer inspection of the colony of Little Reds, he even discovered the existence of individuals with fangs all over their bodies. Looking at all this, Zhou Yu suddenly felt that he didn't have much to do. Even though he hadn't intervened, these creatures had evolved so quickly, far beyond his imagination. Before evolving from single-celled organisms to multicellular organisms, they all had simple repetitive features and appeared to be simple organisms. After becoming multicellular organisms, however, they experienced a burst of evolution. They continued to evolve in a more complex and practical direction. After thinking for a while, Zhou Yu decided not to conduct experiments to accelerate evolution but chose another path. He would further expand their population. These multicellular organisms only reproduced and thrived in the saltwater lake, which was far from enough. The overall area of the ocean on his spherical world was tens of thousands of times larger than this saltwater lake. The birth of life is far from sufficient with the evolution of just a small group. Only by continuously expanding the population can the evolution of these little lives be further promoted. Zhou Yu made up his mind and began carefully selecting the species of these small creatures and searching for new habitats. His spherical world was exceptionally vast, with the ocean occupying a considerable proportion. Taking advantage of the fact that these multicellular organisms generally lived near the coast, Zhou Yu first placed a portion of them near the nearby coastline. After observing for a while, he found that the difference in wave height in this area was not significant, so there shouldn't be any tsunamis or similar events. Zhou Yu began the relocation process. When the organisms in this area began to reproduce, he moved a portion of them to another location. This process lasted for a considerable amount of time. When almost all suitable water areas were inhabited by these little creatures, Zhou Yu even discovered that some of them had evolved structures similar to skeletons. He felt that he didn't need to do anything more in terms of evolution. What he should do is provide them with a suitable environment for survival. As a planet, this was what Zhou Yu was best at. Looking up at the global environment, he suddenly noticed something completely overlooked. The temperature of the entire planet seemed to have dropped significantly compared to before. The average temperature, which had been maintained at 40 to 50 degrees, was now less than 20 degrees. Zhou Yu quickly found the culprit. It was the ice caps that were supposed to be located at the north and south poles, gradually developing in the opposite direction and even extending towards the vicinity of the planet's center. Ice age? That's what it's called, right? Zhou Yu quickly remembered this term. Along with the ice age came the extinction of life populations. The plants that rely on temperature to survive will definitely not withstand the invasion of low temperatures, and the creatures in the ocean are even more vulnerable. Countermeasures must be taken. Volcanoes, erupt again. The fires of hell instantly erupted from Zhou Yu's land and ocean, starting to reheat his planet that had already become cold. The continuously erupting volcanoes immediately began to heat up the temperature of the entire planet, gradually raising the average temperature that had been continuously decreasing. Glaciers melted and receded, breaking into countless icebergs. In order to prevent the icebergs from accidentally colliding with the small lives on the shore, Zhou Yu controlled those icebergs and threw them directly back to the north and south poles. After a while, as the temperature gradually rose, the glaciers also gradually receded near the poles. When they were no longer as massive, Zhou Yu stopped. He put some of the erupting volcanoes to sleep, only allowing less than one-fifth of the volcanoes to continue erupting. After this series of operations, after a while, Zhou Yu stabilized the temperature of the entire planet at around 40 degrees again. The extensive melting of glaciers also raised the global sea level significantly. He raised the land by tens of meters and slightly expanded its area before stopping. Zhou Yu breathed a sigh of relief in his heart. He really did put in a lot of effort this time. However, thinking about these efforts, he felt that it was worth it to create a good environment for those small lives to survive. After all, if things continued like this, the little creatures would begin their great evolutionary journey and eventually become countless intelligent beings. By then, Zhou Yu might really have someone to chat with and pass the time. Thinking about this, he accelerated the speed of creating primitive soil. He cut countless boulders from the rock formations and crushed them into fine particles. This work was much more tedious than before, but it greatly reduced the difficulty of plants coming ashore and even laid the foundation for them to spread to areas closer to the inland in the future. The work of creating soil continued, and Zhou Yu looked up at the distant green mother star. He discovered something very important. Because he was a satellite, he had been revolving around this guy and was tidally locked. This also meant that he did not have the sorrow of the four seasons. The temperature on the sphere now proved this, it did not have the seasonal changes near the temperate zone like the earth. This undoubtedly meant that the plant and animal populations on his body would have to accept the fate of only having summer in the future. 
Looking at the huge red star in the far end behind him, Zhou Yu is now somewhat dissatisfied. If he could orbit around this star, he wouldn't have to worry about such things. He wouldn't have to constantly worry about the coming of an ice age or rely on volcanic eruptions to maintain the temperature. Because of this mother star, he didn't even receive much light. A dangerous and bold idea suddenly arose in his mind. What if I get rid of this guy, get rid of being a satellite, and become a planet? Zhou Yu also knew very well that this would be absolutely impossible under normal circumstances. After breaking free from the strong gravitational pull of the mother star, he would still have to adjust his orbit around the star to ensure that he wouldn't be pulled away by the star's gravity. Just thinking about all of this made him feel that it was too audacious. However, Zhou Yu couldn't tolerate it anymore. What he wanted was a planet similar to Earth, not spending countless days with only summer revolving around this green fool. The dangerous idea in Zhou Yu's mind gradually expanded, and even though he kept grinding rocks into sand, he couldn't stop the idea from continuing to grow. I'm done with this. After circling around the mother star countless times, Zhou Yu couldn't bear it any longer. As a second-class citizen of the entire galaxy, these days were too suffocating, especially being able to only face the mother star, which made him feel uncomfortable just thinking about it. Zhou Yu felt that only by being on equal footing with the mother star could he let out his grievances. If possible, why not give it a try? Even if it's just a one in a million chance. With this in mind, Zhou Yu prepared to confront the mother star. What he wanted to do was to gradually break free from the gravitational pull of the mother star using his almost limitless telekinetic power. Zhou Yu had previously noticed a fact, that even if he didn't want to, there was a force on the orbit during revolution that was like a magnet, forcing him to revolve around the mother star in an irregular circle. For a long time, Zhou Yu had been passively accepting this, not considering it a big deal, after all, he didn't think it was a bad thing before. But now, he was unwilling. How about resisting a little? Zhou Yu started using his telekinetic power. He wanted to gradually expand the orbit revolving around this planet and completely break free from its control. The first step is often the most difficult. Zhou Yu was prepared for this. However, what he didn't expect was that it would be so difficult. His telekinetic power was only able to resist slightly before being seized by an immensely powerful force. Zhou Yu understood that this was the gravitational force that bound him to the mother star, and it was because of this force that there were dozens of satellite brothers accompanying him and circling around. However, if he didn't resist, he would never know what the result would be. He began a tug of war with the mother star. But after a while, Zhou Yu felt that forcibly pulling away was not working. That immense gravitational force wouldn't easily let him go. So, how about accelerating his own rotation? Zhou Yu immediately started experimenting. The result made him realize that this was even more impossible. The opponent was still gravity, and this method was still futile. With a deeply troubled mood, Zhou Yu had no choice but to continue revolving around the green star while also pondering strategies. After a few more rounds, he suddenly noticed something he had long overlooked, the shape of the orbit during revolution. It was slightly elliptical, sometimes bringing him closer to the mother star and sometimes farther away. What if he played a game of gravitational tug-of-war with the mother star when he reached the farthest distance? Zhou Yu quickly seized the opportunity. He was already close to that position. Come on! Zhou Yu mustered his strength. At the same time, that powerful force once again began to struggle against him. However, after Zhou Yu persisted for less than a moment, this method was easily defeated by the power of the mother star. He still couldn't challenge the formidable opponent. Damn it, what should I do? Zhou Yu felt anxious. No matter how hard he pulled, even if he was in a position relatively farther from the gravitational force, it was impossible. To calm himself down, he shifted his gaze and started grinding sand again. The boulders were being crushed and gradually falling apart. Zhou Yu was thinking of a strategy, but his mind was elsewhere. When he finally paid attention, he realized that he had actually created a large and a small stone sphere. Ah, uh, am I going a bit crazy? Zhou Yu self-mockingly thought. Looking at the stone spheres, he was about to crush them when suddenly he thought that this could also simulate his relationship with the mother star. Soon, under Zhou Yu's control, the small marble-like stone began to orbit around the large stone sphere the size of a fitness ball. Of course, Zhou Yu also accurately simulated the shape of the orbit. Pulling outwards is definitely not possible, so how should I do it? Ah, I got it. Zhou Yu looked at the two stone spheres and suddenly had a new idea. Zhou Yu was excited, he found a breakthrough. He couldn't wait to start practicing this idea. Soon, he ran to the farthest point from the mother star again. This time, instead of forcefully pulling outwards, he used telekinesis to move along the direction of the orbit at a slight angle. Zhou Yu found that this time he encountered almost no resistance and actually moved a great distance along the diagonal direction. 
It was such a simple thing, yet he had been troubled for half a day. After drawing an arc like this, Zhou Yu deviated from the orbit around the mother star. Not long after he felt happy, he found himself once again bound by the strong gravity, but he was relieved to see that the orbit had moved a great distance outward. It works. Zhou Yu was eager to try, and he also understood that he had passed the first level of attempt, but now he had to stop for a moment and consider many other things. For example, his brothers and sisters, the 50 to 60 satellites that revolve around the mother star with him. If he accidentally collided with any of them while moving, it would be a disaster for these small lives on his body. Another thing to consider is the safe distance from the star. If he got too close, he would be tidally locked like now, and he would be roasted by the merciless heat wave. If he got too far, the merciless ice and snow would completely cover him. Both of these factors had to be considered together, and either one of them could be fatal. However, after thinking for a while, he still felt that it would be more appropriate to move to a slightly farther distance from the star first. After all, the temperature here on the side of the mother star was actually quite high when exposed to sunlight, so it would be better to be a bit farther away. Zhou Yu began to carefully examine the specific position of the planetary system he was in now. He had been too focused on the life system on his sphere before, and he hadn't even taken a good look at the general situation of this planetary system. The huge green gas giant in front of him had a spectacular ring system. Zhou Yu carefully compared and estimated that this thing was probably hundreds of times larger than himself, no wonder the gravity was so strong that it caused him to become a giant. Among the 50 to 60 satellites of the mother star, Zhou Yu was the largest, but he couldn't measure exactly how big he was. As for the other satellites, there were only seven that were also spherical like him. The rest, Zhou Yu even wanted to call them small asteroids. If it weren't for the fact that they all revolved around the mother star, he wouldn't even consider those pitiful little guys as the same kind. Among all the satellites, Zhou Yu's position was relatively towards the middle and slightly on the outer side, while most of the small satellites were located between several rings. Among the spherical satellites, there were also two smaller ones in the vicinity. On the route Zhou Yu wanted to escape outward, there were four spherical satellites and eleven small satellites. This means that if he wants to escape from here without any harm, he must consider the orbits of these 15 satellites and definitely avoid getting too close to them. At the same time, he also needs to decide at what distance he should revolve around the star. Looking at it this way, this escape journey involves extremely complex tasks and will likely consume a lot of time. However, Zhou Yu has plenty of time. During the escape process, the life forms in the sphere will also evolve slowly, and he has done everything he should do, adding so many layers of insurance to the incubator for life forms. The rest will rely on the magic of time. Therefore, Zhou Yu can focus all his energy on how to become an independent planet. While Zhou Yu revolves around his mother star, he constantly observes the orbits of the three closest satellites to him. He feels that if he wants to shuttle through their orbits, he must pay attention to the timing. Based on previous experiments, he cannot move up or down, so he cannot utilize space to avoid these annoying little creatures from above or below. He can only calculate their orbital revolution in minimum safe distance, and then seek opportunities. The satellite closest to Zhou Yu is a brownish sphere satellite, which is relatively small compared to Zhou Yu and revolves at a relatively slow speed. He has carefully observed that when he completes three revolutions, this satellite has only completed less than half a revolution. Moreover, its orbit is basically in the upper and lower spaces relative to Zhou Yu, so it is not difficult to avoid it at all. The second satellite, which is further away, is a small satellite that moves at a faster speed, similar to Zhou Yu, and its orbit is basically parallel to Zhou Yu's. Zhou Yu feels that this one is quite dangerous. If it gets too close, there may be real danger. The third satellite is also a small satellite, but the space between it and Zhou Yu is too large, and it does not pose any threat. It seems that by studying how to avoid the second satellite, Zhou Yu only needs to pass through these three lines of defense. While maintaining his revolution, Zhou Yu seeks an escape route. He first follows the method from last time and starts moving outward when he reaches the point on the orbit farthest from the mother star. While observing the position of the brown satellite, he quickly passed the first line of defense. The next step is crucial, how to avoid this small satellite that has a similar speed in orbit to Zhou Yu. He cannot get too close, nor can he rush to pass it, after all, the speed of movement is much slower than the speed of revolution, and he also needs to continue his revolution. After observing the small satellite for a while, Zhou Yu suddenly came up with a bold idea. What if he enters its orbit and positions himself in a straight line with it? If he becomes the two farthest points on this elliptical orbit, it could work. Zhou Yu made up his mind and started to act. He continuously reduced the distance between him and the small satellite's orbit, calculating when this satellite would be farthest from him, while also paying attention to the best timing for the point on his orbit farthest from the mother star. 
After several hundred revolutions, Zhou Yu finally seized the opportunity. He quickly took action. The sphere slowly rotated and gradually moved onto the same orbit as the small satellite, completely facing it. After completing all this, Zhou Yu finally breathed a sigh of relief. He didn't expect this second step to take so long. He didn't have time to rest, but instead started calculating how to overcome the obstacles further away. The third, fourth. After a considerable amount of time, Zhou Yu realized that there were only the last two spherical planets in front of him. However, at this point, he suddenly felt that the heat emitted by the star seemed much hotter and more uncomfortable than before. The temperature on the sphere was also rising rapidly. The closer he got to the outermost orbit, the closer he was to the star. Zhou Yu had anticipated this. He had prepared for this beforehand. How could he pass through so many blockades if he didn't expect this? After going through countless hardships and spending a considerable amount of time, Zhou Yu finally gradually moved onto the outer orbit of the mother star. As long as he passes between the two satellite spheres, he will have no obstacles and can consider when to completely break free from the constraints of the mother star and transform from a satellite to a planet. From the original orbit to the current position, Zhou Yu does not know how many years have passed. Several thousand years? Hundreds of thousands of years? Or even longer? He refocused his attention, having done what needed to be done, and now he had no spare time to look at the small lives. Currently, he also encountered something uncomfortable, which was the heat from a distant star. This caused the temperature of his sphere to slowly rise. However, Zhou Yu was prepared for this. He had completely stopped the eruption of all volcanoes on the sphere earlier, which gave the polar ice caps a chance to expand strongly. As he slowly approached the limit of the control range of the mother star, these glaciers on his body began to melt as the temperature of the sphere increased. This immediately resolved the occurrence of this fatal situation. Zhou Yu narrowly escaped a disaster, but he didn't have time to continue celebrating. He had to quickly overcome the final obstacle, get past these two large satellites, and continue to break free from the entanglement of the mother star's gravity. There were still two satellite spheres ahead, and Zhou Yu decided to quickly resolve the situation, even though their speeds were fast and they were basically in the same spatial plane as himself. Zhou Yu had already completed several revolutions, and the expansion of the orbit of revolution had also made the time to reach the farthest point from the mother star much longer. After another half revolution, he reached that point, but the gray planet closest to him happened to pass by, forcing him to give up this opportunity. Zhou Yu also paid attention to the last white guy, whose revolution speed seemed to be slower than his own and was closer to the gray star. If he wanted to take advantage of the time difference, he had to consider it as well. The opportunity soon arrived. When Zhou Yu reached the next farthest point, the gray star had just passed by, and the farther white star had not yet reached this side. He couldn't wait and immediately started the diagonal translation. After successfully reaching the orbit of the gray star, Zhou Yu looked at the white star that had not yet arrived and immediately slid onto its orbit. Very smooth, then. Just as Zhou Yu was thinking this, a white shadow suddenly passed by. Damn it! Zhou Yu was startled and carefully looked, only to find that it was a comet whizzing by with a long tail. His previous attention was focused on avoiding the satellites, completely ignoring everything else. If he had passed a little slower earlier, this guy would probably have crashed into him. At that time, the small lives on the sphere would have faced disaster. Zhou Yu was still in shock when he noticed a crescent-shaped black-gray celestial body becoming a new obstacle. Zhou Yu carefully looked at this guy, who was slowly revolving around the mother star with dimmer light and couldn't help but smile bitterly in his heart. Why does this guy look like a bulbous garlic? It's quite compatible with the big white dumpling that is still following me. However, if he were to capture it and make it his new satellite, would it have a significant impact on the sphere? Zhou Yu remembered the incident when he almost caused all the small lives to perish while competing with the mother star for the big white dumpling satellite last time, and quickly dismissed the impulse to capture the garlic. He quickly avoided this slow-moving guy and moved to a further space. However, strangely enough, Zhou Yu always felt that during this continuous translation process, the immense force pulling him seemed to be getting smaller and more elusive. He realized that this might be the gravitational limit area that his home planet could control, but he couldn't be sure. Zhou Yu tried to pull himself directly outward, no longer waiting to reach a farther point. There's a door. Awesome. Zhou Yu felt that force, which seemed even greater than his own telekinesis. He could even move further away with ease. While continuously moving outward, he also kept looking around for any dangerous creatures. Just in case he encountered a comet or a darker satellite, he wanted to be able to react in time. Fortunately, there were no such creatures nearby. The entire plan had progressed halfway, and Zhou Yu was able to focus his gaze on that red star. What he needed to do now was find an orbit around that star and become a true planet. 
At the same time, as he continued to move outward, he felt the gravitational pull from his home planet becoming weaker and weaker. However, the temperature of the sphere was also continuously rising. When it revolved to the side farthest from the star, the temperature dropped significantly. Zhou Yu felt that he couldn't delay any longer. He had to prepare for the next step immediately. His initial plan was to establish the orbit behind his home planet, where the temperature might be more suitable. With the suitable temperature and the right inclination, Zhou Yu would soon have four seasons on his planet. Zhou Yu became excited. He carefully observed the starry region behind his home planet. That was the paradise most suitable for life. However, Zhou Yu unexpectedly discovered a small orange planet there, constantly revolving and rotating around the star. He was instantly dumbfounded. This was simply unbelievable. What was the point of all his efforts? To coexist with this annoying orange planet? This was absolutely ridiculous. Zhou Yu really wanted to rush over and knock that guy away. Unfortunately, if he did that, he would also be scattered, not to mention those small lives. What if he went to the orbit closer to the star? Zhou Yu quickly spotted a black planet. Its rotation speed was incredibly high, and Zhou Yu also noticed a layer of smoky substance trailing behind it, like a powder on its surface. He immediately understood that the immense gravitational force of the star was constantly stripping the surface rocks of this unlucky planet. It was estimated that in the distant future, this planet would completely turn into powder. Zhou Yu looked at the distant and magnificent ring of stars, which was probably the fate of this black planet. The temperature of the sphere had almost pushed the glaciers back to the vicinity of the north and south poles. If he didn't make a decision soon, it would be too late to even cry. Zhou Yu glanced at the annoying orange planet and sighed inwardly. Since he couldn't push it away, he had to be neighbors with this guy. Zhou Yu moved toward the outer edge of the gravitational layer of his home planet, which was becoming thinner and thinner. After a while, he finally no longer felt that strange force and broke free from the confinement of the green gas planet. The distance to the orange planet was not that far anymore. He he, I did it. Just as Zhou Yu was about to praise himself for his feat, he suddenly felt a force that was countless times greater than that of his home planet, firmly pulling him. The crimson star shone with an incredibly scorching brilliance. Under its immensely powerful gravity, even massive creatures like the green gas planet became its subjects. While breaking free from the gravitational pull of his home planet, Zhou Yu was successfully captured by the gravitational force of the star. Damn, brother, your power is too strong. Zhou Yu couldn't even resist a bit and was forced to start orbiting the star. Although he had become a planet, Zhou Yu couldn't feel any happiness at this moment. Previously, in the embrace of his mother star, he could still move around using clever rules, but now he was like a grasshopper trying to shake a tree, struggling against the gravitational pull of the star. He could only obediently be a subordinate. All right, boss, congratulations on receiving me, who used to be your subordinate's subordinate and now your subordinate. You can be proud, Zhou Yu thought with a hint of bitterness. Orbiting the star, feeling its light and heat, Zhou Yu experienced the treatment of being a lucky planet for the first time, not being tidally locked. Looking at his former mother star in the distance, Zhou Yu felt like he was in a dream. He used to be a second-class citizen, but now he was on equal footing with his former boss. It was like a dream come true. However, this was also the result of his continuous efforts. Otherwise, it would be impossible to achieve such a thing on any other satellite. Zhou Yu orbited the star again and again. He found that the orbit of this revolution seemed to be the same as before, elliptical in shape. He could also occasionally adjust the frequency and speed of his own rotation, and even adjust the angle at which the light shone on him. Suddenly, Zhou Yu thought of Earth. What was the obliquity angle again? He carefully recalled the knowledge from his high school geography textbook, wanting to become a high-fidelity Earth. The environment of Earth was like a carefully calculated one. Whether it was the obliquity angle, magnetic poles, rotation frequency, or revolution speed, even the slightest deviation would immediately bring any life on it to disaster. Could it be that Earth is also conscious? Zhou Yu boldly speculated, while continuously adjusting his rotation and revolution speeds. He vaguely remembered seeing similar speculations online, saying that Earth is a giant organism and humans are just bacteria living on it. It was terrifying to think about. The obliquity angle was also adjusted to 23 degrees 26 minutes. In the past, Zhou Yu would have scoffed at this idea. But now, as a conscious planet, he believed in this hypothesis without a doubt. Didn't he control volcanoes, create an atmosphere and oceans? He even intervened in the evolution speed of single-celled organisms. The more Zhou Yu thought about it, the more afraid he became. The rotation speed had been successfully adjusted to about 24 hours. Zhou Yu had been constantly calculating the rotation time down to the second. 
To prevent any errors, he even calculated it hundreds of times. At the same time, he adjusted the revolution speed to about 360 days, with no more than a 5-day difference. If he wanted to mimic, he had to mimic thoroughly. Everything was for the lives on the sphere. After adjusting the tilt and frequency of his own rotation, Zhou Yu finally breathed a sigh of relief. The overall environment was finally created. He went from being a tidally locked satellite to a planet orbiting the star, making various adjustments based on Earth. Now, he could fully focus on the small lives in the sphere's oceans. How long had it been since he last saw them? Zhou Yu couldn't even remember. He had been doing various things to become a planet and had no time to spare. Alright, let's see how far my little ones have evolved. Zhou Yu finally glanced at the still silently orbiting dumpling-like object and completely focused his gaze on the surface of the sphere. However, before he could even look into the ocean, the massive changes on the land made it impossible for him to look away. This, I'm so uncultured. Zhou Yu looked at the continent covered by countless tall plants and couldn't help but exclaim. Weren't they just small mosses near the water before? When did they evolve into such a large scale and advanced plants? Zhou Yu carefully observed the jungle of blue plants growing not far from the coast. He was surprised to find that almost every plant was over 2 meters tall, with a density that was astonishing. However, these tall guys, resembling giant trees, were not woody plants. They seemed more like enlarged celery, with branches full of moisture. Looking at their blue, ocean-like leaves, he realized that it was an illusion formed by countless droplet-like thick palm-shaped leaves on the branches. Wait a minute, I remember that after algae plants, there are moss plants, and then... Ferns? Zhou Yu carefully recalled his knowledge at that time, filled with curiosity and confusion about the plants in front of him. They looked more like succulent plants he had raised as a human, both in branches and leaves, but just not as tall. Zhou Yu also saw plants that looked like ordinary grass, but upon closer inspection, they looked more like enlarged moss. There was no sign of ferns. He was determined to get closer to the inland to see what other plants were like when suddenly he felt that these giant succulent plants seemed to move. Is it the wind? Zhou Yu looked at the constantly trembling leaves and felt that he was overreacting. However, as a violent commotion arose by the water, a pile of green, semi-transparent, snake-like objects suddenly crawled onto the beach, numbering in the thousands. Zhou Yu was dumbfounded. What on earth were these? Snakes? Or fish? He was certain that they were some kind of animals, as they were constantly moving. Soon, all thousands of them reached the shore. Zhou Yu noticed that these creatures seemed to have black, segmented appendages resembling feet underneath their bodies. As he got closer, he finally saw clearly. Each of these semi-transparent green creatures had eight pairs of symmetrical black, insect-like legs, with their heads splitting open to reveal a purple mouth. They looked around with their heads, making a gurgle sound, as if searching for something. They really looked like a bunch of earthworms. Insects? Aren't they too disgusting? Zhou Yu was a bit disgusted by the small life forms that had evolved on his sphere. Soon, this group of giant earthworms began to scatter and dig caves all over the beach. Whether they were searching for food or preparing to make a nest and do some repairs, they were reproducing and thriving. Zhou Yu thought so, and indeed saw them entering the already dug caves in pairs. And shortly after, cries from the depths of their souls could be heard from there. Zhou Yu found it a bit unbearable to watch. However, his curiosity made him unable to look away. How exactly did these creatures applaud for love? I want to observe it with a critical eye. Just then, the blue plants seemed to shake their branches again. Countless tentacles suddenly reached out towards the group of giant earthworms that were having a great time. Countless blue tentacles shot towards the beach and accurately pierced the ecstatic worms in the sand caves, giving them a chilling blow. Then, carrying their spoils, they gradually retracted back to their original positions. On the bodies that originally looked like succulent plants. Some of the light green worms ran away quickly and plunged into the water again, while many others disappeared without a trace. The originally lively beach is now empty and silent, as if it has fallen into a deathly silence. As an observer, Zhou Yu never expected such a situation to occur. He had originally wanted to critically observe how those bugs were operating, but his plans were interrupted by this sudden attack. He looked at the succulent plants and discovered that after capturing the light green bugs, they completely wrapped them up with more tendrils and floated in midair. After a while, the tendrils dispersed, and a transparent bug shell with black legs fell to the ground. At this moment, a large group of tiny creatures resembling crabs rushed out and headed straight for the bug shells, creating a rustling sound. The succulent plants remained motionless, as if nothing had happened. Witnessing the entire process, Zhou Yu couldn't help but get closer to the succulent plants. He carefully observed and discovered that hidden in the darkness, almost half buried in the ground, were creatures with heads resembling centipedes, with countless pairs of small eyes, constantly looking towards the beach. 
These centipede-headed creatures had huge bodies with six massive legs, and they remained motionless together. Joe you never expected that these plants he thought they were turned out to be all damn bugs, and carnivorous ones at that. He took a closer look at the incredibly realistic tree trunks and leaves and found that they were indeed real. They were directly growing on the backs of these centipede-headed creatures. After observing for a while, it didn't seem like parasitic plants, but rather something completely integrated with these centipede-headed creatures. No wonder those tendrils seemed alive. Joe you couldn't help but curse repeatedly. What is going on? Plants and bugs can coexist in one body? This completely overturned Zhou Yu's understanding. In his knowledge, plants like Cordyceps sinensis were already bizarre enough, but he never expected something even more bizarre to evolve on his own sphere. Zhou Yu glanced at these centipede-headed creatures again and found it hard to accept. Those worm-like bugs were one thing, but these centipede-headed creatures were even worse. Aren't there any normal animals or plants? Zhou Yu had originally wanted to celebrate the great evolution of life, but now, Seeing the appearance of these two disgusting creatures, his enthusiasm diminished by half. Aren't there any attractive things? With doubts in his mind, he began to look towards the depths of the land. As far as the eye could see, dense vegetation dominated the entire land. Except for the rocky desert areas located in the center of the land and the towering mountains, plants were everywhere. However, strangely enough, Zhou noticed that green plants were not the majority, there were more blue and red ones. Underneath the forest, it was basically a paradise of various heights and types of moss. Zhou Yu searched for a long time but still couldn't find any ferns. Occasionally, various small creatures with extremely fast speeds ran through the moss, and of course, there were also giant insects with enormous sizes rustling by. He used telekinesis to catch one of the strange insects and observed it carefully. It had green compound eyes, three straw-like mouthparts, was nearly five to six meters long, and its segmented body was as hard as steel, with a shiny wax-like shell. After releasing the strange insect, he caught a few other things and found that they were all incredibly ugly and unbearable to look at insects. Zhou Yu felt a bit horrified. How did his intervention in evolution produce these things? He didn't feel like looking at anything else and turned his gaze back to the Azure Ocean. What kind of animals and plants would be here? His gaze submerged into the water and quickly resurfaced. Zhou Yu began to doubt his visual system. He had just seen something that seemed even bigger than a small mountain swimming very close to the sea level. No way, how is that possible? In his understanding, a blue whale was already impressive enough, but the colossal creature he just saw was even bigger than dozens of blue whales combined. Joe you felt that there must be something wrong with his visual system. Something so massive couldn't possibly exist. With doubts in his mind, Joe Yu's gaze once again delved into the sea. The mountain-like monster opened its huge mouth, swallowing the seawater along with countless organisms. Then, an incredibly powerful jet of air spewed out from its rear, propelling the creature forward for dozens of meters. Zhou Yu was startled. He quickly widened his field of vision and discovered that it was a giant fish with a shell. Its shape was not much different from the fish on Earth, except that it was incredibly massive. Its back was covered in a continuous layer of thick shell, resembling scales. The fish's head was covered in countless bumps, and its eyes, which seemed to have no pupils, even had a transparent outer shell. As for what this creature was eating, Zhou Yu took a closer look. There were large beetles resembling scorpions, insects resembling centipedes, and snake-like creatures without eyes. Everywhere, there were insects, insects, and more insects. Zhou Yu felt a chill. Was he looking at it the wrong way? Why were there only insects? How did this monster end up with a fish head and body? He then shifted his gaze deeper into the ocean, away from the land. More hideously ugly fish appeared. Zhou Yu thought that his visual system had already developed some immunity to the previous group of ugly creatures, but upon seeing these fish, he felt the need to immediately move his visual system out of the sea. He felt that even the ugliest fish he had seen in an aquarium was a hundred times more attractive than these fellows with faces that looked like they had been pulled apart. Zhou Yu suddenly felt a sense of sadness. What was all this about? Why were the organisms on his sphere so ugly? Wasn't there a single normal one among them? If any of them evolved into intelligent beings, Zhou Yu would never be able to communicate with them. Just looking at their faces would make it impossible to have a normal conversation. With endless regret, Zhou Yu suddenly felt an overwhelming fatigue coming from the depths of his mind. He felt that he needed to get a good rest in order to ease this mental anguish. He closed his visual system and once again entered a state of sleep. Time passed. When Zhou Yu opened his visual system again, the first thing he saw was not the life forms on the sphere, but the orange planet. Previously, he had been blinded by the low attractiveness of the creatures on the sphere so he didn't bother to take the time to look at his neighbor. As a newcomer, he was quite eager to have an eye contact with this big orange. 
Unexpectedly, as soon as he opened his visual system this time, the orange planet came to him. After escaping the gravitational pull of the green gaseous planet and becoming a planet itself, Zhou Yu was quickly bound by the immense gravity of the star. Near the predetermined orbit of revolution, he didn't expect to find a planet that looked so much like an orange. Fortunately, Zhou Yu was not as close to it as he had imagined. From Zhou Yu's perspective, this thing is even the size of a tangerine. Orange, oh orange, you're occupying such a good place, have you also evolved life? After Zhou Yu ran on the current orbit, he discovered that this area is very suitable for the growth and evolution of life, not too hot or too cold, with a suitable temperature. He didn't know how long it had been since he became conscious, but if this orange had been on this suitable orbit from the beginning, it would definitely have even the lowest form of life, right? Zhou Yu actually wanted a companion. As a lonely planet, he couldn't communicate with anything. He had previously thought that maybe other planets also had consciousness, but no matter how he called out, he didn't receive any response. But if there is life on this big orange in front of him, Zhou Yu hopes that they have highly developed intelligent life, so that they can send a detection satellite similar to the Cassini spacecraft to observe him properly, just like Earth. Zhou Yu, filled with infinite hope, magnified the visual system's observation infinitely, chasing after the figure of the big orange, wanting to observe whether there are any signs of life. However, with his current ability, he can only magnify the big orange to the size of a basin, any larger and it would be impossible. Wait, is this the atmosphere? Zhou Yu noticed the thin mist-like translucent gas shield outside the big orange. This layer of atmosphere seems to be quite thick, with not very high transparency. If there is an atmosphere, then there should also be an ocean. Zhou Yu muttered, carefully observing the layer of orange reflected substance on the surface of the sphere, wondering if it was an ocean or something similar. However, he discovered that it was orange colored rocks that covered almost the entire globe. Only a few scattered areas had blue water, and they were very small in size and number. Damn, occupying such a good place, and it turned out like this? Zhou Yu laughed bitterly. If it wants to give birth to life, it's really tough. He looked around again and found that this orange had three satellites, each one a standard sphere, completely white, like three golf balls. This is obviously better treatment than his own. Zhou Yu looked at his unchanging dumpling and couldn't help but smile bitterly. Oh dumpling, oh dumpling, look at the appearance of other people's satellites, ours is lacking vinegar. After looking for a while and realizing that there was nothing worth noting, Zhou Yu finally shifted his gaze back to his own sphere. He didn't know how many years he had slept before, and now he wondered what those ugly, no, cute little lives on his sphere had evolved into. At this moment, Zhou Yu remembered their appearance and instantly lost half of his enthusiasm. However, let's take a look, they are still his children after all. Zhou Yu shrunk the visual system and looked at the land with infinite forests in his memory. Ha, huh? what's going on? Starting from the center of the only piece of land on his sphere, almost until a not so far distance from the coastline, it was almost an endless desert and barren zone. The once covered forest on the entire land now only occupies an extremely small proportion, and the closer it is to the desert, the more vast and sparse grasslands there are. Zhou Yu carefully observed and found that even the precipitation on the land was relatively less, with more occurring over the ocean. He pondered for a while and instantly understood. The area of this entire land is just too large. Moreover, after becoming a planet, with four seasons and the presence of polar, temperate, and tropical zones, the deepest parts of the land also developed desert climates. With fewer forest vegetation, the suitable territory for terrestrial life became smaller, and the entire population of life became smaller and more homogeneous. It is difficult enough just to survive, let alone evolve. Zhou Yu looked towards the north and south poles again. During his hibernation, Glaciers continued to grow rapidly and now they have completely covered most of the polar and subpolar regions, causing the temperature on the entire planet to continuously decrease. Even the ice and snow on the mountains have become thicker. It seems that this environment is too harsh for life. Zhou Yu knew that in the future, he really couldn't casually shut down his visual system unless it was absolutely necessary, otherwise, this hibernation period could even last until the life circle he painstakingly created on the planet completely disappears. Laziness leads to destruction. He decided that from now on, he must constantly observe any changes on the planet and make adjustments in order to prevent the recurrence of the current situation. Having learned from the pain, Zhou Yu blamed himself for a while and decided to completely transform the entire planet. First and foremost, he needed to warm up the planet that was about to enter an ice age. He had done this before, so he was quite familiar with the method. Volcanoes start erupting. Hundreds of volcanoes near the polar regions began erupting violently, and the extremely hot magma quickly heated up the temperature on land and in the oceans, accelerating the melting of glaciers. 
After completing these tasks, Zhou Yu looked at the vast land. He had a feeling that his planet seemed to be even larger than Earth, and now looking at this land, he felt that it was truly boundless. Earth has seven continents and four oceans, should he imitate that? Zhou Yu thought for a moment, then shook his head. There was no need, it would be boring to imitate everything. Instead, Zhou Yu first used tectonic activity to crack the entire land into countless fissures, controlling the volcanoes to not erupt violently. Then, he isolated the largest desert area, using it as the center to divide the land into nine almost equal parts, arranging them in the polar, temperate, and tropical zones. He also continuously moved the land in all directions, radiating from the largest desert area in the center, and separated them with wide oceans, creating nine independent landmasses. Between the landmasses, Zhou Yu left behind vast oceans and destroyed some of the edges of the land, creating numerous peninsulas and a considerable number of islands. Then, he created plateaus, hills, plains, and basins in the major landmasses. He changed the flow of rivers and created countless lakes. After completing these major modifications, Zhou Yu finally breathed a sigh of relief. This way, there shouldn't be such vast desert areas, and the situation where forests were almost only distributed around water sources should not occur again. The next step was to make more subtle adjustments. Zhou Yu had a complex plan in mind. Instead of immediately starting to carefully organize all the terrain and landforms on the planet's surface, he chose to first investigate the current existence of all lifeforms on the planet. When Zhou Yu moved the tectonic plates and roughly created various terrains, he did not consider whether those small organisms could survive. In his opinion, if the overall environment was not suitable, those organisms would probably just barely survive. Moreover, when he divided the land and oceans with the tectonic plates, he made sure not to split the forest zones, suppressed volcanic eruptions, and tried his best to minimize the impact on the organisms living in their original habitats. As for how they will survive and adapt to the new environment, Zhou Yu doesn't care about that much. He feels that in many aspects, he only needs to do well in managing the overall environment. Zhou Yu's gaze turned to the sparse forests in the previously noticed edge zones. The water sources and resources there should be relatively abundant, and organisms should gradually grow in such places, right? His gaze narrowed further. Zhou Yu was very surprised. These were real trees, real woody plants. Most of them were plants with broad leaves, and there were also plants with needle-shaped leaves like pine and cypress trees. He couldn't help but think in his mind, how did they skip a large part of the evolutionary process? What about ferns? Gymnosperms? How did they directly jump to angiosperms? As for the chaotic colors of plants, whether they were blue, purple, or red, Zhou Yu even felt a bit powerless to comment. What's going on here? He looked at the sparse grasslands. It was no longer a paradise of moss plants, but there were quite a few strange-looking shrubs, and even some vine-like plants. Zhou Yu had indeed seen some fern plants, which proved that these things had also appeared on his planet. Since there are fern plants. Wait a minute, does that mean the era of dinosaurs also existed? Zhou Yu suddenly felt like crying. Similar to the magnificent Jurassic and Cretaceous periods on Earth, with handsome and terrifying dinosaurs, Zhou Yu didn't even have time to take a look before they completely disappeared from the sphere. What kind of process is this? What did all the hard work and effort amount to? Zhou Yu also wanted to see what dinosaurs looked like. He didn't want to just imagine their appearance based on the large skeletons in museums. Zhou Yu was furious. He began searching for the skeletons of those huge creatures in the layers. As a result, he actually found some, although they were even larger than those on Earth. Looking at the skulls, they were also a terrifying bunch, some even had three or four eye sockets. Seeing these, Zhou Yu knew that these guys had really existed on his sphere, which made him even angrier. He was angry for a long time. After orbiting the star for dozens of laps, Zhou Yu finally sorted out his mood and began to carefully ponder why this situation had occurred. Massive environmental changes. That was the only possibility. When Zhou Yu was orbiting the green gaseous planet before, everything was evolving according to the extreme environment where dinosaurs thrived and reproduced. Later, until he just became a planet, everything was still normal. But after adjusting various factors such as the obliquity, rotation direction, orbital path, and temperature, the overall environment was completely destroyed. Dinosaurs, I guess, became the rulers of the sphere briefly during my hibernation and then quickly declined. Until they became completely extinct. The scarcity of ferns also fully demonstrated this point. The cool operation I thought of, directly copying the state of the earth when I was still human, led to the current outcome. Counterfeiting is really not good. Zhou Yu regretted it. I want to be quiet, don't ask me who is quiet. He submerged his gaze into the seawater, hoping to ease his mood through this. As a result, he seemed to encounter something familiar. Giant fish. Carrying a shell-like mountain several tens of meters thick, 
the giant fish was almost unchanged from the last time he saw it. Still there, with its gaping mouth, swallowing large amounts of seawater and other creatures, then propelling itself forward with a powerful jet of water from the back of its tail, instantly moving several tens of meters. Zhou Yu was stunned. Wait, what's going on with this thing? According to the evolution described earlier, there should have been drastic changes in the sea, so why hasn't this guy changed at all except for having a thicker shell and a larger size? Could it be that other creatures in the sea are the same? Zhou Yu distanced himself from this creature and began to look around. What he saw next left him dumbfounded. Holy crap, dinosaurs? Are those really dinosaurs? Plesiosaurs? Several creatures with long snake-like necks and lizard-like heads swiftly swam past him, seemingly evading something. Zhou Yu immediately controlled one of them, immobilizing it in front of him for closer observation. This creature was entirely water blue in color, with a head that really resembled a lizard, combined with its snake-like neck, its overall length was just under 5 meters, its limbs were short and sturdy, with membranes connecting the tips of its claws, there was an inexplicable turtle-like shell on its back and abdomen, like a dinosaur stuffed into a turtle shell. This doesn't look like a dinosaur at all. It's more like a reinforced version of a turtle. Maybe I should call you a turtle dragon. He couldn't help but laugh. However, just as Joyu was about to continue observing it, a swift current suddenly passed by, and countless red glowing objects instantly surrounded the unfortunate creature he had captured. Blood mist filled the water and gradually rose. Zhou Yu quickly tried to continue controlling the turtle dragon, but found that he couldn't do it at all. A sense of foreboding washed over him, and he quickly immobilized the group of red creatures surrounding the turtle dragon. At the same time, the remains of the turtle dragon, which was basically just an empty shell, slowly sank to the seabed. And the cluster of red creatures he had captured, after being immobilized and ceasing their movements, revealed their true form. They were a group of small, hideous fish that were almost entirely red in color, each with terrifying saw-like teeth, their developed jaws capable of biting through hard bones. Joe, you instantly thought of piranhas on earth. But those guys were freshwater fish, and their combat abilities definitely couldn't compare to these terrifying creatures that were like mad wolves. If the fast-moving turtle dragon had lived on earth, it definitely wouldn't have been a pushover for the piranhas. While Zhou Yu was contemplating why there were both fish and dinosaur-like creatures in the ocean, some attackers, attracted by the scent of blood, began to surround them. The sunlight couldn't penetrate their massive bodies, and a large shadow even completely covered the red fish. In almost an instant, like famished tigers, these large fish with single horns completely tore apart the formation of the red fish group. Zhou Yu quickly widened his field of vision and observed this horrifying scene of feeding frenzy not far away. The seawater surged madly, even stirring up the fine sand on the seabed, and the color of the water became turbid. Just then, a giant worm that had been hidden on the seabed, tens of meters long, suddenly opened its gaping mouth and swallowed two large fish that had been scavenging near the seabed in one gulp. The sudden sound surprised Zhou Yu. After swallowing two large fish, the black giant insect had just burrowed into the sand, and dozens of yellow-white flatfish flew out from the sand, causing a commotion in the water. They crazily gnawed on the insect's steel-like limbs, some even burrowing into its abdomen to attack the vulnerable parts. The seawater became increasingly turbid, completely chaotic. However, like the final boss, the rock giant fish silently approached through continuous water jets. Then, a powerful water current instantly swallowed the struggling giant insect, the horned fish that was fighting for food, and the yellow-white flatfish into the water. Zhou Yu could see that the giant fish's jaws were constantly chewing, countless blood foam rising and floating in the water. After a while, the giant fish stopped chewing, and a strong water current sprayed out from its rear, instantly polluting the ocean with countless debris. The debris fell onto the sand, and countless small crustaceans that had not appeared before, as well as smaller fish, appeared one after another, feasting on the excrement. Zhou Yu quietly raised his gaze to the horizon. In front of him, the cruelty and cycle of nature played out once again. However, this time, it all started because he rashly controlled a snapping turtle dragon. The rock giant fish seemed to have been the ruler of the nearby sea since ancient times, the top of the food chain. He decided to redirect his gaze to the deeper ocean. He had yet to explore that area. A huge iceberg floated in the distance. Nearly 90% of its volume was submerged in the water, with only a small part protruding above the surface, like the peak of a mountain. Joe, you accidentally discovered that the snapping turtle dragons he had seen before were now swimming in groups in the underwater part of the iceberg. It seemed that this was their territory. He carefully observed that there were quite a few caves in the underwater part of the iceberg, seemingly made by this group of blue dinosaurs. Zhou Yu saw countless snapping turtle dragons entering and exiting the caves, and occasionally some brought a large piece of blue plant-like seaweed from the nearby seabed, which they then took into the caves. 
It seemed that these snapping turtle dragons were herbivorous and liked to live in groups. Joey shifted his gaze again and saw even more strange creatures. They were transparent, with bodies resembling water buckets. At first, Joyu thought they were some kind of plants, but upon closer inspection, he realized that these creatures had large, bright eyes, each resembling an upright water bucket, distributed on the seabed with red seaweed. However, it seemed that these creatures were not vegetarians. Despite relying on the seaweed, they didn't even take a bite. Instead, they used the tentacle-like structures on their sides to constantly search for something in the sand. As they searched, small fish and worms hidden in the sand were unearthed, and the transparent creatures used their tentacles to stuff these high-quality proteins into their mouths above. Zhou Yu could even see the whole process of the struggling small fish becoming a pile of nutrients in their digestive organs. After seeing all this, Zhou Yu looked towards the deeper parts of the deep sea. Countless bizarre and unimaginable ugly monsters kept emerging. He was truly tired of seeing ugliness. How did the original single-celled organisms evolve in the sea for such a long time and still end up looking like this? Where did it go wrong? Apart from the snapping turtle dragons, Joe you couldn't find anything that caught his eye. He found the iceberg again. Ah, you guys look pleasing to the eye. Since you like cold places so much, how about selecting a few lucky audience members to go to the frigid zone and give it a try? Joe you was curious to know if these people who liked icebergs also liked the even colder polar regions. So, he controlled dozens of them and sent them to places near the North and South Poles. As for whether they would evolve and adapt to the life there, Zhou Yu didn't think too much about it. At this moment, he was more like a guy who was experimenting everywhere. He had been doing such things since the beginning of single-celled life. After wandering his gaze in the seawater for a while, Zhou Yu finally looked towards the direction of the land. He had never carefully searched for creatures there. A forest composed of angiosperms extended along the coastline for a long distance. They also grew on both sides of rivers and lakes, just like their ancestors in ancient times. Zhou Yu knew that if he wanted to find creatures living on land, starting from here would be the right choice. He narrowed his gaze and searched for creatures inhabiting this place in the boundless jungle. Soon, he spotted his target. It was a group of creatures that looked like mice but were the size of small lambs. They were covered in gray fur and ran tirelessly between the woods, seemingly chasing and playing. Before long, Zhou Yu saw them collectively lowering their bodies and using their blade-like claws to dig the ground. As Zhou Yu approached to take a look, he found that they seemed to be searching for food. Soon, a creature resembling an earthworm with a diameter of half a meter and a length of over 10 meters suddenly emerged from the soil. Unlike the earthworms Zhou Yu knew, this creature had eyes and even sharp teeth. It raised its head and intimidated the group of large mice. Zhou Yu knew that on land, just like in the ocean, there were constantly occurring conflicts and the cruel natural law of eating and being eaten. The intelligence of the group of mice seemed to be quite high. They easily killed the formidable earthworm without much effort and used their sharp claws to devour its flesh and blood. Zhou Yu slowly backed away. He remembered something. The ancestors of humans. He vaguely remembered that the ancestors of humans or mammals seemed to be similar to these creatures. If they really were, should he accelerate their evolution? Just then, a rustling sound came. In Zhou Yu's line of sight, a group of lizard-like creatures covered in scales, holding spears with sharp stones tied to them and wooden shields, appeared. He was completely confused. In front of Zhou Yu were grotesque creatures that seemed to be a combination of humans and reptiles. They had enlarged lizard-like heads, forked blood-red tongues occasionally protruding from their mouths full of sharp teeth. Their eyes were golden yellow like crocodiles, with black pupils. Delicate green scales covered their bodies, and a powerful, huge tail supported them from behind. No matter how you looked at them, they were ugly, terrifying, and exceptionally strange. Zhou Yu also noticed that the lizard people had five fingers with razor-sharp nails, and there was a thin membrane between each finger, resembling webbing. These guys were probably skilled in water as well. In their hands, they held stone spears with sharp black stones tied to them as weapons, and the shields made of several pieces of broken wood tied together with ropes amazed Zhou Yu. Among them, there was a more robust and strong-looking lizard person who seemed to be the leader of this group. He wore a necklace made of feathers and had a diamond-shaped wooden piece tied to his head. These decorations on him showed his uniqueness. If it weren't for their appearance, they would be almost no different from humans. Zhou Yu looked at these muscular lizard people, nearly two meters tall, and suddenly didn't know where to start complaining. What went wrong with his evolutionary tree? How did lizard people like this suddenly appear when ape-human hybrids didn't evolve? And they even had a primitive civilization similar to the Stone Age? What a mess! Could it be that something went wrong with the intervention during the initial single-cell evolution? Zhou Yu kept doubting himself. He couldn't accept such a magical development at once. After all, lizard people were a bit too far-fetched. 
He couldn't imagine under what circumstances these cold-blooded animals could evolve into humanoid forms. However, those lizard people didn't know why they were created by something almost equivalent to a god, leaving them speechless. Their purpose in coming here was to hunt the small beasts, saber-toothed tigers, that had just finished their meal and hadn't returned to their dens yet. After killing them, they would bring back the food to their tribe, which was running out. The leader of the tribe, accompanied by more than ten of the best hunters in the tribe, was fully armed. Saber-toothed tigers were fierce and fast, but their meat was excellent, and their teeth could be used to make tools, making them the best prey they could find. Attack! As the strongest lizard person in the tribe, the leader always took the lead, and under his command, no one dared to disobey. With his command, the hunters raised their spears and shielded themselves with their shields. The lizard people who lived in the forest all year round were well aware of the habits of saber-toothed tigers. When attacked, they would choose to counterattack immediately. Sure enough, when the saber-toothed tigers discovered the lizard hunter group, they rushed towards the lizard people who had already formed a formation as if they had gone mad. Hold the line. With the leader's order, the hunters almost simultaneously huddled behind their shields, creating a strong wall. Boom. The shields were subjected to the incredibly powerful impact from the bones and flesh, gradually deforming, and the ropes used to secure them couldn't withstand this force and gradually broke. The rope on one hunter's shield broke abruptly and then fell apart. The saber-toothed tigers found a breakthrough and roared loudly. They couldn't miss this opportunity. The previously scattered saber-toothed tigers crazily rushed into the gap in the formation and their sharp teeth and claws immediately attacked the lizard hunter whose shield had been destroyed. The well-trained lizard people were not to be trifled with. The lizard person whose shield was broken rolled on the ground, avoiding the attack, and instantly thrust his spear into the mouth of the saber-toothed tiger that had pounced on him, with such force that the spear tip even protruded from the other side. His companions also protected him from behind. Kill, kill. At this moment, the leader bravely took the lead, releasing his shield, roaring loudly, and charging at the beast with a stone spear. Kill. The other hunters followed closely behind, turning defense into offense, tightly gripping their spears, and charging towards the ferocious beasts. Blood and flesh splattered, screams and roars echoed over this battlefield. The battle continued, and the lizard people with weapons and defensive shields had the upper hand. They didn't fight individually but teamed up in pairs or threes to deal with each saber-toothed tiger, waiting until they completely killed their opponent before attacking the next one. Occasionally, a saber-toothed tiger fell to the ground, and there were also lizard people who were fatally wounded by the saber-toothed tiger's sharp teeth or claws, falling into a pool of blood. The fierce battle lasted for a long time. However, the final victory belonged to the lizard man-hunter group. After the leader thrust his spear into the throat of the last blade beast, the battle finally came to an end. The forest was filled with a mist of blood. The exhausted leader supported himself with his shield and checked the casualties. Two brave hunters died here, while the others were fortunate to only have minor injuries. The bodies of the blade beasts lay on the ground, a total of 21. The hunting results were exceptionally abundant, as the meat of these blade beasts could feed the entire tribe of 100 people for quite some time. However, the cost was also devastating. The leader held the bodies of his fallen comrades and shouted loudly, Return to the tribe. The remaining lizard men simultaneously thrust their spears into the air. After a while, they began to clean up the battlefield, carrying the blade beasts on their backs, gradually leaving this area until they completely disappeared into the depths of the forest. Joe you witnessed the entire process of this battle. He never expected that the lizard men would have something similar to language and could communicate with each other. He also didn't expect that these lizard men could organize effective formations, use tactics, and hunt with intelligence. Furthermore, he didn't expect that they could use tools to hunt beasts with minimal cost. Zhou Yu couldn't help but contemplate. How many thousands of years had passed during his previous slumber? How much had he missed? The dinosaurs on land became extinct, replaced by these humanoid creatures that resembled lizards. Could it be that the final evolution of the dinosaurs was towards miniaturization, eventually evolving to walk upright like humans and forming a civilization? Zhou Yu was somewhat puzzled. What on earth was happening? The evolution tree of the life forms on his sphere seemed to be getting more and more distorted. Just the thought of dealing with these lizard men, covered in scales from head to toe, made him feel uneasy. Zhou Yu became more and more annoyed, but he was still curious about how the lizard men had created such a sense of community. If these guys had such high intelligence, could they possess a primitive civilization? Zhou Yu was filled with questions. Would the lizard men, a race with intelligence, really have an advanced civilization? From their weapons and various manifestations, they should currently be in the Stone Age civilization. However, would they really reach that level? With doubts in his mind, Zhou Yu followed the route of the lizardmen and kept his gaze forward. 
It didn't take long for Zhou Yu's gaze to catch up with their pace. The speed of the lizardmen seemed not as fast as he had imagined, which surprised him. They had shown explosive power in battle, easily pulling out the crude stone spears from the wounds of the beasts. But then he imagined that the large lizards on earth were all lazy, crawling slower than turtles on land, so he didn't dwell on it. Zhou Yu's gaze followed their speed, and the tallest leader carrying the bodies of his comrades led the way, determining the speed of the entire group. Zhou Yu moved his gaze forward for a while but didn't see anything. It seemed that the distance to the settlement was still far away. Zhou Yu couldn't help but observe the lizard men again. After surveying them, his gaze finally settled on the leader. This lizard man was nearly two meters tall, and one could see the muscular body filled with lines and covered in densely packed scales, except for the white chest and abdomen, their skin was almost dark green. Zhou Yu watched for a while and felt that each of them had the super physique that only champions of bodybuilding could have. If they were on earth, they would definitely outshine the guys in the gym. Especially the leader, he was the strongest and tallest among them, no wonder he became the leader. Zhou Yu was also somewhat surprised. He hadn't noticed before that these lizard people were even wearing clothes made of ropes made from unknown grass, which were tied around their waists, but they were pitifully short. Among them, the leader's clothes were even dyed red. Could it be that these lizard people already had a sense of shame? Or is it that these rope clothes are just decorations? Or perhaps they are symbols of social hierarchy? Zhou Yu became more and more interested in these guys. He couldn't wait to see what their civilization had developed into. The lizard people seemed to be familiar with the way back and walked without any pause. Zhou Yu observed that there seemed to be traces already trodden, probably a path they had opened up for hunting. Moreover, along the way, Zhou Yu also noticed that there were other beasts coming to attack. Some strange-looking insects passed by nearby, but they seemed completely uninterested and hurriedly disappeared into the depths of the forest. Zhou Yu was no longer interested in seeing how disgusting the insects looked. His curiosity was now focused on this group of lizard people. The appearance of intelligent beings made him excited. They walked for a while. Hiss. Hearing the high-pitched sound from the lizard people leader, Zhou Yu shifted his gaze to the distance. A settlement appeared in a pile of rocks on the edge of the forest, surrounded by a fence made of sharpened logs. This tribe was built among rocks of various sizes, and the sound of a considerable amount of water flow could be heard nearby. Sharpened wooden stakes, unevenly placed between the rocks, were tied together with rough ropes made of an unknown material that seemed about to break apart, giving an overall appearance of disorder. The lizard people carried their prey and headed towards one of the gaps. Zhou Yu saw that there was a small opening there, just enough for two lizard people to pass through at the same time. Two guards holding long spears stood straight beside it. Zhou Yu understood that it was the gate and outpost of their tribe. He raised his gaze and entered the overhead view mode. He found that this tribe occupied a considerable area, almost enveloping a large area nearby. Even the wooden fence was built in two layers, covering an area of tens of thousands of square meters. A fast-flowing river ran through the entire tribe, rushing towards the distant end. Zhou Yu saw that there were hundreds of lizard people of all sizes near the river, engaged in various activities. He also saw some strange buildings. They were extremely rudimentary shelters made by covering the space between two large rocks with huge leaves and some weeds, without even a door. He felt that these couldn't even be considered houses, as they could only provide some shelter from light rain. If a strong wind blew, they would be completely exposed. Such houses numbered nearly 40 to 50 in total. When the lizard people hunters returned to the second layer of the fence, the lizard people by the river also heard the commotion and immediately gathered around. They joined the hunters group and walked towards the center of the tribe together. Zhou Yu saw that there was a relatively flat circular open space there, covering an area of about two to three hundred square meters. The lizard people leader walked to the center of the open space first and placed the bodies of his two companions in the central position. He waved his fist and shouted loudly, and all the lizard people gathered around, waving their fists and hissing. Then, they moved to the river and washed the wounds of the dead lizard person's body with the river water, removing the woven ropes on it. Zhou Yu was puzzled, what exactly did these lizard people want to do? Could this be a funeral ritual? He guessed right. The bodies of two lizard people were placed next to the flat stones by the river, and some people in the crowd held unknown wild fruits and dark, jerky-like things, placing them next to the bodies. Then, the leader held a long spear and raised it to the sky. Hiss hiss hiss. The lizard people raised their fists towards the sky, hissing. Zhou Yu understood, this was a memorial ceremony. They were mourning their brave comrades who had died. These two were warriors who had unfortunately died in search of the most important food source, and they exchanged their lives for precious food. Zhou Yu continued to look down. The leader held a body and walked towards the river, then slowly placed it in the water. 
The same was done with the second body. The bodies quickly disappeared into the rushing river, disappearing into the waves. All the lizard people stood on the riverbank, silent for a while. They have their own funeral ceremony. It seems that civilization has taken shape to some extent. Zhou Yu pondered. Soon after the lizard people finished this funeral ceremony, they collectively moved from the riverbank to the square. The hunters placed their shields and spears in a corner of the square, and placed all the prey in the open space next to the center. After inspecting the prey, the leader simply waved his hand, and dozens of lizard people, who were somewhat short and lacked muscles, walked out from the crowd, holding sharp stones in their hands, and squatted near the prey to start their work. Zhou Yu noticed that they worked in groups of three, with each person having a clear division of labor. One was responsible for dissecting, pulling out the internal organs of the beast from the abdomen, while the other two assisted. After the internal organs were pulled out, they began to separate the skin and meat, working quite quickly. However, seeing that the fur was not completely separated from the skin, Zhou Yu couldn't help but shake his head. These lizard people seemed a bit clumsy and couldn't completely peel off the whole piece of skin, but this could also be due to the poor quality of their tools. Their work quickly ended. 21 pieces of fur were peeled off, and several people in the team took away the fur and threw it into a corner. As for the meat, it was placed on large leaves to prevent it from touching the dusty ground. The leader then clapped his hands, and the workers began to cut the meat, with stone blades flying up and down, gradually separating the bones. Finally, the uneven pieces of meat were cut and placed together, while the internal organs were piled up. Next, is the distribution starting? As Joe you expected, as soon as they finished dissecting, the leader immediately ordered the distribution to begin, and the dozen or so hunters also stepped forward. The leader received the most, followed by the hunters, and the remaining scraps of meat were given to the workers who handled the meat, while the other organs and bones were divided among the remaining people. In the end, there were still two large pieces left, each much larger than the leaders. Two small lizard people from the team came forward and dragged them away. Throughout this process, the lizard people remained calm, and it seemed that none of them had any complaints about this distribution method. To each according to their ability. Zhou Yu also understood that this was the most primitive and fair distribution method. The one who divided the two largest pieces of meat should be the family of the deceased lizard man. Zhou Yu suddenly felt that these guys, who didn't look like humans, suddenly had some human touch. The leader took a stone blade and cut the pile of meat in front of him. The other people in the tribe walked over one by one and each took a large piece of meat from his hand, then returned to their original positions. After confirming that everyone had been allocated their share of the prey, he waved his arm again. Everyone sat down. Zhou Yu understood that these guys were about to start eating. However, he felt like something was missing. Lizard Man Leader, SSS. Everyone, SSS. Then, they opened their mouths wide and began gnawing on the pieces of meat. Blood splattered, and the entire square instantly entered a primitive scene. Joe, you couldn't bear to look directly at it. Damn, are you guys eating raw food? No fire, no fire. He finally realized what was missing. Joe, you surveyed the entire tribe again. There wasn't even a single piece of firewood. These guys seem to have not obtained the fire of Prometheus. Fire is the booster of civilization. With fire, you can eat cooked food. With fire, you can make tools. With fire, you can smelt metal. This crucial thing, the lizard men completely lacked. Previously, when he saw their considerable intelligence, their sense of shame, distribution rules, and funeral ceremonies, Zhou Yu thought that these guys already had a certain foundation of civilization. But now, it's clear that they don't have it at all. They are still stuck in the era of eating raw meat. Zhou Yu was speechless. This is too backward, simply too backward. If civilization continues to stagnate at this point, when will progress be made? A plague is enough to wipe out all these stinking lizards. He wanted to do something for these guys, after all, they were the only intelligent beings he had seen so far. Alright, even if they're ugly, they are still their own children. Your planet's mother has come to bring warmth. Zhou Yu made up his mind in his heart. First, he needed to create a source of fire. With fire, everything else would be possible. Zhou Yu shifted his gaze to the lizard man leader, who had already finished eating, and decided to manipulate an ability he hadn't used in a long time. It's you, young man. Zhou Yu stared at the lizard man leader, preparing to play a third-person role-playing game. However, just as he was about to control the lizard man, something strange happened. His line of sight didn't overlook the leader from above, but directly changed to a first-person perspective. How did it become first-person? A hand covered in hard scales waved in front of his eyes. According to Zhou Yu's consciousness, he clenched and opened his fist, just like it was his own hands. He moved his legs and took a few steps. His footsteps were light, and a gentle breeze blew in his ears. Zhou Yu could feel his vision, smell, and hearing. 
There was also the strong beating of his heart and the long lost breath. Hey, he was ecstatic. This ability was too amazing. He could actually take over the body of a lizard man. Zhou Yu jumped up and down, and then started to move his fingers as if playing the guitar, getting high. He completely forgot that he had occupied the body of the tribe leader. Of course, he also forgot that the leader was in front of a large group of lizardmen. What's wrong with the leader? I don't know. Maybe he's too happy. Or maybe he's too sad, after all. Zhou Yu suddenly heard these words. He was stunned for a moment and looked at the lizardmen, realizing that he could actually understand the previously unpleasant SSS sound. Ahem, cough. Zhou Yu immediately composed himself. He knew that he had to play the role of the lizardman leader perfectly now, at least in front of these lackeys. The lizardmen instantly fell silent, and Zhou Yu realized that these guys seemed to admire their leader. He looked around, keeping calm. My subordinates, you may all sit down. When Zhou Yu said these words, he thought he would hear a hissing sound, but he didn't expect to understand the sound himself. The subordinates were obedient, and they all sat down sparsely, leaving only Zhou Yu, the tall leader, standing on the square. My subordinates, it seems that we need to make some changes. Zhou Yu felt that he needed to slowly guide these guys to accept fire. Forcing them to accept it would only have the opposite effect. Yes, leader. The lizard men shouted in unison. Zhou Yu opened his arms and pressed his palms down, signaling them to be quiet. But it seemed that the subordinates didn't understand this poem at all, and a small commotion began. What is the leader doing? I don't know. Did he get injured? Maybe today's battle was too intense, his head. Zhou Yu was speechless. He forgot that these guys were very backward and definitely didn't know what body language was. Shut up, all of you. Zhou Yu also had to embody his character so that the leader wouldn't be considered mentally ill in the future. The people instantly fell silent, and under the pressure of the leader, no one dared to compare anymore. Listen to me clearly. When I said change, it's not up for discussion, but for you to accept. Zhou Yu took a deep breath, he hadn't breathed so hard in a long time. If our tribe wants to become stronger, we must make changes. If anyone objects, come forward and duel with me. Zhou Yu knew that in this primitive tribe, whoever was powerful was the boss, and as the tribe leader, he relied on strength. Of course, wisdom was equally important. The crowd fell silent. Very well. Zhou Yu was satisfied. If anyone dared to step forward, he would definitely control that unlucky person and turn them into a puppet, then kill them with the leader's spear. Progress often comes with necessary sacrifices. If civilization wants to advance, this is also a necessary realization. Zhou Yu would not hesitate, nor would he consider it cruel. He was no longer human, always looking at things from the other person's perspective was just too foolish. In order to raise the level of civilization for these humanoid creatures, Zhou Yu would not reject bloodshed and death. He was the ruler of this planet. Fortunately, these lizard men also usually listened to their leader, so they all obediently sat there, saving him the trouble. Today, we have sacrificed two warriors. Their deaths made me realize something. Our weapons, even ourselves, are extremely backward. If our bodies were stronger, our weapons sharper, and our shields sturdier, how could two warriors die and be swallowed by that water flow? The warriors gave their lives in exchange for precious food, but they will never eat it again. New lives will be born, and new warriors will be trained, but if our weapons are still as backward as before, and our bodies remain as they are now, you will see the deaths of comrades, friends, and even your own death. Look at this seemingly strong body, it can't even fight a beast alone, look at this shabby shield, I know you worked hard to make it, as armor to protect us from being killed by beasts, but can they really protect us? Take a look at this almost broken spear. How many stones did it take to shape it like this? Yet it can hardly pierce the fur of a wild beast. With our current bodies and weapons, what have we gained? The bodies of two warriors. Is this what we wanted? Is this what you wanted? Zhou Yu roared angrily at the lizardmen, occasionally waving the spear in his hand high in the air. No! The lizardmen shouted in unison. Chief! A lizardman who appeared to have wrinkled skin and moved slowly stepped forward from the crowd. Zhou Yu looked at him. Choosing this moment to come forward, he should be the most respected elder in the tribe, and his words should represent the voice of the entire group. Speak! Zhou Yu waved his hand. Chief, you also know very well that my two sons were killed today. How could I not feel pain? I also hope that we can have greater strength, so that every time you leaders come to hunt, you won't bring back the body of a single person. Zhou Yu nodded and decided to let the old man continue speaking. Chief, if we can become stronger, we won't be attacked by other tribes, and we won't have to put our loved ones' bodies into the water every time. But how can we become stronger? Can we become stronger? The old man's voice trembled, and he prostrated himself on the ground. Of course there is a way, otherwise, I wouldn't be saying such things here. 
Zhou Yu felt happy in his heart. Since you also want it, then it's easy. However, there are other tribes? It seems that I didn't look carefully before, and I thought there was only this small tribe. The old man trembled and raised his head, looking at Zhou Yu. Chief, please tell us what to do. Zhou Yu was waiting for this sentence. Let me show you a miracle. Zhou Yu knew that in order to deceive these primitive people, he had to show them something that seemed supernatural. For him, it was a piece of cake. If they wanted fire, then he would give them fire. Where would it come from? A volcanic eruption. With a thought, a huge explosion suddenly occurred not far from the nearby beach, and a red ball of fire shot up into the sky and flew towards the lizardman's tribe. All the lizardmen stared at the sudden appearance of the red object in the sky, too scared to move. Controlling the solidified magma, Zhou Yu easily threw it directly in front of the old man, two meters away. God, oh God. The lizardman elder took two steps back, then knelt down, causing all the lizardmen to prostrate themselves on the ground. Zhou Yu felt delighted in his heart. This time, you really got it right. The lizardman elder slowly raised his head, looking up at the leader who had never appeared so mighty and magical before and deeply submitted from the depths of his heart. Whether it was the previous speech or the miraculous appearance of the object descending from the sky just now, it was extremely shocking to everyone. Chief, what is this? Zhou Yu looked at the magma chunks emitting hot steam and crackling noises that the elder was pointing at, and nodded. Bring me some hay and branches. He gave an order. Immediately, a small lizard man ran over holding a large pile of things and looked at him with an incomparably worshipful gaze. Zhou Yu felt an inexplicable sense of pleasure. If you guys knew that I'm not just a simple chief, would you worship me to the point of going crazy? Erecting a shrine, making a statue, and worshipping me every day? He couldn't help but feel happy in his heart. However, he didn't forget the important matter at hand. My subordinates, I have received a divine revelation. God has told me that if we want our tribe to become stronger, we must utilize this thing. Zhou Yu picked up a wooden stick and placed a bundle of dry grass on the lava. Thick white smoke rose, and soon the dry grass turned black becoming a flickering flame that gradually grew. The sudden change frightened the lizard people, who sat paralyzed on the ground. Zhou Yu anticipated this and continued to add branches. Soon, the front end of the thick branch carbonized rapidly and ignited. Zhou Yu raised it high. Our source of strength lies in fire. Fire? The terrified lizard people looked at their leader, completely confused about what he was saying. However, their eyes were fixed on the flickering red unknown object. Could fire be what he was talking about? Zhou Yu casually picked up a piece of uneaten meat next to him, skewered it on a smaller branch, and began to roast it on the already carbonized branch. The aroma filled the air. The roasted meat dripped oil onto the charcoal, sizzling. This, this is. The old lizard person smelled the scent up close and suddenly felt hungry, saliva dripping from his mouth. He had just eaten raw meat. Try it? Zhou Yu tore the half-cooked meat in half and handed one half to the old lizard person. Ha! Huh? The old lizard person held the piece of meat in his palms, his triangular eyes fixed on it, hesitant to take a bite. Zhou Yu knew it wouldn't be easy for them to accept it so easily. Forcing them wouldn't work. He threw the remaining half of the meat into his mouth. Damn, why does it taste so bloody and foul? It doesn't have any flavor at all. It's completely different from what I imagined. However, for the sake of the plan, he immediately pretended that it was delicious and burst into laughter to cover it up. Seeing this, the old lizard person also tremblingly tore off a piece of meat and stuffed it into his mouth. Ugh, what is this? Zhou Yu could tell that the other party seemed confused by the taste. Is it delicious? He wasn't sure himself, but the other party seemed to enjoy it. Leader, what is this exactly? Don't ask, all of you come and try it. Zhou Yu tirelessly promoted it to the hunters. The hunters approached and ate the cooked meat, expressing their admiration. Zhou Yu knew that he was halfway to success. Once the cooked meat entered their mouths, it would immediately have a strong impact on their inherent raw food habits. At first, they might resist, but the more they chewed, the more they would savor this novel texture. In the end, the originally bloody raw meat would gradually be defeated by this texture. Bacteria, viruses, and parasites in the meat would also be eliminated under the high temperature, reducing the chances of disease. Of course, cooked meat is also easier to digest than raw meat, requiring less chewing time. The time saved can be used for many other things. As for the semi-cooked beef, sashimi, and raw seafood that have become popular among earthlings, those are things that only exist in a highly developed technological era. With current science, we can determine the denaturation temperature of proteins, the inactivation temperature of microbial toxins and parasites, and use temperature to make food taste better and healthier. However, these are things that only the top modern humans on the planet can think about. 
For primitive people with poor hygiene conditions and far inferior physical functions compared to humans, cooked meat is what they should choose. Joe, you wanted these lizard people to first get used to eating cooked meat. Only then would they have more time and better physical condition to develop the tribe and make it stronger. But, leader, after passing through this fire, the prey has shrunk so much, it's really. The old lizard man had another question at this time, and the people around nodded along. I'm asking you, is it delicious? Joe, you stood in front of him and asked. Delicious. That's it. If you want to eat more, go hunt more prey. I've decided that from now on, we will only eat cooked meat made with fire. After saying this, Joe Yu looked at the crowd. There was silence. They probably didn't know what cooked meat meant, but Joe Yu had plenty of time to instill this term into their souls. Soon, the second batch of meat was also roasted, and Joe Yu distributed them to everyone in the tribe. He wanted them to remember this taste and forget the smell of fresh blood mixed with meat. Sure enough, shortly after, Joe Yu received satisfactory feedback. Almost everyone became addicted to cooked meat. At the same time, the lizard men in the tribe had to put in more effort to hunt more animals if they wanted to eat this cooked meat again. The backward productivity could not meet the growing demand. Leader, but if we all eat this cooked meat as you said, we will have to hunt more prey. But the tribe doesn't have that many skilled hunters. The old lizard man immediately expressed his concerns. As for this, Joe Yu had a thought. Countless light green fragments flew out from the nearby underground and fell beside him, followed by the astonishment and cries of all the lizard men. In their eyes, this was completely terrifying and strange. When faced with unexplainable events, the first reaction of any intelligent creature is fear. Zhou Yu understood this, so he started to play tricks. Only in this way could he convince the ignorant primitive people. Kong Ta, Kong Te, Kong and I Chi Wa. This is the divine stone bestowed upon us by the gods. Zhou Yu raised his hands to the sky, looking up with a convincing manner. God, divine stone? The people gradually regained their senses and almost spoke in unison. This was not a divine stone, but malachite. Zhou Yu used to be a fan of minerals and had played with them for a while, so he knew what they were used for. Raw material for copper. Kong Ta, Kong Te, Kong Ban Wa. Zhou Yu continued to babble while using his thoughts. The two-meter-high pile of stones instantly turned into green powder. The people in the tribe could only exclaim in awe. Find me more hay and sticks. The divine oracle says this is necessary work for making weapons. Zhou Yu immediately gave a new order. The lizard men didn't know the relationship between the divine stone and the hay and branches, but after Zhou Yu played his tricks, they had no choice but to believe. While they went to get fuel, Zhou Yu didn't idle either. He dug a nearly 20 centimeter round pit in the dry ground with his strong claws. He glanced at the nearby thick branches, found a relatively straight one, and with a thought, hollowed out the center to make a cylinder. At this time, a considerable part of the branches near the magma had also been carbonized. Leader, here are the hay for you. The lizard man subordinates put down the hay and wood and looked at Zhou Yu with an incomparably worshipful gaze. Everything is ready. Zhou Yu muttered softly, putting a handful of hay into the pit, adding many small sticks, and igniting them with the fire from the magma. Thick smoke rose, and a small fire started. Zhou Yu took out the charred sticks and put them into the fire. Then, he held some malachite powder and put it into the pit, covering it with charcoal. After the flames were covered, white smoke gradually thickened. The wooden pipe that had been hollowed out before is now being put to use. Before inserting it into the pit, Zhou Yu sent a lizard man to fetch some wet mud and a thick piece of grass-covered ground from the riverbank. The wooden pipe was inserted into the pit, covered with the piece of ground, and all the air vents were quickly sealed with wet mud. He was ready to blow air into the wooden pipe. However, there was a sudden problem. Zhou Yu forgot that the one blowing air into the wooden pipe was a humanoid with a lizard head. It seemed difficult for his long mouth to align with the opening of the pipe. Hey, come and try. Zhou Yu called a hunter over and ordered him to come immediately. What should I do, chief? Blow air, can you do it? I understand. The hunter seemed a bit frustrated. What the hell is this? My mouth is no shorter than yours. Why can't you do it yourself? Zhou Yu didn't care about that. He stared at him and the guy obediently started blowing into the wooden pipe. Blowing air into it had to be continuous, so Zhou Yu called all the remaining hunters to come and take turns blowing air into it for safety. The other lizard men stared at each other, not knowing what their chief was up to. Blowing air into the pit? Is he crazy? Should we overthrow him? After a while, Zhou Yu felt it was almost done. Someone, bring me a large amount of water. The confused lizard men obediently went to fetch water with baskets made of ropes. Zhou Yu watched and couldn't help but laugh. Baskets made of ropes for fetching water. What are you guys doing? But he still lifted the layer of grass cover and had the lizard men take turns pouring water into it. The smoke choked everyone and they all started coughing. 
Gradually, everyone had a common understanding, their chief had gone mad, and if he couldn't come up with anything, they would overthrow him immediately. The smoke gradually dissipated, and Zhou Yu poked it with a long spear. A shiny reddish-yellow object appeared before everyone's eyes. This was the copper he wanted. Zhou Yu used to be a curious young man. He joined a club in college with strange people who were obsessed with minerals. In order to prove himself, he even read some popular science articles and enthusiastically tried smelting copper by the river. The process was a bit difficult, but the results were rewarding. After several experiments, he managed to produce a large pile of copper blocks and even made a copper brick to give to his beloved goddess. Of course, she almost used the brick to smash him to death. After that, Zhou Yu quit the club and kept his achievements and fame hidden. The experiment was actually very simple. The first step was to dig a pit, light a fire, put charcoal, and then sprinkle some malachite powder, followed by another layer of charcoal. The second step was to take out a bellows and connect it to an iron pipe, inserting it into the pit. Then find a slightly wet piece of grass to cover it, seal the gaps with mud from the riverbank, and create an air outlet. The third step was simple. Use the bellows to continuously inject air into it for several hours, paying attention to the color of the flame. Finally, pour water into the charcoal pit, pick out the copper with tongs, and rinse it. Good children, please do not imitate, this utilized the principle of oxidation reduction. The burning charcoal produced carbon monoxide. After covering it with heat-resistant wet grass, the wind blown in by the bellows would increase the temperature inside, creating a simple furnace. Continuous air injection for a long time would result in an oxidation reduction process at high temperatures, where carbon monoxide would combine with the oxygen in malachite to produce carbon dioxide and metallic copper. Primitive people who didn't even know about fire naturally didn't know about this chemical reaction. Joe you also didn't expect that it would come in handy at this time. Using a wooden stick to hold the still hot copper block, Zhou Yu led everyone to the river and attracted some river water to wash and cool it. The metal, shining with fiery colors, shimmered under the starlight. The lizard people were all confused. Who has ever seen such a thing? Moreover, didn't the leader just throw the green powder into the fire before? What is this red thing again? You guys, use the same method to make it into the shape of a spearhead. With Zhou Yu's command, several short lizard people immediately emerged, holding the copper block like holding the moon and started making it by pounding several black stones. After a while, leader, this is. The old lizard person saw something he had never seen before. Although it had the shape of a stone spearhead, it felt even sharper. The shining light was enough to blind his eyes. The spearhead was quickly tied to a wooden stick and handed to Zhou Yu. He took the new weapon and made an arc in the lush grass by the river. Instantly, the grass was cut in half. Zhou Yu effortlessly cut the freshly peeled animal skin into pieces. Zhou Yu was very satisfied. The sharpness of this spearhead was truly remarkable. The lizard people knelt down in a hurry. They all confirmed with their eyes. Whoever dares to overthrow our leader, I will be the first to kill him. The blades made in this way were much stronger and sharper than stone blades. However, Zhou Yu still needed practical experience to let these simple-minded lizard people know how good metal was. Alright, follow what I did before and make more of these things. Zhou Yu gave the order, and soon, the lizard people, led by the hunters, started imitating each other. One by one, round pits emerged on the flat ground of the square. While they were digging the pits, Zhou Yu piled up a half-meter circle in the center of the square with rocks and threw a pile of dry branches and straw into it, along with the magma. After a burst of thick smoke rose into the sky, the fire ignited. Now, the bonfire, serving as the fire starter, was ready. All right, bring more branches and sticks and put them into the fire starter. When they turn white, add more wood, remember to use as dry as possible, got it. The next step was to make sure these guys protected the source of fire and that the fire starter didn't easily go out. Leader. Understood. The old lizard person saluted and immediately some lizard people ran off to work. Zhou Yu looked at this old guy and thought, damn, you're really lazy, always ordering others to work. However, Zhou Yu also noticed that from the beginning, he had been watching him do those things. When making the bonfire, the old lizard person even went to study the peacock stone powder for a while. If he could summarize these techniques and teach them to more lizard people, it would save him a lot of trouble. The profession of a teacher must exist from now on, and Zhou Yu felt that this old lizard person should be competent to become the first official teacher. Come here. Zhou Yu beckoned to him. Leader, did you see the whole process of me making the weapon just now? Zhou Yu asked. Yes, leader. Go, tell them how to do it. Zhou Yu pointed to the hunters who had forgotten how to smelt copper. The old lizard person nodded and immediately began instructing the hunters. Starting a fire, adding charcoal, adding peacock stone powder, adding charcoal again, making a wooden tube. 
Every step, this old guy remembered exceptionally clearly. Under his patient guidance, the hunters quickly became familiar with this somewhat complicated process. Soon, irregular copper blocks shining with light were produced. Then, the female lizard workers who had been waiting on the side began to polish them with rocks after cooling them with water. As the sun set, after a while, more than 10 copper spearheads were also manufactured. Joe you originally wanted to invite the hunters to the forest to test the power of the copper spears, but unexpectedly, he discovered something. All the lizard people gathered around the bonfire, and even the guards at the gate closed the door and ran over. Joe you was puzzled at first, but until he felt the cold air continuously invading his skin from the outside, he quickly hugged his arms and sat down. Reptiles are ectothermic animals. When the temperature drops, their various functions also decrease, and their body temperature gradually decreases. Even a group of fierce ones, when encountering cold, will immediately become weak. Joe Yu had never thought about it before, but the lizard people actually had this fatal flaw. He vaguely remembered that the location of this continent was in a low-latitude subtropical region, and in weather like this, it would still be cool at night. This sudden drop in temperature also limited the activities of the lizard people. The bonfire crackled and burned fiercely. The lizard people attracted by this temperature cuddled up to each other and gradually closed their eyes. Zhou Yu knew that not to mention going out hunting, he didn't even want to move. Using his mind, he began to move this land to a lower latitude area. In this way, the lizard people living in the tropics might not have to rely on flames for warmth when night comes. Morning came. Zhou Yu opened his eyes, having not slept all night. He didn't want to experience how a lizard person slept. One reason was that he was afraid that if he fell asleep, tens of thousands of years would pass in an instant. The other reason was that he was really afraid of the group of female lizard people next to him. After seeing the power of the leader, they emerged from various places and rubbed against Zhou Yu all night. This also made him have to occasionally hold his arms and go to a distance to find firewood to replenish the bonfire, hardly daring to stay for even a minute. Although labor and management were playing a first-person perspective VR game, they didn't want to experience everything. He didn't want to applaud for any female lizard person. Even though he had never experienced it as a human, he didn't want to completely lose his dignity as a god here. Joe you saw the star finally rise and looked around. The lizard people, who were hunters, also woke up early and immediately gathered around him. Get ready, let's go test the new weapons later. Joe you said, heading straight to the house where the weapons were stored, took out the copper spears, and handed them to them. As for the shields, Zhou Yu felt that these broken wooden pieces tied with simple grass ropes didn't have much defensive power. The evidence was that after withstanding the impact of the beasts once, they were almost half destroyed, and the ropes had more or less unraveled. However, the lizard hunters seemed to value this, and in front of Zhou Yu, they found some grass ropes and retied the wooden shields. Zhou Yu suddenly felt that some improvements should be made to this shield as well. Where are the fur of those beasts? Leader, those useless things from the toothed beasts have been thrown into the corner. One hunter seemed to not understand why Zhou Yu asked this question and casually answered. Zhou Yu was so angry that smoke was coming out of his head. Damn it, such good things, why did you just throw them away? Fur, fur. Don't you think it's great to make them into clothes? They're warm and have a certain level of defense. At worst, wearing them is still better than huddling together for warmth at night, right? Bring those fur over here, quickly. Zhou Yu was speechless. What's the deal with these lizard people? They didn't even make use of anything on the prey's body. After a while, several hunters piled the stinky fur in front of Zhou Yu. Watch how I do it. Zhou Yu, speechless, immediately took a piece of fur and wrapped it directly around his shield. Here, like this. But even so, he still couldn't handle the grass rope well enough to tie the shield and fur together properly. The hunters, on the other hand, were very skilled at this task. They effortlessly tied the fur onto the shield. Zhou Yu nodded. All right, let's get ready to go. At this time, the other lizard people also woke up and returned to their posts. Zhou Yu saw that these guys were actually quite diligent, especially the old lizard person who brought some people over to explain how to make copper. Zhou Yu was quite satisfied with this. At least they were diligent and knew they wanted to become stronger. Such a race was worthy of surviving on his planet. Zhou Yu had previously roasted some pieces of meat by the fire. After they cooled down, he put them in leaves and tied them around his waist with a rope, as reminded by one of the hunters. This was their food supply. The previous hunters had hardly thought about this. In case they got hungry, they would find wild fruits on nearby trees to eat. If there were none, they would have to hunt on an empty stomach. Zhou Yu led ten hunters out of the tribe, following the path they had taken yesterday, in a single file formation, constantly exploring forward. This was his first time hunting. As a human, Zhou Yu had never even killed a chicken, let alone gone hunting. 
He was more excited about this mission than anyone else. He didn't walk like the leader did yesterday, stopping every step to observe the surroundings before moving forward. Instead, he walked quickly. During the journey, he also constantly used his visual system to check the surroundings. If there were any signs of wild beasts, he would definitely know before these lizard people did. It didn't take long for Zhou to lead the hunters to the place where they had fought the beasts called Toothed Beasts yesterday. Leader, it doesn't seem safe around here. The hunter at the back of the team just stopped and immediately reminded him. Zhou Yu had noticed it a long time ago. Those toothed beasts from yesterday seemed to be searching for their enemies. After smelling their scent, they gradually surrounded them from all directions. After retreating a few meters with the team, Zhou Yu saw several toothed beasts reveal their true forms, but they didn't immediately choose to attack. Zhou Yu understood that they were waiting for the main force to arrive so they could have a feast with these lizard people. He didn't want to give these low-level beasts any chance. Kill! Zhou Yu shouted and quickly attacked. The hunters beside him were dumbfounded. Was this their leader? Wasn't their leader's tactic always defensive counterattacks? Why did he directly charge in? However, they immediately followed Zhou Yu and rushed out. Zhou Yu deeply felt the power of this body. Even while running, he didn't feel the slightest imbalance. The weapon in his hand, which should have been heavy, felt as light as a feather. Zhou Yu felt the wind whistling in his ears as he reached the group of toothed beasts. His arm almost reflexively thrust the copper spear towards one of the toothed beasts with all his might. The copper spear left behind a trail of red light. However, the toothed beast rolled in place and ran away. Zhou Yu missed. Damn it. Zhou Yu was stunned. What's going on? Are they really that fast? Come on. He looked at the target next to him again, and the gun swept across. The saber-toothed beast only took two steps back and avoided the attack. The hunters. Zhou Yu? This is not right. Why can't I hit it? Zhou Yu tried several times again. Even with the power of the lizard people and the strength of the bronze spear, he couldn't touch a single hair of any saber-toothed beast. He messed up big time. As the leader, will he be overthrown when he goes back? However, the hunters waved their new weapons and killed the three saber-toothed beasts while Zhou Yu was randomly poking around. Leader, this weapon is really powerful. They didn't care whether Zhou Yu killed the saber-toothed beasts or not, they were immersed in the power of the awesome new weapon. With less than half the strength, the bronze spear easily pierced the flesh of the saber-toothed beasts, and when pulled out, there was hardly any resistance. This was a power that the stone spear couldn't compare to. The saber-toothed beasts that usually required two or three people to attack and kill, now one person could even fight them alone without falling behind. The hunters were extremely happy, understanding that this hunt would yield more than all the previous ones combined. However, while the lizard people, including Zhou Yu, were distracted by their own affairs, the army of saber-toothed beasts had already surrounded the eleven of them. Zhou Yu looked up. Damn, with this density, even a mess of threads could be woven. He laughed in his heart. The reason Zhou Yu didn't use his mind at the beginning to let these saber-toothed beasts willingly come to him and be skewered like candied haws was also to experience the authentic hunting experience as a primitive human. As long as he wanted, let alone the nearly hundred saber-toothed beasts in front of him, even if there were tens of thousands, he could easily make them follow him back to the tribe without struggling when stabbed with a spear. But that would be boring. Since entering this first-person game, Zhou Yu had become slightly addicted. Controlling the strong lizard people, walking, thinking, breathing, heartbeat. He could even create copper himself, lead other lizard people to hunt. Everything felt real, and everything gave Zhou Yu an incredible sense of freshness. Among them, the most exciting thing was hunting with weapons. This kind of tension and excitement had already made Zhou Yu extremely excited, especially in the face of being surrounded by hundreds of saber-toothed beasts. Leader, what should we do? The other lizard people felt that they were done for this time. The number of saber-toothed beasts this time was several times more than last time, and facing their dense numbers, even the hunters felt a bit uneasy. The hunters and Zhou Yu formed a circle, standing close to each other, hiding their bodies behind the large shield for defense. Wait for the opportunity, we can win. Zhou Yu comforted everyone, feeling confident. In case things didn't go well, he still had a trump card, and he wouldn't let them easily be defeated. The shield formed a defensive wall. Zhou Yu remembered that the lizard people did the same thing under the command of the leader last time. Exploit the habits of the saber-toothed beasts and defend and counterattack. Sure enough, after a short time, the roars of the saber-toothed beasts began to echo in the forest, and the attack began. Here they come! Zhou Yu shouted, remembering the leader's actions last time, kill. With this shout, Zhou Yu felt his blood boiling. The hunters also exerted all their strength, leaning on the shield, not daring to slack off. Boom! The saber-toothed beasts immediately chose to attack, rushing from all directions, 
directly colliding their full strength onto the shield. The pressure of bones and flesh squeezed the durability of the shield, making the wooden frame of the shield creak. However, the hunters were delighted to find that the shield, covered with fur and not even a rope, was not broken. The memory of the shield being destroyed in one blow last time was still fresh in their minds. This was expected by Zhou Yu. The first stretchability and elasticity, combined with the freshly peeled fat, gave it excellent cushioning ability. Tied to the wooden shield, its defensive power even increased. Kill! Zhou Yu shouted. Now was the time to counterattack. Eleven spearheads flashing with red light cut through the air and swiftly pierced the still unconscious toothed beasts on the ground. Puff! The muscles in Zhou Yu's arm burst forth, and he felt a tingling sensation in his palm as a strong vibration came from the spearhead. The copper spear fiercely pierced the back of a toothed beast. Blood splattered on Zhou Yu's scales. Suddenly, Zhou Yu felt a strong sense of stimulation reverberating in his cerebral cortex, and his strong heart was beating wildly. The toothed beast convulsed and gradually stopped moving, and a strong sense of satisfaction suddenly rose in his heart. Was this hunting? The most direct and bloody collision between creatures. Another toothed beast rushed forward and collided with the shield in Zhou Yu's hand. Feeling the strong vibration, Zhou Yu suddenly felt a fierce force rising from his heart. Let me hit you. Zhou Yu pulled the copper spear out of the toothed beast's corpse and immediately made a sweeping motion. The sharp spear tip drew a crescent moon. He saw the head of the toothed beast flying in the air. Kill. 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 Zhou Yu roared in anger. After tasting the pleasure, he could no longer stop swinging the long spear in his hand or stop this exhilarating roar. Blood mist filled the air. The lizard men, panting heavily, held their shields and copper spears, almost exhausted, nervously observing their surroundings. Apart from them, there were no living creatures left on the battlefield. All the toothed beasts had been eliminated, leaving only a few that fled into the depths of the forest in panic. Only two or three of their own had suffered minor injuries. We won! Zhou Yu shouted. We won! We won! We won! The lizard men also roared in anger. Their voices pierced through the forest and echoed in the sky. Everyone erupted with joy at surviving this deadly battle, and then they all burst into laughter. Zhou Yu took out pieces of cooked meat wrapped in leaves and distributed them to everyone to replenish their energy. After such an intense battle, everyone was exhausted. The hunters ate this delicious convenience food and once again admired their leader. They had brought some raw meat for hunting before, but over time, the meat would produce a strange smell, causing unbearable pain in their stomachs after eating it. Now, after eating this cooked meat for half a day, they didn't feel anything similar. Zhou Yu didn't pay attention to this. He chewed on the unpleasant piece of meat, looked at the corpses of the toothed beasts lying around, and felt troubled. He counted them and there were a total of 106. This quantity was a bit too much. Last time they came hunting, Zhou Yu remembered that they only got 21, so how could they transport so many? However, Zhou Yu clearly underestimated the strength of the lizard men. Leader, let's go back. A hunter exclaimed excitedly, raising both arms. Zhou Yu thought that this guy wanted to do a high five, so he raised his arms and prepared to clap. As a result, another hunter next to him threw the carcass of the two-toothed beast between his arms, looking at Zhou Yu with a puzzled look. Zhou Yu felt very embarrassed. What the hell is this? Wasn't it supposed to be a high five celebration? So it turns out they wanted to carry the prey. He didn't know whether to put it down or not. It was really awkward. Soon, Zhou Yu helped these hunters continuously put the carcasses of the two-toothed beasts on top of their heads. However, this method also had a drawback. One person could only carry five or six at most, any more and they would fall off. Moreover, there was no place to put the shield and spear. This was completely impractical. Wait, let's try a different method, Zhou Yu thought of an idea. He gathered everyone's shields and had the hunters tie them together into one unit. Put the prey and the spears on top and drag it along, Zhou Yu commanded, and started to move the carcasses of the two-toothed beasts. Soon, the large shield was piled up with a mountain of prey and bronze spears. Zhou Yu tried it out and it was still quite heavy. He used the remaining rope to tie it tightly to the oversized shield, and all the hunters started to drag it forward together. Zhou Yu didn't strictly follow the rules on this. With a thought, the weight on the shield instantly decreased by more than half. Hey! Hey! Roar! Zhou Yu shouted the slogan, and the lizard men exerted their strength together. The hunters also felt something different. The weight of these prey seemed to be not as heavy as they had imagined. However, the joy, excitement, and the urge to return to the tribe had already made them unable to think too much. The group forged ahead through the dense jungle, following the beast hunting trail towards the tribe. Before long, Zhou Yu led the hunters back to the tribe's gate. All the lizard men in the tribe came out, waiting for the hero's return. Seeing the mountain-like prey, everyone began to cheer like a tidal wave. 
In the Lizardmen tribe, everyone was busy. Witnessing the hunters bringing back an unimaginable number of prey, everyone felt incredulous. Not a single one died, and they even hunted several times more prey than before. This was almost unimaginable. But they did it. Except for Zhou everyone felt like they were dreaming. They worked hard to skin, dissect, and divide the prey into small pieces. Zhou Yu saw that they were using something similar to copper blades in their hands, which had completely replaced the teeth of the two-toothed beasts and became their new cooking tools. He was very satisfied. These lizardmen had quite impressive learning abilities, and they could even apply what they learned to other areas. This was probably the wisdom of the old lizardman. Chief, there are just too many prey. It seems that this thing called copper is really powerful. It's much stronger than our stone spears. The old lizard man half knelt beside Zhou Yu, constantly exclaiming. Not only that, these shields covered with the two-toothed beast's skin are also incredibly sturdy. Otherwise, how could we have only suffered some minor injuries? It's all thanks to the chief. A hunter resting nearby laughed and added. This is all the guidance of the gods. Zhou Yu didn't forget to act mysterious. Otherwise, these lizard men would probably wonder for a long time in the future. How did their ordinary chief suddenly start making new weapons and use that so-called fire? Thank the great gods. The lizard men prostrated on the ground and shouted loudly. Zhou Yu felt secretly pleased. Labor and management are really amazing, I know it. At this moment, he suddenly smelled a fragrance and looked towards the direction of the bonfire. The lizard people actually took the initiative to grill meat. Among them, the workers were divided into two groups. One group used small wooden sticks made with copper knives to skewer the meat, while the other group continuously placed these skewers on a pile of charcoal taken out from the bonfire to grill them. The aroma of charred meat filled the air, and the oil splattered. The grilled skewers were then placed on the large leaves seen before and soon brought in front of Zhou Yu. Leader! A female lizard person respectfully knelt down, holding up the leaves with both knees, looking at Zhou Yu with admiration. Zhou Yu, who was excited, picked up a skewer and started eating. He didn't expect to experience the pleasure of eating skewers on his own planet. Eating skewers is the essence of life. Skewers are justice. Eating. Wait a minute. Zhou Yu chewed the meat in his mouth and struggled to swallow it. He forgot one thing. This wasn't the texture he remembered. Dry, fishy, bitter. Where's the spicy and salty flavor? He completely forgot that he was in an ancient lizard tribe. These guys didn't know what fire was until yesterday. Not to mention washing the meat to remove blood, removing the fishy smell, or adding seasoning. Leader? The female lizard person found it strange that Zhou Yu didn't speak. Distribute it to everyone. Zhou Yu felt that his task was still very heavy, far more than just teaching these lizard people to use fire. The workers grilled the skewers one by one and distributed them among the tribe members who were already drooling. The aroma of the skewers filled the entire tribe, and Zhou Yu couldn't eat a single bite. It was an achievement to let these lizard people know that cooked meat tasted better than raw meat. After the meal, Zhou Yu walked to the center of the square. I don't need to say much. You all have seen the power of this weapon, which is more powerful than a stone spear. The lizard people were convinced and immediately prostrated themselves on the ground. No one dared to question it. The prey, as big as a small mountain, was the best evidence. Fire has brought us more delicious food. Fire has created more powerful weapons for us. But don't think its magic is limited to just these. After Zhou Yu finished speaking, the people below were confused. There's more? Does fire have even more uses? How amazing is fire? Everyone became excited. Zhou Yu smiled at the sight. When faced with the unknown, people are usually afraid. But when they discover that they can control it, their curiosity cannot be stopped. It seemed that the lizard people had reached this stage as well. Zhou Yu waved his hand, and all the lizard people stood up. They now understood Zhou Yu's body language, which meant to follow him. Zhou Yu led the crowd to the riverside. The rushing river divided the tribe in half. Unlike the half of the tribe where the square was located, there was almost nothing on the other side except for rocks and fences. There wasn't even a small house. Can you swim across? Zhou Yu knew that the lizard people had a thin membrane-like layer in their hands, but he hadn't seen them swimming in the river these past few days. The people whispered to each other. What's wrong with the leader? Everyone can do it. Why is he asking? Zhou Yu cleared his throat and immediately became serious. A few of you come with me, holding copper knives and rope baskets, and we'll go to the other side together. Zhou Yu thought that since this was their reaction, it seemed that there was no problem. He first entered the water, and the others followed closely behind. Zhou Yu unexpectedly found that the flow of this river was strong, but the depth was not as intimidating as he had imagined. It only reached his neck. There seemed to be quite a few creatures in the water, but when Zhou Yu dived down to take a look, 
They were just some strange looking small fish and shrimp. Using both hands and feet, he quickly found himself half floating in the river and started swimming. Hey, this body is quite light. On land, the lizardman's movements were not fast, but in the water, they became much quicker. Joe Yu quickly crossed the river and arrived on the other side. His goal was the land here. Previously, Zhou Yu had noticed that the ground on this side seemed to be composed of moist clay, which was also his objective. What are we going to do, leader? The few people who followed him had no idea why Zhou Yu had run to this desolate riverbank. Dig the soil. Zhou Yu pointed to the ground, indicating that they should start. Everyone was puzzled, but since the leader ordered it, there must be a reason. Before long, the rope baskets were filled with clay. Take these back to the other side of the river. Zhou Yu commanded them, and he also carried a basket on his head and returned to the other side. The lizard men saw their leader return, carrying a pile of mud, completely unaware of what he was going to do. Zhou Yu ignored them and found a place to pour the clay together. He then instructed someone to bring some water and mix it into the clay. The water quickly turned the clay into mud. Zhou Yu squatted down and started playing with the mud. The remaining people were confused. What's going on? The leader is playing with mud? What can you do with mud? Zhou Yu didn't pay attention to them but continued to mold the mud into cups and bowls. However, his craftsmanship was limited, and the things he molded were simply unbearable to look at. Look, I made this shape, can you see it? He demonstrated a wrinkled bowl to everyone. The students sat up straight and squatted down, imitating him. At first, they did slightly better than Zhou Yu, but their final products approached perfection. Zhou Yu even noticed that these people had a pretty good sense of aesthetics. At least their starting point was much higher than his. No one is perfect, there are always flaws, such as molding pottery. Zhou Yu watched as they piled up a large number of mud cups, bowls, and even basins. He called everyone again and led them straight to the location of the bonfire, carrying these things. Zhou Yu didn't know how to make a pottery kiln. If he couldn't make it properly and the kiln didn't work, it would be a waste. It would be better to just throw these things into the fire. The temperature of the bonfire should be enough to turn these lumps of clay into pottery. Zhou Yu thought it was beautiful. The lizard men used branches to support the clay pieces and placed them in the bonfire. Zhou Yu knew that the rest would be left to time. During this time, he had other things to do. Hey, where did you put the bones of the toothed beasts? Zhou Yu looked around and didn't see any trace of those bones. Leader, we have already thrown away those useless things outside the tribe. The old lizard man emerged again. What? Thrown away? Zhou Yu didn't expect these guys to be so wasteful. Those were treasures, classmates. Wouldn't it be great to make them into tools or weapons? Leader, what can bones be used for? Those things. The old lizard man was confused again. Can't they be ground into knives or used as decorations? Zhou Yu was speechless, these people really didn't know anything. Leader, I don't quite understand what you're saying. Zhou Yu was furious. Why does labor always have to demonstrate everything? He led the group of hunters to the location where the discarded saber-toothed tiger skeletons were mentioned by the old lizard man. There, he saw a group of fly-like insects sticking to them. This is so unsanitary, and it can easily lead to disease. Zhou Yu sighed and signaled the hunters to start moving the skeletons. Soon, the skeletons were carried to the riverside and cleaned by the idle lizardmen. He walked to the cleaned bones, knocked off a dozen ribs, and handed them to the weapon-grinding workers. They seemed to be smarter and immediately understood Zhou Yu's idea. With the bone blades having a sharp white edge, the workers spontaneously tied grass ropes to them making them into handles. The extremely sharp half-curved bone knives were completed. Zhou Yu glanced at the old lizard man. That old guy was in a daze. With this production, hundreds of weapons were instantly equipped on the waist of every adult lizard man. This way, even the lizard man cubs had self-defense weapons. Truly worthy of being the leader. Everyone prostrated, and the sound of praise filled the air. Zhou Yu waved his hand, telling everyone not to be polite. Leg bones can be used to make striking weapons like clubs, as for skull bones, after sealing the holes, they can be used as water scoops. After finishing these, Zhou Yu turned to look at the bonfire. The pottery should be almost done. He used branches to dig out these rough pottery pieces, and after the temperature dropped, he washed them with river water. A pile of primitive pottery appeared in this lizardman tribe that was completely ignorant just a few days ago. The female lizardmen happily took these finished products to hold water. Leader, these seem to be much more advanced than our previous tools. The old lizard man looked at them and was once again shocked. They are much more advanced indeed. Zhou Yu smiled and said nothing. They could abandon those almost useless tools made of grass ropes and instead use these more advanced things. Even if they were working far away from the river, with these pottery pieces, they could still replenish water in a timely manner. All the lizard men began to worship again, 
and Zhou Yu was a bit tired of it. Cooked meat, bronze utensils, pottery. These were the changes that fire brought to this primitive tribe. Cooked meat made with fire shortened eating time and reduced the chances of infection from parasites in raw food. Bronze made with fire, peacock stone, and charcoal greatly increased productivity. Pottery made with fire and clay also greatly improved convenience in life. My people, this is fire. This is the power that can make our tribe continuously develop and become stronger. Zhou Yu held a bronze spear and raised it high with one hand. Fire. 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 All the lizard men followed suit, raising their arms to the sky and shouting loudly. Zhou Yu also knew that with fire, this tribe would definitely become more civilized and developed. With these things, they would gradually develop the tribe and increase their numbers. When the tribe's capacity could no longer accommodate them, attacking other tribes would naturally become a thing. The tribe is getting bigger, their territory is expanding, and the concept of nation is also taking root and growing in their minds. Zhou Yu feels that what he is doing, including moving large land masses to lower latitudes, is just giving these primitive intelligent beings a catalyst. Just like what he did with single-celled organisms a long time ago, he influenced the evolution of the lizard people. However, the chances of surviving and growing on this primitive land are very slim. Zhou Yu hopes that his influence can increase the chances for the lizard people to evolve into highly intelligent beings. After thinking about it, he used his consciousness to flip a large amount of turquoise from the deep underground to the surface near the tribe, forming a small cave. This is also prepared for when these guys run out of copper in the future. He looked around and the tribe was already taking shape. Looking at them, he looked up at the sky. It was getting late and he had basically finished what he needed to do. When the master leads you in, it's up to the individual to practice. He would have liked to teach them more, but unfortunately, there are still many things to do. Zhou Yu originally just wanted to observe those animals that resembled human ancestors, but unexpectedly, he came across the lizard people's tribe and also promoted their civilization. He hadn't even had time to do anything about adjusting the mountain ranges, river distribution, or the condition of the glaciers. Under the worship of all the lizard people, Zhou Yu threw countless hay and branches into the bonfire. The fire illuminated almost the entire tribe. Everyone prostrated themselves on the ground, treating him as a god. At this moment, when everyone was worshipping him, he withdrew. With a thought, Zhou Yu's vision returned to an overhead perspective. Below, the lizard people leader was in a state of panic and confusion. He was calling out loudly, while the old lizard person and the hunters were constantly communicating with him. Zhou Yu discovered that he couldn't understand their language as long as he didn't occupy their bodies. This was also a regret. The leader and the old lizard person communicated for a long time, gradually transitioning from excitement to calmness. Zhou Yu also understood that ordinary people couldn't accept the fact that everyone suddenly became amazing without knowing anything, let alone the fact that he taught them everything. They chatted for quite a long time, and when Zhou Yu saw that there didn't seem to be anything else, he expanded his visual system and arrived thousands of meters above the land. There were two small clusters of light on the sphere, still flickering. Everything. Wait, two clusters? Zhou Yu remembered very clearly. He only lit a huge bonfire in that lizard people's tribe. This light should be the only one in the night of this primitive era on this planet, illuminating the ignorant and backward civilization. But what about the other fire on another continent? This is not scientific. He was not distracted and went somewhere else to play with fire. With a strong curiosity, he kept narrowing his vision. The increasingly obvious bonfire-like light became clearer and clearer. Zhou Yu was now convinced that it was a fire created by humans. He had previously speculated that it might be caused by lightning strikes, but as his vision continued to shrink, that idea was rejected. Zhou Yu's visual system shrank to a position more than 10 meters above the ground. He also saw the situation nearby clearly. There was no doubt that it was a bonfire. Next to the bonfire, there were humanoid creatures walking around constantly. Zhou Yu suddenly became excited. They can use fire? Humanoid creatures? Could it be that humans have civilization? Zhou Yu felt incredibly excited to discover another intelligent life form on his sphere. The sense of accomplishment was indescribable. This civilization appeared without his influence. It felt like watching a child grow up and become sensible. However, he hoped that this time, he wouldn't encounter lizard people again. It would be nice to have something fresh. Ideally, humans. He was looking forward to it. Zhou Yu's visual system continued to zoom in, floating directly above the bonfire. But when he saw those humanoid creatures, he instantly froze. What are these? In front of him were strange beings with thick black fur and wolf heads. They were small in stature, about one. Five meters tall, able to walk upright, with slender fingers that could form fists, and a large mouth with sharp teeth. Their eyes had blood-red pupils, and each one looked fierce and menacing. 
However, at the moment, these terrifying looking werewolves were leisurely doing various things, communicating with each other in their own language. Zhou Yu began to suspect that there was something wrong with his sphere. The evolutionary tree seemed to have been crooked from the beginning and became even more crooked over time. It eventually gave birth to races like lizard people and werewolves. Can't there be something normal? Humans, standard humans, even if they're a bit ugly, like gorillas, I can accept it. What the hell are these werewolves? Zhou Yu cursed a thousand times in his mind. What kind of deviation occurred in the process of evolution? They all look like genetic hybrids. He used to be interested in this race that could use fire, but now that interest was almost gone, replaced by a thought of love what is beautiful. After all, these creatures were even uglier than lizard people. Forget it, let's take a good look. They're still my children, no matter how ugly. Zhou Yu fell silent for a while and finally calmed down a bit. The limit of patience can be lowered. Zhou Yu thought about the extremely ugly things in the depths of the sea and compared them to these werewolves. Suddenly, they seemed much more attractive. He quickly surveyed the werewolf tribe. Wow, they've really developed a lot. After a rough inspection, Zhou Yu exclaimed in admiration. This tribe had nearly four to five hundred people, much larger than the lizard people. They also used wooden fences to enclose the entire tribe. The werewolves seemed to be more meticulous in their work compared to the lizard people. The fences were neat and reinforced with support beams. The most surprising thing for Zhou Yu was that these werewolves had even built watchtowers high above the ground. The werewolves sleeping on the watchtowers had finely crafted stone short spears by their side, seemingly for throwing, and they also had something like a bow strapped to their backs. Upon careful observation, Zhou Yu confirmed that it was indeed a bow, with a decent curvature and a bowstring, although it didn't seem very sturdy. Neatly arranged thatched houses were scattered throughout the tribe, forming some straight streets, with the square where the bonfires burned as the convergence point. He took a closer look and noticed some strange things. The entire tribe had no gates. The absence of gates was strange. Did these werewolves really build such a large fence to enclose themselves? Or were they being kept here by another race? However, what happened next immediately disproved Zhou Yu's thoughts. In the faint light, a deep hole suddenly appeared in the ground at the base of the watchtower, and several werewolves seemed to be holding something as they emerged one by one and ran straight towards the center of the square. After the last werewolf emerged from the hole, it closed again. It seems that this is the gateway to the outside world. As for why the door is made like this, Zhou Yu also can't quite understand. His gaze followed the werewolves and also arrived at the square. He also saw what they were holding. It was a small bird. Zhou Yu saw the birds of his own planet for the first time. Previously, he was too focused on the ocean and didn't even carefully check if there were such creatures on his sphere. Unexpectedly, he saw them here, but only in the form of corpses. The dim light did not hinder Zhou Yu's visual system. Seeing or not seeing was just a matter of whether he wanted to or not. Zhou Yu observed those gray birds that looked extremely fat. Yellow beaks, small heads with rounded arcs, feathers covering their entire bodies, and three-pronged, scaly, waxy feet. They seemed to be no different from birds on earth. Except for the three human-like eyeballs on their foreheads. Very bizarre. Zhou Yu felt that the life on his sphere was becoming more and more strange. If he saw this on earth, he would definitely catch them and give them to research institutions, while making some money on the side. Zhou Yu himself would not feel afraid of such things. If he were on earth, he would be curious about what the creator did to produce such creatures. Now that he has become a creator, Zhou Yu wonders if he's really gone crazy. The werewolves brought the bleeding three-eyed gray birds to the bonfire and knelt down, holding the prey with both hands. Zhou Yu looked at the person they were kneeling to and almost burst out laughing. It turned out to be an old werewolf with gray-white fur and drooping eyelids, looking like it wouldn't live for many more days. What's going on here? What happened to the tribal pattern? Shouldn't the strongest and most powerful guy be the leader? Like the big guy kneeling now? What's the deal with this old guy? Are werewolves not very smart? Zhou Yu realized that since he saw the werewolf tribe, one question followed another. This race seems to carry quite a few mysteries. Curiosity gradually arose, and Zhou Yu's heart began to stir. He wanted to understand everything about this race. I might as well play a role-playing game and choose this little guy standing next to the old werewolf. Next to the old werewolf stood a half-sized werewolf, with strange pure white fur and surprisingly golden pupils. Among this group of freaks, it stood out. With a thought, Zhou Yu's perspective instantly shifted to that little werewolf. Chief, the offerings and food are ready, the ceremony can begin, said the leading kneeling werewolf. The god is pleased, he told me that now is the best time. Come, tie him up for me, the ceremony is about to begin. The old werewolf raised his hands high, looking up at the sky and shouting. Before Zhou Yu could react, he found that someone had already tied up the little werewolf on his upper body and lifted him up. 
As a conscious being planet, he actually encountered the treatment of being tied up. Joe Yu suddenly felt excited. He wanted to see what these werewolves were up to. However, based on their previous conversation mentioning words like sacrifice and ceremony, it was probably similar to what he had in mind. To complete some mysterious ritual, using the little werewolf as a sacrifice to beg for something to happen. It seems that the civilization of this race is indeed more advanced compared to the lizard people. They can use fire and have a basic form of ritual culture. Zhou Yu, who was bound and unable to move, did not make the slightest struggle. With his abilities, he could easily wipe out this seemingly invincible tribe of over 500 people on the sphere. Not even a trace would remain. But that wicked curiosity drove him to experience this first-person role-playing. Zhou Yu wanted to see for himself the level of civilization that the werewolf race possessed. Unbeknownst to him, while he was bound and lifted in the air, all the fallen werewolves had gathered in this square. Under the illumination of the bonfire, their wolf-headed figures were densely packed together, countless pairs of blood-red eyes gathering, making them even more terrifying in this situation. Zhou Yu chuckled in his heart. If this race was truly ignorant and brutal, he might consider wiping them all out. With so many ugly things happening, why bother staying on my sphere? At this moment, apart from himself, all the werewolves, big and small, began to rustle and eat something. However, strangely enough, after watching for a while, Zhou Yu discovered that they were actually eating raw meat. Clearly, there was fire. So why were they eating raw meat? Isn't cooked meat more delicious? Why are they all like this? Zhou Yu thought about these things and glanced sideways. The old chief stood in front of the bonfire, raising his hands to the sky. Ah uh, ah uh, ah. Uh. The gods are about to descend. Zhou Yu was speechless. The gods had already descended long ago, and yet they were still tying him up. Oh gods, show us your miracles. Just then, after a small explosion, the burning bonfire suddenly turned blue-purple. Oh gods. All the werewolves instantly knelt down, trembling incessantly. Zhou Yu chuckled, you've got the wrong person. After a while, the color of the flames returned to normal. Then, with a bang, the flames turned green again. The group of werewolves who had just raised their heads trembled once more, their eyes filled with even more ignorance. Zhou Yu carefully looked at the old werewolf's side and saw two small stones, one yellow and one green. Suddenly, he understood how this old guy became the chief. Playing tricks, using these chemical reactions to deceive people, I feel offended. Zhou Yu muttered. The blue-purple flame was caused by the yellow ore, sulfur. When sulfur encounters fire, it produces a colored flame reaction, which is the strange color. As for the flame turning green again, it was caused by something he had touched not long ago, the flame color reaction of peacock stone. As a mineral enthusiast, this was common knowledge. Zhou Yu sighed. This old guy must have accidentally picked up these two types of ores while playing outside, and then started playing tricks and fooling the masses, becoming the chief of the entire tribe. This set of tricks was also used by some scammers on earth to deceive rural old ladies when selling things. It seems that the profession of scamming has existed since ancient times, even in other star systems. After leaving the little werewolf for a while, Zhou Yu looked around and indeed found an inactive volcano nearby. It was estimated that the sulfur was picked up from there, right? He stood up again. The gods say that as long as we throw the sacrifice into this sacred object, we will become a stronger tribe and eliminate our enemies. The old man's play was about to begin. Zhou Yu looked at his fingers and realized that the sacred object referred to the fire. Oh, throwing the sacrifice into the fire would strengthen the tribe and eliminate enemies? I really don't understand your logic. Speaking of sacrifices, those birds with three big eyes, and even the little white werewolf on his body. Damn it. Zhou Yu continued to observe and realized that he was being carried towards the direction of the flames. Aooo! Countless werewolves roared. After this deafening sound, Zhou Yu noticed that those three-eyed birds had already been thrown into the fire one by one. The flames burned fiercely, crackling loudly. A strong smell of burnt flesh quickly spread. Zhou Yu couldn't help but think, isn't roasted bird meat delicious? Is it really okay to waste it like this? However, he also knew that it would soon be his turn, the little white werewolf that housed the true god inside. Please accept the final sacrifice, my. Do you want to see a miracle? I can do that too. Zhou Yu suddenly felt like playing a trick on these guys. And at the same time, completely stripped this old guy of his authority. Zhou Yu's words interrupted the old man's speech. You have offended the god. Throw him in. The old werewolf seemed very excited, shouting loudly. The werewolf carrying Zhou Yu obediently approached the flames. I can also make sacred objects change. Zhou Yu chuckled. I'll let you make a fool of yourself. Throw him in. Throw him in. Throw him in. The werewolves continued to shout loudly. Ha ha ha. Zhou Yu laughed madly, and the rope tied to him broke. 
I said I would show you a miracle, didn't you hear? He looked around as he stood on the ground. The werewolves who were just fanatically shouting to throw him into the fire were now silent, some even sitting paralyzed on the ground. What about you? Did you hear? Speak up. Zhou Yu turned his gaze towards the trembling old werewolf. I, I heard. Then stop talking and give me your hand. Zhou Yu walked over and snatched the oar from his hand. Miracle, come forth. While the old man was in a panic, Zhou Yu threw sulfur into the fire. The flames instantly turned blue-purple. Then, the Malachite turned the flames green. Chaos erupted among the crowd. WH what? The old werewolf collapsed to the ground. I can do this too. Zhou Yu's finger pointed towards the direction of the volcano. Erupt. Boom. A tremendous sound rang out, and the once dormant volcano had half of its peak blasted open by the surging underground energy, instantly spewing out a large amount of smoke and dust. The bright red magma even dyed the sky above the mountaintop crimson. Thunder rolled in the clouds, and lightning illuminated the earth. Stop. As soon as he spoke, the shaking immediately stopped, and the crack did not widen. I can do this too. Zhou Yu pointed towards the volcano, erupt again. Boom. An incredibly loud sound came, and the previously silent volcano erupted, with a large amount of smoke and dust billowing out. The bright red magma even dyed the sky above the mountaintop crimson. Thunder rolled in the clouds, and lightning illuminated the earth. Stop again. Zhou Yu shouted. The volcano immediately stopped erupting. After this series of amazing actions, the werewolves were completely dumbfounded. Who has ever seen such a spectacle? The so-called miracles of the old man were nothing compared to this. Let's all worship the new chief together. As for the old man, let him die wherever he loves. Oh oh oh. Roar. All the werewolves knelt on the ground, facing Zhou Yu, raising their hands above their heads and rubbing them continuously. Zhou Yu nodded. This is more like it. The night passed. The excitement continued until the early hours of the morning, but Zhou Yu didn't feel tired at all. He stayed awake with his eyes open until dawn. This first-person game still had to continue for a while, after all, there were still many mysteries in this tribe. For example, when did they learn to use fire, build walls, establish watchtowers, and even make weapons like bows? As the sky brightened, Zhou Yu walked out of the largest straw house in the tribe and carefully observed in all directions. All the werewolves were still inside their houses, and even the werewolves on the watchtowers were fast asleep. Zhou Yu was a little puzzled, why were these people so lazy? Don't even stand on duty? No need to work? Zhou Yu walked to the center of the square. No one was there. In the distance was a rectangular wooden fence, and no one paid any attention to him. Zhou Yu released his possession. He always felt that this little white wolf person seemed inconvenient to move around, with small steps and not much strength, making everything a bit difficult. However, as soon as he released his possession, the little white wolf person lay down on the ground and fell asleep. This actually suited Zhou Yu's intentions. If this little guy shouted and made a fuss, it would cause some commotion. With a thought, Zhou Yu covered the little wolf person with some nearby hay. His gaze went straight to the guard tower. The goal was clear, it was that bow. Zhou Yu had previously felt that this thing should not be here. Using his mind, he pulled the bow out from behind the sleeping guard and carefully observed it in midair. This green bow seemed to be made of some kind of tough wood or vine, and its beautiful curved shape, resembling a half moon, and the gray yellow scorch marks on it indicated that it had been shaped by flames. As for the bowstring, Zhou Yu looked left and right and felt that this slightly rigid gray white color did not resemble any kind of textile. When he used his mental power to pull it, he unexpectedly found that the elasticity was exceptionally strong. Zhou Yu pondered carefully. Finally, he understood that this was more like something found on a wild beast tendons. He was not sure if the bowstrings of ancient bows on earth were made from the tendons of wild beasts. Even if they were made from tendons, did they have to undergo some processing to become such tough and elastic objects? Zhou Yu fell silent. Had the civilization of this tribe evolved to this level? He continued to examine the guard's surroundings, trying to find arrows. However, no matter how he looked, there was not a trace of arrows to be found. Strange. Did he have to use the stone spear next to it as a bow and arrow? Zhou Yu looked at the sturdy rope tied in the middle of it, and the heavy and tough things on both ends, and tried to put it on the bowstring. No, his own mental power was fine, but if it was these wolf people, they would definitely not be able to increase the range of this stone spear to 5 meters away. The stone spear was just too heavy. Zhou Yu looked at the other three guard towers, wanting to see if there were any arrows there, but he discovered something even stranger. Not to mention arrows, there wasn't even a bow. At most, he could find some stone long spears which didn't even look as well made as the lizard people's. He couldn't help but feel suspicious. He looked back at that bow. If he could make one like this, 
then two or three more should be no problem. With doubts in his mind, Zhou Yu searched the entire tribe. However, there was not a trace of a second bow, let alone arrows. A bow without arrows. Could it be some kind of musical instrument? Zhou Yu couldn't help but speculate. This question not only remained unanswered, but it also made him even more puzzled. Setting aside this matter, Zhou Yu turned his gaze to another place that caught his attention. The entrances and exits of the holes. Normally, if they could build such a neat wooden fence, they wouldn't lack the technology to make doors. Even the backward lizard people could make a big gate. But the black wolf people chose to dig holes under the fence. Could it be that there was an enemy or a beast that could open the gate? Zhou Yu suddenly remembered what the old wolf person said last night. He said that after offering sacrifices to the gods, their tribe would become stronger and would eliminate enemies and such. Could it be that building a sheep pen was to prevent enemy invasions? No, there were more and more doubts. Zhou Yu felt that just by looking at this tribe, he would never be able to figure out the answers to these questions. Perhaps, these secrets are hidden in the forest. Perhaps, there will be other tribes. He raised his gaze and began to traverse the forest. His gaze unfolded a carpet-like search in the nearby dense forest. Countless flying insects, birds, and beasts flashed before Zhou Yu's eyes in various ugly and unimaginable postures. He no longer had much thoughts about other non-human creatures. You all look too casual, I don't like you. After searching for a while, Zhou Yu finally found something different near the foot of a mountain not too far from the werewolf tribe. It was a wide and tall cave surrounded by two neat circles of wooden fences over three meters high. However, the fences looked like they had just been repaired in many places, appearing somewhat uneven. Zhou Yu unexpectedly also saw several guard towers behind the fence. Could it be? Guard towers are something every tribe has? Are they all so developed? Zhou Yu was surprised to see the guard towers again. Is this a branch of the werewolf tribe from earlier? But Zhou Yu immediately noticed the differences. This tribe had a gate. At the wooden fence directly opposite the cave, several sections of sharpened wooden stakes tied with rough ropes were crisscrossed, and some humanoid creatures were walking back and forth in front of those stakes. Zhou Yu narrowed his gaze. Bows and arrows. He immediately noticed the weapons on the backs of those upright creatures covered in white fur. The shape and color of the bow were undoubtedly from the werewolf tribe. The arrows were made from almost straight wooden sticks. However, these upright humanoid creatures. After Zhou Yu saw them clearly, he was somewhat astonished. Their appearance was exactly the same as the werewolf tribe, except their pupils were not blood red but a strange golden color, and their fur was as white as snow. White werewolves. Zhou Yu suddenly remembered, aren't they the same as that little werewolf? He pondered carefully. No, when he saw the entire werewolf tribe earlier, except for that little guy, there wasn't even one white one. How come there are so many here? Moreover, there was a complete combination of bows and arrows. Taking into account the little guy's situation, could it be, he just happened to encounter a war between two tribes? Is the little guy a captive of the black werewolves? Were the bows taken from these white werewolves? Several guesses emerged, but just thinking about it was not enough to confirm. Zhou Yu decided to find out for himself. After all, as an earthling in a peaceful era, Zhou Yu couldn't experience the wars between primitive people. In addition, as their creator, Zhou Yu was also very concerned about the development of these two tribes and who would become the future ruler of this forest, and even this land. Inside the cave, the leader with a broken leg struggled to control his trembling hand, holding onto the stone spear that had been with him for many years, leaning against the stone wall, trying to appear calm. A tragic expression was revealed in his golden eyes. In front of the leader, three subordinates knelt on one knee, looking up at him. Each of them had light or heavy wounds on their bodies. The women, children, and those subordinates who had already suffered some injuries had long been driven outside. The leader took a deep breath. They will attack here soon. The three subordinates looked at each other and nodded heavily. Will you escape or fight? After the leader finished speaking, he stared at his subordinates. Fight! 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 Three subordinates shouted without hesitation, their angry roars echoing in the cave. But their voices were filled with sadness and desolation. Fighting means death, escaping means survival. I want you to live, the leader looked outside the cave, where the women and cubs were silently watching. Leader, we must fight. One subordinate raised his head, escaping is also death. Fight. Fight. The three subordinates had made up their minds. The leader knew that saying anything else would be useless. All right, prepare yourselves, eat all the food, the leader said, enduring the intense pain in his leg, and slowly made his way out of the cave. The three subordinates followed closely behind. All eyes were now on the four of them. Fight. The leader raised his arm high. Fight. 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 Everyone, women, cubs, warriors, guards. Everyone raised their arms and shouted. 
Zhou Yu watched all of this, listened to all of this, and couldn't help but feel anxious for this tribe. He possessed, no, now he had a new term for it, called God's presence, and he experienced the entire process of what seemed like a pre-war meeting among the three subordinates. These guys were going to fight the black wolf people they saw last night to the death. Initially, these white wolf people had been living peacefully in the tribe on the edge of the forest. The group of black wolf people attacked the tribe and overwhelmed the white wolf people with their large numbers. In the hasty defense, the white wolf people lost almost half of their warriors. They managed to escape to the cave, hoping to continue their peaceful lives, but they didn't expect the black wolf people to want to exterminate them. In the previous battle, the white wolf people lost a large number of warriors again. Among them, the leader's child was taken away, their life or death unknown. It seemed that the black wolf people would come again today, ready to completely wipe out these white wolf people. The white wolf people, altogether, numbered just over 40. Among these 40 people, more than half were women and cubs without combat power. The remaining 20 or so warriors, including the leader, were all injured. On the other side, there were a total of 4 to 500 black wolf people, with at least 200 warriors. 20 against 200, even if one fought 10, it was a joke, right? Have you ever heard of two fists being no match for four hands? In the eyes of these black wolf people, you white wolf people are disposable. Joe you couldn't help but sigh deeply. It was a tragic race. The fire he saw in the tribe before was discovered by the white wolf people by chance, and they discovered and used fire, allowing them to eat cooked food. This also made Zhou Yu understand why the black wolf people had fire but still ate raw meat. The black wolf people had no idea what fire was for. Bows and arrows, watchtowers, they were all the wisdom of the white wolf people. The black wolf people were originally a branch of the white wolf people, but this ignorant and terrifying violent race grew in numbers after continuous reproduction and returned to the vicinity of the white wolf people's tribe. After seizing the territory of the white wolf people through sneak attacks, they were not satisfied and wanted to completely exterminate this branch. Zhou Yu felt that this seemed to go against the laws of nature. In theory, savagery should not be able to drive civilization to such an extent. However, looking at the appearance of these white wolf people, each one malnourished, it was probably related to their lack of combat strength. Before understanding all of this, Zhou Yu had wanted to let these two races naturally engage in a big battle, and he would also take the opportunity to see the law of the jungle among intelligent beings. But after understanding all of this, Zhou Yu didn't want the white wolf people to lose. How much effort does it take to civilize a race? How much strength does it take for an already civilized race to progress further? The answer was obvious. Compared to the ignorant, vicious, and ignorant black wolf people, the white wolf people who already have various foundations of civilization are the race that can bear the future. Even though their numbers are indeed fewer now and they have little combat power, they still have an indomitable character. Compared to the lazy black wolf people, these guys are obviously more suited to living on this land. Of course, this is also Zhou Yu's whimsical idea. But who is he? He is the planet itself. He can influence and control everything. He can let whoever live and whoever die. Zhou Yu can be capricious. He has the qualifications. He prefers to let the already distorted evolutionary tree grow healthily according to his own ideas, rather than continue to twist. Just like when there were simple single-celled organisms, Zhou Yu once used the slowly evolving little green as experimental food for the specimen little red. Does it have a human touch to let both sides live? Perhaps all life will not evolve, and they may all dissipate. Zhou Yu left the white wolf people under the god's arrival and, according to his memory, returned to the black wolf people's tribe. He found that the people here, surprisingly, had not fully awakened at this time and there were not many people moving around. Isn't today the day to fight the white wolf people? It's already halfway through the day. Zhou Yu's disgust deepened. He looked towards the direction of the square, wanting to find the little white wolf person from under the hay. That should be the leader's captured child mentioned in the previous intelligence. If it weren't for his god's arrival on this child yesterday, the child would have been thrown into the fire as a sacrifice. But when Zhou Yu used his mind to sweep the hay aside, he didn't see the little white wolf person at all. Just as he was puzzled, he suddenly heard a series of chilling screams. Zhou Yu followed the sound and came to a grass hut. He saw an extremely cruel scene. The little white wolf person, whose fur was almost dyed red with blood, had already been decapitated and thrown onto the haystack like garbage. Several black wolf people were still laughing and poking holes in him with stone spears. The dried grass beneath him was stained red with blood. Zhou Yu sighed deeply in his heart. This race of black wolf people really disappointed him. Clearly, this little white wolf person was under his control and even created miracles last night, being worshipped by this group of wolf people, but today he was killed. For what reason? Cruelty and bloodlust. 
When the little white wolf person didn't show the same divinity as last night, they killed him out of anger and shame. These, Joe you felt that these guys seemed to be rotten enough. He decided to fully intervene in this cruel tribal battle that should have been won by the many against the few. With a single thought, he could summon countless lava blocks to fall from the sky and blast the black wolf people into ashes. Or he could directly cause a strong localized earthquake to bury them alive. He could also directly arrive as a god and make them kill each other. Zhou Yu wanted to erase this race from the sphere, and there were as many methods as he wanted. However, he still decided to let the two tribes have a big battle. In order to let the white wolf people show their will to fight, the easier something is to obtain, the less it is cherished. If he wiped out the black wolf people himself, the white wolf people might hope for this lucky event to happen again and again, or they don't have to fight to win. The will to fight? Joe you believe that they would definitely forget it. Even though there are people to help when they encounter difficulties, why should they still fight? This character will gradually be ingrained until the day they become extinct because of it. Survival of the fittest, it's not the super lucky ones who are superior, but the tribes that are stronger in all aspects. After brutally killing the little white werewolves, the black werewolves finally emerged from various grass huts and slowly gathered on the square. Joyu looked and saw that everyone who had fallen had come out. It seemed that these guys were also preparing to gather and go to the white werewolf tribe. In the center of the square, Joyu saw the scammer werewolf from last night. In his hand was the head of the little white werewolf. The werewolves all knelt down, and the old werewolf opened his mouth, pointing at the head and speaking loudly, while laughing hysterically. The werewolves below also laughed along. The old werewolf raised his hand again, and his subordinate threw the corpse of the little white werewolf into the crowd. Joe Yu saw that the werewolves rushed towards the spot where the corpse fell, instantly tearing it into countless pieces. They shamelessly chewed on the blood, flesh, and even bones in their mouths. On the other hand, the old werewolf casually dug out the eyes of the little werewolf, bit them, and crushed them in his mouth. Zhou Yu looked at this extremely savage scene and truly felt that this tribe was beyond saving. He didn't want to possess any of the black werewolves either, he couldn't accept it psychologically. This absurd feast didn't last long. With a command from the old werewolf, everyone stood up again. They began to move towards the direction of the cave, leaving behind a mess in the square. The black werewolves were a completely collective race. Zhou Yu carefully checked and saw that the entire tribe was now empty. It seemed that they wanted to easily crush the white werewolves with their overwhelming numbers. Four or five hundred against just over forty people. There was no chance of failure. Zhou Yu believed that all the black werewolves thought the same way. He watched as they gathered outside the tribe and started moving forward as if they were familiar with the route. However, the discipline of the group was extremely loose, with people occasionally stopping on the road to play around or chasing each other with stone spears. They were truly beyond saving. Zhou Yu sighed inwardly, took his gaze off the black werewolves, and returned to the white werewolf tribe. The people here were crazily making weapons for the final resistance. Some small female white werewolves were constantly cutting tree branches into arrow shapes with stone blades. The cubs beside them took these arrow prototypes and rubbed them on sand and stones, further processing them. They had already piled up many sharp arrowheads. The injured fighters, whether on the watchtower, practicing marksmanship, or sharpening stone spears, didn't take a moment's rest. The wounded leader, along with the three subordinates seen earlier, seemed to be discussing intense attack tactics. The spirits of everyone in the tribe were united, transforming into beasts that refused to die, licking their wounds, and preparing for a decisive battle with the enemy, even if it meant just a glimmer of hope. Zhou Yu sighed inwardly, this was more like it. Compared to those lazy, foolish, ignorant, and cruel black werewolves, they were more deserving of living on their own planet. After observing their preparations for a while, Zhou Yu looked back at the black werewolves group. The location of the cave was quite a distance from the forest, with a buffer zone of nearly three kilometers wide, which was a grassland. Zhou Yu saw that the black werewolves were about to come out of the forest and enter this grassland area. He felt that it was time to inform the white werewolves and find a suitable candidate for possession. He saw a white werewolf warrior on a watchtower, but noticed that he remained motionless for some reason. Upon close inspection, it was discovered that there was a terrifying wound on his abdomen, seemingly infected and long dead, with his body stiffened. Would there be any danger in possessing this corpse? Or would it be better to switch to a living person, or perhaps a different method? Time was running out. There was no time for hesitation. Moreover, could this be considered a miraculous experience? It was called possession, but it was more like manipulating a corpse, right? However, after transferring his consciousness to this corpse, Zhou Yu found that it didn't feel as bad as he had expected. His limbs moved normally, just like when he was alive. So, let's control this corpse. The black wolf people are coming. Everyone, be alert. 
A loud roar erupted from his mouth, and all the white wolf people in the tribe immediately stood up and looked in his direction. How much further? The chief immediately shouted. Not much further. Zhou Yu looked again, and the black wolf people were about to emerge. Good. All warriors, take your positions on the tower. Prepare for battle. With the chief's command, including himself, over ten white wolf people armed with bows and a large number of arrows ascended to the tower, which was over three meters high. Where are they? The chief climbed up the tower where Zhou Yu was and immediately asked. That direction, it should be them. Zhou Yu accurately pointed to the position of the black wolf people. Just then, the leading black wolf people emerged from the dense forest. The chief also noticed immediately. All warriors, listen up. They're coming. Prepare your weapons. Hearing the chief's angry roar up close, Zhou Yu almost dropped the bow and arrow he was fumbling with in his hands, and he almost fell off the tower himself. Did you want to reduce the tribe's numbers first? Why make such a loud noise? However, Zhou Yu also noticed that the people on the tower were tightly gripping their bows, crouching down, and grabbing their arrows, ready for battle. He followed suit. Aim in that direction. They're approaching continuously from that direction. Don't let a single one pass. Kill one if they charge, kill two if there are two. The chief roared in command, grabbing the bow and arrow, and placing the arrow on the bowstring. Zhou Yu imitated him. There was a teacher next to him with extremely standard movements, and Zhou Yu quickly learned the method of drawing the bow. Even though he could accomplish it with just a thought, Zhou Yu wanted to fully experience the primitive battle through this body. He had some battle experience from fighting the saber-toothed tiger before, but this was his first time fighting against intelligent beings. Zhou Yu didn't want to miss this opportunity. The black wolf people were fast, and they crowded out of the forest like a black mass, immediately rushing towards the direction of the tribe. Zhou Yu estimated that the vanguard of the black wolf people should be less than 200 meters away from here. Prepare for battle. Attack. The chief roared, the bow like a full moon, and the arrows like shooting stars. The wooden arrows pierced through the air, drawing an arc, and accurately struck the eye sockets of the nearest black wolf person to the tribe. The opponent let out a miserable scream and instantly fell to the ground. Awesome. What a great shot. While marveling, Zhou Yu didn't idle his hands either. Picking up an arrow, he placed it on the bowstring. With his fingers gripping the arrow tail, he aimed the arrowhead at the approaching black wolf people. This was his first time shooting arrows. It was also his first battle. Feeling the fierce beating heart of the white wolf warrior he possessed, Zhou Yu was extremely excited. Here we go. The bowstring hummed, and the arrow flew into the enemy ranks. The arrow drew a beautiful arc. Impressive, I'm getting the hang of it. Zhou Yu silently exclaimed in his mind. However, at the end of the arc, there was a patch of weeds with no one in sight. Leader. Zhou Yu? Zhou Yu was speechless. What's going on? I aimed properly. It must be because the quality of this bow and arrow is too poor, after all, it was made by primitive people. At this moment, several sounds came from the watchtower, and the arrows of the white wolf people shot out swiftly. Then, the approaching black wolf people immediately let out a miserable cry. Zhou Yu pretended not to see this. He once again skillfully aimed and shot the arrow, but this time, he couldn't even aim as well as the first time. The arrow flew halfway and then fell haphazardly into the grass. The leader continued shooting arrows while glaring at him. The others hardly missed a shot, but when he looked at himself, Zhou Yu started to feel uneasy. The third, fourth, and fifth arrows all missed. They temporarily retreated. Go down and organize your weapons, the leader said, staring straight ahead and shooting three more arrows without missing a shot. He didn't even want to look in Zhou Yu's direction. Several black wolf people who were retreating were shot and fell to the ground. Zhou Yu sighed. He messed up. He disappointed the leader. He had originally wanted to kill a few of them, but he didn't even hit a single arrow. He wasted five arrows for nothing. The black wolf people in the distance had already retreated to a safe distance where the arrows couldn't reach. Having tasted defeat, they were regrouping. Zhou Yu knew that even if the leader gave him another chance, the other side wouldn't. After all, the maximum distance he could shoot was only half of where the black wolf people had retreated to, but he still counted. In this wave of long-range attacks, the white wolf people killed nearly 30 black wolf people, and dozens of them were injured and escaped. It was quite a significant achievement. The battle had entered a stalemate early on. The black wolf people seemed to be wary of the arrow rain. After being obstructed, they remained motionless in the safe area where the arrows couldn't reach, and there was no intention to charge again for the time being. Zhou Yu jumped down from the watchtower along the supporting wood and walked towards the place where the stone spears were placed on the ground. Several white wolf people who were heavily injured and unable to move or fight were constantly wetting the stone spearheads here, trying to make them sharper. 
The female white wolf people and the children were intensively making arrows without stopping. As Zhou Yu looked at them and thought about the black wolf people who couldn't even tie the spearheads properly, he felt that if the white wolf people could survive, they would definitely become an incredibly powerful race in the future. These people cherished even the tiniest bit of hope. Even though the enemy's numbers were nearly 20 times theirs, they didn't lose confidence. Regardless of age or whether they were on the verge of death, they continued to carry out their fighting spirit. Zhou Yu squatted down, picked up a spearhead that had been ground until it was hot, and admired its neatness, sharpness, and aesthetic appeal. The black stone shimmered in the sunlight. Don't just stand there, hurry up and grind. We'll kill more later. The voice of the person whose right leg had completely disappeared urged him. Oh, Zhou Yu nodded and looked at the rough pottery container filled with water next to him. These guys even mastered this technique. Not to mention the black wolf people, these guys were far ahead of the lizard people he had trained in almost everything except smelting. He dipped the spearhead in the water and began grinding it on the rough sandstone. After grinding for a while, Zhou Yu felt that it wasn't enough. These stone spears probably wouldn't last for more than two uses before the spearheads broke. Zhou Yu remembered how the lizard people suffered a great loss when dealing with beasts because of this, resulting in the deaths of two people. Looking at the condition of these white wolf people, even the lightly injured ones seemed quite serious. Not to mention those who were missing limbs. If the enemy's large army attacks and breaks through the fence, they will definitely engage in close combat mode. Even if they hold long spears, they won't be able to kill many people. What if we continue to use archery for attrition warfare? Zhou Yu looked at the stock of arrows. He had noticed before that there weren't many arrows left, and with the ones currently being manufactured, there were only about a hundred or so. There was no way to go out, so if they wanted to produce new arrows, they could only find a way from the wooden fence used for survival. But this was almost like sacrificing the essential for the trivial. Not to mention the speed of production, even with these hundred or so arrows, it would only be effective if one arrow could kill several people at once. However, due to their durability and the skills of these people, this was completely impossible. Moreover, the Black Wolf tribe would definitely not be completely foolish, they would eventually discover the shortage of ammunition here. It seemed that relying solely on the existing weapons of the White Wolf people offered no opportunity for a breakthrough. Zhou Yu sighed as he sharpened the spearhead. Could it be that he could only go all out and directly eliminate the Black Wolf army with his mind? That would be a very simple matter. Much simpler than the current situation. However, it would also deviate from his original intention and deal a blow to the morale of the White Wolf people. After struggling for half a day, the result was divine intervention? It would be better to rely on the gods when it came to dying. This was absolutely not acceptable. Zhou Yu was very afraid of such trouble. Suddenly, he thought of a method. What if he gave these white wolf tribes a little help? Hey, be careful. It's almost worn out. The person next to him reminded him, and Zhou Yu snapped out of his thoughts. Yes, I know. Zhou Yu threw away the worn out spearhead, and with a thought, he controlled the white wolf warriors while instantly enlarging the visual system and moving it to another piece of land. It was the Lizard Man tribe. Zhou Yu had a thought, and more than a dozen sharp objects shining with red light flew into the air and quickly flew towards the distance. The Lizard Men, who had made thousands of these things, didn't even react. For them, this gift from the gods was already inexhaustible. Zhou Yu controlled them, flying over the ocean and arriving in the familiar airspace above the land. Well, there shouldn't be a complete lack of mystery, but if I want to fool these white wolf people, he came up with an idea. Zhou Yu immediately entered a cave. Those things had flown into the cave when no one was paying attention and had directly inserted themselves into an inconspicuous natural small pool. Zhou Yu quickly took them out and rushed towards the entrance of the cave. They were shining brightly under the light. These are spearheads? The leader, who had finally come down from the watchtower, was immediately startled. Yes, I don't know who threw them into the pool. I saw them when I was fetching water. But these seem to be more powerful than what we're using now. Zhou Yu quickly made up a lie and then placed the copper spearheads in front of the people who were sharpening their weapons. He picked up one copper spearhead and with just a gentle force, a white mark appeared on the surface of the stone spear. The leader's body trembled. He had never seen something shining so brightly. Where did these come from? Zhou Yu pointed to the cave. I don't know who put them deep inside. His hand, however, did not stop. Following the primitive method of binding, along with these spearheads that had been processed to be easily bound, Zhou Yu quickly made two copper spears. However, he was not satisfied. According to the relatively short height of the white wolf people, he cut the wooden stick and made it into a convenient length of about one meter. After playing around with the short copper spear for a while, he started to get a feel for it. Zhou Yu felt that this was more like it. The leader and the people around him were extremely surprised. 
What was this guy up to? Why was he doing this? Leader, I'm going to show off. Zhou Yu said, holding the two guns and rushing out of the tribe's gate. When Zhou Yu came out of the Black Wolf tribe, he carefully examined the equipment they brought with them. They didn't know what they were thinking. There were so many stone spears in the tribe, but they only brought less than 200, and they hadn't been polished at all. The spearheads were rough. When they came out of the forest, Zhou Yu looked around and found that these guys had more than 150 stone spears left. Under the long-range attacks organized by the leader before, those guys had discarded their armor and even lost most of their precious stone spears. Now, out of the 4 to 500 Black Wolf people, there were only 70 to 80 stone spears left in their hands. In other words, their weapon and equipment rate was extremely low. However, the Black Wolf people still had the advantage. Judging from the current situation where the White Wolf people were about to run out of ammunition and food, if the Black Wolf people charged again, they could completely force them into a desperate situation. They didn't have many weapons, but they had the advantage in numbers. In a war of attrition, the White Wolf tribe would definitely lose. However, this was the situation in Zhou Yu's absence. With the power of the copper spearhead, Zhou Yu also improved the spear body and made it into a short spear suitable for close combat. Long spears were indeed good, but they were more suitable for long-range attacks against beasts and the like. They weren't as effective against agile humanoid creatures. Moreover, the long spears were in the hands of the black wolf people who had no combat skills and only knew swarm tactics. This gave Zhou Yu even more advantage. Zhou Yu doubted whether they would even use the stone spears. After making a bold declaration, Zhou Yu held a short copper spear in each hand, agilely crossed the gate, and galloped forward on the grassland. As the will of the planet, it was impossible to experience this feeling. Charging into the enemy alone. He was like Zhao Yun. The wind whistled in his ears, and the fighting spirit ignited in his heart. The already dead white wolf warrior's congealed blood began to boil again. Fight! 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 Zhou Yu roared, completely forgetting everything. What? What is that? The black wolf people were also completely caught off guard. They didn't expect a strange white wolf person holding a red glowing weapon to run out and seek death on his own. After a brief moment of chaos, they were prepared. They were prepared to kill this fool in the cruelest way possible. However, Zhou Yu didn't charge directly into the enemy. That would be reckless. It was true that he had the power of the gods, but it would be meaningless to cheat in his show off. He ran forward while estimating the distance. After reaching the predetermined destination, he immediately stopped. Who dares to fight me? Zhou Yu taunted, holding the two guns up. He was less than 20 meters away from the Black Wolf people. The crowd of Black Wolf people hesitated for a moment, then burst into laughter. Ha ha, the stupid White Wolf tribe, are you too scared to come? That's right, do you think you can take us all on? Come on, crouch down and eat some grass, I'll let you die a little later. The Black Wolf tribe laughed and mocked but they also had some fear of the red glowing short spear in Zhou Yu's hand. No one dared to approach him. No one dares? Or is it that you all just know how to tuck your tails between your legs? Zhou Yu continued to provoke. He didn't know that these were the words that the black wolf people feared the most. Kill him. Kill him. To Zhou Yu's surprise, the crowd exploded with curses. Dozens of black wolf people with long spears rushed out from the crowd and attacked him. Zhou Yu turned and ran. Stop. Stop. Run faster. The black wolf people realized something was wrong after chasing him for less than a dozen meters. They looked up at the densely packed arrows in the sky and immediately turned to flee. But their speed couldn't match that of the arrows. The sound of screams quickly echoed behind Zhou Yu. This baiting tactic instantly eliminated 16 black wolf people. Zhou Yu deflected the arrows aimed at him with his mind, slowly moving forward with his dual guns, the screams at his feet never ceased. There was a black wolf person with a bloodied face, shot in the head, staring at him with pleading eyes. He turned the tip of his right gun and without hesitation, stabbed it into the black wolf person's throat. Blood splattered on his white fur. The scent of grass mixed with blood, the wind on the grassland began to blow. Killing, this was not the first time for Zhou Yu. As the ruler of this planet, he had killed many single-celled organisms in the ancient past simply because they did not evolve or evolved too slowly. He fed them to predators without any regard for their feelings. Previously, in the lizard tribe, he had also killed countless saber-toothed beasts. Killing intelligent beings from his own planet, however, was a first. But this feeling wasn't bad. Flesh merging, breaking, harvesting souls. Zhou Yu suddenly felt a strong sense of pleasure smelling the scent of death. He pulled the gun tip out of the corpse, the blood on it coagulated into a thin bloodline, continuously dripping into the grass, condensing on the leaves, becoming countless red gems. He grinned. One, two, three. 
The Black Wolf people who were severely injured but not completely dead from the bow and arrow shots did not have a chance to catch their breath. All wiped out. These lazy, arrogant, brutal, and ignorant subjects. Shouldn't you die with your eyes closed when the creator kills you? The army of Black Wolf people, seeing this blood-soaked demon, also retreated in fear. They had never seen such a powerful white wolf person. Quick, kill him. Someone kill him. How did this happen? Don't let him come over. Kill him. The Black Wolf tribe's army fell into chaos. Joe you waited for this opportunity and rushed forward again with his dual guns. His feet stepped on the grass, each step filled with endless power. 50, 40, 30. Joe you sprinted towards the area with the most Black Wolf people. The fighting spirit covered his whole body, making him tremble and laugh out loud. Fight. 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 The gun's red light instantly pierced the heart of the nearest Black Wolf person and cut the throat of another next to him. The screams were the most beautiful melody at this moment. Several stone spears appeared in his pupils, and Joyu rolled continuously to dodge the attacks, cutting off the legs of several black wolf people in the process. Battle is a habit. Once in this state, there is no time to consider anything else. After killing several people in a row, Joyu's brain had no room for other thoughts. He didn't stop for a moment. Stab, slash, stab, chop. Using both guns, he danced the dance of death among the enemy group like a white demon. This body possessed unexpected agility and lightness. Almost in impossible positions, Zhou Yu evaded the attacks of the desperate Black Wolf tribe members time and time again. In the overwhelming number of enemy troops, he caused a complete upheaval. However, Zhou Yu did not completely lose his sanity. It was impossible for him to single-handedly kill all the Black Wolf clan members in one go. While dodging, he led the pursuing troops back into the range of the bows and arrows. A rain of arrows appeared in the sky at the same time. Zhou Yu seized the opportunity and lay down next to a dead black wolf person. He completely ignored the rain of arrows and used his mind to deflect any arrows aimed at him. Soon, screams rang out from close range, and Zhou Yu and the leader cooperated quite well. However, when he got up to check under the body of the black wolf person, he cursed. The area nearby was densely packed with arrows. You son of a bitch, leader, you actually fired all the arrows at once? If it weren't for me being able to distort their trajectory, I would have become a hedgehog. Joe Yu cursed and looked around. In this battle, he had killed 50 to 60 black wolf people. We're going to show off. They shouted as they passed by Zhou Yu, heading straight for the black wolf army that was already completely chaotic and retreating. Zhou Yu was dumbfounded. Did they think they could also show off because they said that? They're misleading others, damn it. Zhou Yu quickly got up and ran after them. No, this phrase must not be passed down by these people in the future. It must be explained clearly. But first, these black wolf people had to be completely wiped out. However, after seeing the heroic appearance of his companions, Zhou Yu bitterly smiled and stabbed the back of a black wolf person with his spear, feeling like he had made a mistake. His companions all held sharp weapons, and combined with the infinite courage inspired by Zhou Yu's bravery and the combat power gained from the phrase I'm going to show off, their fighting spirit was beyond imagination. It didn't take long for these dozen or so white wolf people to kill this group of scum, making them cry and beg for mercy. Zhou Yu also saw that the white wolf people didn't spare even the children of the black wolf people, killing them mercilessly. He also understood that this was something that had to be done. Cruel? Leaving them alive would be cruel to their own side. Otherwise, as long as even one escaped, the white wolf tribe would never be peaceful. In addition, Zhou Yu had seen before how the black wolf people killed the leader's child and fought over eating him, so he felt that these people had done nothing wrong. The battle continued until dusk. The last surviving black wolf person had his throat pierced and died without much pain. The black wolf people, as invaders, probably never expected that they would all perish here. Zhou Yu released his control over the corpses and looked down at the white wolf people. They lowered their heads, silent as they looked at the copper spears in their hands, seemingly contemplating something. The setting sun shone on them, casting a long shadow on the grassland. We've won, Zhou Yu murmured in his heart. Night fell, and the moon rose in the sky. Under its light, all the white wolf people worked hard to dig large pits on the grassland. The white wolf people did not have the habit of consuming the black wolf people, nor did they have any intention of doing so. In terms of dealing with the deceased, they seem to have a similar approach to modern earth people. Leader, the pits are ready, and they should be big enough. The pit dug by more than 30 people was the final resting place for those black wolf people. Throw them in. We can't let them be exposed outside, otherwise this area will be eroded by miasma and become an impassable place for us in the future, the leader said, throwing the bodies of two already stiff black wolf people into the pit. Everyone listen up, everyone take action. No one spoke during this process. 
Zhou Yu quite liked the White Wolf Clan, this humanoid race. They even knew that decaying corpses would breed bacteria and contaminate the land. They knew that burying the corpses in the ground would isolate these bacteria. Perhaps the White Wolf Clan possessed a lot of knowledge that the Lizardman Clan did not have. Zhou Yu liked them more and more. Brave, intelligent, with the genes of the White Wolf Clan engraved in their bones, they could use fire, eat cooked meat, they could build sturdy wooden fences, construct guard towers, they had the technology to make bows and arrows. They had mastered these complex knowledge that would take a long time to learn without any interference. It was truly an incredible achievement. Coupled with their not overly large stature and agile movements, they were almost a perfect race. Except for one thing. The population of this race was only a little over 40. The population base was really low. Zhou Yu didn't know how long the breeding cycle of the White Wolf Clan was, nor did he know when those cubs would reach adulthood, but it would be quite difficult to develop from this tribe of 40 people. Unfortunately, he, this almost almighty god, couldn't exert any strength in this regard. After all, he couldn't influence this direction, nor did he want to try activities like creating wolf cubs for the White Wolf Clan. The bodies of the Black Wolf Clan were finally all thrown into the pit, and with another command from the leader, everyone completely buried them with soil. The body of the White Wolf Clan warrior that Zhou Yu had controlled was also found by them. For the great spirits, the body was buried in a deep pit covered with wildflowers, and the leader raised his right hand to the sky, roaring angrily. For the great spirits, for the great spirits, the howls of the White Wolf Clan echoed throughout the grassland. It seemed that the White Wolf Clan had also not lived in vain and had become heroes through their control. Zhou Yu was very satisfied. What the White Wolf Clan had to do next was to return to their old land. They silently entered the forest and finally arrived at the place where they had once lived. The bonfire was lit again. In the vast tribe, more than 40 White Wolf people sat here, appearing unusually empty. They had returned to their long-lost homeland, the place that had been taken by the Black Wolf Clan. The leader placed a small skull in front of him, his golden eyes staring straight at it. No one said a word, they were all quietly sobbing. These tears were shed not only for the pain of the young lord's death, but also for the joy after surviving death. Just a short while ago, they all thought they were going to die in battle, letting their blood spill on that grassland. Now, they had returned to their old land and completely exterminated the enemy Black Wolf Clan. Zhou Yu looked down at the faces of the White Wolf people, their faces reddened by the bonfire, and let out a sigh of relief in his heart. After some effort, he had managed to preserve this race that had already developed a rudimentary civilization. However, he did use some unconventional methods. Having experienced his first battle as a conscious being, Zhou Yu still felt excited. He could still remember the feeling of the gun piercing through fur and piercing the heart of the Black Wolf people. This was something he couldn't experience as a consciousness. After gaining the ability of God's presence, he also participated in the development of the intelligent beings on the sphere and played a significant role. He looked at the White Wolf people who were already embracing and crying, silently eating their food. Since they have been saved and all the Black Wolf people have been successfully killed, reclaiming their original territory, there is nothing more he can do for the White Wolf people. The big white dumpling reflected the light of the stars, casting a soft glow over the forest. The White Wolf tribe stood in a circle, howling towards the big white dumpling, as if it was some kind of mysterious ritual. Zhou Yu looked at this and expanded his gaze to the entire continent. Is there anything else I can do? His gaze turned towards a river that was somewhat distant from here. With a thought, a deep trench opened up on the riverbank, gradually extending towards the direction of the tribe. The river water moved along this trench until it was close to the tribe, then it turned a bend. Zhou Yu had made a U-shaped bend in this originally straight river channel. The water resources that were originally far away from here were now within reach. But it didn't stop there, just like what he did at the Lizardman tribe, Zhou Yu brought out a large amount of turquoise from the ground, creating a small mountain near the tribe and making a cave, and placed these minerals inside. With abundant water sources in these turquoise, with the wisdom of the White Wolf tribe, it shouldn't be too difficult for them to figure out how to make copper spearheads, right? With copper, their combat power would surely become stronger. The premise is that they can eventually reproduce and expand their population to survive. Zhou Yu raised his gaze, overlooking his own sphere. The scenes he had experienced in the past few days were still vivid in his mind. Like a nanny, he taught the lizard men, giving them the fire of civilization, and taught them the techniques of smelting copper and pottery making. He participated in the struggle between two tribes and, with his own ideas, eliminated the black wolf people he couldn't stand. Is all of this correct? If the lizard men didn't have fire or copper tools, perhaps they would have remained in a primitive era for a long time, progressing slowly. If the white wolf people were all killed by the black wolf people, a more ignorant and terrifying race might have emerged on this continent, 
plunging it into complete darkness. Zhou Yu knew that his power was too great. The greater the power, the greater the responsibility. This was a line from a movie he had seen. Now he suddenly understood this truth. Since he was the ruler of this planet, his every move could easily influence the fate of a creature, a race. Under his influence, the lizard men embarked on the path of civilization. Under his influence, the white wolf tribe, outnumbered, eliminated the black wolf tribe. All of this would have a tremendous impact on the future of these creatures. So, should such things continue? Zhou Yu immediately gave himself a clear answer. Yes, they should continue. His original intention was to create a highly intelligent life form. Obviously, the uncivilized lizard men and the ignorant black wolf tribe were not on the path to be taken. What he has done so far, or rather, his influence on this planet, is absolutely correct. Only in this way can a truly highly intelligent race be nurtured and evolved. The vast blue ocean stretched out endlessly. Waves rolled and splashed. In the ocean, which occupies two-thirds of the entire planet, there are countless lives. This is a world that Zhou Yu has not had time to explore. However, he is not too eager to find out what strange and ugly creatures exist in this vast and boundless area. His goal was clear from the beginning, to find those intelligent beings that exist. This was also the original intention when creating and nurturing life in the sphere. Nowadays, whether it's the lizard men or the white wolf tribe, they have already possessed the embryonic civilization of the Stone Age. This embryo will gradually grow, branch out, and grow into a towering tree over time. However, it may also slowly disappear in the dense forest and become dust of history. Zhou Yu looked at the continent where the lizard men and the white wolf tribe were located, hoping that they would eventually evolve into the form he desired. However, he would not intervene anymore for the time being. Always rushing to be a nanny, children cannot grow up well like this. Indulging a rebellious child, that's how it is. They have to develop on their own, explore more on their own, instead of relying on Zhou Yu's guidance and intervention for everything. There is a crawling process for a child from birth to walking, and all Zhou Yu did was shorten that time. He lifted his gaze, the distant red star still remained unchanged throughout eternity, and the big dumpling beside him obediently revolved around itself. Occasionally, one or two meteors could be seen in the distance, then they disappeared into the vastness of space. Zhou Yu looked at the boundless universe and the vast galaxy-like arms, and suddenly thought of Earth. Before being reborn on this planet, he was just an ordinary human. And afterwards, how many years have passed? What galaxy is this place in? What has happened to Earth? Have humans there already developed into life forms with more advanced technology and can travel between stars? Have they also discovered this planet with an atmosphere, water, and life? However, all of this is just speculation. Joe, you can only be sure of one thing, that he is not on Earth, and this is not the solar system. Ah, I don't want to think about it. Let's focus on myself. Everything has just begun. Zhou Yu forced himself to be spirited. He has only seen two out of the nine continents in the world, maybe the other seven will exist? As for the oceans, Zhou Yu doesn't hold even the slightest expectation for the existence of highly intelligent creatures in the ocean. To be honest, he had fantasized about it before. Perhaps there really is a civilization like Atlantis in the myths of Earth? Compared to land, the ocean is more mysterious and harder to explore. Even as the sphere itself, unless he really wants to thoroughly inspect every inch, he cannot know what lies in the deep sea. Before encountering the lizard men, he had dived into both shallow and deep seas. He felt that besides the ugly and irritable bugs and strange fish there, there was also the snapping turtle dragon that looked like a normal creature. In order to survive in the ocean, there is simply no time to evolve a large brain. It is estimated that all efforts are focused on special skills such as camouflage, swimming speed, and reproductive ability, doing everything possible to stay alive. In that extremely survival of the fittest world, even if a creature with a developed brain capacity evolves, it would probably become an amphibian early on. Wait, could it be that the lizard men came about like this? Zhou Yu still remembered that the place where those guys tribe was located was not too far from the ocean. However, this is also just speculation. So, let's forget about fantasizing about intelligent life surviving in the ocean. As Zhou Yu thought this, just as he was about to think about looking at other continents, he suddenly remembered something. In order to cultivate single-celled and multicellular organisms, he had built two saltwater lakes as incubators before. The first saltwater lake was established in a location very close to where the dirty snowball meteorite fell, but because it caused a tsunami when he competed with the green gaseous planet for the big dumpling satellite, that saltwater lake was completely destroyed. The second saltwater lake is located within a complex meteorite crater about 10 kilometers away from the ocean. It is the cradle where multicellular organisms and thriving plants originated. Zhou Yu wonders where the first saltwater lake is, 
but he is more interested in finding out if the second saltwater lake still exists. He remembers that he built a rock wall around the lake, several meters high, to prevent tsunamis or other sudden events. Now, it has become a landmark for locating the lake. He carefully scans the edges of the landmasses on the sphere. Some areas do not have a lake but only a circle of rocks without a single drop of water inside. Zhou Yu scans one piece of land after another and realizes that the lakes are either too big, too small, or even freshwater lakes far from the ocean. Their shapes are not exactly as he remembers. He is puzzled as to where the saltwater lake could have gone. Even if he split the land into nine pieces, he couldn't have completely lost the saltwater lake, right? There should at least be some traces left, considering the lake's size. But he can't find it. After examining all nine landmasses, there is still no sign of the saltwater lake. Zhou Yu is confused as to how it could disappear just like that. There were clearly visible rocks serving as landmarks. With doubts in his mind, he looks towards the archipelago at the edge of the land. These are the islands he created by fragmenting the landmasses to create unique environments. Some of the larger islands are about one-tenth the size of the smallest landmass, while the smaller ones have diameters of nearly dozens of kilometers. Zhou Yu cannot accurately count the number of islands on the entire planet, especially with hundreds of volcanic islands mixed in. Could it be here? He carefully searches again. Wait, this shape. Zhou Yu spots an island that looks extremely strange. It should be considered a peculiar group of reefs rather than an island. The reefs are composed of rocks several meters wide, only a few meters above sea level, with almost no vegetation, and incredibly desolate. Near the inner side of the reefs, there is a circle of beaches about 10 meters wide. The nearest land is only a few kilometers away, relatively close. The rocks, several meters wide, are completely connected, forming an arc with a turn every so often. These arcs enclose a significant portion of the sea, leaving only a narrow channel connecting it to the ocean. Zhou Yu carefully compares the shape of the saltwater lake in his memory with this one, and they are incredibly similar. Could it be here? Just then, Zhou Yu suddenly sees a group of green, transparent figures emerging from the waves and crawling onto the beach next to the reefs. Zhou Yu is excited. When he sees the green creatures crawling ashore, his first thought is whether they are humanoid beings. What if they are? What if they are? Initially, he didn't hold much hope for the evolution of intelligent beings in the ocean, but seeing these new creatures, his anticipation grows. Even if they are a bit ugly, he can accept it. After all, he had some difficulty accepting the lizard people at first. With infinite curiosity, he immediately lowers his gaze. Oh my god, oh my god. After seeing the true appearance of those green things, he quickly raises his gaze again, unable to stop exclaiming. Their bodies, like enlarged centipedes, have green translucent bodies with thick black segmented legs and small black bean-like eyes scattered on their open purple mouths. These are definitely not intelligent humanoid creatures. They are a group of strange and ugly bugs. Zhou Yu now seriously doubts whether there is something wrong with his planet, to be able to produce such disgusting things. However, he feels that this thing seems familiar. Where has he seen it before? The bugs didn't stay on the shore for long before scattering and starting to dig holes on the beach. They wriggled incessantly, continuously digging sand out of the holes until they could accommodate their large and foolish bodies. Next, the bugs entered the holes in pairs, and then indescribable sounds came from inside the holes. Listening to this familiar applause for love, Zhou Yu instantly remembered. These disgusting bugs were the strange aquatic bugs he accidentally discovered a long time ago when he went to see the creatures on land. He still remembers that last time, these bugs did the same thing as they are doing now after gathering on the beach, digging holes, and doing some indescribable things. However, Zhou Yu thought about it and felt something strange. These bugs seem to have not changed at all compared to what he remembers. Or rather, they haven't changed in the slightest. This is strange. It has been such a long time, back then the land was still dominated by moss and bugs, but now there are already ferns and primitive humans appearing, so many years have passed. How can there be no evolution at all? You know, the sea is so dangerous, how can such stupid bugs not be eliminated? Extinct? Even single-celled organisms that split will evolve, right? What's wrong with you guys? Zhou Yu's questions kept coming. He found that these large bugs seem to be full of mysteries. Bugs that shouldn't have brains can dig holes and applaud for love, which is abnormal in itself. In Zhou Yu's impression, such bugs should not exist on earth. Could it be that this thing is not a bug, but an animal? Strange, should I catch one and study it carefully? I always feel that something is not right. The more Zhou Yu thought about it, the more uncomfortable he felt. Why was he so entangled in this? Intelligent beings should be the main focus. Let those other ugly creatures on the sphere live or die on their own. But in order to protect the ecosystem from being destroyed, Zhou Yu couldn't easily exterminate a creature that looks disgusting. 
With a sigh in his heart, Zhou Yu decided to come to this cradle of life that gave birth to everything less often in the future, carefully return to his original intention, and adjust the mountains and rivers on various lands while looking for intelligent beings. Just at this moment, splashes of water on the beach suddenly brought a group of shining silver creatures ashore. Fish? Zhou Yu wondered. But when he saw the specific appearance of those things, his heart couldn't help but skip a beat. These creatures had arms. At first, he thought there was something wrong with his visual system, but upon closer inspection, they were indeed arms. These creatures were about one and a half meters tall, covered in silver fish scales, with a layer of transparent mucus on top. Their heads resembled flattened fish heads, with mouths occupying the majority of their skulls, filled with countless sharp teeth that opened and closed. The pair of dull round eyes were located just above the breathing holes on the mouth, with an unusually close distance between them. The human-like arms were not still, shaking multiple times with each step forward. Their palms only have three fingers, connected by a thick layer of membrane. Zhou Yu felt that this was like someone combining human and fish genes to create a monster. From a distance, it looked like a fish with arms. Compared to the lizard people, they were almost the same. One was a combination of human and lizard, the other was a combination of human and fish. Fish people? Or should they be called directly fish monsters? Zhou Yu shook his head, suddenly feeling that these humanoid creatures might have just happened to grow this way, perhaps not like that group of somewhat cute lizard people who possessed intelligence. Evolving into this form must have been an ugly misunderstanding. These silver fish monsters were not accidentally washed ashore. Zhou Yu could tell that they were carnivorous creatures. As for what meat they ate, he didn't even need to guess, he looked directly at the big bugs applauding in the cave. Sure enough, the fish monsters quickly gathered on the shore, silently moving to the edge of those pits. Contrary to Zhou Yu's imagination, the fish monsters were not the kind of savage and unintelligent creatures that would directly pounce into the cave and tear the big bugs apart. They chose a different tactic. They filled the sand that the bugs had dug out back into the holes. This move was effective, and the big bugs quickly stopped moving, hurriedly digging out of the holes. And the fish monsters were waiting for this moment. They ambushed nearby and instantly opened their teeth full of sharp teeth, biting the heads of the big bugs. The screams were endless, black bug liquid sprayed out from the heads of the green bugs, even staining the faces of the fish monsters black. However, they didn't have any weapons to fight back. The big bugs that were lucky enough not to be caught crazily drilled into the sea, but there were just too many fish monsters. One after another, the big bugs were killed. Joe you watched this feast belonging to the fish monsters and suddenly remembered the scene of the big bugs being preyed upon the last time he saw them. It was the same, being caught and wiped out by a group of predators that didn't conform to the rules. The process was almost exactly the same. However, thinking about it carefully, this didn't make sense. How could such weak creatures as the big bugs have survived until now? They didn't camouflage, didn't have speed, and didn't even spray venom. They hadn't shown any signs of evolution throughout history. In this extremely survival of the fittest ocean, their existence itself was a paradox. Moreover, when Zhou Yu recalled the last time he went near the sea, he didn't see any big bugs in the water. This fact was just too strange. Just then, Zhou Yu saw several big bugs evade the heavy encirclement and rush into the sea. The waves engulfed them, and Zhou Yu quickly followed their gaze and dived into the water. However, an incredibly huge shadow suddenly appeared in front of him. On the back of the shadow, which was the size of a small mountain, there was an exceptionally prominent rock-like shell. Zhou Yu widened his view and at the same time discovered that this was the old friend he had seen many times before. The ancient giant rock fish. Zhou Yu gave this incredibly huge and terrifying fish such a tacky name. How many times had he seen it already? Zhou Yu had almost forgotten. This creature, like the big bugs, belonged to the category of non-evolving organisms for thousands of years. However, compared to the big bugs, it could still be the ruler of the sea without evolving, and it was completely on a different level. Speaking of the big bugs, Zhou Yu searched for their light green shadows in the seawater. They happened to be nearby, only four of them left, it was truly pitiful. But how many could these four reproduce? Zhou Yu wanted to see if the treasures that have survived until now are things like laying hundreds of thousands of eggs at once. However, a powerful current suddenly surged in the sea, and Zhou Yu saw that the ancient giant fish opened its mouth wide. Those few big bugs, along with a pile of miscellaneous things, were sucked into it, completely wiped out. Zhou Yu felt sad for the existence of these foolish creatures. Their irresistible charm that everyone wants a taste of is still not extinct, which is indeed a mystery. However, he wondered, are they really that delicious? Does it taste like chicken, crispy? Is the protein extremely high? With doubts, Zhou Yu continued to look at the ancient giant rockfish. Its existence is also a mystery. 
According to the trend of evolution, the size of this creature should be getting smaller and smaller, but they have remained unchanged for thousands of years, just like the big bugs. Joe you fell into contemplation. This guy, as well as the big bugs, are things that cannot be understood with common sense. This is even more difficult for him to understand than why lizard people and white wolf tribes can exist. However, just at this moment, the ancient giant rockfish suddenly spewed out a stream of water and swam into deeper waters. Ha! Huh? Joe you was speechless. Classmate, you only ate a few big bugs and ran away? Aren't there a bunch of fish monsters on the shore? Don't they smell good? Are you an idiot? The fish monsters may look ugly, but they look very delicious. What's wrong with you, little brother? Joe you couldn't understand at all what was going on with this guy. Why didn't he wait for those fish monsters to come down and have a feast? Could it be that the fish monsters are poisonous? No, last time he saw the ancient giant rockfish sucking in big bugs that looked extremely poisonous, and nothing happened. Both of them are extremely strange. Joe Yu refocused his gaze on the water's surface and found that on the beach, those fish monsters had already eaten all the big bugs and were preparing to return to the ocean. This was originally an extremely normal scene of survival of the fittest, but Joe Yu always felt that something was off. The mysterious big bugs and the overly massive ancient giant rockfish. Wait, overly massive? Joe Yu suddenly noticed a problem. This rocky island only has a small opening, less than 20 meters wide, but how can that big fish be 50 meters wide? Could it be that this giant fish has been here since birth? But that doesn't make sense, how big is this area? All the creatures combined wouldn't be enough for that giant fish to eat in a day, right? Joe Yu quickly submerged his gaze into the sea again. It wasn't difficult to find a massive creature in this hundreds of square kilometers of water. A giant fish that big is like an orange in a swimming pool, quite easy to recognize. Plus, the giant fish swims very slowly, so it shouldn't be. No, it's not here, and it's not there either. The entire water area doesn't have a trace of that giant fish. Joe you couldn't believe this fact and searched again. However, besides various marine insects, fish, and unidentifiable monsters, Joe you didn't find a trace of the ancient giant rockfish. Of course, he didn't see any of those big bugs either. Another mystery added to the list. He searched around the outer side of the reef again, but of course, he found nothing. It's strange, very strange. Joe you couldn't figure it out. Why would it be like this? Did he miss something? Zhou Yu had a thought. The seawater in this large area of the reef instantly floated into the sky. At the same time, Zhou Yu also blocked the seawater from flowing in from the outside. However, with this action, hundreds of square kilometers of the seabed were exposed to the starlight, and every strand and every bit could be seen clearly. Zhou Yu didn't check the water, in his line of sight, there appeared a huge hole, which was more than enough for a primitive giant rockfish to pass through. He approached and looked at it, the cave seemed to have been neatly cut by something. The outer wall was smooth, it didn't look like something a fish would make, it looked more like something naturally formed. However, in Zhou Yu's memory, there was no such place when creating the saltwater lake. Even if it was the giant fish that made this cave, why would it do so? Just to come here and eat a few big bugs? Is it necessary? More and more mysteries made Zhou Yu more and more confused. Putting the seawater back, Zhou Yu decided to temporarily ignore it. In the vast sea, it was impossible to find the giant fish he just saw, there were no obvious markers. And even if he found it, so what? It seemed that he had misunderstood the focus, he should use this enthusiasm on intelligent creatures. Thinking of this, Zhou Yu quickly shifted his gaze. He looked towards the nearby land. This area, located at a very low latitude, was the area with the highest forest coverage among the nine landmasses, and also the flattest. However, the altitude was unexpectedly high, and in the center of the land, there was a high plateau covered in white snow. But thanks to this, the water source seemed unusually abundant. There were quite a number of rivers flowing on the land, forming a network structure, flowing through the endless forest, the domain of forests and water. Zhou Yu sighed. He didn't know if there were intelligent creatures here, but at least various animals, insects, and fish were definitely present. The complexity of life was fully displayed here. So, were there any intelligent creatures here? Zhou Yu decided to find out. But this forest was a bit too big. Zhou Yu didn't know where to start. Every plant was competing for space, fighting for even a tiny bit of light and nutrients. They even occupied the beaches, occupying a considerable distance near the sea. Zhou Yu felt that this was quite tricky. Should he just go and take a look at the small plateau where the river originated? He was about to shift his gaze when he suddenly noticed something flashing in the bushes near the sea. That was. Zhou Yu quickly zoomed in his vision. A person? A human? After looking at the appearance of the creature, which was almost identical to Earth humans, Zhou Yu couldn't help but exclaim. There was no doubt, it was a human face. 
Zhou Yu had a strong memory, even after countless thousands of years on this planet, he could still remember what he, as a human, used to look like. And what this creature in front of him had was a face very similar to humans, but with a lot of body hair, covered in long sweat hair. The body was the same, covered in a dense layer of black hair, and unusually short in height, only about one, three meters tall. Whether it was the limbs or the appearance, this was clearly a person covered in fur. Darwin said that humans evolved gradually from apes. And these beings, who were neither human nor monkey, could they be the legendary apes? Zhou Yu looked at the more than 20 black apes swaggering around, picking unknown fruits from the low bushes by the coast. They chattered as if they were having a conversation, confirming his thoughts. However, as they swung around on the trees and on the ground, they quickly put the fruits they picked into their mouths, occasionally playing and laughing, seeming very leisurely. Zhou Yu furrowed his non-existent eyebrows. Something wasn't right. Even apes would use tools and have basic tribes. But these guys in front of him, apart from their human-like faces, had the habits of monkeys. Zhou Yu decided to observe them for a while. At the very least, he needed to follow them into the forest to see if there were any structures or usable tools. The black apes occasionally threw the leftover fruit cores into the sea, which were instantly devoured by something silver. Zhou Yu suddenly felt that the silver thing seemed familiar. His gaze quickly found it in the water. It was a fish monster. He couldn't help but be astonished. What was going on? Fish monsters eating fruits? Are they omnivorous? Weren't they supposed to eat meat? The black apes also noticed the fish monsters, seemingly familiar with them. They picked more fruits from the trees and threw them into the water, as if they were feeding them. The fish monsters were happy to accept, gathering near the feeding area, but they didn't show any intention of attacking the shore. Zhou Yu couldn't help but laugh silently. This scene was like people feeding fish. Could it be that the fish monsters were pets of the black apes? That would be hilarious. After a while, the group of black apes seemed to have eaten their fill. They suddenly gathered together, no longer feeding, and the fish monsters disappeared into the ocean. Zhou Yu narrowed his eyes and felt that they were probably going somewhere as a group. However, these guys suddenly started applauding for love. Zhou Yu couldn't help but be dumbfounded. He never expected this kind of development. Are they thinking about love when they're full? This is so realistic. No wonder their actions while eating the fruit were like diving and stretching. So that's how it is. He sighed in his heart. Five minutes later, they were done. Zhou Yu's wait wasn't long. Wasn't it time to get down to business? However, they seemed unsatisfied and came back for another round. Zhou Yu was truly speechless. Why not do it at a better time during the day? Did they have to do this? Couldn't they go back to the tribe or something? Wasn't the wilderness fun enough? And why did they have to do it in a big group? Suddenly, Zhou Yu felt worried about the future of these black apes. Would they continue to inherit this behavior? With a critical eye, he observed them for five minutes, from various angles, trying to see how they would degenerate. After this round, the black apes were finally tired. They walked heavily, each carrying a pile of fruits, and headed deeper into the forest. Zhou Yu's gaze followed closely. Were they going back to the tribe? What would it be like there? Zhou Yu's interest was piqued. If there was a certain degree, no, even just a hint of the emergence of a Stone Age civilization, Zhou Yu would immediately lead them to rapidly advance civilization and be at the forefront of global civilization. This was also one of Zhou Yu's obsessions. Compared to those with lizard heads or wolf heads, he felt a natural affinity with these monkey-headed creatures. They were more like humans on Earth, which was a big plus. The black apes moved easily through the dense forest, effortlessly covering a distance of over a hundred meters. As Zhou Yu followed closely behind them, he occasionally observed the moist forest, realizing that it was truly a treasure trove of flora and fauna. Among various colored trees, there are countless grasses, mosses, and ferns, as well as plants with beautiful flowers of various colors. These plants have also become habitats for various insects. Zhou Yu did not stop to carefully observe them, but followed the footsteps of the black apes and gradually advanced into the depths of the forest. After a while, they finally began to slow down, and Zhou Yu widened his field of vision, finally seeing a tribe-like existence. Unlike the previous two, this tribe seemed to be built on trees. It was a civilization built on a small hill. Among the tall trees on the hill, there were simple huts made of branches and wooden stakes, which looked extremely crude but had a strong ancient atmosphere. The apes slowly approached an open space between the huts and finally stopped. Zhou Yu's mood gradually became excited. All right, let me see what kind of civilization you apes have become. Just then, a group of large apes with red fur, resembling orangutans, walked out of those huts, slowly descending from the trees and sitting around in the open space. Ha! Huh? Zhou Yu did not expect this development at all. Why are there different apes again? Different species? Or are these red ones what the apes grow into when they grow up? 
No, the black apes have all applauded for love before, proving that they have already reached adulthood, so this doesn't make sense. Moreover, the appearance of the red-furred apes is more ferocious, more like monkeys or orangutans. The size of their skeletons could probably match three or four of these monkeys. This is strange. The behavior of the black apes that followed further confused Zhou Yu. They respectfully piled up a heap of fruits in their hands, then chattered and hid in a corner of the open space, each one bowing their heads. The red-furred apes swaggered over to the fruit mountain and began to eat recklessly. Soon, there was hardly anything left of the fruit, and the next scene made Zhou Yu even more astonished. Two obviously not full red-furred apes walked over to where the ordinary apes were, waved their big hands, and each grabbed one, clutching their throats. With a strong force, the two black apes quickly lost their breath. The red-furred apes then proceeded to directly bite and devour the bodies of the black apes. Their behavior quickly attracted other red-furred apes, who joined in the feast. The open space quickly turned into chaos. The red-furred apes tore and fought, even engaging in fistfights. The living black apes remained motionless in the corner like puppets. Joe you suddenly understood the relationship between them. Master and pet. This was an extremely primitive master and pet relationship. The red-furred apes had tamed the black apes, sending them out to pick fruits and avoiding the various dangers they would face if they went out themselves. And when food was scarce, the first thing the red-furred apes thought of was selecting sacrifices from the black apes to satisfy their hunger. The black apes didn't even dare to run. Not to mention the Stone Age, this could hardly be considered a civilization. No tools, no fire, only simple domestication relationships like this. It was pitiful. This was not the civilization Zhou Yu wanted, and he had no room to intervene in it. Not to mention God's arrival helping either side of these guys enter the most primitive Stone Age civilization. Zhou Yu looked at the so-called houses on the trees, which were extremely rough and could barely withstand a light wind or rain, and suddenly felt that his original enthusiasm had been completely extinguished by this reality. He also concluded that this group of apes had no possibility of evolving into a civilization. The red-haired apes rely on the labor of the black apes to eat, and the black apes seem to be happy with this arrangement, without any resistance, not even struggling when they are eaten. Zhou Yu sighed in his heart. Compared to the lizard people who can create shields and stone spears, they are completely unqualified. Not to mention the more advanced civilization of the white wolf tribe. These guys with heads like ordinary humans will definitely be quickly eliminated in this evolutionary tide. Zhou Yu raised his gaze to the sky above the forest. The initial anticipation has now become completely empty. Originally thought that the black apes were intelligent beings, capable of keeping fish monsters as pets, but it turns out that they are also pets of the red-haired apes. This incomprehensible pet chain is truly puzzling. None of the animals in this pet chain have the qualifications to occupy this land in the future. At least, not now. Zhou Yu looked around. As far as the eye could see, plants occupied almost the entire field of vision. He raised his gaze and in the distance, there was a gradually rising plateau, shrouded in clouds and snow, with towering peaks reaching into the sky. This place is a good place, much better than the lizard people's rocky hills and the white wolf tribe's grasslands. But it seems that this intelligent life is even more backward. Zhou Yu suddenly thought, could it be that the abundance of food prevents species from evolving? Just think about it, the lizard people who only eat meat have to take risks to hunt, and the white wolf tribe almost got wiped out by the black wolf tribe as food, which is much harder than these red-haired apes. In this vast forest, the red-haired apes who grow up eating fruits probably have no difficulty in obtaining food. If they are not stabbed with needles from behind, they won't evolve. Zhou Yu figured this out and shifted his gaze away from here, heading straight for the central plateau of the land. There is no need to waste time here, even if time is not precious. He arrived at the foot of the mountain at the edge of the forest. Suddenly, he realized that he hadn't carefully arranged it back then. The junction between the plateau and the plain was almost at a right angle, with steep and extremely steep rock formations completely separating the vast plateau from the forest plain. Countless spectacular waterfalls cascaded down from the top of the cliff, creating thousands of waves, with mist filling the air in deafening noise. The bottom of the cliff was dotted with sparse shrubs and a large amount of moss, and the rest was countless huge rocks that were difficult to count. Zhou Yu looked around and found no signs of caves or obvious man-made structures. If there is none here, could it be on the plateau? Zhou Yu raised his gaze and felt that the difference in height between the plateau and the plain was at least a hundred meters. It seems that he didn't consider it too much when creating the terrain back then. Should he make some gentle slopes or lower the overall height of the plateau? He always felt like he was creating another piece of land on land. But then he thought, maybe there are unexpected creatures in this isolated place? Zhou Yu decided not to make any adjustments for now, but to continue his gaze with anticipation towards the depths of the plateau. 
It seems that the edge of the area is the lowest altitude of this plateau, and the height gradually increases as he goes deeper. The scenery in his field of vision transitions from the forest to shrubs, and then from shrubs to endless grasslands. And like capillaries, numerous rivers shimmering with silver flow, dividing these landscapes into countless pieces. There are islands in the rivers, and rivers in the islands, forming unique scenic lines. Zhou Yu admired the beautiful scenery while carefully searching for anything that resembled man-made traces. However, apart from plants, there was nothing but plants on this land, and even animals were scarce. Moreover, the higher the altitude, the fewer the organisms. Could it be that the previous terrain adjustment even messed up the entire ecosystem? Zhou Yu became more and more disappointed. It's a pity that such a vast plateau doesn't have any special intelligent creatures that have evolved. Zhou Yu was getting bored, so he shifted his gaze to a steep mountain near the grassland, where he had just seen a small creature wandering around. Bringing his gaze closer, the small creature hidden in the bluegrass instantly magnified several times. It was a creature that looked like a cat but had long ears that stood upright like a rabbit. Unlike cats on earth, this guy had a very short tail, well-developed forelimbs with strong muscles, and walked by swinging its forelimbs back and forth, looking very majestic. Its fur, which was also blue-green, perfectly blended with the grassland, hiding its petite figure. However, Zhou Yu noticed that despite its fierce appearance, this creature was actually herbivorous and was constantly chewing on the bluegrass. He couldn't help but marvel at how the creatures on this planet seemed to have undergone some kind of genetic fusion with those on Earth, which was quite strange. Not far behind this rabbit-eared cat, there was a round hole covered by the surrounding grass, quite well hidden. However, several small heads were sticking out from inside, eagerly waiting for food like hungry baby birds with their mouths wide open. Zhou Yu was speechless. Isn't there grass right next to this nest? Are you guys that dumb? He then saw the big rabbit-eared cat quickly return and spit out the blue grass from its mouth onto the ground. It then opened its mouth wide, and a blue liquid flowed out, directly dropping into the mouths of those little creatures. Zhou Yu was speechless again. This efficiency was too low, my friend. If you spoil your children like this, what will happen in the future? What if you die and these little brats starve to death? How have you managed to survive until now, you fellow? Just then, the long ears of the rabbit-eared cat suddenly twitched, and Zhou Yu also heard the sound it heard. Ding, ding, ding. This crisp and dense sound was coming from the steep mountain. The rabbit-eared cat crawled back into its burrow, and Zhou Yu followed the sound, scanning the mountain with his gaze. Soon, he noticed something unusual. It was a cave, and the sound was coming from inside. Zhou Yu shifted his gaze to the cave and discovered something extraordinary happening right before his eyes. This is... Zhou Yu always had a great interest in unexpected events. Just like everything happening before him, nearly a hundred small humanoid creatures were energetically hitting stones with tools in the cave. The cave was brightly lit, with torches made of some kind of wood fixed to the rock wall, illuminating the quite spacious cave. This allowed Zhou Yu to get a closer look at the appearance of these working humanoids. Zhou Yu was always filled with curiosity about unexpected things. Apart from their beards and hair, the hair on other parts of their bodies was unusually sparse, and their light brown skin could be clearly seen. Their muscles were well developed and full of lines, and they even had blue fur wrapped around their barrel-like waists. They had faces similar to humans, with black brown eyeballs, but higher cheekbones, upward-facing nostrils, and messy beards, making them look like rough men. Both their palms and toes had five fingers, and judging by the way they held the fruits, they seemed to be quite dexterous. Tails? Zhou Yu looked carefully and indeed, there were none. Oh well. Zhou Yu looked at this creature that was almost identical to Earth humans and couldn't help but feel relieved. This guy was the ideal primitive man. Compared to this, those black-haired and red-haired people below the plateau are all a mess. However, there are still some shortcomings. This group of people seems to be short in height? Zhou Yu estimated their height and found that he was only about one, two meters tall. Looking at their physique, they indeed seemed to be of the short and stout type, with short and thick limbs. Zhou Yu was extremely excited now. These were truly humanoid creatures. Compared to the werewolf tribe with lizard heads and white fur all over their bodies, these were the real primitive humans. In Zhou Yu's subjective imagination, only creatures similar to Earth humans could be called humans, while the rest should be called humanoids. This was also due to his psychological attachment to being originally from Earth. If he had lived in the age of dinosaurs, perhaps he would have favored the lizard people even more. Zhou Yu felt that if possible, he would like to contribute more to the civilization of this race and help them progress. So, let's call them dwarves. However, judging from the metal tools in their hands, even if he didn't do anything, these dwarves were far ahead of the other two tribes. With metal, it meant they had mastered fire, and with fire, it was basically certain that they ate cooked food. As for weapons, they were definitely not lacking. 
Tribes that could mine were already far ahead of the Stone Age civilization, so, how developed could they become? Zhou Yu was full of excitement and continued to observe. The division of labor among the dwarves was quite clear. There were dwarves specifically responsible for mining, almost always working in pairs. Both of them used metal hammers and tools similar to chisels to cut and break the rocks, displaying exceptional skill. There were also dwarves specifically responsible for transporting the mined ores from the cave to the outside. On the outside, there was clearly a group of female dwarves sitting together, using small hammers to pick and choose from piles of ore. Zhou Yu carefully identified the ore and found that it was mostly a reddish color, producing a clear and pleasant sound when struck. The female dwarves were picking this type of stone. Of course, he recognized what this thing was. Hematite. As an important raw material for smelting iron, this type of ore usually produced high-quality iron. It seemed that these dwarves had already surpassed the Bronze Age and directly started using iron tools. This, without a doubt, was a great leap in civilization. Compared to copperware, ironware is harder and lighter. It is also more widely used in the production of various tools. However, iron smelting requires more advanced technology and is completely different from copper smelting. So, do the dwarves possess such technology? Zhou Yu's gaze gradually drifted away and began to scan the surroundings carefully. Soon, he saw a riverbank not too far from here, where a thick smoke had just emerged. Narrowing his field of vision, he also saw dwarves constantly emitting thick smoke and flames from a cylindrical object, as well as dwarves moving and carrying things around it. This cylindrical object seemed to be made of clay-like material, with a hole on the side of the bottom, inside of which wood charcoal was burning. Several dwarves were holding strange-looking bellows and continuously blowing air into it. Behind a crack, there were red residues constantly flowing out. There was no doubt that this was a blast furnace for iron smelting. Zhou Yu was amazed by the dwarves' powerful smelting technology. How many times had they improved this seemingly complicated blast furnace? After a while, the dwarves picked up hammers and smashed the blast furnace. A dwarf who had been waiting by the furnace used an iron tool resembling a large shovel to take out a hot object emitting a red and white light from inside. Then, he placed it in a small blast furnace next to a slightly flat giant stone. Two dwarves holding large hammers and chisels were waiting beside the giant stone. Zhou Yu nodded, was this the beginning of forging? As expected, soon the large piece of red iron turned white again and was placed on the giant stone. After being divided into two pieces with a chisel, the two dwarves immediately swung their hammers. Sparks flew. The dwarf who had previously blown air into the furnace also came over to continuously blow air into the furnace. During the process of the giant stone and furnace turning red and black, the black impurities on the surface of the iron block were continuously hammered down, gradually forming strips and flattening out. Zhou Yu also noticed that the people who had previously started to collect new clay by the riverbank were now kneading it into strips and starting to make new blast furnaces. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. The dwarves actually possessed such advanced smelting technology. It was much more impressive than the simple and extraordinary smelting method he had taught the lizard men. The dwarves civilization was much higher than Zhou Yu had imagined, and they were also far ahead of the lizard men and the white wolf tribe. On Zhou Yu's planet, many civilizations had already started to experience significant asynchrony. Was this a good thing or a bad thing? He couldn't judge at the moment. Zhou Yu had initially wanted to give this dwarf civilization a push with his bias, but it seemed unnecessary now. In terms of smelting alone, if left to develop naturally, the lizard men and the white wolf tribe would need to catch up for at least a hundred years, or even longer. However, what about other aspects of the dwarf race? Zhou Yu also noticed that the dwarf population seemed quite large. In that cave, including the female dwarves who were sorting ores outside, there were roughly 50 to 60 people, and at this smelting factory by the river, there were nearly 50 people. This didn't even include those responsible for transportation in the middle. Zhou Yu conservatively estimated that this dwarf tribe had at least 200 laborers. What does this concept mean? To support these 200 laborers, there would need to be at least 200 people or more in the food gathering team. Adding some children with little labor capacity and logistical personnel, this community would have a population of over 600. Unlike the extinct Black Wolf tribe, the 600 was real. The Black Wolf tribe is lazy and gluttonous, but they have a strong reproductive ability. However, most of them live in hardship and have to attack the White Wolf tribe to sustain their population. On the other hand, the Dwarf tribe should have developed productivity that meets their population growth. These are two different concepts. The level of civilization is also vastly different. Thinking about this, Zhou Yu shifted his gaze. He wanted to see what the situation was like in the dwarf tribe and how they obtained food. Zhou Yu didn't have to spend too much effort and quickly found a dense jungle near the upstream of the river, where there was a small team of about 20 to 30 dwarves. 
Each of them held a tightly woven net made of straw and crawled on the ground, constantly picking fruits. Zhou Yu carefully observed and realized that they were picking fruits from a low shrub. They were yellow orange berries with dewdrops on the skin, about the size of ping pong balls, not small at all. Are these oranges? No, oranges don't grow under trees, and moreover, it is unlikely that similar species would appear on earth according to probability. Zhou Yu suddenly became interested in these fruits. Since gaining the ability of divine possession, he had never eaten any fruits. Whether it was the lizard men or the white wolf tribe, it seemed that they preferred meat, and he had never seen any wild fruits over there. The golden fruit skin gradually captivated Zhou Yu's attention. He felt a desire reaching its peak. Divine Possession Zhou Yu quickly possessed a dwarf located in the corner, and in that instant, he also put a fruit into his mouth. Sour Zhou Yu hadn't experienced this taste for a long time. The sourness in his mouth kept spreading, making him shiver involuntarily. Hey! What's wrong with you? Suddenly, a voice came from his ear. Zhou Yu quickly turned his head and spat out the fruit, instantly using his ability to throw the sour fruit several kilometers away. He looked at the female dwarf next to him, who was frowning and looking at him. Ah, nothing, got pricked by something. Zhou Yu pointed at the dwarf shrub in front of him and replied. However, he was a bit puzzled. Why was the voice of this body so high-pitched, and it seemed to have gained two points and lost one? Zhou Yu touched himself. Damn, he didn't pay attention and actually possessed a female dwarf. Hey, is that so? I thought you were being silly and ate a rakota fruit. It would be troublesome if you ate it. Keep going. The female dwarf next to him shook her head and continued working. Zhou Yu watched her thick and short fingers struggling to push aside the thorny branches and pick the fruits. He also took a quick glance. This group consisted entirely of female dwarves, seemingly responsible for harvesting this type of fruit. Zhou Yu didn't expect to make such a mistake this time. Originally, he really didn't intend to possess a female dwarf. As a male, suddenly becoming a woman. Exciting! I must do something critical. His hands began to unconsciously. Work hard. Don't just stand there. Don't you want to eat tonight? A plump female dwarf looked at Zhou Yu and shouted. Yes. Zhou Yu immediately stopped his dangerous actions and gave up his thoughts. He also realized that the female dwarf was probably the supervisor here. Unexpectedly, the dwarves also put in some effort in terms of manpower to improve productivity. Zhou Yu tried to pick a fruit and put it in the net bag. Of course, in order to experience the real process of harvesting, Zhou Yu successfully cut two wounds on his hand. By the way, these fruits cannot be eaten raw? Then what are they for? Gurgle. A strange sound came, and Zhou Yu felt his stomach twisting like a knife. Waves of gas surged, and soon, it reached a position diagonally below his body. Zhou Yu instantly released his divine presence and raised his gaze. At the same time, a sound like a tractor starting up also reached the sky. Holy crap! Soaring through the clouds. It was a close call, so close. Zhou Yu finally understood why the fruit called coat couldn't be eaten raw. Eating it would turn him into a jet. Zhou Yu continued to raise his gaze, but the sound after the tractor noise was too enchanting for him to bear. By the way, why pick it if you can't eat it? Is it used to make a constipation remedy? He really thought this fruit was meant to be eaten, but he didn't expect it to have such effects. Zhou Yu shifted his focus. Since it wasn't for eating, there must be something else that can be eaten beasts. The meat provided by beasts could greatly replenish the energy of the dwarves who worked with high intensity. And what could advanced metallurgy bring? The answer was simple, powerful weapons. Stronger and harder than copper, that's the power of iron. Make weapons? Knives, guns, swords, and spears. Oh no, most importantly, it's probably the arrowheads and spear tips. When dealing with beasts, these two are the most useful. Beasts with greater strength and speed fear long-range weapons. However, from Zhou Yu's current observation, the dwarves, who are only half the size of lizardmen, probably can't handle long spears. If they were to use bows, their short and thick fingers and height would be quite limiting. So, what could they use for hunting? Zhou Yu began a carpet-style search. It didn't take long for him to see a small army of nearly 70 people. The things on their bodies were shining under the starlight. And very close to these dwarves were quite a number of rabbit-eared cats. Zhou Yu never thought that when a herbivore encounters disturbance and life-threatening danger, its first choice would actually be to actively counterattack. There were over a hundred rabbit-eared cats in total. They all extended their sharp claws, fluffed up their fur, and roared fiercely, intimidating the dwarves. It seemed like they didn't want to leave and were confronting the dwarves. Zhou Yu was also puzzled. No matter how you look at it, these little guys seem like carnivorous animals, so why would they eat grass? Looking back at the dwarves, Zhou Yu unexpectedly discovered that the shiny things hanging on each of them were actually well-polished hammers. 
Even the handles of these hammers were made of metal. This completely caught him off guard. Hammers? Not bows, not guns, not even swords? You guys really don't take the usual path, huh? What can these hammers do? Are they used as musical instruments? Zhou Yu had countless criticisms he wanted to tell these dwarves. He couldn't understand why these supposedly highly intelligent guys only had hammers in their minds. Zhou Yu felt that as long as these rabbit-eared cats weren't foolish enough to engage in close combat with the dwarves, it would be difficult for them to be smashed to death by hammers. Wait, if hammers are melee weapons, why bring so many of them? As if responding to what Zhou Yu was thinking, suddenly, in an instant, one of the dwarven hunters who had the most hammers hanging on him let out a roar. Yeah, 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 yeah. The other dwarves also shouted along. Then, countless hammers flew into the sky. Holy crap, this is too amazing. Zhou Yu watched as they continuously threw the hammers on their bodies at the rabbit-eared cats with extremely fast speed, drawing countless arcs. Put. The sound of small screams continued to come, and Zhou Yu could also see that the rabbit-eared cats, who didn't anticipate this development at all, were all smashed to pieces by these flying objects. There weren't many rabbit-eared cats that managed to escape, as the number of hammers was just too dense. This is an unexpected hunting method. The dwarves divided into two teams. One team was responsible for retrieving hammers, while the other team was responsible for collecting prey. Zhou Yu felt that their efficiency was honestly not very high. The rabbit-eared cats were not small creatures, they were almost half the height of the dwarves, not to mention that they were all well-fed and strong. At most, each dwarf could carry two back, but every dwarf with hammers hanging all over them still held a large pile. Their footsteps were unusually heavy, and Zhou Yu felt a bit sorry for them. These people seemed a bit foolish. They knew that their bodies were stout and short, yet they hunted so many rabbit-eared cats at once, without even making transportation tools. Wait a minute. Zhou Yu suddenly realized something. These dwarves possessed powerful smelting techniques and could gather wild fruits and hunt wild beasts. Their civilization seemed to have no room for him to intervene, but it seemed that they were missing something. Yes, an effective means of transportation. Whether it was transporting or bringing back gathered fruits to the tribe, or carrying hammers and prey after hunting. Something was missing. A transport vehicle. Their current development seemed to be limited to this point. Just think about it, with a transport vehicle, they could save a lot of manpower in transporting or, without having to worry about carrying a rope bag back to the tribe from a far distance, or having to return after only catching a little prey. They would be able to allocate more manpower to mining, gathering, and hunting. Productivity would also experience a leap in growth. Watching the hunters slowly carry their prey back, Zhou Yu began to think. How to create a simple and effective means of transportation. Zhou Yu decided to go find the dwarves tribe first. After going around in circles, he had never been to the dwarves tribe before and didn't know what the situation there would be like. After searching for a while, Zhou Yu saw a cave on the mountainside of a small hill that was tens of meters high. The cave was almost 20 meters above the ground, and a rough hay rope connected the cave entrance to the ground. There was a dwarf standing guard at the entrance, which was very conspicuous. Could this be another mine? Zhou Yu thought so and shifted his gaze to the inside of the cave. It was like another world. Looking at the entrance, which was only a little over 2 meters in diameter, but inside had nearly a thousand square meters of cave, Zhou Yu couldn't help but think of this term. There were quite a few primitive people living inside the cave, each sitting or lying down, doing different things. Zhou Yu saw that almost all of them were weak women and children, probably because they were not needed elsewhere and could only be responsible for logistics here. Not far from the cave entrance, there was a small side cave, and smoke from the bonfire drifted out of it. This was truly their stronghold. However, it was also unexpected that the dwarves did not choose to build fences with wooden barriers, but instead used natural rocks and high barriers to construct their homes. The advantages and disadvantages were both obvious. The advantage was that it was difficult for anyone else to climb up. The disadvantage was that it was not easy for them to climb up either. After not too long, the hunting team returned. After gathering outside the cave, the children inside came out as well. These low-skilled laborers held small metal knives and began skinning and cutting. Unlike the lizardmen, the dwarves with advanced tools were extremely skilled at skinning, easily removing the skins. Soon, they started roasting the meat and put the fruit that could cause diarrhea in the fire as well. Zhou Yu also understood why the female dwarf said that eating it raw was not good. The sky was already late, and he saw that the people by the river, in the mine, and collecting fruits had all returned. After careful counting, there were less than 400 people. It was quite different from his estimation. The total amount of food determines the number of people, and with such a small amount of prey, it would only be enough for this group of dwarves to survive. Even if they were to expand their population, it would be quite difficult. 
It seemed that he had to tell them to improve their backward transportation methods. And another divine visitation? Joe, you always felt that every time there was a divine visitation, there would be consequences. The person being possessed would fall into chaos upon release, which was not a good method. What if they controlled a corpse like the White Wolf tribe? But he didn't see any tendency for these dwarves to give up. They were quite healthy. Ah, if only he could understand what they were saying, it wouldn't be so difficult. Just then, the chaotic Yaya and Woloyala sounds suddenly became logical and coherent, and Zhou Yu understood their words. Chief, I feel too tired, carrying so many stones every day. A dwarf sighed and extended his short, thick palm. Zhou Yu saw that it was covered in blisters. We're the same, the amount of kota fruit we bring back is too little, and the rest can only rot on the trees, complained a female dwarf. Oomph, aren't we the most tired? After making tools and weapons, we have to carry them all the way back to the tribe. It's us, that's right, us. The dwarf tribe started arguing. Zhou Yu was extremely surprised. How could he suddenly understand them? His abilities were too powerful, weren't they? If only he could have done this before, he wouldn't have had to use divine visitations. However, from the conversation among these dwarves, Zhou Yu also understood that they had discovered the current bottleneck. If they didn't break through, one day it would become the straw that broke the camel's back for this civilization. Chief, we can't continue like this, we must think of a solution. The dwarves looked at the strongest dwarf, seemingly waiting for his decision. However, the chief could only shake his head helplessly. We've tried many methods, but none of them work, right? The dwarves seemed to have thought about how to solve the transportation problem, but they were already stuck in a dead end. Joe, you also understood that even though they were already highly productive, they were still at a relatively low level in terms of craftsmanship and manufacturing. So, it was time for him to make an appearance. But how should he do it? It was actually quite simple. Make a cart. Specifically, a four-wheeled hand-pushed transport cart with extremely simple functions. It was like an upgraded version of the two-wheeled cart used to transport bricks. Two wheels were not easy to make, but four wheels only required two pairs of wheels and a flatboard to manufacture. Relatively speaking, it was also easier. So, how could he tell the dwarves the method of making the cart? Divine visitation? Control? Or, a new method? Through suddenly being able to understand the dwarves' conversation, he gained another layer of confidence in his abilities. Since he could do almost anything, why not give it a try? Shifting his gaze from the cave, Zhou Yu arrived at the bottom of the cliff. He concentrated his psychic power, controlling the broken rocks at the bottom of the cliff, keeping them suspended in midair. Then, those broken rocks turned into powder, continuously rotating in the air and condensing into shape. A storm suddenly arose, lightning flashed between the black clouds that covered the sky, and silver snakes danced with electricity. The previously clear sky suddenly seemed like it had descended into hell. One after another, thunderbolts struck the ground at the bottom of the cliff, causing the dwarves who had just woken up inside the cave to huddle together tightly, shrinking to the deepest part of the cave. After a while, the thunder gradually ceased, and the light outside also gradually faded. The trembling dwarves curiously looked outside the cave. The dark clouds in the sky scattered, and countless rays of light poured down, one of which shone on the bottom of the cliff. The dwarves were amazed by this strange phenomenon and became even more curious about what was beneath that ray of light. Chieftain. The dwarves gathered around their leader, all looking at the shining object. Let's go down together and see what that seems to be a special stone. The dwarf leader, experienced and knowledgeable, still couldn't identify what the seemingly rocky object was. He led the others and descended to the ground at the bottom of the cliff using ropes. Hundreds of people held their breath and stared at the strange-shaped rock that was almost the same height as them. My people. The rock suddenly emitted an incredibly ancient voice and slowly opened its eyes. The dwarves were so scared that they sat directly on the ground, and some even cried. Who has ever seen a talking rock? Do not panic, do not fear, my people. The rock stood up. In front of the dwarves, the rock spread its arms. P.E.O. people? The leader was the only one who wasn't frightened. He carefully looked at the rock and discovered that it had the same height, beard, and almost identical appearance as them. Was this a talking dwarf rock? My people, I am the god of the hills. God. Of the hills? The dwarf leader recalled the strange phenomenon just now and seemed to understand something. He immediately knelt down, and the other dwarves followed suit. My people, the god foresaw that you have encountered an insurmountable problem, right? The dwarves looked at each other and nodded frantically. How could it not be? If they couldn't solve it, they would have to fight among themselves. We cannot solve the problem of transportation, so. The leader bowed with his hands raised above his head, his voice trembling. I came here to solve this matter. The booming voice of the god of the hills was deafening. The dwarves prostrated themselves on the ground, 
trembling, unable to calm their excitement. This so-called god of the hills was actually a puppet made by Zhou Yu using broken stones. After he finished making it, he slightly controlled it with his will and found that the puppet's movements were unexpectedly flexible. Then, after dawn, Zhou Yu controlled the clouds and lightning, creating a phenomenon, and finally used the clouds to create the rays of light, like spotlights on a stage, creating a frightening atmosphere. As for the name God of the Hills, it was purely a random name Zhou Yu came up with due to naming difficulties, but it seemed to resemble a name from a game? Zhou Yu felt that appearing as a god rather than a deity seemed more convincing and would not result in a situation similar to the confusion of the Lizardmen leader in the end, even though relying on being a god was indeed cliché. However, using this shell, Zhou Yu was able to guide these dwarves in their civilization's evolution. With a single thought, not to mention wooden wheels, Zhou Yu could even make a complete rock into a Rolls Royce. But the problem was that it was easy for him to make, but the dwarves couldn't. This was a crucial problem. He couldn't just use his thoughts to create hundreds of wooden carts, right? Being a full-time nanny was something Zhou Yu never wanted to do, let alone do it all the time. It was right to make a car with this group of dwarves and let them imitate it, just like when he introduced copper smelting and pottery making to the lizardmen in the beginning. The master leads the way, but the practice depends on the individual. If they can grasp it, then the evolution of civilization is all good. If not, then they can only maintain a backward civilization until a more advanced civilization arrives and subjects them to ruthless plunder and enslavement. Perhaps, the backward civilization will not even wait for that day and will gradually disappear. The survival of the fittest in civilization is even more cruel than in nature. However, the dwarves are still respectful of this god of the hills, and Zhou Yu is satisfied with this. Confused people, bring your tools and follow me to the place where miracles happen. Controlling the clouds, letting the glow of the sunset follow, the god of the hills floats in the air and moves forward, making the dwarves extremely fearful. Zhou Yu knows that he has to take it step by step. It wouldn't be meaningful to make a car all at once. His destination is the forest near the smelting plant, where he can find what he wants, wood. Compared to stone, wood clearly has more advantages. It is not easily destroyed and is lighter. The most important thing is that, relatively speaking, it is also more time-saving to make things with wood. Without advanced metal smelting, wood is obviously the most suitable material for making a transport vehicle. Yes, Lord God of the Hills. The dwarves finally stood up and followed the God of the Hills to the forest near the smelting plant. Lord God of the Hills, please forgive me for being rude. What are we here for? The leader knelt on the ground, not daring to lift his head. Of course, it's related. First, cut down this tree for me. Zhou Yu pointed to the giant tree behind him, with a diameter of nearly one meter, and said to the crowd. The dwarves looked at each other. This is not a difficult thing to do, so why? They immediately took out their axes. Compared to the axes Zhou Yu knew, the ones they made were relatively larger. The sharp blade alone was nearly half a meter long. The dwarves' strength was unusually strong. Although their bodies were round, almost every part of them was muscle. With one axe, a big gap appeared at the base of this towering tree in an instant. Oh wow! Zhou Yu couldn't help but applaud in his heart. This axe is impressive. However, after the dwarves took a very short time to cut down this giant tree, Zhou Yu was even more surprised. Lord God of the Hills, what do we do next? The dwarves gasped for breath, waiting for further instructions. Cut down this section of the tree trunk into pieces about this size. Zhou Yu gestured, indicating a width of about 10 centimeters. The dwarves did as instructed, but this was relatively more difficult. Without inventing saws, the pieces of tree trunk they cut were uneven and not standardized. Zhou Yu endured it. This didn't have much impact. In any case, he had to create a prototype first. As for improvements, that could come later. After cutting four uneven pieces of wood, the basic material for the wheel that Zhou Yu wanted was also ready. The little ones held the wheels and were a bit at a loss. What is this for? Why cut out something that looks useless? Zhou Yu looked at the imperfect semi-finished product and had no intention of explaining to the dwarves. He was more concerned about the next item, which was the axle. The axle not only needed to be of uniform thickness but also needed to be strong enough. This could only be obtained from thinner branches. Cut a few branches, peel off the bark, and use the axe to shape them to have consistent thickness from top to bottom. Zhou Yu instructed a few dwarves to do this and floated over to the four pieces of wood. The branches quickly took on the shape he wanted, and Zhou Yu ordered the dwarves to find the center of the wood pieces and use the sticks to measure. Next, it is to use an axe to remove the excess wood from the center. The dwarves quickly completed the work. My people, now, combine these things. Zhou Yu commanded the dwarves to start assembling the wheels and axles. The finished product was quickly made. A sound of worship erupted, and Zhou Yu saw them prostrate on the ground again, 
raising their arms and chanting, Where had they seen this before? Lord of the hill god, may I ask what this is? The leader stood up and tried to touch it, and this crude thing actually rolled forward for a while. Zhou Yu was speechless. Have you dwarves never used your intelligence in this way? Have you never pushed a round stone? At the very least, have you never seen a round stone? Rolling it is the same thing. What if we put a layer of wood on top and have someone push it from behind? Zhou Yu asked in response. What would happen? The dwarves were still clueless, looking at each other. Zhou Yu was speechless. These people are really. Bring over longer slices of wood. Zhou Yu continued giving orders. The dwarves followed and cut a line across the giant tree horizontally, cut off a piece of trunk, and placed it in the designated position by Zhou Yu. Lord of the Hill God, may I ask? In front of everyone was an extremely crude four-wheeled cart, with a wooden board covering it, serving as the cargo platform that Zhou Yu wanted. Great Lord of the Hill God, we have made this sacred object, but how should it? Push, Zhou Yu said concisely. The dwarves followed suit. However, the long wooden board fell to the ground, and the front wheels rolled away while the back ones didn't move. Lord of the Hill God? The dwarves looked at Zhou Yu with puzzled eyes, seemingly not understanding his divine oracle at all. Zhou Yu was also embarrassed. In his imagination, this cart should roll further and further, but he forgot one thing. The cart board is movable. There is nothing to fix the wooden board to the axle, no nails. Zhou Yu was speechless. Making a cart is really damn difficult. Lord of the Hill God? In the eyes of the dwarves, this god seemed a bit unreliable. Zhou Yu shook his head. My people, follow me. Zhou Yu waved his hand and led the crowd to the smelting factory, of course, not forgetting the crude little cart. This is where the dwarves smelt, and since most of the people were brought to the forest by Zhou Yu, there were only a few dwarves specifically responsible for watching the furnace fire here. My people, create the sacred object. Zhou Yu placed in order. There was still one blast furnace that wasn't destroyed yesterday, and there were some remaining ores in charcoal. With the materials ready, it was up to the workers. Zhou Yu had also thought about using grass ropes instead of nails to connect the axle and the wooden board, but that would require drilling holes and paying attention to the wear of the ropes, so it was better to just use nails. After all, the dwarf smelting technology was so advanced that making a nail was no problem at all. Following the diagram drawn by Zhou Yu on the ground, the dwarves began their processing. Their speed was not slow. Following the original steps, they melted the ore into molten iron and finally made it into iron blocks. In a short time, they started making iron nails according to Zhou Yu's requirements. Unlike the modern iron nails that Zhou Yu knew, the ones made by the dwarves should be called extremely thin pointed iron rods. Better than nothing. The sacred object has been made, now, use a hammer to connect these two things. The dwarves accepted the divine oracle and successfully combined the wooden board with the axle using the still hot iron nails. After finishing this, Zhou Yu can finally prevent this shabby looking car from falling apart with just a push. The dwarves followed Zhou Yu's instructions and pushed again. However, Lord of the Hill God, but we can't push it. The dwarves pushed the car, but the wheels didn't budge. Zhou Yu was speechless, what was the problem this time? He checked it out. My foolish subjects, can't you make the hole you dug on the wheel bigger than the axle of the car? The invention of the new car seemed to have encountered some setbacks. After solving one problem, another one arose, which made Zhou Yu anxious. However, he suppressed his annoyance, at least the car was made properly. The dwarves became anxious and bowed their heads, knowing they had done something wrong to make the Lord of the Hill God so angry. However, according to the Oracle of the Hill God, they removed the four wheels, enlarged the small hole, and put them back on. To prevent them from falling off or sliding, the dwarves used iron nails to secure the connection between the wheels and the axle on both sides. At least it was fixed. The crude little car was finally completed. Lord of the Hill God. Lord of the Hill God. The leader of the dwarves pushed the car excitedly. He pushed the car around the smelting factory several times. All the dwarves understood why the Lord of the Hill God wanted to make this thing. In order to test its load-bearing capacity, Zhou Yu ordered the dwarves to sit on it while other dwarves pushed it. He observed that apart from a little bumpiness, it was fine. The dwarves saw this treasure that was made and imagined the future. This could solve the transportation problem. Lord of the Hill God, now we only need one or two people to transport stones, fruits, or prey. After pushing it a few more times, the dwarves were extremely excited. Zhou Yu nodded, feeling a sense of accomplishment. The hard work paid off. The first car made by Chiu Shang. In his excitement, he also had some expectations. This car was just a model, and in every aspect, it was extremely rough. Compared to the various mature transportation tools on earth, it was simply too poor. 
However, he believed that these dwarves would gradually improve this new means of transportation and make it more convenient and sturdy. Perhaps this would take a considerable amount of time. With convenient transportation tools, they could allocate more labor to where it was needed, obtain more prey and fruits, and feed more people. The increase in productivity would also lead to a growing population of the entire tribe. He believed that soon, the dwarves would spread throughout every corner of the plateau on this continent. Joe you didn't forget to use his mind to create another transport vehicle. Of course, without the inconvenient axe and without the clumsy dwarves, the car he made was exceptionally beautiful. Lord of the Hill God, the dwarves prostrated themselves on the ground, constantly rubbing their hands in worship. My people, the gods will watch over you. Joe you said these words, controlled the stone statue, and flew up to a height that the dwarves couldn't see, disappearing without a trace. Joe you threw the stone statue into the forest, thinking about the dwarves. This race, with a higher level of civilization, seemed to be able to enter the next stage of civilization faster compared to the lizardmen and the white wolf tribe. With much stronger means of transportation than before, they could also raise productivity to a higher level. With more prey and a supply greater than demand, the dwarves would gradually expand their population and move out of their not-so-spacious caves. Then, larger tribes will be established, even divided into many tribes. Zhou Yu's thoughts drifted far away, even thinking about the distant future. On the plains, there are strange relationships between the red-haired apes and the black-haired apes. On the plateaus, there are more advanced civilizations of the dwarf race. What will this continent develop into in the future? Zhou Yu looked at the boundary between the plateau and the plains and decided not to change the terrain of this area. It would be better for them to be isolated for a while. If the dwarves discover a forest area with more abundant and suitable food, civilization may stagnate. Zhou Yu circled around the star for a while. He suddenly noticed something. If he focused completely on rotation, time would pass much faster. On the other hand, if he focused on the surface of the sphere, especially during the Divine Presence, time would pass exceptionally slowly. He couldn't understand the principle behind this. Perhaps, this was the reason why everything on the planet became so fast after he transformed from a satellite to a planet. After rotating for a while, Zhou Yu refocused his attention on his own sphere. In addition to the three lands inhabited by the lizard people, the white wolf tribe, and the dwarves, there were six other lands that he had not explored. Although he said that, he hadn't thoroughly searched these three lands that he had already explored. He had no concept of whether there were any other intelligent beings on these lands or how many there were. The three chosen races were just very lucky in Zhou Yu's eyes. They were lucky to be discovered by him and lucky to have their civilization propelled. That was all. But if there were their own kind or other intelligent beings on the land, their civilization would eventually conquer, enslave, and slaughter other civilizations. This was a law of development. If we were to make an analogy, these three races were like the special little red and green ones that he had chosen in the beginning. As for the others who were not chosen, they only had two options, either accelerate their evolution or die. Zhou Yu didn't think there was anything wrong with his interference. It was just to make the creatures smarter, stronger, and more suitable for survival on his sphere. It was the law of the survival of the fittest. Even if it was somewhat unfair. If we had to be serious, then these three races were the lucky ones favored by the will of the planet. Zhou Yu thought about this and looked at another land. Unlike the previous three, this one had a much larger area. Zhou Yu always had a feeling that he was slightly larger than the earth in size. He looked down at the sphere and roughly calculated in earth's measurements. Even the smaller land of the white wolf tribe was much larger than Africa. Globally, there were nine lands of almost the same size. Simple calculations showed that he was several times larger than the earth. The area of land he was currently observing was the largest among the nine lands. It was located between the temperate and cold zones of the northern hemisphere. What kind of intelligent beings would there be here? With plateaus, mountains, deserts, basins, hills, plains, swamps, and a large number of lakes, this land had almost all types of terrain and landforms. The lush grasslands were the main theme of this continent, with dense forests only growing in low-latitude areas. Most of the high-latitude areas were frozen soil and wasteland, with a small amount of coniferous forests. However, Zhou Yu also noticed that the animal and plant resources here seemed quite abundant due to the large latitude span and complex terrain. He had just lowered his gaze when he saw a vast multitude of animals running on the vast grasslands, with a large army of white birds flying together like a curtain. Countless wild animal calls echoed through the grasslands and forests. It seems that this area has a considerable amount of food compared to the other three lands. So, what would intelligent human-like beings look like? Would their tribes become stronger because of abundant food? With these questions in mind, Zhou Yu continued to carefully search for any traces of human activity in the forests and grasslands. 
Day and night, the cycle repeated. Zhou Yu almost searched the entire coastline, thoroughly searched the nearby forests, and needless to say, there were no traces of humanoid creatures on the grasslands. He thought he might have missed something and carefully examined it again. However, he still found nothing. Could it be that there really was nothing? He looked towards the deserts and even the high-latitude permafrost regions. Only these barren areas had not been searched. However, Zhou Yu quickly discovered that there seemed to be something between the desert and the grasslands. He narrowed his gaze and immediately noticed these unusual things. They were hundreds of crude houses built entirely of dark stones, hidden among the rocks in the desert. Zhou Yu did not believe that these stone houses, built with the help of cliffs and three giant stones, were natural formations. Especially when he saw countless animal skins drying on the outside of the stone houses, he became even more certain that this was the crystallization of the wisdom of some mysterious tribe. However, strangely enough, he had been observing for a while, and there was still no movement here, only the howling of the wind passing by. Strange. No one, not even any living creatures. Complete silence. Could it be that the civilization here has already perished? No, the degree of drying of those animal skins was not that severe, which proved that someone had recently lived here. With doubts in his mind, Zhou Yu focused his gaze on these stone houses. He unexpectedly discovered something that he had never seen in other races inside the stone houses. A bed. It was rectangular in shape, about half a meter above the ground, and covered with grass-green leather. What else could this be if not a bed? Zhou Yu couldn't think of any other use for it. It seems that this place is inhabited by a fairly advanced civilization, right? He really wanted to think so, but among the hundreds of stone houses, there was really no sign of any living beings. Zhou Yu carefully inspected the stone houses again and suddenly discovered something new. They were stone containers filled with gray or yellow-red square crystals. What is this? Crystal? Gemstone? Do they even have this kind of luxury item consciousness? With a thought, Zhou Yu lifted one of the crystals into the air to observe it carefully. Unlike the gemstones he was familiar with, this crystal seemed a bit dirty, more like a semi-transparent stone filled with dust-like impurities. When two crystals lightly collided, some debris actually fell off. What the hell is this? I didn't mean to do that. Zhou Yu quickly put the fragile item back and searched the same stone houses, finding that almost every one of them had almost identical decorations, and even many of those fragile gemstones. Just as he was puzzled, he heard a gradually approaching sound of footsteps. Footsteps? People? Zhou Yu excitedly turned his gaze in the direction of the footsteps and indeed saw a group of humanoid creatures. After seeing their appearance, Zhou Yu couldn't help but sneer. Although I am used to mocking the appearance of the intelligent beings on my sphere, this time the impact brought by them still made it difficult for me to accept. They have sheep heads on human-like bodies, covered in short brown fur, walking upright. With brown horizontal pupils, beside their faces covered in brown short hair, there are long ears hanging down, resembling triangles, and a nose like a black stone embedded in their faces, opening and closing. Some of them even have two horns on their heads, resembling crescent moons, adding to their strangeness. Zhou Yu looked at their limbs, where hooves should be, but instead, there were palms with three slender fingers, and the same goes for their feet, which looked even more bizarre. Zhou Yu also noticed that even though they had fine hair on their bodies, they were wearing crude clothes made of large leaves, looking out of place. Sheep people? Sheep monsters? Zhou Yu didn't know how to refer to these creatures that seemed to be a combination of human and sheep genes, especially when he saw them grabbing a piece of dried meat and putting it in their mouths, revealing their tiger-like teeth. Sheep eating meat? Zhou Yu thought he must have been mistaken. But what they were eating was meat with bones, right? He couldn't help but mock silently, cats that look like cats eat vegetables, and sheep that look like sheep eat meat. Well, forget it, Zhou Yu didn't want to talk about the strange things in the evolutionary tree anymore. The ones in the sea were even more bizarre than them. Since they were here, he might as well accept it. Numb to it, you can grow however you want, I'll just watch casually. The sheep people didn't have any weapons or tools in their hands, and they casually walked into the stone houses. After Zhou Yu followed them in, he suddenly noticed that they were all licking something crystal-like. Watching them lick and squint their eyes in enjoyment, Zhou Yu suddenly remembered, could this crystalline thing be rock salt? He couldn't help but lean over to a sheep person who was licking it and stuck out his slender tongue. Damn, it's so salty. Zhou Yu, who immediately tasted it, couldn't help but shiver. These sheep people have quite a taste. It really is rock salt. After withdrawing his tongue, the uncomfortable feeling disappeared. Zhou Yu looked at the sheep people who were still licking the salt, completely unaware that they had been tasted by him, and they closed their eyes, looking extremely satisfied. He looked at what the sheep people were holding. It was indeed meat, but it wasn't roasted meat as he had imagined. It looked more like cured meat, or a kind of dried meat. 
Looking up at the roof, Zhou Yu noticed some pieces of dried meat that he hadn't noticed before, covered with a thin layer of white crystals. There was no doubt that it was salt. They actually rubbed salt on the meat. Zhou Yu was extremely curious about this. How advanced has their civilization progressed to have a sense of seasoning? After finishing the meat and licking the salt, the sheep people started to gather outside again, and then, along a small path, they walked towards a cliff. Zhou Yu was puzzled. What was there? He narrowed his vision, but there was nothing at the bottom of the cliff, just bare and empty, not even a blade of grass grew. What were they going there for? To dance in the square? However, when he saw the sheep people skillfully climbing the steep cliff, Zhou Yu finally understood why they came here. But what was on the cliff? A lush green. It was an endless grassland, and neatly arranged low wooden fences that were almost the same color as the grassland. Wait, wooden fences? Zhou Yu suddenly realized something was wrong. There were wooden fences here? And they were so short? What were they used for? The sheep people successively reached the top of the cliff, and then entered the wooden fences. Suddenly, on the dense grassland less than half a meter high, like a stone thrown into a pond, ripples splashed. A large number of animals with gray fur emerged from the grass, nervously observing their surroundings. Upon careful observation, Zhou Yu discovered that these animals had round heads and neat teeth like cows and sheep. The largest of them was only about 30 centimeters long, with short tails and a round and chubby body. Their small eyes were like black beans. Zhou Yu also noticed that after a moment of tension, these small animals burrowed into the messy nest made of sticks and branches to hide. The sheep people circled inside, then jumped out of the fence. What were they going to do? Wasn't this fence supposed to be their new habitat? Weren't these small animals inside? Shouldn't they be cleared out? With these doubts, Zhou Yu continued to follow the traces of the sheep people. Not far from this place was a large patch of sparse bushes. The sheep people's destination seemed to be there. Zhou Yu saw that once they entered, they started to work busily. Could it be that they were going to eat fruits? Indeed, there were many bushes with ripe red fruits. They didn't just eat meat, but also fruits. They were quite similar to humans now, eating everything. Sure enough, the sheep people came out carrying countless fruits. Zhou Yu then saw that the sheep people returned to the wooden fence, jumped in, and threw all the fruits inside. The chubby little animals immediately emerged and crazily fought over the fruits, eating voraciously. Suddenly, Zhou Yu had a sudden realization. Could it be? Looking at the current scene, Zhou Yu understood that the sheep people had mastered the civilization of domestication. Or rather, they had mastered the most primitive animal husbandry techniques. The small animals inside the fence, while eating the fruits, seemed to completely ignore the sheep people who were constantly moving around them. After they were full, they carried the remaining fruits back to their nests and fed the squeaking cubs inside. The sheep people would occasionally wander around the nests of the small animals, picking up some with their three fingers, observing them, and then putting them back. However, Zhou Yu also saw that in the end, the sheep people caught some larger and fatter ones and jumped out of the fence. When they returned to the sheep people near the stone house in the Gobi, they quickly took out stone blades, killed the animals, removed the fur and bones, and brought back the bloody meat, skillfully performing the actions. Then, they took some rock salt from the stone house, smashed it into powder with stones, and spread it on the meat. The hornless sheep people placed the meat on the roof of the stone house to dry. After watching for a while, Zhou Yu finally understood the specific level of civilization of this sheep people tribe. They didn't know how to use fire, didn't have any decent tools, let alone the technology of metal smelting. However, they knew how to raise animals, as well as simple pickling and seasoning. This sheep people tribe was really strange. Leaving aside how the sheep-headed human-bodied form evolved and why they ate meat, Zhou Yu was more curious about one thing. How did these guys manage to survive without extinction? The population of the tribe was too small, even comparable to the nearly extinct white wolf tribe that was being killed. Their civilization was basically stuck in the earliest stage of the Stone Age. Eating so much salt and preserved food every day, wouldn't they get high blood pressure or heart disease? From any perspective, their civilization was at an extremely low level. If one were to intervene in fire, cooked meat, pottery, metallurgy, rope making, transportation, it seemed like there was more to do than with those lizard people back then. Did they really have to guide them one by one? The backward sheepman tribe has not been extinct until now, probably because there are no stronger tribes. He decided to search in other parts of the Gobi Desert. This civilization is really terrible. If he can't find any other civilization, he will reconsider. With some regret, Zhou Yu raised his gaze and began to carefully scan the thousands of kilometers of the Gobi Desert. It seems like the early days of a planet here, without a trace of life. No rivers, no lakes, and nothing related to water. Endless rocks and extremely dry ground, not even a trace of wild grass. Zhou Yu can conclude that besides that small group of sheepmen, there will be no other creatures here. 
It seems that the land is too vast, which is not a good thing. And the depths of the Gobi, the larger desert, is more like a sea of death, becoming a forbidden zone for life along with the Gobi. Zhou Yu shifted his gaze back to the sheepmen. After all, they are intelligent creatures, much better than fish monsters or black-haired red-haired apes. Why not try to teach them, at least to learn how to use fire and eat cooked meat? Then, what method should be used to guide these sheepmen? He didn't want to use the power of a god, maybe he could create a puppet like he did with the dwarves and become a god of the Gobi, or something? Zhou Yu now has a deeper understanding of his abilities. He can manipulate anything on the planet as long as his imagination is strong enough. He can control rain, snow, clouds, and thunder, create various weather conditions, as long as it doesn't cause disasters, he can do anything. He can possess any living being and experience everything on this planet from their subjective perspective. He can also inhabit the body of inanimate objects. He can use trees, rocks, or any material to create anything and can even reside in them. In addition to his previous ability to manipulate multiple organisms, Zhou Yu realized that he can do anything he wants within the sphere of his influence. Furthermore, he can now understand the voices of creatures without the need for godly possession. Among the many abilities, he decided to use the one he just used to guide the sheepmen. Becoming a god of the Gobi and taking advantage of the primitive nature and ignorance of the sheepmen, he will help them acquire advanced civilization. This method seems relatively better. With this in mind, Zhou Yu shortened the distance between him and the sheepmen who were gathering near a rock house. So, let's listen to what they are talking about. Zhou Yu activated his ability. E, E, Ha, what's going on? I clearly activated the ability to listen to language. Why is it still this kind of sound? Let's try again. E, O, E. The sheepmen's cries did not turn into language. Zhou Yu was puzzled. He instantly teleported to the dwarf tribe and used the same ability. Great Hills. He could understand the voices of these worshippers. Could it be that this ability can only understand the dwarves? He teleported to the Lizardman tribe, which was already prosperous. There are more prey. Will of fire. Will of fire. He could understand. What about the white wolf tribe? Zhou Yu teleported to the tribe that already had hundreds of people. We're going to show off. Ah, uh, he could understand. This is strange. Zhou Yu returned to the sheepmen tribe again. E, E, E. He seemed to understand something instantly. The sheepmen do not have their own language. Or, to put it another way, they are unable to produce similar sounds. The pale blue organ in their throats, the vocal cords, has not evolved to generate a complex language system. He he, what exactly is this race? Human-like, yet not quite human. Zhou Yu is somewhat conflicted, unsure how to proceed. Without language, it is impossible to communicate with them. Maybe he should try divine possession? Zhou Yu instantly possesses a sheep-like being. E. Damn. Even the sounds he hears are strange like this. Zhou Yu is completely speechless. He releases the divine possession, knowing that he may not be able to do much. Without verbal communication, even with only body language, he cannot convey his intended meaning correctly. Not even with the simplest divine possession can they understand. Is there really no way? Must he give up on this civilization? The sheep-like beings all stand up together and Zhou Yu watches as they enter the largest stone house in the area. One, two, three. Zhou Yu counts, there are a total of 31 sheep-like beings going in. Wait, how can so many people fit in such a small stone house? He immediately shifts his gaze and follows them inside. The size of this stone house is unexpectedly spacious, with no decorations. The walls of the house are a deep cave with a diameter of over 3 meters. No wonder more than 30 sheep-like beings disappeared inside, they must have come here. Zhou Yu looks at the entrance of the cave and realizes that it seems to extend downwards. The sound of the sheep-like being's footsteps continues to echo inside. His visual system can ignore the darkness, a mere unlit cave cannot hinder him. However, after advancing more than 10 meters, Zhou Yu suddenly sees a blue-white light coming through not far ahead. Light? Don't the sheep-like beings not know how to use fire? What is this light? Zhou Yu carefully observes and realizes that this blue-white light is not a flame, but more like fluorescent light that is much brighter. Is it fluorescent light? As the cave goes deeper, the tunnel becomes wider and the strange light becomes clearer. This light allows Zhou Yu to see the entire tunnel of the cave even without using night vision. The sheep-like beings enter a deeper area, while Zhou Yu stops. In his line of sight, he is completely enveloped by the blue-white light. He observes carefully and discovers that the fluorescence on the stone wall is not something applied, but rather plants with strange luminescent abilities. These plants, tightly attached to the stone wall, appear more like a strange moss from the outside. The brightness emitted by this fluorescent moss is very high. Zhou Yu believes that even if it is already late at night outside, this cave would still be as bright as daylight. 
And it is thanks to this luminescent moss that the sheep-like beings are able to enter this cave. Zhou Yu continues to follow his line of sight and catches up with one of the sheep-like beings who has been walking deeper. After a while, the sheep-like beings finally stop, and Zhou Yu's line of sight moves forward, seeing an exceptionally vast space. Above the rock formations hundreds of meters high, there were glowing mosses that illuminated the entire space as if it were daytime. The ground was flat and smooth, with a clear and cool underground river flowing silently, occasionally revealing strange aquatic creatures. The walls were covered with countless clusters of rock salt crystals, densely packed together. Hundreds of sheep people were diligently hammering them with stones. In the central part of this space, which was almost the size of several football fields, Zhou Yu saw small houses built almost entirely of rock salt. More sheep people were moving around nearby. Could this be the true tribe of the sheep people? Zhou Yu felt that he had underestimated these sheep people from the beginning. Although they couldn't use fire or engage in metal smelting, it seemed that they had developed civilization in a different direction. Unlike the crude rock houses he had seen outside, these houses made of rock salt seemed much more refined. The rectangular rock salt crystals were stacked together, and even had something resembling a door curtain made of grass. In front of the salt houses, a group of sheep people were filling containers made of stone with crushed rock salt, grinding it into powder with wooden sticks. Then, the powder was poured into boxes made of wood. These boxes seemed to be carved out of a whole piece of wood with tools, and were quite exquisite. The boxes were then sealed with dry straw and handed to the sheep people who had just arrived from outside. Carrying these wooden boxes, the sheep people returned the way they came, and Zhou Yu curiously followed them back outside. After bringing out a considerable amount of dried meat, they continued along a steep mountain path for a long time until they stopped at the edge of a large, sparse forest. Then, Zhou Yu suddenly saw some familiar-looking dwarves walking out from inside, which surprised him. These were actually a group of dwarves. Unlike the dwarves on the mainland he had seen before, these dwarves seemed to have evolved better. Their fur was sparse, and they didn't have the large beards that the previous dwarves had. Although they were also very short, their muscles were not prominent, and they appeared chubby overall. These dwarves were also only wearing simple animal skins, and the patterns on the animal skins were surprisingly the same as those of the small animals raised by the sheep people. Zhou Yu was puzzled. Where did these dwarves come from? If they were so close, shouldn't they all be sheep people? How did the dwarves end up here? Zhou Yu looked at another piece of land, which was separated from this land by a large sea. He suddenly had a bold idea. Could it be that when he divided the land, he also separated the tribes of the dwarves? Or perhaps these dwarves evolved from the primitive dwarves on this continent? However, this was just speculation. They might have traveled long distances from the divided borderlands to this place for recuperation. Zhou Yu saw that the dwarves seemed to be holding a small pile of something in their hands. Ha! Huh? Those were, obviously gemstones. Unlike the rock salt he had seen before, these crystalline objects had bright and pure colors, even shining brightly in the dirty hands of the dwarves. So, the sheep people had rock salt and dried meat, while the dwarves wanted gemstones. Could it be that? The sheep people handed over the wooden boxes and dried meat to the dwarves, making a horsey sound. The dwarves nodded and also came out in the same number, taking the items from the other side and placing gemstones in the hands of the sheep people at the same time. The sheep people seem to really like this kind of gemstone. They keep rubbing it on their fur, even holding it up to the stars and opening their mouths wide. The dwarves, on the other hand, are smiling happily as they look at the rock salt and dried meat. It seems that these things are even more important to them than gemstones. They are trading. Trading. Zhou Yu suddenly feels an uncontrollable excitement in his heart. It is almost unimaginable that the seemingly backward sheep people have learned how to trade. This is truly happening right before his eyes. These two different races are using barter to seek what they want, instead of through war and plunder. Isn't this a great progress? Zhou Yu is not sure if there has been any conflict between these two races before, or if they have fought each other to the death for what they wanted. But now, it seems that they are using this peaceful method of exchange to meet each other's needs, which is a significant development in the evolution of the civilization of the entire planet. The dwarves value salt and dried meat very much, and they probably have a developed mining industry for the gemstones they use to trade with the sheep people. In order to obtain these gemstones, the sheep people even have a considerable salt mining and livestock industry. This can be described as each taking what they need and mutually promoting each other's development. It is likely that the fur the dwarves wear is also obtained through barter, right? Zhou Yu has never seen or even thought of such a symbiotic civilization system before. Even the sheep people, who do not have their own language system, are not as backward as he imagined. The consciousness they possess is even more advanced than all the races he has seen before. If they can continue their civilization, they will probably become a very powerful merchant race. As for the dwarves in this land, 
Zhou Yu feels that they are much more backward compared to what he has seen before, except for their ability to trade. Currently, it seems that they have to trade with the sheep people even for food. They probably do not have mature smelting techniques and do not have decent hunting abilities. Before trading with the sheep people, they probably barely survived on fruits and tree roots. In order to verify his conjecture, Zhou Yu keeps looking ahead and enters a vast sparse jungle. Sure enough, not far into it, he sees a somewhat hidden underground building complex. It is called a building complex, but it actually looks more like small mounds, with only a small doorway left, even covered, and hidden with straw and tree branches. It is inconspicuous, and even if someone passes by, they would only think that it has been dug by some animal or is a bird's nest. Zhou Yu had carefully searched this area before, but at that time, he thought it was just ordinary terrain and didn't pay much attention. Now, seeing this, the dwarves have indeed hidden themselves quite well. The dwarves quickly come over with salt and dried meat, and each of them enters a small mound, burying the entrance again after a short while. Ha! Huh? Isn't this a place to live? Just a warehouse? Zhou Yu is somewhat surprised, but looking around carefully, there is really no trace of their activity here. Could it be that their place of residence is not here after all? Zhou Yu's gaze follows the dwarves holding the dried meat and notices that not long after, they come out from another direction in the forest and head straight for a desert with giant rocks. Could it be that their tribe is located over there? Zhou Yu raises his gaze and heads in that direction, and sure enough, between the giant rocks and the desert, he sees a quite hidden cave. He he, the dwarves really like caves, don't they? How come they're all like this? The tunnels in the cave are not long, but as you go further in, there is a shining, flickering red light, which is obviously fire. Now, apart from the lizard men encountered at the beginning, the extinct black wolf tribe, and the recent sheepman tribe, Zhou Yu found that the remaining civilizations all knew what fire was used for. The dwarves in the cave were no exception. It's just that, in front of Zhou Yu, the dozen or so tiny flames proved that this group of dwarves had a different civilization. They seemed to have made lamps. Or rather, they made something similar to candles. In Zhou Yu's line of sight, beneath the burning flames was a dark rope, with the other end soaked in lamp oil like water. The lamp oil was soaked in a roughly made metal bowl, which also told Zhou Yu that this group of dwarves had quite impressive metallurgical skills. The lamp, a new technology developed from fire. Its principle is the same as a torch, but there is no need to worry about it burning out at any time, just fill it with lamp oil from time to time. This undoubtedly makes full use of the characteristics of fire and can be widely used in many fields. For example, taking it to deep mines to search for gem-like ores. Compared to the previous dwarves, they seem to have not shifted their focus to hunting and gathering fruits, but instead used trade with the sheepmen to save time and focus on mining and developing their tribe. They understood better than any other race how to utilize resources. Otherwise, they wouldn't have such a large population, right? In Zhou Yu's field of vision, there were nearly six or seven hundred dwarves squatting on the ground, talking about something. This also included women and children, it seems their population is quite large. He had a thought and used his ability. Leader, the food we obtain from them is enough for us to venture into deeper areas. That's right, leader, these dried meats will last us a longer time, as long as we find more flame stones, they will give us more food. But we can't go any further, some brothers have disappeared inside before, what if? Yes, leader, I also think it's fine to maintain the status quo. Zhou Yu immediately heard their voices. It seems that, as he guessed, this group of dwarves has already established a cycle in their civilization, which is to use gems to obtain food and then use food to find more gems. This seems to be a virtuous cycle, as long as the sheepmen like gems, the dwarven mining industry will gradually become more developed, and their race will become more prosperous. As for the sheepmen, they will raise more animals and mine more rock salt, and they will also progress. The premise is that the sheepmen can maintain a sustained interest in gems. However, this is a false proposition. Zhou Yu cannot know what the silent sheepmen mean, otherwise, he could help these dwarves make a judgment on whether to continue or not. Everyone, stop talking, I have my own judgment. If there are no objections, we will go down now and search for more flame stones. The bulliest dwarf among them interrupted the noisy voices of the crowd, his deep voice sounding exceptionally commanding. Understood. The responses were varied, but they had no choice but to obey the leader's words. The dwarves stood up one after another. After they walked out of this mountain cave, they brought with them lamps, dried meat, wooden sticks, and a large number of metal picks, and came to a cave hidden at the bottom of a huge rock. Zhou Yu suddenly felt that the actions of these dwarves were not what a mature civilization should have. Why should everyone go mining? Can't they do something else? Even if it's just picking wild fruits or making weapons? However, his gaze still followed them into the mine. The mine was not spacious, with a diameter of only about 2 meters. The rock walls did not have the glowing moss that the sheep people had, 
and the dwarves could only slowly move along a not steep slope with their lamps held up. Zhou Yu looked at the rock walls and found that they seemed to be naturally formed and had been developed by the dwarves to become so smooth and flat. The further the dwarves went, the fewer traces of artificial intervention in the mine tunnels, until in the end, there were only a large number of stalactites and other landforms left. After a while, the dwarves finally stopped, and Zhou Yu noticed that they had come to a vast underground space. Unlike the sheep people's rock salt mine, this space did not have a towering cave roof, nor did it have a flat ground. Instead, there were countless boulders scattered everywhere within sight. And in one corner of this space, there was a naturally formed tunnel that extended further down. This might be the deeper area that the dwarves mentioned. Zhou Yu noticed that many boulders with a diameter of nearly 5 or 6 meters had been shattered on the walls of this huge space, and gravel-like things were scattered all over the ground. To be honest, this mine was completely unsafe. With just a minor earthquake, it would quickly become the grave of this group of dwarves. However, Zhou Yu had control over earthquakes in his own world, so as long as he didn't intentionally cause trouble, these dwarves could continue mining here for a long time. Did those gravel-like stones really contain the so-called flame stones? Zhou Yu decided not to leave here for the time being. He wanted to take a good look at how these dwarves mined. When he was on that piece of land before, he didn't pay much attention to what mining was like, but now that he had finally followed them here, he might as well take a good look. What if he could bring this advanced mining technology to other civilizations in the future? That would be necessary. The dwarves immediately scattered, forming small teams of 20 people, lighting torches with their lamps placed by their sides, and using metal picks to strike the rock walls. The clanging sound created echoes, making this originally quiet space suddenly lively. Zhou Yu carefully observed them. The rock walls seemed quite thick, and Zhou Yu saw that they not only had metal picks, but also metal hammers and wedges to break more solid rock walls. The rocks kept falling off, but Zhou Yu knew that the red flame stones were still buried deeper. Should he bring them all out for them? Zhou Yu was well aware that the amount of red gemstones in this layer of rock where they were was not much. The idea that they mentioned earlier about the deeper area possibly having flame stones was purely speculative. Zhou Yu checked and found that there was almost nothing in the deeper area. Oxygen was the biggest enemy of this dwarf mining team. Chi -e. Chief. After working for several hours, the dwarves seemed a bit impatient. They had been digging for so long and hadn't even seen what the ore looked like. Don't stop, keep going. The chief commanded, understanding the current situation. Their ancestors had dug here countless times, and they were repeating the same process. Was there still flame stones in this mine? No one could be sure. At this point, should they go to the deeper mine? But, chief, we think we should go to the deeper area. Otherwise, who knows? Gawawawawa. A roar that seemed to come from a wild beast suddenly echoed through the mine. Joe, you followed the river upstream and discovered that the areas it passed through seemed to be abundant in rainfall, with dense tributaries. No wonder the entire river was almost located in a valley. This was not good news for the dwarves downstream. He began to use his abilities, cutting off and redirecting almost all of the tributaries, separating the main river in the area where the dwarves were located into several channels, diverting some and converging several hundred meters away. This way, even if there was a sudden heavy rain that he didn't notice, the river, which had already become low in water volume and slow in flow, would not suddenly rise and drown the dwarves, feeding them to the fish. Of course, Zhou Yu also knew that the dwarves, who had traveled a long way to the central part of the land, probably had enough experience to deal with such situations. They wouldn't be foolish enough to build their excavated caves too close to the water's edge. He came back to check and sure enough, it was the case. The entire river valley was nearly 50 meters high, and the prototype of the dwarves' excavated caves was located around 20 meters. Most of this area was made up of fragile rock formations similar to limestone. The dwarves had almost effortlessly excavated them during the time before Zhou Yu returned. It seemed that they might really be the remnants of the dwarves on the mainland, with the height of their caves not much different. This height not only prevented water disasters caused by sudden rises in the river, but also avoided wild beasts that didn't know how to search for food. It was a very clever choice of location. However, until the caves were completely dug out, it seemed that they could only camp for now. Zhou Yu saw that the dwarves had brought a considerable amount of hay and found some branches nearby, placing them at a distance from the riverbank. With the addition of some black stones in their hands, it seemed that they were about to start a fire. Zhou Yu hadn't carefully observed how the white wolf tribe made fire, nor had he noticed it with the dwarves on the other continent. Now, seeing the behavior of the dwarves here, he seemed to understand how they had preserved the fire since they acquired it. The collision of flint produced sparks, which were then splashed onto flammable materials to ignite the flames if only it were really that simple. 
After a lot of effort and sweating, the dwarves finally ignited the pile of hay and hurriedly picked up branches and other things to put into the fire. Zhou Yu saw that they started putting things like tree roots into the fire. It seemed that they had already become accustomed to cooked food. However, they had already become somewhat dependent on salt, so it would probably take some time for them to adapt to tasteless food. Seeing this, Zhou Yu felt that the dwarves should have settled down here and he had prepared the environment for them. The rest was up to them. Whether they lived or died, whether civilization would perish or revive, Zhou Yu could no longer interfere. He only hoped that the dwarves would forget their previous habits and not distort civilization in the future. Even if they regressed to a very simple way of life like now, it would be much better than before. As for what would happen afterwards, it was up to their own destiny. Taking his gaze away from the dwarves, Zhou Yu returned to the volcano. He quickly found the dinosaurs that had attacked the dwarves before, but he also discovered that there were many new bones in the dinosaurs' nests. These were obviously the dwarves who had been bitten or trampled to death by the dinosaurs in the underground space. This reminded him of that scene. Zhou Yu sighed deeply in his heart. Just eat, there is no plan to bury the corpses of these dwarves. They are just a part of the ecosystem, there is no need. If the dwarves from another continent encounter these three dinosaurs, maybe they will win. They are focused on finding food, unlike these people who are neglecting the essentials. Zhou Yu's gaze moved forward in the jungle of ferns, with countless insects, small animals, and dinosaurs constantly appearing. He estimated the area here, which is actually not large, only about 10 square kilometers. Previously, when he was searching for intelligent creatures from the sky, he did not find the reason for this place. He subconsciously believed that there would be nothing in the volcano. He also observed carefully and found that the dinosaurs here were not large in size, there were no huge creatures of tens of meters, but more like the ones attacking the dwarves, carnivorous dinosaurs of about 3 meters in size, and there were also a considerable number of herbivorous dinosaurs. However, they seemed to have evolved some strange features. Previously, Zhou Yu had dug up some fossils while searching for dinosaurs. He remembered that there were freaks with three or four eyes. Unexpectedly, he saw the real thing here. The herbivorous dinosaurs all had three or more eyes, which allowed them to observe any movement at a very fast speed within a short distance. They all looked strong and liked to live in groups. With the size of these small dinosaurs attacking the dwarves, it would be almost impossible for them to attack those herbivorous dinosaurs. Maybe as soon as they ran over there, they would be discovered and beaten up. The reason why the ecosystem in this volcano has not been destroyed is probably due to this. He suddenly wanted to give this place a name. The Forgotten Land. This is a place forgotten by time and the outside world. It is located within a nearly completely closed dormant volcano and has a unique natural ecosystem. Abundant rainfall, high temperature, and humidity. Zhou Yu felt that besides the greenhouse effect, he might also be controlling the volcano from erupting, and the movement of magma underground was the reason for the high temperature here. However, since this place has such a unique ecosystem, do other volcanoes around the world also have something similar? This seems quite interesting. He immediately turned his gaze to various volcanoes around the world and checked all of them that were not erupting. However, contrary to his expectations, besides this one, it seems that there is only one volcano in another unexplored land that has almost the same ecosystem. However, compared to the forgotten land in this volcano, Zhou Yu is more interested in something else. Are those dwarves? No, dwarves don't have such long arms and legs. What kind of humanoid is it? He couldn't help but mutter in his heart. They were wearing clothes made of large leaves and were busy collecting something in the mud by a fairly wide river. Zhou Yu narrowed his gaze and realized that he should take back some of his words. These people who were working with their backs bent were not humanoids, but humans who looked almost exactly like earthlings. Beasts? Zhou Yu was also stunned. In his opinion, there shouldn't be any beasts in this place. In the oxygen-depleted underground, there were no plants, and besides these dwarves, there were no other living creatures. Everywhere he looked, it was all rocks. In this environment, are there beasts? Zhou Yu didn't think he was hallucinating, and the dwarves felt the same way. The probability of beasts existing here is infinitely close to zero. What was that roar just now? Ao Ao. It seemed like the sound of a hungry stomach, and the beast's roar sounded again, and it seemed like more than one. The dwarves stood still like statues. They all stared at their leader, who was also uncertain, waiting for further instructions. Zhou Yu didn't have time to look at the expressions of the dwarves. He followed the direction of the roar and focused his gaze on the lower mine tunnel. As his gaze continued forward, Zhou Yu was surprised when he saw the appearance of the beast. A dinosaur? There was no mistaking it. These monsters, over three meters tall, covered in scales, with lizard heads, golden eyes, and countless sharp teeth, walking on two legs, what else could they be if not dinosaurs? 
But why would dinosaurs still exist? Why would they be here, hundreds of meters underground? It made no sense at all. According to reason, dinosaurs should have been extinct, they should have disappeared during the days Joey was asleep. He instantly remembered the turtle dragons with shells at the sea ice, weren't they also dinosaurs? Could it be that there were still a large number of dinosaurs in every corner of the sphere? Gah! The roar of the dinosaurs, like a curse drifting from hell, changed the dwarves' astonishment to fear, and then to panic and despair. Run, run! The leader shouted. He had already used the light of the fire to see the terrifying monsters poking their heads out of the mine tunnel. In the dim light, these ugly creatures looked even more terrifying. The dwarves were in a panic, even throwing their tools on the ground, crawling and rolling down into the mine tunnel. But these dinosaurs were even faster. They pounced on a dwarf's foot in the blink of an eye, and the sharp claws on their short, thick front paws instantly tore terrifying wounds on the screaming dwarf's body. Torn wounds, squeezed out organs, shattered bones, desperate screams. In just a few seconds, the flame of this dwarf's life was extinguished in a tragic manner. However, the three dinosaurs were not satisfied with just one prey. They wanted to go on a killing spree and hunt down all the moving pieces of meat. At this moment, Joe Yu watched coldly. He could easily grab these dinosaurs by the neck and throw them back to where they came from one by one. He could use his abilities to send the dwarves back to the surface in a short time. He could even, if he wanted to, crush and mash all the dinosaurs. However, he didn't do any of that. It was also at this moment that the dinosaurs caught their second and third prey. With incredibly terrifying screams, they also became delicious food. From the beginning, Zhou Yu felt that these dwarves seemed to rely too much on the flamestone. They even gave up searching for food themselves, abandoned the proper use of fire, and even made everyone come out to mine. After all, as long as they found this rare gem, the goat people would trade with them and provide meat jerky that could last a long time. Compared to these dwarves, although the civilization of the goat people was a bit behind, they did not rely on essential items for their lives. Even if the dwarves didn't give them the gem, these guys could do whatever they wanted. But for the dwarves, if the goat people stopped trading, what awaited them would be death. This was not an exaggeration. Joey you felt that this was highly possible. Who could guarantee that the taste of the goat people wouldn't change? Would it last forever? When that time comes, the reality waiting for the dwarves will be even more terrifying than these three dinosaurs. Here, dinosaurs may only be able to kill a dozen or so dwarves. But if the sheep people refuse to trade, all six or seven hundred of them will have to pay the price. The appearance of these dinosaurs happened to accomplish what Joe Yu wanted to do, shatter the dwarves' obsession with the flamestone. Although it is not known how these terrifying monsters can survive underground, they are indeed effective. At this moment, several dwarves' screams rang out again. Zhou Yu saw that the remaining dwarves were crying and rushing towards the exit, seemingly disregarding everything. They even threw their metal picks and oil lamps on the ground and stumbled along the pitch-black cave tunnel to escape. Due to fear and panic, coupled with the inability to see anything, these dwarves caused a serious trampling incident in the tunnel, and more than a dozen dwarves disappeared completely. The dinosaurs seemed unsatisfied with simply eating their prey, they seemed to enjoy the feeling of hunting and killing dwarves. Using their speed and sharp teeth and claws, they quickly killed several dwarves and then attacked new targets. Zhou Yu felt that this was going too far. The dwarves had already received enough lessons. Including the leader and those in the tunnel, nearly 50 or 60 dwarves had already died. If the dinosaurs were allowed to continue their killing spree, it would probably take the dwarf tribe decades to recover. With a thought, the dinosaurs were immediately bound, like sculptures. Even if they wanted to break free from this control, they were completely unable to do so. Several dwarves who had managed to save their lives crawled and screamed as they ran towards the cave exit. Zhou Yu looked at the corpses scattered on the ground, as well as the rocks soaked in red blood, quietly waiting for the dwarves to completely escape from this mine. After a while, he checked all the bodies and found that none of them were still alive. Then he turned his gaze to the dinosaurs. What kind of living environment do these creatures, which suddenly appeared hundreds of meters underground, have? In theory, their existence is a paradox. As ectothermic animals, dinosaurs should not be able to survive in such harsh environments. So where did they come from? Zhou Yu controlled the three dinosaurs and walked towards the place where they came out, which was the natural tunnel that led deeper underground. At first, it was almost pitch black, but after walking nearly a hundred meters, the slope suddenly steepened. As he continued forward, Zhou Yu suddenly saw many bones, metal picks, and extinguished torches on the ground. He didn't need to examine them closely to know that these were the dwarves' remains, the missing companions they had mentioned before. These dwarves ran to a deeper place in search of the flamestone, only to be discovered by the dinosaurs and become an easy meal. Greed really causes trouble. Zhou Yu sighed and suddenly noticed that the light in the cave, which was constantly ascending, 
had become much stronger. What's going on? Light? Moss? No, this is clearly a stronger and more natural kind of light. As his gaze moved forward, the intensity of the light reached its maximum, and the entrance of the cave was right in front of him. And outside the cave entrance, an incredible sight appeared. Zhou Yu saw a strange painting. Outside the cave exit was the interior of a completely dormant volcano. The light of the stars shone through the huge crater that had once erupted with scorching lava in ancient times, illuminating the various forms of fern plants. Bathed in the light, they grew recklessly, forming a vast jungle. In the jungle, there are countless lakes formed by water flowing from underground, creating mirror-like reflections. There are even underground rivers that connect these lakes, flowing slowly. Various strange and marvelous animal calls can be heard in the forest. Zhou Yu saw that there were tens of thousands of dinosaurs living here, as well as various strange-looking creatures. In this isolated paradise, the plants and animals have not been affected by the changes in the outside world, maintaining their ancient appearance and surviving and reproducing until now. Zhou Yu suddenly remembered hearing about the formation of a unique ecosystem in relatively closed environments, but he never expected to encounter such a situation in his own sphere. He looked at the cave and discovered that it seemed to be the nest of these dinosaurs, with many branches and other things piled inside. It seems that when the dwarves dug deep enough to reach that large space, the noise they made alerted the dinosaurs. They followed the noise and smelled the scent of the dwarves, resulting in an unexpected feast. It was probably the same this time. The greedy dwarves made even more noise, attracting the dinosaurs to venture down again and obtain a rich reward. Losing one-fifth of their population, and even their leader being killed, this dwarf tribe would probably be overshadowed by the dinosaurs for a long time and would not dare to enter the mine again. However, things are not absolute. Zhou Yu decided to deal with the dwarves' situation before carefully observing the small world and the volcano. He wanted to put an end to their thoughts of continuing to mine the flamestones here and focus on hunting, gathering fruits, digging roots, and smelting metals. They should do something productive instead of constantly thinking about trading gemstones with the sheep tribe. This kind of distorted trade is not what Zhou Yu wants to see. Thinking about the dwarves' compatriots on the other piece of land, their way of life is normal and civilized. Although the barter system is quite advanced, it appeared too early and is not normal. His gaze fell on the underground mine tunnel. After checking and confirming that there were no living dwarves left in the entire mining cave, he used his mind to block countless extremely hard boulders at the entrance of the dwarves' mine, completely sealing off the tunnel that led to the underground space. In this way, even if they dared to come over, they would not be able to do so. Unless they have more advanced smelting techniques and the determination to break open the nearby rocks to find the extremely rare flamestones in the rock layers. By then, what awaits them may be endless despair. Of course, this is also to protect the small ecosystem that exists in the volcano. Zhou Yu does not know how long this easily destructible ecosystem can last, but in the short term, he wants to see if the resilient plants and animals living inside will produce any new evolution. He missed a long period of time before and did not observe the specific process of how the lizardmen, white wolf tribe, dwarves, and sheep tribe evolved from animals into humans. But now, with such a closed ecosystem, it is not impossible for him to truly observe and witness it. After completing the task of completely sealing the cave, Zhou Yu looked at the dwarves and found that they had completely abandoned their previous caves and had collectively migrated. This was unexpected. He thought that these dwarves would continue to live in this place and slowly recover. However, upon careful consideration, this is indeed a logical and inevitable choice. After this mining expedition, they lost more than 60 people, most of whom were in their prime, including the tribe's leader. All the lamps, metal picks, and dried meat were buried underground. Even if Zhou Yu didn't seal the entrance, they would never dare to go down and search, as there were three terrifying monsters waiting below. Without food and tools to continue mining for gems, the dwarves had to find a new habitat and worry about tonight's meal. Zhou Yu didn't expect the dinosaurs to push the dwarves to this extent, but the development of events inevitably led to this outcome. Of course, if the dwarves were to establish a new tribe and prosper again, this disaster could be considered a blessing. However, if they were to collapse and completely fail to adapt to the changing life, eventually becoming mere passers-by in the age of civilization, it would only prove that they couldn't adapt to this world. Similarly, if it weren't for this disaster, they would likely continue to follow in the footsteps of the sheep people after losing interest in gems. No world adapts to people, it is people who must adapt to the world. Survival of the fittest means that only the stronger will have more opportunities for survival. The weaker ones, like these dwarves who rely entirely on the sheep people for food, will ultimately perish if they refuse to change. They will become abandoned children of civilization, fading away in the flow of time. The dwarves were lucky, after a long day of travel, they didn't encounter any danger and finally arrived near a valley with a slow-flowing stream. 
Zhou Yu breathed a sigh of relief when he saw them start picking the nearby fruits. The area seemed a bit dry, with limited food and poor soil, but relatively safe. Zhou Yu had noticed before that there were creatures similar to tigers and leopards around the sheep people's tribe, constantly hunting other animals. These carnivorous animals had also been active in the area where the dwarves were previously located. However, after reaching this river valley, Zhou Yu didn't find any traces of them, probably because there weren't many herbivorous animals in this area. The dwarves still had a few metal picks left, and the men began to excavate the mountain of the river valley. The women and children focused on picking fruits, and some brave ones even went into the water, seemingly trying to catch some fish. Seeing that the dwarves had settled down, Zhou Yu felt relieved. At least they hadn't completely forgotten how to survive. The future is for the strong, as long as they haven't forgotten what it means to be powerful. Zhou Yu followed the river upstream and found that the areas it passed through seemed to be abundant in rainfall and had numerous tributaries. No wonder the entire river was almost located within the valley. However, this was not good news for the dwarves downstream. He began to use his abilities, cutting off and redirecting almost all of the dozens of tributaries, separating the main river into several channels in the area where the dwarves were located, and merging them several hundred meters away. This way, even if there was a sudden heavy rain that he didn't notice, the river, which had already become slow and low in water, wouldn't suddenly rise and flood the dwarves, drowning them and feeding the fish. Of course, Zhou Yu also knew that the dwarves, who had traveled a long distance to reach the central location of the land, must have considerable experience in dealing with such situations. They wouldn't be foolish enough to build their excavated caves too close to the water's edge. He came back to check and sure enough, the entire river valley was nearly 50 meters high, with the dwarves' cave prototypes at around 20 meters. Most of this place was made up of a type of mountain that was similar to limestone, which the dwarves had already excavated with little effort before Zhou Yu returned. It seemed that they might actually be the descendants of the dwarves from the previous land, as the height of the caves was not much different. This height was quite cleverly chosen, as it could prevent sudden floods caused by the river from causing water disasters, and it could also avoid wild beasts that came in search of food. However, until the caves were completely dug, it seemed that they could only camp. Zhou Yu saw that the dwarves had brought a considerable amount of hay and had found some branches nearby, which they placed on the riverbank at a distance from the river. With the addition of some black stones in their hands, it seemed that they were about to start a fire. Zhou Yu had not carefully observed how the white wolf tribe made fire nor had he paid attention to the dwarves on the other continent. Now, seeing the behavior of the dwarves here, he seemed to understand how they had preserved the fire since they obtained it. The collision of flint stones produced sparks, which were then splashed onto flammable materials to ignite the flames if only it were really that simple. After a lot of effort and sweating, the dwarves finally ignited the pile of hay and hurriedly picked up branches and other things to put into the fire. Zhou Yu saw that they had started putting things like tree roots into the fire. It seemed that they had already become accustomed to cooked food. However, they had already become somewhat dependent on salt, so it would probably take some more time for them to adapt to tasteless food. Seeing this, Zhou Yu felt that the dwarves had probably settled down here and he had already prepared the environment for them. The rest was up to them. Whether they lived or died, whether civilization would perish or revive, Zhou Yu could no longer interfere. He only hoped that the dwarves would forget their previous habits and not distort civilization any further. Even if they degenerated into a very simple way of life like now, it was still much better than before. As for what would happen afterwards, it was up to their own destiny. After taking his eyes off the dwarves, Zhou Yu returned to the volcano. He quickly found the several dinosaurs that had attacked the dwarves before, but he also discovered that there were many new bones in the dinosaurs' nests. These were obviously the dwarves who had been bitten or trampled to death by the dinosaurs in the underground space. This reminded him of that scene again. Zhou Yu sighed deeply in his heart. Let them eat, he had no intention of burying the dwarves' bones. They were just a part of the ecological cycle, there was no need. If the dwarves from the other continent encountered these three dinosaurs, maybe they would win. They were actually thinking of ways to get food, unlike those people who were neglecting the essentials. Zhou Yu's gaze moved forward in the jungle of ferns, countless insects, small animals, and dinosaurs constantly appearing. He estimated the area here which was actually not large, only about 10 square kilometers. He hadn't discovered it before when he was searching for intelligent creatures in the sky, as he subconsciously believed that there wouldn't be anything in the volcano. He had also observed carefully and found that the dinosaurs were not large in size, there were no huge creatures tens of meters in size. Instead, there were mostly small to medium-sized carnivorous dinosaurs, about 3 meters in size, and a considerable number of herbivorous dinosaurs. However, they seem to have evolved some strange features. Previously, Zhou Yu had dug up some fossils while searching for dinosaurs. 
He remembered seeing freaks with three or four eyes, but he never expected to see them in person here. The herbivorous dinosaurs all have three or more eyes, which allow them to observe any movement at short distances with exceptional speed. They all look incredibly strong and enjoy living in groups. With the size of these small dinosaurs that attack dwarves, it would be almost impossible for them to attack. They would probably be discovered and beaten up as soon as they ran over there. The reason why the ecosystem in this volcanic crater has not been destroyed is probably due to this. He suddenly thought of giving this place a name. The Forgotten Land. This is a place forgotten by time and the outside world. It is located within a nearly completely sealed dormant volcanic crater and has a unique natural ecosystem. Abundant rainfall, high temperature, and humidity. Zhou Yu felt that besides the greenhouse-like effect, he might also be controlling the volcano from erupting, and the movement of magma underground might be the reason for the high temperature here. However, since this place has such a unique ecosystem, do other volcanic craters around the world also have something similar? This seems quite interesting. He immediately turned his gaze to various volcanic craters around the world and checked them all, as long as they were not erupting. However, contrary to his expectations, besides this one, it seems that there is only one other volcanic crater on another piece of unexplored land that is almost the same ecosystem. However, compared to the forgotten land in this volcanic crater, Zhou Yu is more interested in something else. Is that a dwarf? No, dwarves don't have such long limbs. What kind of humanoid is it? He couldn't help but mutter in his heart. They were wearing clothes made of large leaves and were busy collecting something in the mud by a fairly wide river. Zhou Yu looked closer and realized that he should take back some of his words. These people who were working with their backs bent were not humanoids but humans who looked almost identical to earthlings. Whether it was their facial features, body limbs, or behavior, they really looked almost the same as earthlings. Zhou Yu used to think that dwarves might be the only race on his planet that looked like earthlings, but now he unexpectedly found these guys on this continent, by the river next to the volcano, in an extremely accidental situation. What are the chances of evolving into a human-like appearance? Zhou Yu felt that this couldn't even be calculated with mathematical probability. Does this mean that on all planets with similar environments to Earth, intelligent beings with a similar appearance to humans will evolve? Or is this just an extremely low probability? It's really a mystery. Will there always be a place for humans in the evolution of life on the line of intelligent beings? However, after the excitement, Zhou Yu calmed down and realized that these humans were not completely similar to Earthlings either. Obviously, their cheekbones were higher, their heads were smaller, and their hair was thicker. They didn't walk completely upright, and their arms didn't seem as symmetrical as earthlings, giving the impression of being somewhat like orangutans. Their bodies were slightly overweight as well. Perhaps they haven't fully evolved into a human-like form yet? Or will they be like this in the future? Zhou Yu is not sure. This will require time to prove. However, with intelligent beings that are extremely similar to humans, Zhou Yu's excitement at this moment is even greater than when he saw the dwarves before. He feels that if these humans have needs, he will do his best to bring them more advanced civilizations. The lizardmen's hunting techniques, the white wolf tribe's watchtowers and fences, the dwarves' advanced smelting techniques, the sheepmen's animal husbandry. Anything that these humans don't have, Zhou Yu will patiently teach them. Biased? Zhou Yu knows that he does indeed have such an impulse when encountering intelligent beings more similar to humans. Compared to other races, Zhou Yu really wants to elevate the civilization of these humans to a higher level. If he were born with a lizard head as the dominant species on the planet, he would certainly be more biased towards the lizard men. What kind of psychology is this, he is not sure, but thinking like this should not be wrong, right? The appearance of humans is more familiar to him than other races. Of course, this bias is also limited which is to try not to let the civilization of humans diverge too far from that of other races. In that case, it would be like a reenactment of the conquerors enslaving and slaughtering the indigenous people after discovering a new continent. He will try to appear fairer. After all, everyone is a citizen of his own planet. Zhou Yu thought for a while and began to carefully observe these humans, wanting to see how far their civilization has progressed. Suddenly, he discovered that the things they were collecting seemed to be some kind of small green leafy plants, and these plants seemed to be growing. Somewhat neatly, he took a good look at this large area of plants growing on the fertile soil by the riverbank. Indeed, if ordinary plants grow without any regularity, growing wherever they can, the plants collected by these humans, although not completely parallel in growth, are quite orderly. And speaking of which, why do these humans go to pick these plants? It's not fruit, nor tree roots, so why plants? Could it be? Are these vegetables? Some kind of vegetable? Or are they cultivated? Zhou Yu began to boldly speculate. After all, after thinking it through, this is the only possibility. Humans who can cultivate vegetables. 
Just thinking about it feels amazing, right? This means that they can cultivate the land, sow seeds, water them, and harvest them. Utilizing the fertile land by the river to achieve self-sufficiency through farming, isn't this a quite advanced civilization? However, Joe you didn't get too excited because this was just a guess. What if it's not true? However, when he saw these humans binding the picked vegetable leaves with long dry grass and occasionally chewing on them, Joe you believed in his own speculation. These humans are really serious. Do they already have a primitive agricultural civilization? Zhou Yu suddenly felt that these humans seemed much more impressive than the humanoid beings he had encountered before. With an agricultural civilization, it means that the usual methods of hunting and gathering fruits and roots can no longer meet their growing needs, which means they have a considerable population. The explosion of population will bring more demands, more food, more clothing, more spiritual needs, improvements in tools, more advanced smelting techniques, the evolution of weapons. Zhou Yu dare not think further, that image is too beautiful. If it is really like that, even if he doesn't intervene, these humans will become the pinnacle of civilization on the entire planet. With an excited mood, he watches as the humans slowly rise from their respective fields and pick up those vegetables. There is a strange thing by the field, which is a wooden raft made of several wooden boards tied together with straw ropes. There is a layer of boards around the raft, and the whole thing looks like a wooden cart. Humans put vegetables into the cart. Then, they brought a strange creature from the grass by the river. On the flat brown-haired head, the two large eyes on both sides were exceptionally striking, with black pupils constantly looking around. The mouth, filled with flat teeth, was chewing on plants. It also had a pair of towering horns on its head. The animal crawled on the ground with its limbs, and its short tail was over two meters long, while its height was just over half a meter. Overall, it looked like a shell-less turtle. However, its body seemed exceptionally strong, and the strong muscle lines on its limbs and tail indicated everything. A straw rope was tied around the neck of the shell-less turtle, and it seemed sturdy. Humans placed the cart on its back, with one person leading in front and two others supporting on the sides. The shell-less turtle obediently walked forward while being led. Have they even mastered domestication techniques? To what extent have these humans evolved civilization? Zhou Yu's mood became more and more excited. It seemed that he could foresee what even more powerful civilization these humans, who constantly surprised him, would have in the future. Along their route, Zhou Yu saw more vegetable fields, as well as blue root plants and trees with red flowers and heart-shaped fruits. Rows of shell-less turtle carts emerged from these fields, forming a curved and colorful procession, moving forward into the distance. Zhou Yu focused his gaze ahead and saw dozens of rising smoke not far away. He seemed to be able to smell something fragrant. That must be the human tribe, right? Agriculture, tool-making, domestication, and the use of fire. These were some aspects of the civilization displayed by this primitive tribe that constantly amazed Zhou Yu. They could grow vegetables and fruit trees, manufacture transportation tools, and tame animals to help with transportation. Of course, Zhou Yu had already learned about the basic technology of fire from the smoke of their cooking. He was very curious about how far these primitive humans would evolve their civilization. Would there be more advanced technologies? Zhou Yu's gaze gradually narrowed towards the direction of the smoke. It was a tribe located on a flat grassland. Neat and tall wooden fences surrounded a vast flatland, and within this flatland were hundreds of exquisite buildings. Stones, wooden boards, and ropes were neatly combined to outline each small house. Numerous primitive people were sitting around dozens of fire pits, constantly adding dry branches into them. On top of the fire pits, there was something that Zhou Yu had not seen in other tribes. It was a huge shell of a fruit, which he didn't know what plant it came from. It had a barrel-like shape with two hollows on each side. Two sturdy ropes passed through the holes and tied it, while the other end hung on a thick wooden stick as thick as those people's arms. The two ends of this nearly two-meter-long wooden stick were placed on top of two thick branches in a Y shape, which were stuck into the ground. This was a rudimentary cooking set. Inside the blackened shell of the fruit, foam was rolling and white smoke was constantly rising, obviously water. After the primitive people transporting vegetables and fruits drove the shell-less turtles to deliver the goods to the tribe, others distributed the food near the fire pits. Zhou Yu saw that each primitive person began to throw a large amount of vegetables and fruits into the boiling water. Then, they picked up something else that surprised Zhou Yu. It seemed to be a bowl-shaped object made of clay or something similar, with a smooth inner layer and fine cracks all over it. There was no doubt that this was a kind of pottery. Have the primitive people mastered even this? Impressive! After a while, the vegetables and fruits softened and turned into a paste-like substance in the boiling water. At this point, someone took the pot along with the wooden stick on top and brought it down. Zhou Yu noticed that someone scooped out the paste-like substance with something resembling a ladle and poured it into those pottery bowls. 
All the primitive people stared at the steaming food with an incredible desire, unable to control their drooling. Is it really that delicious? Joe, you couldn't understand why this paste was so appealing. It reminded him of a nightmare like advertisement he once remembered, where a little boy eagerly waited for a vendor selling black sesame paste, bought a bowl, and ate it all, even licking the bowl clean. These primitive people didn't mind the heat and licked the vegetable and fruit paste completely clean, even smearing the pottery bowls, one bowl after another. The primitive people began their paste carnival, until they couldn't eat anymore and satisfied, they lay down on the ground with their bloated bellies. Joe Yu was puzzled. Is this stuff really that delicious? And are you full just by eating this? Just vegetables and fruits? Cooked into a paste? What's going on here? Could it be that the animal resources in this area are scarce? Can't hunt at all? Can't eat meat? With doubts in his mind, Joe Yu widened his gaze. He carefully observed the grasslands, riversides, and forests closest to this tribe. Various novel and fascinating animals constantly appeared before Joe Yu's eyes. Their numbers seemed extremely large, and there was a rich variety of both carnivorous and herbivorous species. Some of them didn't even pay attention to the primitive people, as if they were entering their own homes, swaying and jumping around in the tribe. Looking closer, countless birds also nested nearby, some even diving in and out of the messy hair on the heads of the primitive people. What kind of scene is this? Could these animals be pets of the primitive people? Or have the primitive people already acquired the technology to establish a natural wildlife park? Or did the primitive people choose to settle in the middle of a zoo? This is too absurd. Aren't the animals and birds afraid of the primitive people? Zhou Yu shifted his gaze back to the tribe, carefully searching for what should be their weapons. Stone blades, stone axes, stone spears, stone swords. They were all there. Why not use these to deal with those animals that look so fat and strong? Are you only making weapons for defense? In Zhou Yu's mind, 138 alpacas had already run past. What's going on here? Could it be? No, this should be impossible. It doesn't conform to the laws of development. Zhou Yu didn't want to believe that his somewhat dangerous idea was true. Perhaps the primitive people only occasionally eat vegetable and fruit paste? One day, two days. Zhou Yu watched the primitive people come and go picking vegetables and fruits, transporting them, eating the paste, resting. Over ten days passed. Even if an animal accidentally fell into the fire pit or was thrown directly into the pot, the primitive people would pick them out, even if it meant making a new pot of paste. Joe Yu finally understood and had to admit a fact. These primitive people, who best fit his image of humans, are pure vegetarians. What does this concept mean? In this extremely backward world, primitive people cannot obtain the important thing they should get, protein. Therefore, it is impossible for their bodies to become stronger. After all, Joe Yu did not see these people eating bird eggs, which means that they almost completely lack channels to intake sufficient nutrition. Even if vegetables, tuber plants, and fruits do contain some protein, it is not enough to offset their consumption. Instead, it is possible that the large amount of starch in those things makes them somewhat obese. This is completely incomparable to modern humans on Earth. Modern Earthlings can choose to eat raw meat or eat some seemingly unclean food, or even choose a vegan diet, all supported by a strong medical system and scientific technology. Without these, these different dietary choices are just nonsense. And these primitive people in front of him have obviously deviated from the norm. In this barbaric era, choosing to eat a purely vegetarian diet has resulted in such a small tribe, with less than 500 people. According to reason, since they have agricultural civilization and related technologies to support them, they should have at least thousands of people. Moreover, their low demand for meat also hinders their motivation to develop metallurgical technology, and they don't even have basic weapons, not to mention mining and the like. Zhou Yu pondered, how should he guide this race? Compared to other races he had encountered before, primitive humans were obviously more difficult. They could use fire, but they didn't hunt the nearby wild beasts to supplement the energy they lacked. Either they never thought of eating meat and were accustomed to eating fruits and plants, or something happened that made them choose to refuse meat. Zhou Yu felt it necessary to understand it well. If these primitive humans could solve the problem of eating meat, a considerable number of technological advancements would be unlocked. Eating meat requires hunting, which consumes a lot of physical strength, making their bodies more symmetrical. After capturing prey, they would use the fur to replace the torn leaves on their bodies, creating warmer and more comfortable clothes. It is believed that bone needles and the like would also be invented. When the number of animals decreased, they could also develop fishing in the river. Stone tools were useless against fierce beasts, so they would gradually seek more powerful things, such as copper or iron. When productivity scales up, they would be able to do more. Efforts to expand the population, 
gradually expand their influence, and conquer a broader continent. What seems like a small matter of eating meat actually involves many issues. For example, the lizard people, who ate meat from the beginning, Joe you only needed to teach them basic knowledge of fire and metallurgy. With their own efforts, they could develop civilization, improve productivity, and when he visited them again after a while, they might have become a quite formidable race. However, the primitive humans in front of him, although seemingly mastering higher level technologies that other races did not, their civilization has actually reached a bottleneck in terms of development due to this issue of eating meat. The small population that does not match the level of civilization development already clearly indicates all of this. What Zhou Yu needs to do now is to make them learn to eat meat and learn to hunt. The method. Zhou Yu immediately began to look for the leader of this primitive human tribe. This was not difficult. He had seen it before, the central house of this tribe, which had a relatively large area. Although it was built with wood and stones, it had a beautiful design. Strange patterns were painted on it with plant juices, and there was a stone pillar at the entrance as decoration, better than the other houses. However, why could he hear constant screams from inside? What the hell were the people inside doing? Zhou Yu's gaze entered the seemingly spacious house. As soon as he entered the door, which was made of braided ropes, he saw a group of primitive women doing something that couldn't be written about with the leader. Oh my god. You guys really have some enthusiasm. Joe you really felt that in this primitive civilization where there was absolutely no entertainment, there weren't many things to play with. After they were full and satisfied, they probably didn't have anything else to do. Playing with monkeys was the only form of entertainment. However, did they really think that the current productivity could really support so many people? There was also something strange. The leader seemed quite strong, with muscles all over his body, not fat like other primitive people. The primitive women who fought with him were the same, with a well-built figure. Zhou Yu observed for a while and then backed out. Damn. He didn't expect these primitive humans to have unlocked quite a few skills. What old man, what sitting, what missionary and so on. He dared to say that in this aspect, primitive humans were far ahead of other races. But this really wasn't useful. You couldn't eat posture. Zhou Yu originally wanted to understand from the leader's side whether they didn't eat meat from the beginning, but it seemed that he had to wait until they were done. His gaze turned to the other decorations inside the house. The primitive humans seemed to be very fond of the shells of huge fruits that could be made into pots. Even in the leader's room, they were piled up with these things. They not only used them as cooking utensils, but also used them for storage and decoration. They had many uses. Especially in this house, they were painted with colors. Zhou Yu felt that those should be the colors of plants and fruits, which would easily rub off. It had been a while, and the leader was still working hard. Zhou Yu also lost interest and began to look bored at what was inside the fruit shells. Purple red chunks of plants, vegetables turned into powder, wrinkled fruits, and dried meat that looked good in color but didn't really stimulate the appetite. Wait, dried meat? Zhou Yu thought he had seen it wrong. He focused his gaze on those piles of dry and hard things, the fibers and texture on their surface, and the faint aroma of meat that seemed to be floating. There was no doubt that they were dried meat. Zhou Yu carefully checked the other fruit shells and found even more dried meat. Could it be? He looked at the leader, who seemed to never tire of pounding, and suddenly had a guess in his mind. However, there was no evidence. What if these dried meats were used for something else, like feeding other small animals, or feeding that shell-less turtle? After a while, the leader finally got off the ground. After he finished his high, he walked to where the dried meat was stored. He smiled and took out the dried meat from the fruit shells and started gnawing on it. He brought some more and handed them to the kneeling primitive women. Hee <laughs> hee, you guys are really interesting. Zhou Yu's guess once again became a reality. The so-called leader of this tribe seemed to have a really bad character. Eating meat for oneself, giving meat to these women, and giving the rest of the tribe only vegetable porridge. I guess they were just pretending to eat vegetables in front of everyone before. These women in the tribe probably came for the meat and the prestige of the chief. As long as they're not stupid, everyone in this primitive tribe should know that meat is much tastier than tasteless vegetable porridge. Case solved. It's really ridiculous to think that monopolizing jerky will make you a winner in life. Can't we all enjoy together? Joe you couldn't help but smile bitterly. The chief probably ordered that no one in the tribe can eat meat, hunting is strictly prohibited, and invented this way of eating vegetable porridge. The purpose, of course, is for his own happiness. But then again, he could have used his power as chief to achieve this goal. Could there be another reason? Joe you stared at the chief carefully and suddenly felt that he seemed different from others. Unlike ordinary primitive people, this chief had green or orange juice smeared all over his body and he wore a headdress made of feathers on his head, which looked somewhat ridiculous. Zhou Yu looked closely at everything in the house, 
then looked at the decorations on the outside walls of the house and the strange stone pillars. He had some doubts about the identity of this chief. Could it be that he is not the chief, but a priest? If this person in front of him is not the chief but a priest, then all the questions can be answered. It can also explain the strange decorations inside and outside the house, the special paintings on his body, and the strange feather headdress. As the smartest person in the tribe, the priest definitely doesn't have as much power as the chief in terms of authority, after all, he only exists as an auxiliary role to the chief's rule. He may be able to do less work and eat more, but he definitely can't attract the attention of many women, because there is still the chief, and as his subordinate, he can only dream. Zhou Yu had a hypothesis. If one day this priest suddenly said that eating meat would lead to the destruction of the tribe, and coincidentally, many people died inexplicably, the ignorant and ignorant people of the primitive tribe would panic and start to believe his nonsense, and in order to avoid death, they could only eat vegetable porridge. He would continue to deceive and consolidate his argument, making the people in the tribe believe without doubt. Maybe there really is something in the vegetables that contains vitamins, starch, protein, etc making everyone's bodies fatter and better, and the people in the tribe would be even less willing to eat meat. No one would go hunting, but instead, they would develop agriculture in an orderly manner, and everyone would eat vegetable porridge. Isn't that beautiful? But there will always be people who dream of meat. After all, they are primitive people and cannot effectively control their expectations. The priest would use this point and secretly hunt some animals, secretly make them into jerky, and use them to tempt those primitive women. Of course, he can say that the strange sounds in the room are for praying for the crops in the fields to grow more vigorously. And for the jerky, the primitive women would also keep this secret and never speak of it. This is a so-called closed loop. If this person is really a priest, Zhou Yu shifted his gaze and searched again in the tribe, and found that in the direction closest to the center of the tribe, there was indeed a slightly smaller building than the main one. This building was more magnificent, and there were two guards holding stone spears standing at the entrance. Zhou Yu saw that in the center of the house, there was a fat man chewing vegetable porridge lying in a haystack, talking to a primitive person kneeling beside him. Is this the leader? With a thought from Zhou Yu, their voices came. Leader, our numbers are increasing, but the food is not enough. The fruits and vegetables in the fields can no longer meet our needs. The kneeling person said to the fat man. Zhou Yu nodded in his heart, indeed this fat man is the leader. So, is that person really a priest? Open up more fields, plant more food, that's the way to go. The leader drank the vegetable and fruit porridge with a satisfied expression, as if it was not a big deal. Forgive me for speaking frankly, but shouldn't we start hunting again and get rid of the excessive number of prey? Didn't the witch doctor show us? If we eat meat, the results will be terrifying. Have you forgotten? The leader suddenly threw the bowl in his hand to the ground, smashing it to pieces. This, the subordinate lowered his head and stopped speaking. Meat contains terrifying worms, and there is a deadly poison. Have you forgotten that after we ate the meat, more than a dozen subordinates died? I understand, I will never mention eating meat again, please calm down, leader. Find more people, bring tools, and open up more fields. The leader waved his fat hand, and the subordinate with a frown turned and ran out, seemingly to convey the task. Zhou Yu also understood that the person he saw earlier was not a priest, but a witch doctor. And this human tribe did indeed experience a food poisoning incident, just as he had guessed. The terrifying worms mentioned by the leader were probably parasites hidden in animal meat, and the deadly poison was likely to be bacteria and viruses contained in spoiled meat. It seems that these humans did not cook the meat like vegetables when they ate it. Speaking of which, the jerky of the witch doctor clearly looked like something that had been cooked or roasted. The witch doctor possessed higher intelligence than all the other people in this tribe, and with this intelligence, he manipulated the other primitive people. Now that Zhou Yu looked at it this way, it was really similar to what he had thought. The reason why these primitive people did not eat meat was not because they didn't want to, but because they were afraid. They were afraid that they would get sick and die directly after eating, just as the witch doctor said. As for those women who were with the witch doctor, they were probably willing to become the witch doctor's playthings after eating meat that wouldn't make them sick and tasted better than before. Zhou Yu had already understood the situation quite well and fell into contemplation. It probably wouldn't be so easy to make these primitive people who had refused meat for many years accept it again. If it was forced, it might even have the opposite effect. Kill the witch doctor directly? That probably wouldn't solve the fundamental problem. Control the leader and have him call everyone to eat together? That wouldn't work either. If the witch doctor came out to obstruct, coupled with the primitive people's rebellious psychology, it was possible that the fat man would be overthrown. So, what should be done? Joe, you suddenly remembered a saying. To conquer a person, you must first conquer their stomach. 
The reason why they didn't accept meat was because the meat they had eaten before was raw, even rotten, and caused stomach aches or even death. Simply grilling or boiling meat, Zhou Yu didn't think it would be easy for them to accept it again, after all, he also didn't find the taste appealing. It was very bloody and lacked any salty taste. From Zhou Yu's pursuit of meat, this was a failed food. If delicious meat dishes were made, making the primitive people crave it, wouldn't they have to come and eat it? But if you want to make delicious food, you need a lot of things. This tribe does not have various seasonings like salt, soy sauce, vinegar, chile, and Sichuan peppercorn from earth, nor do they have many cooking tools. Zhou Yu doesn't have much he can do. However, even with just simple flavors, he can still create extremely delicious dishes. Salt is easy to handle. With a thought, Zhou Yu explored all the nearby layers and caves within hundreds of kilometers. Luckily, there was a large amount of rock salt preserved in a shallow cave not far from the tribe. There are plenty of animals near the tribe, and now there is salt too. The remaining work seems to be going smoothly. However, Zhou Yu still feels that he must add a pinch of salt to the peaceful lives of these primitive people. Zhou Yu quickly surveyed this vast continent. He searched every inch of the forests, grasslands, mountains, and riverside. Soon, he found his target, a primitive tribe that was not too far from the previous one, only about a few dozen kilometers away. With just a quick glance, he understood one thing, the people here seemed to have developed civilization in a healthier way. Backed by a huge cave, the primitive people tied sturdy and tall wooden stakes together with ropes, forming a considerably large semicircular arc around the cave. The shape of this tribe is somewhat similar to that of the White Wolf tribe, but much larger, even the cave is like that, not only wide but also exceptionally deep. At the fence directly opposite the cave, there is a two meter wide and tall gate, guarded by several primitive people holding weapons shining with metallic luster. The metal is neither copper nor iron in color. Looking further into the tribe, besides the cave, there are hundreds of houses built around the fence, similar to the previous tribe, made of wood and stones. The houses are covered with something like fur as roofs, appearing much more solid and sturdy. Numerous primitive people are constantly moving between the buildings and inside the cave. Zhou Yu observes carefully. There seem to be nearly a thousand people here, and their physique can truly be considered strong, much stronger than the previous tribe. Moreover, the majority of people are currently working tirelessly. There is a square in the tribe for drying animal skins, a pottery kiln for firing clay into pots or bowls and various utensils, a dedicated area for making ropes from dried straw, and even dozens of people wielding large hammers, forging red-hot metal blocks taken from the furnace. Inside, the primitive people either use metal blades to peel animal skins, or continuously knead clay into various containers, or sweat profusely while making various metal tools and weapons, even drying meat or roasting meat chunks. The tribe is filled with the clattering sounds, seemingly telling Zhou Yu about its prosperity. Zhou Yu expands his field of vision and sees nearly a hundred primitive people carrying weapons and a considerable amount of prey, marching towards the tribe. Zhou Yu notices that these primitive people not only carry long spears made of metal but also wear long swords made of metal. In a place further from the tribe, there are also female primitive people constantly collecting fruits from the ground or trees. Zhou Yu couldn't help but sigh. This is the healthy development of civilization in a primitive tribe. Whether it's using fire, pottery, weaving, or forging, even the technology of making long swords from metal that he had not seen before, Zhou Yu understands that these primitive people seem more suitable to become the rulers of this continent than those who only know how to farm and eat fruits and vegetables. He originally wanted to find a tribe composed of primitive humans or other humanoid beings, but he didn't expect to be lucky enough to encounter such a developed civilization. However, this tribe also has its shortcomings. After circling around, Zhou Yu didn't find any domesticated animals or farming techniques. It seems that these people prefer hunting and gathering food that is unknown to them, compared to the vegetarian primitive humans. This also has a downside, as the time spent hunting and gathering will become longer, and the prey and fruits will become scarcer. One day, when the nearby prey and fruits become scarce and the population's appetite cannot be satisfied, this tribe will face three choices. Either passively reduce the population, migrate to a more abundant food area, or wage war with a tribe that has abundant food. Zhou Yu looked at the storage room and the tribe where weapons were stored and found that they were piled up like small mountains. The quantity was even more than the number of people in their tribe, and it definitely wasn't something used for hunting. In another corner of the tribe, hundreds of primitive people with green paint on their faces held long spears and were practicing something. They formed a square formation and constantly let out deafening roars. It seems that the primitive people of this tribe have really encountered a bottleneck, and they should be preparing to choose the third path. So, if that's the case, who would be their opponent? The answer seems obvious. So, the idea of this tribe is exactly the same as his own. Joe, you wanted to sprinkle salt on that tribe, 
using a powerful tribe like this to conquer them. Only through conquest can the stronger race in front of him gain more power and continue to exist. Zhou Yu saw a primitive person with an exceptionally strong body and messy hair wearing a long bone on his head, standing in the central part of the tribe. In front of him were dozens of people half kneeling. From Zhou Yu's perspective, it seemed like they were saying something. He used his ability. Chief, we all think that we are ready now, we request to go to war. Zhou Yu quickly heard such a sentence, which was not surprising to him. Go to war. Wait, how did the reconnaissance go? The person called the chief, who was the strongest primitive person Zhou Yu saw, was now sitting on a wooden stake, and his expression seemed to indicate that he was also eagerly awaiting this sentence. Chief, since we encountered them deep in the forest last time, we have been following them all the way to a place with a strong smell. That is their tribe. The subordinate immediately replied. Oh, a strong smell? Wait, is their tribe far away? How many people are there? Chief, if we start moving tomorrow morning, we can reach their tribe when Tanta reaches its highest point. As for the number of people, we haven't counted them all, but it's about 400. Tanta? Zhou Yu looked at the red star hanging high in the sky, and it was the first time he heard the name given to it by the intelligent life form on the sphere. But this name is really hard to understand. If everyone in the world calls that star Tanta in the future, it doesn't sound too good. But what would be a good, popular, and easy to understand name? It can't be called the sun, right? Ha ha. For hundred people, then it seems that we need to gather and prepare all the warriors in the entire tribe. The chief seemed indifferent to this number. He obviously cared more about other aspects. How are their weapons? The leader, there are very few of them, and they all have long spears made of stone. Stone. The leader smiled, a contemptuous expression on his bearded face. They possess technology that we do not have and they have a considerable amount of food reserves. Moreover, they have something that we cannot comprehend. We march tomorrow. The leader waved his hand, without asking what that technology was or what that incomprehensible thing was. He made an immediate decision. Zhou Yu could tell that the leader's mind had been clouded by the phrase considerable amount of food reserves. Furthermore, the enemy had few weapons, and they were all just stone spears. There was no need to consider anything else. Just get the job done. Zhou Yu's original intention was to find a tribe and attack the agricultural tribe he had first encountered, playing the role of a conqueror. By defeating and assimilating them, he would also forcefully spread more advanced technologies, including the concept of eating meat. In the history of Earth, during the age of discovery initiated by advanced countries, when they discovered the continents of Africa and America as conquerors, they almost exterminated the indigenous people, plundering resources such as gold and spices, and even turning the natives of primitive tribes into slaves. However, they also spread more advanced culture and technology, leading to prosperity and the advancement of civilization there. Through war, the goal of conquest can be quickly achieved, and civilization can also be forcibly integrated, even if it is filled with bloodshed and enslavement. This kind of conquest is much easier than teaching the agricultural tribe to eat meat alone, or making the tribe in front of him start farming. At this moment, he also understood what he should do. Since he wants to do it, he must do it to the extreme. There will be no weak intelligent life on his sphere, and even without his intervention, the weaker side will eventually be eliminated. Just like now, this primitive tribe, even without his intervention, already has the idea of conquering the farming tribe. This is an inevitable trend. Chief. Our chief. The subordinate stood up and roared loudly. Hey. 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 All the primitive people in the tribe raised their arms and roared along. Time passed quickly, and the next day arrived quickly. At the moment when the star just rose, all the people in the primitive tribe had already woken up and immediately entered a state of preparation for battle. After gathering in a short period of time, the chief summoned all the personnel in the tribe who could fight and immediately distributed weapons. Zhou Yu counted. This is a nearly 500-person army, which is quite large in this backward era. 500 primitive people wearing thick animal skins gathered on the grassland outside the tribe, standing in a neat square formation. The outermost circle of warriors held metal spears nearly two meters long in their hands, while those inside held metal long swords suitable for close combat. With this formation, Zhou Yu felt that even if the population of the farming tribe was ten times larger, they would probably be slaughtered. The difference in civilization is too great, it is simply overwhelming. Zhou Yu saw that each of them was carrying some dried meat on their backs. Judging from the quantity, it seemed like they were going camping, not much, seemingly extremely confident in their own abilities. They completely despise the other side, and they have the qualifications to do so. Zhou Yu suddenly had an idea. Can he manipulate the situation to develop in the direction he wants without relying on divine intervention or other abilities that have been used? 
In short, it is to control the primitive person who is the chief and instill his own ideas in him only to conquer and enslave, not to massacre everyone. What he needs is to complement the technology of the two tribes and form a more complete and scientifically sustainable civilization. At least he will save a lot of effort in guiding them, they can learn from each other. Zhou Yu used his ability, but this time it was the first time he used a completely unknown ability. Can he control their thoughts? The chief stood at the forefront of the team, just about to make the final mobilization, suddenly found that no matter what he wanted to do or say, he couldn't do it. His consciousness gradually became confused. After using his ability, Zhou Yu saw that the chief, who had originally raised his arms high as if he wanted to make a pre-war mobilization, suddenly stopped moving completely in the instant of using his mind. Is it done? Zhou Yu tried to instill his consciousness. Say when in doubt, quantum mechanics and see. The chief remained motionless. What the hell? What's going on? Did it fail? Could it be that the sentence was too difficult? Zhou Yu tried again. Or how about saying, the weather is nice today, it's sunny and breezy. The chief still didn't move. The warriors in the formation saw the chief suddenly silent, and thought he might be angry, so no one dared to make a sound. Zhou Yu tried a few other oranges, but none of them succeeded. Suddenly, he realized that his ability might not be omnipotent, and perhaps he couldn't control the leader's thoughts. This was somewhat similar to the God's Arrival ability, both involving controlling an individual. The only difference was that one was complete control, while the other was implanting subconscious thoughts. Unexpectedly, he couldn't succeed. Ah, does that mean he can only forcefully enter the leader's mind? Zhou Yu felt that it was almost the same as personally guiding him, which was really exhausting. It would be better not to do it and just pretend to be mysterious. There wouldn't be any consequences. In the future, the god's arrival ability would probably only be used to experience things that couldn't be done as a will body or things he wanted to try. He stopped using his ability and prepared to think of another solution. Just then, the leader spoke with a deep and resounding voice, when in doubt, quantum mechanics. What the hell? What's going on? At this moment, Zhou Yu thought he had misheard something. He was just as confused as all the primitive warriors. What's wrong with this leader? Why did he suddenly say that? Wasn't that what he was just thinking of saying? The weather is nice today, it's sunny and breezy. The leader also seemed surprised that he could say such a sentence. He looked at everyone with a terrified expression. How did I say that? Wait, what I wanted to say was, take a chance, turn a bicycle into a motorcycle. Zhou Yu realized. So there's a delay with this ability. The words he wanted the leader to say were spoken after he released the ability. It seems that this ability can't be used at will. If he wants to use it, he must think about how to use it in advance. After the leader said things like times have changed and I'm not human anymore, he fell into complete chaos, and of course, his subordinates were the same. Who could have imagined that the leader would say a bunch of meaningless words? The crowd began to murmur, thinking that the leader might be sick. Some kind of mental illness? After all, the leader was not young anymore, maybe. After a while of confusion, the leader temporarily freed himself from self-doubt. The primitive army now had more important things to do. Everyone, listen up. We're going to completely conquer that tribe. Take their food. With the leader's command, all the warriors in the formation raised their weapons high above their heads. Hey! 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 After the deafening cheers, led by the leader, the formation gradually transformed into four columns and began to advance through the grassland and into the forest. Zhou Yu looked at the direction they were heading. What the hell, where are you going? According to the orientation, the farming tribe is in the south, why are you going north? What's going on? He had to quickly control them to go south. There's no tribe in the north. Zhou Yu suddenly felt something was strange. The direction in which this group of primitive people was advancing was clearly the opposite. The location of the farming tribe was in another direction, no matter how they turned, they shouldn't be going north. Could it be that they weren't going to the farming tribe, but somewhere else? The legion marched forward, with primitive people wielding metal spears sweeping the ground, seemingly clearing the way for those behind, while those with long swords continuously cut through the tangled branches in the forest. The two sides cooperated and cleared a relatively easy path through the forest. Zhou Yu took his gaze away from them and began to search for his target in the direction these people were heading. Before long, he found a tribe established by a river in a valley less than 15 kilometers away from here. It was small and inconspicuous, and it seemed that he had overlooked it during his previous search for intelligent life. However, upon closer observation, he discovered that the people living in the tribe did not have the same appearance and form as those primitive humans. They were lizard people. These lizard people looked different from the foolish ones Zhou Yu had seen before. The scales on their bodies were not light green, but a strange purple-red color. They were relatively smaller in size, 
and even their tails were shorter. Their eyes were dim, making it difficult to see the color of their pupils clearly. Compared to the lizard people he had seen before, who were relatively small and agile, they seemed more like a species that had not yet completed their evolution. Joe, you also noticed that the population in this tribe seemed to be not very large, only about three to four hundred people. The weapons they held were undoubtedly stone spears, sharpened from stones, with limited destructive power. They were completely unqualified to fight against those primitive humans. However, on second thought, the metal weapons in the hands of the primitive humans did not seem to be like red copper or the iron weapons of the dwarf tribe. Joe, you couldn't tell what they were. Perhaps it was some kind of metal alloy? Joe, you suddenly made a bold guess. It was not impossible. There were already more than one or two surprises or even terrifying civilizations brought to him by so many intelligent beings. It wouldn't be strange even if there were races with higher level smelting technology. Joe you looked at the lizard people holding stone spears and suddenly felt that even if a hundred people from the primitive tribe came running over, they would probably be able to wipe out this lizard tribe. The difference in weapons could greatly amplify the advantage. Moreover, those primitive humans had a higher level of combat skills and even knew how to use formations. Zhou Yu stared at these purple-red scaled creatures carefully and saw that they seemed completely unaware that someone would come to attack them. They continued to do whatever they were doing in a peaceful manner. The storage room for dried meat was almost full, and the stone spears were neatly and orderly placed in the storage room. It seemed that they had no worries about food, clothing, or shelter. The lizard people seemed to be living well. He noticed that although they didn't use fire or have advanced weapons, these lizard people seemed to have found a different path of civilization. They were actually soaking in a pile of pools not far from the river. The pools were emitting steam, and a group of lizard people were enjoying themselves inside, seemingly fond of this behavior. However, why were the pools emitting steam? Joe you carefully observed the surroundings and suddenly discovered that this so-called river valley was actually located between two dormant volcanoes. The river cut off the connection between the two volcanoes and, after who knows how many years, became the present-day valley. The geothermal heat from the volcanoes heated the pool water which seemed to be quite abundant. After merging into one, it even connected with the nearby flowing river, becoming a strange tributary. Joe you noticed that the majority of the lizard people in the tribe had started to come to the pools in groups of two or three, eating dried meat while soaking in the baths, with a look of enjoyment on their faces. They were truly living a comfortable life. Joe you looked at all of this and really didn't know where to start with his criticism. It was a misunderstanding. Originally, the subordinate who spoke to the leader of the primitive people about the technology we don't have was not agriculture as Zhou Yu thought, but hot springs. For Zhou Yu, the intelligent beings living on the sphere, despite being extremely backward and even looking like misshapen fruits, always managed to bring him some surprises. Like the lizard people on this land, they once again opened his eyes. With low productivity, a small population, and not even knowing how to use fire, they have now learned to enjoy life and leisurely soak in hot springs. Compared to the lizard people on another continent, they have developed some rudimentary forms of leisure and entertainment as a branch of civilization. Although this does not conform to the normal laws of civilization development, do they have time to study things like fire and weapons? Or learn from another primitive tribe and start farming and cultivating fields? Joe you suddenly felt that if he wanted to bring the civilization of this lizard tribe one step closer, he seemed to have to trouble the conquerors who were developed in all aspects. He didn't want to teach them all the aspects of civilization from scratch again. At the beginning, Zhou Yu was really patient and wanted to teach various basic civilizations to the tribes of various races on the sphere, but after seeing so many tribes and civilizations in succession, he no longer had the same idea as before. If there are more advanced civilizations coexisting, Zhou Yu would like them to conquer the backward civilizations. This is also a law of the jungle, a natural law, even if he doesn't intervene, the final result will be the same. Moreover, they are so close to each other. More advanced civilizations can make the backward civilizations understand whether hot springs or smelting metals are more important. 500 warriors wielding metal weapons against 3 to 400 lizard people who like to soak in hot springs, the result is obvious. Actually, Zhou Yu doesn't want to see a completely one-sided battle, and there will definitely not be intense fighting between them. Metal weapons against stone weapons, 500 muscular warriors against leisurely and lazy skinny lizard people, the result is self-evident. However, Zhou Yu is still very interested in how the primitive people fight. When he was in the White Wolf tribe, he once inhabited a corpse with his spiritual body and experienced a fierce and primitive battle. At that time, it was a matter of few against many, almost winning with individual bravery and some tactics, rather than the overwhelming battles of today with both numbers and more advanced weapons. He really wants to observe how these primitive people fight and how the lizard people resist. 
Of course, this time he is not prepared to possess anyone or inhabit a corpse. Zhou Yu shifted his gaze from the lizard tribe and once again found the primitive people walking in the forest. However, he unexpectedly discovered that the primitive people had encountered a formidable enemy in an area where the trees were sparse. It was a ferocious and fierce beast that could be seen just by its appearance. They were nearly two meters long, with shiny golden fur and lightning-like red stripes on top. Their heads were huge, with fiercely red pupils staring ahead, and their two sharp teeth, like swords, were half a meter long, which looked extremely terrifying. Their claws were like blades, and their tails were like steel braids. They resembled leopards but were not leopards, and resembled tigers but were not tigers. Sharp teeth, sharp claws, fierce beasts indeed. Zhou Yu counted them, a total of 17. Are they such terrifying creatures even when they are in a group? They surrounded the more than 500 primitive people and did not immediately launch an attack, but confronted them. If it were an ordinary person, they would definitely start to panic and even wet themselves at the sight of this situation. To Zhou Yu's surprise, the primitive people held weapons, their eyes fixed on the attackers, their expressions seemingly calm. It was impossible to find even a trace of fear. These guys are amazing, they're not afraid at all. If modern earth people were surrounded by a large group of tigers and lions running out of their cages in a zoo, their throats would be hoarse, their legs weak, their clothes wet, and their pants dirty in no time. All the primitive people were arranged in a square formation, just like Zhou Yu had seen in the tribe before, with long spears pointing outward, unusually neat. Each person had a determined and resolute expression, as if they were accustomed to such things, their hands holding weapons without even trembling. The group of tiger and leopard beasts seemed to be waiting for something, constantly circling the primitive people. Although their steps were slow, each step was heavy, their agile muscles tense, as if they were about to explode. They would leap, pounce, bite, tear, and bathe in blood. Several tens of minutes quickly passed, this battle tested patience and strategy. The air heated by the scorching rays of the stars made the faces of the primitive people covered in sweat. Their breath was heavy, their legs like rocks, and in the suddenly silent jungle, not even a bird's chirp could be heard. As time passed, the tiger and leopard beasts seemed to gradually lose patience. Their previous leisurely pace also lost its rhythm, and the continuous feeling of hunger in their bellies urged them to launch an attack. Roar! The roars of the seventeen tiger and leopard beasts echoed throughout the jungle. At the same time, the primitive warriors were also prepared, pointing the tips of their spears outward, their muscles gripping the handles of the spears tightly, stretched to the limit. Roar! The tiger and leopard beasts instantly rushed out from all directions. Swift as the wind, fast as lightning. Like golden thunder, their figures flashed in mid-air in an instant. And in the next second, their razor-sharp claws, like blades, opened up, cutting through the air. Their mouths, adorned with terrifying fangs, opened to the limit. Attack! At the same time, the leader standing in the center also roared in anger. Kill! The tips of the long spears pointed straight ahead and diagonally upward. This almost invincible defensive formation protected the entire primitive group, just like a hedgehog. The tips of the spears quickly made contact with the pouncing beasts. Gah! Sharp metal cut through fur, skin, and thick fat, claws and fangs tore through flesh, severing bones. Blood splattered into the air along with screams. Kill! Kill! The primitive people roared, channeling all their strength into their weapons. In that instant, a mist of blood filled the air. The roars of the beasts, the screams and shouts of the primitive people, the clash of weapons against flesh, turned the once peaceful forest into a fierce battlefield. Tigers and leopards were constantly stabbed by spear tips, falling to the ground convulsing. They couldn't break through the spear formation, nor could they get close to the primitive people, resulting in heavy casualties. On the primitive side, there were only two or three injured, hardly affected at all. They maintained their formation, even if one corner of the defense line was breached, someone would immediately step in to fill the gap. Indestructible. Attack. Use swords. The leader roared, wielding two swords, charging towards a tiger and leopard beast that had been pierced through the heart and back by a long spear, swinging his hands, and the beast's head instantly fell to the ground. The brave leader's feet further excited the other primitive people. Attack. In a loud and orderly roar, the warriors raised their long swords, killing every last tiger and leopard beast on the ground. The tiger and leopard beasts that were lucky enough not to be injured had completely lost their fighting spirit. After seeing their companions being cut down one by one, they hurriedly fled deep into the forest. The confrontation lasted an unusually long time, but the actual fighting time was very short. In just a few minutes, the primitive people, with their strong defense and attack power, conquered the attacking tiger and leopard beasts. The primitive people were panting, their hands holding weapons were not relaxed, they kept a close eye on their surroundings, still maintaining their formation, and their nerves were tense. The tiger and leopard beasts may have pretended to flee, 
but they had no reason to relax. Years of living in the forest had taught them that a small negligence could lead to their complete defeat. After some time passed and the tiger and leopard beasts did not reappear, the primitive people finally relaxed their nerves a bit and began to clean up the battlefield. On the ground lay the corpses of eleven completely lifeless wild beasts, while the primitive people themselves only had one seriously injured person and one lightly injured person. This was undoubtedly a great victory. Hey! 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 They shouted loudly, celebrating their victory. After watching the whole process, Joyu's biggest feeling was that this primitive tribe seemed to be several levels ahead of other tribes in terms of combat skills. Of course, those sharp and hard weapons also shone brightly. After celebrating their victory, the primitive people began to carefully examine the injuries of the two wounded. However, to Joyu's surprise, the guy whose abdomen had been cut open and whose intestines were spilling out was directly thrown into the grass by them. The lightly wounded member, whose leg had been cut off a piece of flesh by the tiger and leopard beasts, received the same treatment. Zhou Yu was a little confused at first, but immediately understood why it was like this. In this damp and hot primitive jungle, it was impossible for these low productivity tribes to have any advanced medical skills. A simple infection could be deadly. After losing a piece of flesh from his leg, even if there were no infected bacteria, he would definitely be a cripple in the future. The large tribe already had no extra food, and if they had to support someone who had lost their labor capacity, it would be like inviting trouble for themselves. The primitive people surrounded the two individuals and raised their spears. With a scream, the two lives suddenly disappeared. It was the right decision. However, Zhou Yu still admired those primitive people for being so decisive. In the vast primitive jungle, both their own tribe and the enemy tribe were extremely far away, not to mention that the tiger and leopard beasts might still be lurking around, waiting for an opportunity to seek revenge. Taking care of one wounded person would require two normal warriors to lose their combat effectiveness. Even if they miraculously returned to their original tribe, there would be almost no chance of survival. Tetanus infection, excessive blood loss, weakened resistance. These risks reduced the survival rate of the wounded to an unimaginable extent. In this primitive civilization where medical awareness had not yet been established, being injured was equivalent to death, and this was common sense. In the face of common sense, the existence of life was insignificant. This was also the natural law of survival of the fittest in the primitive era. After killing their injured companions, the primitive people picked up the food from their bodies and then regrouped. Zhou Yu saw that they seemed to have no expressions of sadness at all and started eating while standing in place with their weapons. The previous battle had consumed a lot of their energy, so it was understandable to replenish their energy, and even holding weapons to prevent the tiger and leopard beasts from ambushing could be understood. But right next to them were the companions they had just killed. These people were really. Zhou Yu felt that he couldn't make any evaluation, and if he were in their place, perhaps he wouldn't do any better. Tanta, the star, had already risen to its highest point in the sky, and the primitive people had also noticed this. It seemed that they needed to modify their original plan. If it weren't for the attack of the tiger leopard beasts, they should have already arrived outside the lizardman's tribe by now. Chief, Tanta has reached its highest point. What should we do next? A warrior stood up and asked the question that everyone else wanted to know. Continue forward. With our fighting strength, it won't take long to conquer the enemy's tribe. Can they be as formidable as the tiger leopard beasts? The chief's face was full of disdain, showing exceptional confidence. He had the qualifications for it. After all, in the recent battle, they were only able to injure two people in this primitive human legion despite being surrounded by more than ten powerful tiger leopard beasts. What abilities did a backward race of only a few hundred people have to resist them? Ha ha ha, the chief is absolutely right. Those monsters of theirs are no match for the tiger leopard beasts. That's right. Kill them all. Yes. Leave no one behind. Don't kill them all. Taste their women. Yes. Taste them. The chaotic shouts of the primitive people were like noise, their faces filled with mocking expressions, and their mouths spewing all sorts of vulgar words endlessly. The chief raised his arms to signal everyone to stop. After we finish eating, we will immediately set off. After occupying that tribe, we can return tomorrow. Of course, I won't stop you from doing anything at that time. Remember, it's okay to go a little overboard. His words were like adding fuel to the fire. The primitive warriors became even more excited. Hey! 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 They shouted loudly, rearranging their formations. At this moment, they were already impatient. Zhou Yu watched all of this coldly, feeling somewhat complicated. This is what conquerors are supposed to be like, right? Acting for money, wealth, and everything unknown. Greed is their nature, and madness is their synonym. In their eyes, relying on their powerful strength to conquer the weak, everything is rightfully theirs. 
But in this extremely backward primitive civilization, if they don't do this, their own lives would be difficult to sustain and guarantee. Desire has changed everything. Joe, you had a question about these incredibly ignorant primitive people. When they occupy other tribes, are they aware of absorbing various skills and technologies from the other side? After conquering the Lizardmen tribe, will they absorb the technology there? What about agricultural tribes? Will they burn those fields? These seem to have become rhetorical questions. Does that mean that after they occupy the nearby tribes, he will have to teach and guide them in various technologies that they don't have? This seems to deviate from Zhou Yu's original intention. He originally wanted to use the war actions of these conquerors to promote integration and leap forward in civilization on this continent. But now, it seems to have simply turned into the primitive people's expansion of power. However, there doesn't seem to be any solution at the moment. He can't just throw these primitive people into the sea to feed the ancient giant rock fish and simultaneously guide three tribes to learn technology, right? That's not realistic. Zhou Yu sighed bitterly in his heart and decided not to think too much for now. He would just watch how this legion would conquer the lizard men. Zhou Yu noticed that this primitive human legion seemed to have quite formidable methods when exploring the forest. They even have scouts walking at the forefront, distinguishing directions based on the position of the stars, the growth of leaves and tree trunks. They occasionally make marks on the tree trunks with their long swords and constantly adjust their direction. Having lived in the forest for a long time, they are already familiar with such things. The middle of the group is quite bulky, without spreading out the length of the entire army too much, so as not to leave individual soldiers isolated and unsupported in case of unexpected events. The number of people in the back of the group is not small, and even the leader is among them. They have a more robust physique and the strongest combat power. Even if something really happens, these people alone can quickly withdraw from the battlefield based on their abilities. They seem to have a unique understanding of marching and warfare, taking into account various aspects. Talent? Zhou Yu temporarily thinks so. However, in the distant future, how far they can apply this talent can only depend on themselves. The group continues to march in the jungle, occasionally encountering fierce-looking wild beasts, but those are nothing compared to their powerful attack and defense. Even being surrounded by more than 10 tiger leopard beasts doesn't scare them, one or two passing by are simply like experience points. The primitive people are getting closer to the lizardman's tribe, and they have reached the edge of the forest. A little further ahead is a hilly area with sparse shrubs about 1 or 2 meters high. In front of the shrubs is a grassland that stretches to the valley. As long as these primitive people crouch down, they can easily hide and not be discovered by the lizardmen who enjoy hot springs. They must have used this point for reconnaissance before, right? Now look at the lizardmen. They are really leisurely, as if whenever you see them, they are either soaking in hot springs or on their way to soak in hot springs. Is it that enjoyable? You are about to face a great disaster. Zhou Yu couldn't help but doubt in his heart how these lizards have survived for such a long time. In Zhou Yu's eyes, the evaluation of these lizardmen, who started enjoying themselves before fully possessing mature civilization, has reached its lowest point. They don't know how to use fire, let alone metallurgy and pottery techniques. Instead, they endlessly soak in hot springs. Is there a need for such a race to continue to exist? The answer is naturally negative. Even if they have never been conquered and have not experienced disasters, allowing them to survive until now. A race that is excessively lazy cannot always rely on luck. The footsteps of the primitive army did not stop, and they had already entered the thicket of shrubs. It wouldn't take long for them to reach their destination. Just at this moment, two lizardmen who seemed to be patrolling happened to pass by. They carried stone spears on their shoulders, with relaxed expressions and water droplets on their bodies, as if they had just finished bathing. After the primitive people collectively entered the thicket of shrubs, they did not disturb the snakes in the grass and silently hid among the leaves. The lizard men also seemed to have not properly checked the surroundings and casually returned to the tribe. After entering the tribe, they only chatted with a few people in the tribe for a while before lazily going to bathe. Sigh. Zhou Yu was speechless, thinking that even if you were more careful, you would still notice the light-colored skin of the primitive people that completely contrasts with the green shrubs. If they had discovered it earlier, they might have gained an advantage in the imminent battle. However, even if they gained an advantage, they would definitely not be able to defeat the primitive army. Zhou Yu sighed in his heart. The people in this strange skin lizard tribe would soon face their last day on this planet. It was their inevitable fate. There was no chance of turning the tables. Zhou Yu watched as the primitive people crouched down and gradually emerged from the bushes, crawling into the waist-high grass. They had a strong tactical sense and didn't foolishly charge out for an attack, even though they had sharper weapons, greater numbers, and all the conditions to win. Today, there was no wind, and the grassland was like a calm green sea, providing better conditions for their approach. 
The primitive people were not slow, and they quickly reached the edge of the grassland. It was only a few dozen meters away from the lizard tribe. Zhou Yu looked at the lizard sentinels, who were still standing there foolishly, even though they were facing outward and staring at the direction of the grassland. Their vigilance was very low, and they would occasionally chat as if they didn't take their guard duties seriously. As for the other lizard people, they were just as relaxed as before. This time, everyone went to relax. Zhou Yu chuckled. Go ahead and relax. Soon, the pool water will turn blood red, and your bodies will float on the riverbank. He felt that his thoughts were leaning towards Schadenfreude, which didn't seem like the kind of thought a being from another planet should have. But seeing the lizard people like this made him angry. A great disaster was approaching, yet they were so lax. How far could they still indulge themselves? However, Zhou Yu seemed to overlook one thing, the hearing of these lizard people seemed to be very sensitive. Just as the primitive people were about to crawl out of the grassland, they also sensed the unnatural movement and anticipated the impending danger. Prepare for battle. Prepare for battle. The two lizard sentinels abandoned their posts and hurriedly ran towards the square in the tribe, shouting at all the lizard people who were soaking in the hot springs. An enemy attack? Zhou Yu saw that the most burly lizard person emerged from the largest hot spring pool and quickly ran to where the weapons were stored, holding two stone spears in his hands. Chi eh. Chief. There's. However, the primitive people began to roar loudly. Hey. 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 Nearly 500 primitive people quickly emerged from the bushes and appeared on the inner side of the lizard tribe, blocking the only exit like divine soldiers descending. The fence of the lizard tribe was made of broken stones and dilapidated wooden fences, but its height was quite intimidating. Unless they desperately escaped from the exit, they would be trapped inside and wait for death. Quick, grab your weapons. Zhou Yu saw that the lizard chief seemed unusually nervous. He seemed to have completely underestimated the arrival of the enemy. Almost all the lizard people in the tribe jumped out of the water at the same time and headed straight for the crude house where the weapons were stored. Zhou Yu was surprised to find that the primitive people didn't attack directly. After entering the tribe, they immediately formed a square formation, just like when they dealt with the tiger leopard beasts before. Hey! 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 The primitive people began to shout loudly. They knew that with their abilities, this race that looked like monsters was no match for them. This invincible formation that had killed more than a dozen tiger leopard beasts would be the nightmare of these monsters. At this moment, a cruel and mocking smile appeared on the faces of the primitive people. They all knew that there was no reason for them to lose. This tribe of monsters in front of them was almost a done deal. Zhou Yuming understood that the reason they didn't attack immediately seemed to be to use the terrifying oppression to crush the spirits of the lizard people. After that, they would use a frenzy of slaughter to make them completely despair. Civilization is an advanced civilization, but will this warlike and cruel nature become a hidden danger in the future? Zhou Yuming cannot determine that now. These are all things to consider later. Let's first see the war between the two tribes. However, on second thought, this may not even be considered a war, just a one-sided massacre. The primitive people did not directly attack, which gave the lizard people ample time to prepare. After hurriedly equipping themselves with weapons, they formed a rather chaotic formation. The largest and strongest individuals were in the front, followed by the slightly weaker ones, while the female lizard people and young lizard people hid in the houses. They didn't seem to have a clear concept of formation like the primitive people, and their idea of battle was simply standing with weapons in hand. There was a large distance between each other, like scattered sand. The disparity was truly too great. In every aspect, it was like this. Perhaps the moment this war started was also the moment it ended, right? Now let's see if the lizard people can take the initiative to respond and add some fun to this boring battle that has already been predetermined. However, something seems strange. After the primitive people roared and intimidated, they did not immediately choose to attack, and the lizard people were the same, remaining motionless like a group of statues. Zhou Yuming couldn't wait any longer. What is there to hesitate about? Victory is completely inclined towards the primitive people. Come on, what are you waiting for? However, the primitive people remained motionless. I wonder what they are thinking. Zhou Yuming was speechless. Do I really have to take action? He remembered how he controlled the leader before. After a while, charge. The leader's roar at this moment was like a thunderous explosion in the ears of the primitive people. Charge. The primitive people had been waiting for this sentence for too long. They raised their weapons high and ran towards the lizard people's tribe. It's not what I said. Come back quickly. Come back. Come. The leader, who was waving his arms in place, went crazy seeing his subordinates rushing out. They're acting strange. Come back. Just as the leader's voice fell, the spear of the frontmost primitive warrior suddenly stiffened before even touching the lizard people, 
then collapsed to the ground with a loud crash, blood flowing from seven orifices. The cruel smirk on the faces of the frontmost primitive warriors had not yet faded when their hands suddenly loosened, and their heavy weapons fell to the ground. Following that, dark purple blood slowly flowed from their eye sockets, nostrils, and ears, splattering into the air and becoming irregular blood rain, violently smashing onto the bodies of the primitive warriors, forming eerie blood flowers. Over 60 primitive warriors lost their lives in an instant. Zhou Yuming didn't see what exactly happened in that short moment. Stop, stop. Retreat, retreat. The primitive people suddenly panicked, their formation almost instantly falling apart, and they even abandoned a large number of weapons, terrified by this horrifying reality. Those who were completely scared and paralyzed on the ground were swiftly harvested by the merciless lizard people, and several dozen more lost their lives. The fear of the unknown destroyed their almost perfect performance from before. If Zhou Yuming hadn't witnessed their battle with the tiger and leopard beasts, he would even think that these were completely two different armies. The monsters have sorcery. They have sorcery. One of the guys who almost became a corpse just now, with a hoarse voice, repeated this sentence, bringing more panic to the rest of the people. The situation suddenly reversed and tilted back, and the primitive people were so scared that they threw their long swords and spears to the ground and ran back, screaming and peeing. In a short period of time, the team lost nearly a hundred people, something that even the 17 powerful tiger leopard beasts with powerful weapons couldn't do, but these seemingly trash lizardmen actually did it. Joe you never expected this situation. Why did those primitive people die on the ground? Why are they bleeding from seven orifices? Could it be that these lizard men did something? He was too concerned about the performance of the primitive people just now and ignored the lizard men, so he could only infer what happened from the miserable state of those dead people. After all, the primitive warriors, after being hit this time, had already shrunk near the gate and temporarily dared not approach the lizard men. Wait, bleeding from seven orifices? In Zhou Yu's impression, this kind of condition is generally related to poison. Moreover, the blood on the faces of the primitive people is really black. Could it be that these lizard men really used some poisonous weapons? Zhou Yu carefully observed the equipment on the lizard men, especially the hands covered with scales. If there were poisonous weapons, they must still have them. However, Zhou Yu checked 360 degrees back and forth and did not see any similar weapons on any of the guys with scales. Is the tip of the stone spear poisonous? Zhou Yu looked over there again, but he couldn't see anything on these black stones. This is strange. According to reason, only these weapons would have traces of poison. Could it be that what killed the primitive people was not poison? Then what was it? Zhou Yu stared at those primitive people who were crowded together and had retreated far away. After nearly a hundred companions were inexplicably killed, no one dared to approach. Strange? What's strange? The weapons and attire are nothing special. Could it be the lizard men themselves? Then, Zhou Yu had an idea. The dozens of primitive people who had already died staggered to their feet, picked up their weapons slowly from the ground, and with blood on their faces, they approached the lizard men. When the lizard men saw this scene, they were obviously startled. What's going on? Why are they still alive? Impossible. No one can stop our abilities. Stop arguing, let's do it again. They chattered, and Zhou Yu listened to what they said about abilities with great interest. Abilities? Let's see them in action. He controlled those corpses to continue approaching, while keeping his eyes on the lizard men. However, it seemed that nothing could be seen. Suddenly, the lizard men's heads nodded. But when they found that those originally dead people were still approaching, their expressions on their faces became panicked again, and finally they retreated repeatedly. What's going on? Zhou Yu's experiment failed, but he thought carefully. Curiosity gradually overcame everything. The seemingly backward lizard men could compensate for the lack of weapons and numbers with their abilities. This is really an interesting thing. Their development seems to be different from all the races seen before. Since dead people don't work, how about using living people? There will always be death in this battle. Even if the lucky ones selected don't bleed from seven orifices, they may still have their heads stabbed in the chaos. With this idea, Zhou Yu quickly selected a dozen or so of the most powerful crying warriors from the primitive people. With a single thought, the primitive people who were huddled in the farthest corner immediately stopped all their movements and became puppets in his hands. It was like playing a real-time strategy game, where Zhou Yu, in his god's eye view, was like a commander, controlling these cannon fodder units as they gradually approached death. This time, it wasn't much different from the last time. After the unlucky ones approached the lizard people, they screamed in agony and blood flowed from their seven orifices, causing Zhou Yu to instantly lose control over them, turning them into lifeless bodies. The army, which had just slightly recovered, fell into panic once again, and they even retreated outside the gate. However, this time Zhou Yu could see clearly. 
The lizard people were just opening their mouths and exhaling, and only after a very short period of time did it look like they were nodding. They were spitting out air? They had bad breath, causing the seven orifices of those poor guys to bleed and die. It seemed necessary to teach them how to brush their teeth in the future, of course, Zhou Yu was joking and thinking randomly. He was surprised to discover that among the intelligent creatures on the sphere, some had evolved unimaginable abilities. The invisible gas they exhaled was obviously a kind of poison gas. It was a kind of gas that could instantly kill enemies. Zhou Yu finally understood that it was because of this ability that the lizard people's tribe had been able to survive until now. But then again, why did they look exactly the same as the lizard people on the previous continent, except for the difference in body color and the ability to carry poison in their bodies? Zhou Yu still clearly remembered how the lizard people on that continent hunted. If they had such a convenient ability, why bother making copper weapons? What kind of environment allowed these purple-skinned lizard people to possess toxins? Could it be? Zhou Yu turned his gaze towards those hot springs. He hadn't carefully examined the kind of soup the lizard people loved to soak in before, but now, he suddenly noticed that bubbles were constantly rising from it, producing a smell similar to rotten eggs and an even more pungent odor. So that's how it was. They soaked the poison into their bodies, turning it into a weapon. Zhou Yu suddenly felt that this seemed somewhat unscientific, but something seemed beyond scientific explanation. Besides soaking in the hot springs, he couldn't think of any other reason why these lizard people would have poisonous breath. Zhou Yu originally had no expectations for the lizard people, not even a one in a hundred million chance of victory. In his opinion, the primitive people with advanced weapons and excellent combat experience would create an overwhelming war, but instead, the lizard people took the initiative in the first round and caught them off guard, inflicting heavy damage. Their abilities also surprised Zhou Yu. The ability to spray poison gas, an almost unique lethal weapon, became the lizard people's trump card. The primitive people, who had no relevant information, lost absolute control on the battlefield due to this hidden secret. The balance of victory gradually shifted from extreme imbalance to a normal and equal state, as long as the lizard people didn't move, the primitive people wouldn't die, and if the primitive people acted foolishly, the balance would tilt towards the lizard people's tribe. Zhou Yu had felt that something was strange before, whether it was the lizard people patrolling at the beginning, or the sentinels who voluntarily opened the gate without closing it, or the seemingly loose formation of the lizard people, it all seemed like a strategy. This strategy made the primitive people mistakenly believe that this was a trash tribe and that the people inside were not worth mentioning as opponents. It also deceived Zhou Yu. The current situation on the battlefield was the best evidence. Regarding the outcome of this war, Zhou Yu is no longer very interested. What he is more concerned about is what kind of civilization these poisonous humanoid beings will develop in the future. Why is that? No matter what, the primitive people cannot defeat these lizardmen, they don't even have a glimmer of hope. Unless they have long-range weapons, bows and arrows. However, relying too much on close combat and short-range attacks with long spears makes them almost equivalent to death when facing lizardmen who can spew poison gas. As long as their heads are clear, the tribe's leader, seeing the current situation, would definitely choose to retreat. As long as there are green mountains, there will be no shortage of firewood. However, there is one thing that puzzles Zhou Yu, and that is that the lizardmen who previously spewed poison gas seem to be very exhausted, panting heavily and retreating one after another to the back of the group. In this dependence, the weaker lizardmen warriors have become the front line. Zhou Yu sees that these guys seem to be useless, they have no strength at all, and can't even hold a stone spear steady. They occasionally turn their ugly heads towards the larger lizardmen, their eyes filled with doubt shaking their heads repeatedly. Their embarrassment is also clearly seen by the primitive people. Zhou Yu is a little puzzled. Could it be that only the larger lizard men can spew poison gas? Otherwise, what is so terrifying about them? As long as they spew poison gas, the enemy will definitely not dare to advance. However, the development of the situation that follows once again surprises everyone. The primitive people seem to gradually recover from the previous chaos. The lizardmen who did not continue to approach gave them enough time to catch their breath, regroup, form up. The previously heroic leader has returned, and under his loud shouts, all the primitive people, just like before, rearrange their formation. Holding their weapons, they suddenly roar. Attack. Kill. For our comrades, for revenge. He is not currently controlling the leader's consciousness, but at this moment, he hears a voice that should never come from the leader's mouth. The sound of the charge instantly echoes through the sky. Numerous primitive people once again launch an assault on the lizardmen's tribe with their weapons held high. They, they're coming again. Ah! The lizardmen immediately let out a cry of despair, even dropping their weapons and freezing in place. The savage smiles on the faces of the primitive people bloom once again. Kill! 
Their sorcery is gone. Leave none alive. The primitive leader shouts loudly, his face filled with ecstatic expression. Zhou Yu understands, he seems to have also noticed the strange behavior displayed by the lizardmen. Whether it's the previously strong lizardmen retreating to the back or the excessively timid behavior of the smaller lizardmen, it all indicates one fact. The lizardmen's poison gas seems to only be possessed by those larger ones, while the rest are just ordinary individuals. However, Zhou Yu always feels that the behavior of these lizardmen is a bit strange. Even if they no longer have poison gas, they shouldn't be this afraid, right? You just severely damaged the enemy's morale and killed nearly a hundred people. The lizard men at the front, who are lying on the ground, can't stop trembling in their legs. They have completely lost their fighting spirit. Ha ha, all of you die. Ah, what exactly happened? The primitive people who charged to the front, including the most frenzied leader, suddenly felt something strange when they were less than two meters away from the lizard men. Their eyes widened, and a voice of immense pain squeezed out of their throats. Then, black-purple blood flowed from their eye sockets, nostrils, ears, and mouths. No, no. The leader clutched his neck with both hands, his expression twisted in agony. However, his body could no longer withstand the fierce poison's invasion. Nearly a hundred primitive people, along with their leader, became sacrifices to the lizard people's treachery. The remaining primitive warriors, lucky enough not to be poisoned to death, found it impossible to escape from this eerie battlefield. The large lizard people had already charged out from behind, wielding blunt stone spears, reaping their lives. The fiercely powerful primitive people, like tiger and leopard beasts, had become prey, slaughtered by the lizard people they had never taken seriously before. Clusters of life fires were extinguished with continuous screams. Run, run, help, help. The dozens of primitive people who ran faster than the others were filled with extreme fear. They only wanted to escape from this hellish place, but suddenly realized that the previously open gate had been completely closed by someone. No, please, don't kill. However, all the lizard people wore the same cruel smile as the primitive people did when they first arrived here. Bathed in splattered blood, the lizard people leader raised his weapon. Leave no one alive. Attack. Hundreds of stone spears were thrown by the lizard people, tracing an arc. No, no. The last of the primitive people saw in their pupils a dense rain of deadly spears. Blood stained the originally peaceful tribe red. The life fires of 500 fiercely powerful primitive people were completely extinguished here. The lizard people, on the other hand, didn't even suffer a single injury. This battle abruptly ended amidst Zhou Yu's continuous doubt and astonishment. The primitive tribe, with advanced weapons, high tactical proficiency, and strong power, should have been the victors in this war no matter how you looked at it. As a civilization that was almost completely backward, the lizard people had no reason or chance of winning. The original outcome should have been the complete conquest, slaughter, and enslavement of the lizard people tribe by the primitive army. However, the lizard people gave everyone who underestimated them a counterattack. From the beginning, the patrol pretended not to notice the enemy, the sentries led the enemy into the tribe, and the chaotic and irregular formation confused them. This series of actions was to lure the primitive people into their trap, a gas attack. However, before the first successful defensive counterattack, they had already planned their next move. In order to completely crush the enemy, they pretended to let the leading large lizard people retreat and pushed the seemingly fragile small lizard people to the front. The small lizard people were skilled actors and successfully deceived everyone, including Zhou Yu, who had also thought that they were out of tricks this time. But this was exactly the effect this cunning tribe wanted to achieve. The small lizard people were numerous, and the poison gas they sprayed killed the vast majority of the primitive people. Then, to prevent deserters, they even closed the tribe's gate without anyone noticing. Finally, there was the somewhat unexpected attack. Using stone spears as arrows was actually just a basic skill according to common sense. But because none of the intelligent beings he had seen before had ever done it, Zhou Yu never even considered it. After seeing the bodies of the primitive people who were pierced like sea urchins, Zhou Yu felt that it was time to reflect on his own thoughts. Since the moment he discovered intelligent life, he had always believed that advanced civilizations should defeat backward civilizations. Rationality should triumph over chaos. At the time when he helped the White Wolf tribe defeat the Black Wolf tribe, Zhou Yu believed that his actions were not the slightest bit wrong. Helping advanced civilizations triumph over backward civilizations should be unquestionably correct. Even if the advanced civilization only had 40 people left, while the backward civilization had 4 or 500 people. At that time, he believed that compared to the savage Black Wolf tribe, the White Wolf tribe, with their rationality, wisdom, and indomitable will, was more deserving of existence on his sphere. But now, seeing the weak lizardmen repeatedly turning the tide of battle and annihilating the incredibly powerful primitive people, 
he felt that the truth he had once insisted on seemed not absolute. If he had just stood by and allowed the Black Wolf tribe to eliminate the White Wolf tribe, would the Black Wolf tribe have established a civilization similar to the White Wolf tribe? Even in the distant future, would they establish a massive force and occupy the entire land? For the Black Wolf tribe, which possessed strong reproductive ability, fierceness, and a strong will to survive, this probability seemed high. Looking at the White Wolf tribe again, with only 40 people, when would they truly be able to revive their tribe? These were things that Zhou Yu had never thought about before. Is an advanced civilization always correct? Must a backward civilization always perish? Zhou Yu felt that in the future, when encountering similar situations like the White Wolf Tribe and the Black Wolf Tribe, as well as the clash of civilizations between the Lizardmen and the primitive people at this moment, he should not easily influence the continuity of a civilization based solely on subjective assumptions. Including himself, no one could guarantee whether a backward civilization would defeat an advanced civilization, as there were too many uncertainties involved. The lizard men before him were the best example. Cunning as they were, they completely reversed the outcome that should have been a complete massacre of the primitive people. Zhou Yu pondered, reflecting at the same time. During this time, the lizard men had already begun to clean up the battlefield. They stripped the animal skins off the bodies of the primitive people, picked up the metal spears and swords they had dropped on the ground, and made them their own. Even without the skills to make clothes or the craftsmanship to forge weapons, they obtained these things. Things that should have been impossible to obtain. It was just a war. The bodies of the primitive people were thrown into the river, and the lizard men seemed to have no habit of consuming their enemies, nor did they have any intention of insulting the corpses of their enemies. In this regard, they seemed much stronger than the primitive people who had dirty thoughts about the lizard men before coming here. After the lizard men finished these tasks, they jumped back into the bubbling hot spring to enjoy themselves. However, Zhou Yu would not think that they were just enjoying this time. How far will this cunning race, with its unique venom ability, go in the future, and where will it lead? Pondering these thoughts in his heart, Zhou Yu shifted his gaze once again. He had just remembered something. The destruction of the primitive army seemed to have affected a plan he had before. To sprinkle salt on those lovers of mushy fruits and vegetables in the agricultural tribe. Originally, he wanted the advanced primitive people to conquer that side, while also popularizing the importance of meat consumption and raising their civilization to a higher level. Now that the primitive army had been destroyed, this idea had lost its fundamental driving force. So, what should be done? If it were himself before this little war started, Zhou Yu would definitely and absolutely think of another way to change the recipes of the fruit and vegetable porridge lovers. However, now Zhou Yu has completely lost the idea of doing so. Maybe eating porridge could create a special civilization? Why does everything have to be the same, everyone competing in the same race of civilization? A uniform civilization is not what Zhou Yu pursues, nor is it the result he ultimately wants. He now realizes that he seems to have deviated from his original intention. Each civilization has its own different characteristics, strengths, and weaknesses. Even the races are completely different entities. Why must there be a unified standard? Those who like salty taste, those who like to farm and eat vegetarian, those who like to soak in hot springs. Such diverse civilizations, under continuous development, may show him meaningful results in the future. Their respective racial talents will also thoroughly distinguish their differences in this continuous evolution of civilization. Of course, maintaining the status quo does not mean letting things go. As long as there are creatures living on his sphere, Zhou Yu will intervene to prevent them from being wiped out due to certain mistakes. What if a war breaks out? It's better to let the fittest survive. After all, the winner takes all. Zhou Yu once again turned his gaze to the primitive tribe of 500 warriors, including the chief, who were all killed in the war without knowing anything. The hundreds of primitives here, just like usual, were hunting, gathering fruits, smelting, and making weapons. Only a few males remained in the tribe, who also appeared old and weak. And there were hardly any women and children with any combat power. They were all ordinary people. The once powerful tribe with a legion of 500 people was instantly defeated because of a war with the lizardmen. The arrogant chief took everyone who could fight out, and as a result, none were left after this time, hoping that these remaining people would revive the tribe. Unless the nearby fruit and vegetable porridge tribe and the lizard men had no ambitions. Otherwise, they would almost certainly be conquered. The original conquerors would become the conquered in the future. Is this considered irony? Zhou Yu originally wanted to use this group of conquerors to add some spice to the life of the fruit and vegetable porridge tribe, but now he doesn't want to do it anymore. As a group of humans similar to earthlings, they initially looked really beautiful. One tribe could farm and domesticate, while another had strong military capabilities and a large population. 
Originally, they should have been one of the strongest civilizations he encountered since the discovery of intelligent beings. But now, looking at them like this? One believes in which doctors and eats fruit and vegetable porridge, while the other, with 500 elite soldiers, died along with their leader. They seem to have become the bottom civilization among all the tribes. What's even worse is that these three tribes are very close to each other, with a distance of just over 10 kilometers, and there will inevitably be a day when they meet. The Lizardman's tribe was discovered because the primitive people went to scout. Zhou Yu estimates that it won't be long before these three tribes will once again ignite the sparks of war through friction. Shortage of food, population growth, and various desires arising from it are the catalysts for war. What will war bring? The victors will seize more advanced technology, even slaves, and rapidly improve productivity. Then, they will continue to expand the tribe, gradually prospering and flourishing. The defeated who manage to escape will flee and migrate, seeking a safer and more suitable place to settle. With their sparse population, they may undergo a long process of reproduction and survival. Whether their population can survive and avoid extinction will depend on their luck. The strong may not always be the winners, but the winners are definitely strong. On this continent, the primitive tribes with legions are the strong ones, but their disastrous defeat against seemingly weak lizardmen instantly turned them into the weak ones. As the ultimate victors and the strongest lizardmen on this land, it remains unknown whether they will further expand their influence and even assimilate these two human races. However, Zhou Yu still feels some regret. He really wanted to see a human tribe gradually develop and leave a significant mark in the history of civilization. Although this may be biased and unfair, if the lizardmen eventually eliminate these two human races, he would consider relocating some of them elsewhere to start civilization anew. Of course, if they are destined to be wiped out, he definitely won't help them a second time. Zhou Yu shifted his gaze. Counting from the beginning, from the lizardmen to the lizardmen's end, he has already seen five continents in a row. He is well aware that the remaining four continents, even if unlucky, will still encounter one or two tribes of intelligent beings. At first, he thought that the lizardmen were the only intelligent race, but seeing one after another the white wolf tribe, the dwarves, the sheepmen, and even humans, he suddenly realized that an unimaginable and prosperous civilization has emerged on this sphere. It is much stronger than a world that only has humans. However, Zhou Yu now wonders, are humans also lucky enough to stand out among many intelligent beings? Did something similar to lizardmen exist in the ancient era of Earth? These are all unknowns. Thinking about the civilization on his sphere, Zhou Yu had some strange feelings. Lizardmen, white wolf tribe, dwarves, sheepmen, humans. When these known races are combined, there seems to be something very peculiar. It wouldn't be a problem if they existed individually on the sphere, but it's quite extraordinary for them to appear together. Zhou Yu pondered carefully. Are they somewhat like creatures from a novel in another world? In the world of swords and magic, there are various humanoid creatures, right? Lizardmen, dwarves. They are all standard creatures in another world. An inexplicable sense of doubt arose in Zhou Yu's heart and continued to grow. Why would so many intelligent beings from another world suddenly appear on his sphere? Could it be that his planet is actually another world? No, that's not right. The humanoid beings that exist in the fictional novels are much more real on his sphere, and they don't have any magic here. There are no demon kings or heroes. At least not now. Logically speaking, the sudden appearance of so many humanoid beings entering the Stone Age almost simultaneously is indeed abnormal. It should have happened earlier or later. Could it be the result of the adjustments he made to the single-celled organisms, the butterfly effect? Zhou Yu remembered this term again. The various adjustments he made to single-celled organisms, altering the living environment of numerous multicellular organisms, resulted in the diverse and colorful forms of civilization on the sphere. This is also a conjecture. During the unknown period of time when he was asleep, what exactly happened and what kind of stimulation caused the organisms on the sphere to collectively evolve into humanoid forms, these were all completely unknown. Zhou Yu took a deep breath in his heart and decided not to think about such things for the time being. The more he thought about it, the more confused he became. It would be better to quickly explore the unknown four continents. Finding the creatures they possessed was the most important thing Zhou Yu should do. Apart from the five continents, there was one unexplored area which was the vast desert that was originally the center of the origin continent. What kind of changes would occur here after it was completely transformed from a desert far from the ocean into a land surrounded by the ocean? Zhou Yu's gaze directly found the almost elliptical land located at the center of the equator. It had now become a sea of plants. Zhou Yu was very satisfied with this. The forest, which almost occupied the entire land, was a blue-green color that blocked out the sky. It was filled with the sounds of countless animals, birds, and insects. 
The once barren desert had now become a paradise for living creatures. So, what kind of intelligent creatures would be here? He raised his gaze and was about to start searching carefully when he suddenly noticed a building reflecting the light of the stars. It was. A pyramid? If Joe Yu were to choose 10 moments that had surprised him immensely, this well-formed pyramid in front of him could definitely be one of them. In his impression, pyramids like this should not appear here and now, but rather on a distant earth whose distance was unknown. However, this almost standard cone-shaped structure was right in front of him. The layers of rock stacked on top of each other formed a trapezoid shape that decreased in size as it went up, becoming an extremely sharp square at the highest point. The light of the stars shone on it and was reflected by the rocks, just like a huge mirror. Zhou Yu focused his gaze on this surreal building and carefully examined it. He found that this pyramid was actually built on a small hill surrounded by the jungle and was not as tall as he had imagined. From a close distance, the so-called layers of stack stones actually looked more like layers of shale that had peeled off. However, the traces of human work were still very obvious. He found that many places seemed to have been peeled off and piled up. This pyramid seemed to have been created without much effort. Rather than being built, it looked more like rough carving. After this analysis, Zhou Yu suddenly felt that it didn't look like a pyramid anymore. It seemed more like an illusion caused by visual deception created by the subconscious. This made Zhou Yu, who was familiar with pyramids, mistakenly believe that this cone-shaped structure was a pyramid. However, what exactly was this semi-artificial structure built from? The problem didn't seem difficult to solve, and Zhou Yu quickly found some clues at the base of this pyramid. It was a huge cave directly carved out on the hill at the bottom. The reason why it was said to not be a natural cave was because it was too wide and huge, and it had quite a lot of artificial traces, just like the pyramid. Within this cave, there were constant noises. Zhou Yu focused his gaze into this not-so-dark cave and instantly discovered the intelligent creatures that caught his eye. When he saw the lizard people, he thought they were just ugly, and when he saw the goat people, he found them somewhat horrifying. But when it came to the appearance of the intelligent creatures in front of him, Zhou Yu was completely puzzled. Birds? Yes, in front of him, the head with a black, hard, horn-like beak, the huge brown pupils and the eye sockets with black edges, it was clearly a bird's head. A layer of gray, short, fine fur covered the entire body, which maintained an upright standing posture. Where the wings should have been, there were only sparse feathers, but human-like arms grew out of thin air. At the end of the arms were five long, hard fingers covered in scales, and below the slender legs were feet with five toes, which surprised him even more. This completely went against his understanding of the species bird. Should they be called bird people? This is not an insult, there really is no language to describe the strange creature in front of him. They were more like a fusion of birds and human genes rather than an evolution from birds. However, thinking about how much brain capacity a bird's head could have, Zhou Yu subjectively believed that they might not be very intelligent. But the pyramids outside in this spacious cave were definitely made by them, which also indicated that these guys could create sturdy tools. Moreover, these tools should mostly be made of metal. So, smelting. Wait, something's not right. Zhou Yu counted and realized that there were nearly 2,000 bird people gathered here, but he didn't see anything they would need for their lives. No houses, no bonfires, no food, and no furnaces for smelting, no storage rooms for weapons and tools. Nothing at all. All there was were the densely packed chattering bird heads. What were they doing? Zhou Yu couldn't understand. Could it be that these bird heads didn't carve out the caves and pyramids? Were they just freaks with low intelligence that evolved by chance? He suddenly noticed that the bird heads seemed to be roughly facing a direction, the deepest part of the cave. What was there? Zhou Yu's gaze continued forward for another 10 meters. He suddenly noticed something strange. There was a naturally formed stone that looked like a bird's nest, and on top of it were oval-shaped stones that really looked like eggs. The stone was embedded with quite a few transparent or translucent minerals, which seemed to be gemstones. On both sides of this strange stone were four statues of bird-headed human bodies. These statues were over two meters tall and covered in white paint, even with black dots on their eye areas, making them lifelike. In front of the statues were placed meat and fruits, which looked quite fresh. Zhou Yu also saw that there seemed to be murals painted on the rock wall above the statues' heads. The main body of the mural was white, with simple black lines outlining how the bird people hunted, ate, and prayed to the gods. The so-called gods were the pile of folk ornaments in front of him. Zhou Yu seemed to understand what this cave was for. It was an ancient temple. The reason why the numerous bird people gathered here was to kneel and bow to the ornaments collectively, just like depicted in the murals, praying for good weather. And from the murals, it could be seen that this kind of worship was not a frequent occurrence. He had encountered this by extremely coincidental circumstances, his luck was really good. However, they had been making noise for a while now, why hadn't they started yet? 
Just at this moment, one of the bird people standing at the forefront suddenly shouted a few words, and the cave instantly fell into absolute silence. Zhou Yu immediately used his ability. The gods gave birth to us and bestowed us with suffering. They are merciful, yet cruel. Grant us the light of compassion, and cast our enemies into the abyss. What he hates, we shall destroy, what he delights in, we shall offer. We are willing to offer up our prey, jewels, and everything, even our lives, to beg for the blessings of the great in it God. Please bless us. After the birdmen finished a long string of prayers, the birdmen instantly knelt down, pressing their hands to the ground and praying in unison. The echoes reverberated in the cave, and Zhou Yu could feel that the birdmen seemed to have put their whole hearts and souls into this prayer. They remained in this position for a long time. Zhou Yu understood that in their eyes, this inad god was the supreme being. They relied on this inad god for favorable weather, victory in battle, and bountiful hunts and harvests. He couldn't help but chuckle. Is this egg a god? Then what am I? As a self-proclaimed god, Zhou Yu felt insulted. Regardless of how the egg became a god, it was Zhou Yu himself who created the conditions for life to exist on this planet. So why not show these birdmen what a so-called miracle really is? Zhou Yu suddenly had the idea to play a prank on them. He remembered that when he faced the dwarf tribe, he had once held a stone statue and pretended to be the god of the hills. By using his abilities to inhabit the inanimate object, he could even make the stone lump speak and move. Now, he decided to use the same trick to scare these kneeling birdmen, my ignorant subjects. In the originally calm cave, a deep and ancient voice suddenly resounded. This voice also startled all the birdmen. This, this is. The voice of the priest trembled, and he raised his head and looked around, while the other birdmen couldn't even manage to lift their heads. I am in it, your great god. Zhou Yu controlled one of the statues and made its head twist, accompanied by creaking and squeaking sounds. Woo, woo ah ah. The priest looked at the statue with a side glance, startled when he saw it move, and quickly prostrated himself again, muttering another prayer under his breath. The birdmen dared not make a sound, and Zhou Yu noticed that the short feathers on their arms were trembling. This was truly interesting. It seemed that they were genuinely afraid and respectful of this Inet God. Great God, Inet God. The priest secretly raised his head and glanced at the moving statue, feeling a gaze, and quickly lowered his head again. Our offerings to you will become even more abundant. Please bless us with more prey and make our tribe stronger. The priest prayed, bowing to the stone statue. Zhou Yu couldn't help but sneer. It was just as he expected. They already believed that the world's workings were controlled by divine beings, and that these divine beings could be appeased and pacified. Once the gods were pleased, they would reward people with some benefits, but if they angered the gods, they would face divine punishment. This was a primitive level of belief. It was more advanced than those charlatan which doctors and priests who used magic to manipulate rain, heal diseases, or deceive people in the name of the gods. These birdmen had already discovered that even without using magic, rain and wind would still come, trees would still grow, and light would still shine upon the earth. The role of a priest was unnecessary. The mysterious power that invisibly controlled the world's workings had also subdued them. And the combination of power is this Inuit god. My foolish and greedy people, food and hunting are where joy lies, and they are also the meaning of your survival. Joe you didn't know what to say. He couldn't just tell them, don't waste your time here, go out and hunt quickly, you could have caught several by now. Great Inuit god, thank you for your oracle. The birdman priest kept bowing, and the rest of the birdmen followed suit. Zhou Yu released his control over the statue. Boring, he thought. I thought it would be more exciting, but it was just a deep experience of being worshipped. However, he also realized that this birdman race seemed to have an unusually devout worship of gods. This worship seemed deeply ingrained, otherwise they wouldn't have built a pyramid on top and dug a cave underneath to place objects, statues, and paint murals for collective worship. Zhou Yu looked at the mountain-like offerings and then at the birdmen who were still bowing low. He hadn't seen the tribe leader of the birdmen yet, but just from the signs in this cave, he could tell that their civilization had reached a certain level. They had impressive carving techniques, able to carve stones into their own likeness and even repair giant stones into pyramid shapes. The simple murals on the stone walls proved that they had a sense of recording and could use paintings as symbols to record things. The pigments used in the murals also indicated that they had the technology to extract and produce simple pigments. The abundant offerings included a large number of animal carcasses and strange-looking fruits, along with a pilgrimage of nearly 2,000 people, all of which indicated their talent in hunting and obtaining food. Their hunting weapons were probably quite advanced as well. The gemstones embedded in the egg-shaped stones also proved that they had decent mining and smelting techniques. Those gemstones couldn't be easily obtained if they were several hundred meters deep. Just from the facts in this cave's place of worship, so much could be inferred. 
The Birdman race seemed to be a race with a highly advanced civilization. They were even stronger than any race Joe you had seen before. In terms of population and various technologies, they were far ahead of other civilizations. Would they become the most advanced in the future? After spending some time in the cave, the birdman, led by the priest, walked out. Zhou Yu's gaze followed them closely. He really wanted to see what else this strange-looking race had to surprise him. The birdman, covered in brown short fur all over their bodies, gradually emerged from the cave and stepped onto the rocky surface outside, basking in the warm light emitted by the stars. Zhou Yu was able to see their complete appearance clearly. In the cave, they had been constantly moving around, and when they stopped moving, they were all kneeling, so he couldn't see them as clearly as he could now. Besides the various features he had seen before, Zhou Yu was surprised to find that these birdmen had wings. He had originally thought that the place where wings should have grown had evolved into arms and hands, but unexpectedly, they had a pair of small wings with feathers on their backs and behind their legs. Could it be that the birdmen could fly? However, Zhou Yu watched as they walked several hundred meters and disappeared into the forest without any intention of flying. Just decorations? Zhou Yu couldn't help but think. If they're not used, do they still have any meaning? These guys, who look like birds but can't fly at all, suddenly sped up after entering the forest. Zhou Yu saw that their lower limbs seemed unusually powerful, with the front ends of their toes curved, able to grasp the tree roots on the ground and prevent themselves from falling while moving at high speeds. After walking for a while in the forest, the more than 2,000 bird people gradually stopped. Zhou Yu realized that they might have reached their gathering place. He shifted his gaze forward and indeed saw a huge building hidden in the forest. However, immediately after, he couldn't help but be surprised. Is this a house made of pottery? There is no doubt that the building in front of Zhou Yu, with its gray-brown color, is definitely not made of clay or similar materials, but rather a more solid and less deformable processed material, pottery. Huge tiles with rough and even surfaces, coated with clay, were stacked together to outline this nearly oval-shaped giant building. Unlike the traditional method of building houses, the bird people's collective house does not seem to have obvious boundaries, they use tree trunks as walls when encountering giant trees, and do the same with giant rocks. The tall and dense forest canopy becomes a natural barrier, allowing this building, which is about 3 meters high, to blend into the entire forest. It is because of this that he did not notice this huge man-made structure at the beginning. Zhou Yu shifted his gaze to the inside of the building. He found that the walls in all four directions were made of bricks of different sizes, and the roofs were covered with thick, huge plant leaves. There were nearly 2,000 of them. This seems to be the location of the bird people's tribe. Compared to other tribes, these bird people are obviously much more advanced. Just think about it, while others are still living in grass or stone houses, they have already started to build advanced pottery houses. There is a big difference in levels. After entering the tribe through a beautiful gate, the bird people each entered their respective houses behind the grass curtains. Joe you also noticed that not all bird people went to the cave to worship. There were also many who did not go there, for unknown reasons. Could it be that they have developed a similar concept of hierarchy? This is just speculation. Maybe they just don't want to go. After a while, all the bird people came out of their rooms and gathered in the square. Joe you looked and saw that even those who didn't go to worship before had come, and in their front, there seemed to be several bird people standing. Could it be that this bird tribe is going to do something? He used his ability. The great god Enid has given us a divine oracle. The priest that Zhou Yu had seen before stood in the center of the row of people, raising the staff in his hand adorned with gemstones. The bird people instantly knelt down, in an exceptionally orderly manner. The great god Enid. They immediately bowed their bodies and lowered their heads. The voice was as orderly as the kneeling. The divine oracle says that we must undergo trials in order to grow. The priest looked around, his voice resounding with a sense of holiness, without a doubt. The great God in it. The divine oracle says that pursuing desires is not a sin, but the meaning of our existence. The priest raised the staff high, his eyes closed. The great God in it. The deafening voice echoed in the silent forest, as if they were the only ones there. The great God in it. Bless us. The priest and several people beside him all knelt down, shouting the name of their God. The great God in it. Joe you was tormented. These bird people. They really are a bunch of bird people. They go through all this ceremony and talk about the great Inuit god, but he really doesn't want to hear it anymore. However, he also realizes that the purpose of the bird people tribe seems to be to obtain prophecies from the Inuit god's egg and convert them into the energy for survival. It is this energy that has allowed this race to have the civilization they have today. Zhou Yu looks towards the tribe. In what seems to be a warehouse, there are piles of metal spears, primitive civilizations seem to really like spear-shaped weapons. Whether it's the lizard people he first encountered or even the lowest-ranking sheep people, they all use similar-looking spears. 
With their medium attack range, they are one of the most suitable weapons against beasts. However, Zhou Yu can't help but feel that he has seen the color of these weapons somewhere before. Could it be some kind of alloy? Or are they made of gold? And what is the equilateral triangle pattern on the blade? With these questions in mind, Zhou Yu looks at the other weapons stored in the warehouse. To his surprise, he finds bows made of dark gold metal, countless wooden arrows with feathers attached to their tails, and even short blades. Their craftsmanship is not rough, but rather exquisite. However, there is a standard equilateral triangle engraved on the bow and the handle of the short blade. Zhou Yu understands that this should be a symbol with some special meaning. However, he is equally amazed by their metallurgy, forging, and even carving techniques. The bird people's weapon technology seems to far surpass that of other races. It is easy to imagine what kind of outcome there would be if other races lived on the same continent as the bird people. Zhou Yu is pleased. Weapons are already top-notch, but what about other aspects? He looks towards the other storage rooms. Piles of dried meat, resembling small mountains, and large amounts of pale yellow crystalline powder catch his attention. Without a doubt, those crystals are salt, which can be determined from the particles remaining on the dried meat. Ha, huh? they even have this? It seems that it's not exclusive to the sheep people tribe. Then, pottery. Oh no, even the houses are made of clay bricks, so there's no need to say much about this aspect. Even without inspecting the storage rooms, Zhou Yu knows that the bird people tribe definitely has a large number of pottery plates, jars, bowls, and figurines. Just then, the bird people who had been kneeling for half a day began to stand up and scatter. Soon, the sound of clanging and banging caught his attention. Looking in the direction of the sound, Zhou Yu unexpectedly discovered that there were quite a few blast furnaces on the outer side of this huge building. These blast furnaces look remarkably similar to the ones he found from the dwarves before, but they seem to be more finely crafted and aesthetically pleasing. The bird people have returned to their workstations here. Zhou Yu happened to notice that there is a considerable amount of malachite on the ground. This old friend, ever since he saw it with the white wolf tribe, he hasn't seen it from any other tribe, and now it suddenly appears, bringing back some familiarity. Could it be that the bird people are going to make bronze objects? However, when he sees them throwing malachite and other stones into the blast furnace and starting to blow and burn continuously, Zhou Yu finally understands what material those weapons are made of. It's a copper alloy. Bronze. As an alloy with higher hardness and lower melting point than copper, bronze can be used to make various exquisitely shaped ornaments. Wait, this seems to be a backward technology compared to iron smelting. Looking at the word alloy, it seems quite fancy, but compared to iron, bronze is really far behind as a weapon. Iron is much more suitable as a material for weapons than bronze. Since these bird people can make bronze and even mine gemstones, why don't they smelt iron? Zhou Yu checked the underground of this large area, and the content of iron or couldn't be any more abundant. He remembered the various finely crafted weapons he had just seen, as well as the egg-shaped stone embedded with gemstones in the cave. Suddenly, he had a guess. Could it be that the weapons of the bird people are not used for hunting and fighting? If weapons are not used for combat and hunting, then what is their purpose? There is only one answer. Decoration. Zhou Yu carefully looked at the spearheads, arrowheads, and blades. Indeed, they had nothing to do with the word sharp, which confirmed his idea. But if they don't use weapons for hunting, what are they making these for? If they can be made into these shapes, they must have been used in this way before. He looked towards the other warehouses. However, he didn't find any similar weapons again, but unexpectedly discovered something strange. It was a shape made of bronze in the form of five fingers, hollow inside, and the fingertips extended more than 20 centimeters, exceptionally sharp, like five sharp short blades. Gloves? No, they should be called claw blades, right? If these bird people put these claw blades on their fingers, it would be quite suitable. Could it be that this is their weapon? Zhou Yu imagined what it would be like for the bird people to swing these claw blades, like bird claws. Well, it's quite fitting. At least it doesn't feel out of place compared to them holding knives, guns, bows, and arrows. Could it be that after years of fighting and continuous improvement, claw blades are the most suitable weapons they have obtained? Zhou Yu looked carefully again and found that these claw blades didn't have that strange equilateral triangle, and the claw tips were indeed exceptionally sharp. With a thought, a pair of claw blades floated in the air and quickly made a swinging motion. It drew five arcs. She, deep scars instantly appeared on the brick wall of the warehouse. Oh, wow. Zhou Yu looked at the blade tips, and there was no sign of breaking or shattering, still intact. This is impressive. This is the most exquisite and sturdy weapon he has seen among many primitive tribes. These claw blades also prove to Zhou Yu the strong craftsmanship of the bird people in weapon forging. Compared to them, the dwarves are not worth mentioning, even though they use iron, which is harder and more suitable for forging. 
After combining precision and practicality, this exceptionally powerful weapon represents the civilization of the bird people. Soon, dozens of bird people entered the warehouse, skillfully put on these claw blades, and walked out of the tribe in groups of three or five. This confirmed Zhou Yu's guess. After gathering in the open space outside the tribe, under the leadership of the stronger bird people, they disappeared into the vast forest. Zhou Yu was very interested in their hunting. He also wanted to confirm the fighting methods of the bird people equipped with powerful weapons. His gaze followed them into the jungle and immediately tracked the bird people. The bird people were moving at an extremely fast speed, and it seemed more like they were heading straight for a certain place rather than hunting. Their route was also very clear. Zhou Yu followed them and walked for about 2 kilometers before they suddenly stopped. He also immediately heard a loud roar coming from ahead. Is that a waterfall? Zhou Yu raised his gaze and noticed a narrow river not far from them, with fast-flowing water, winding through the dense forest. When it reached the front, it suddenly fell into a huge pit, forming a spectacular waterfall that seemed to lead straight to the underground. This strange sight amazed Zhou Yu. Even on Earth, it was rare to see a river suddenly turn into an underground stream like this, right? The bird people gathered at the edge of the pit and suddenly knelt down. Ha! Huh? What are they doing now? The bird people seemed to open their mouths, as if saying something. Zhou Yu had a thought. Great Kurito God, please. Damn, is this really necessary? Why are there so many gods? What does Kurito do? Zhou Yu thought for a moment and guessed that they were referring to the huge waterfall that fell into the pit. After the bird people finished their worship, they circled around the pit and headed in another direction, continuing their journey. After walking for some time, Zhou Yu saw them stop again. In front of them stood a peculiar rocky hill in the middle of the forest. The bird people knelt down. Great! Can't you guys just worship one god properly? Why make it difficult for yourselves? Besides, those are all fake illusions. The real gods are currently mocking you like crazy. Zhou Yu was speechless. So, this trip wasn't just a simple hunting expedition, but also a pilgrimage to various places where gods reside? The bird people stayed for a while before leaving again. Now, they should finally go hunting, right? Zhou Yu watched as they walked for a while, kneeling before a giant tree, then a rock that looked like a bun. This is going too far. You guys are too devout. Why worship so many gods? What can they bless you with? Finally, after going back and forth, the bird people worshipped a total of six gods and arrived at a low bushy area. As soon as they entered, they prepared their claw blades. Finally, the main event, right? Zhou Yu raised his gaze and carefully searched. Two kilometers away. 73 creatures that looked like wild boars but had reddish brown fur and four black and yellow tusks. They were not small in size, each one seemed to be similar to a rhinoceros on earth. Could it be that the bird people were going to challenge them? Wait, isn't that too ambitious? Counting them, there were only 36 bird people in total, which was half the number of those animals, putting them at a significant disadvantage in terms of quantity. And there was another fatal point. No matter what, even the strongest lizard people on the planet wouldn't dare to fight these giant beasts one-on-one, -on -one, let alone in a group. Humanoid creatures have their limits. To take down a group of fierce animals, they must have an absolute advantage in numbers and incredibly powerful weapons. In Zhou Yu's opinion, if the opponents were these giant pigs, they should at least send a few hundred more people and equip themselves with bows and arrows. Close-range claw blades would have absolutely no advantage against beasts like these. The premise is that the giant pigs don't use their massive bodies and tusks as weapons, becoming unstoppable war machines. Zhou Yu felt like he was worrying too much. What if the group of giant pigs wasn't the one two kilometers away? Perhaps it is a small yellow-haired mouse with a single horn, bouncing around nearby like a small dog? Or maybe it is a round and chubby animal with six legs and spotted fur, running in the forest like a little horse? Just then, great Inuit god, grant us the power to tear apart our enemies. The bird people put their hands on their hearts and raced towards the direction of the giant pig. Zhou Yu didn't know how powerful this belief could be. But even if they could give the bird people a buff, it couldn't turn them into superheroes, right? It's a joke, right? These 30 bird people are no match for a giant pig. One against two. Ha ha. Zhou Yu was ready to watch a good show. The giant pigs, eating leaves and grass full of water, had their triangular ears twitching restlessly, constantly listening to the sounds in the forest. Accustomed to living in groups, they didn't think their large and powerful bodies could ensure their safety. Especially the young ones, they would be protected in the middle by the larger adult pigs to ensure they wouldn't be attacked by any danger. A gust of wind blew through the forest. The giant pigs quickly noticed this unusual disturbance. They immediately stopped eating, quickly moved, narrowed their range of movement, and surrounded the young ones in the middle, forming a circle. The giant pigs extended their fangs outward, lowered their center of gravity, 
and took a defensive posture. Their small triangular eyes stared intently at the surroundings, and their breathing became heavy. The attackers soon appeared in their sight. For the Inuit god, the bird people emerged from the dense forest, regrouped in this area, and roared again. Sharp claws with a dark golden glow on their hands emitted a dangerous signal, even causing the giant pigs to take two steps back involuntarily. In this primitive forest where the weak are preyed upon by the strong, any unknown element could destroy everything, this is the precious experience accumulated by animals over tens of thousands of years of evolution. The giant pigs had never seen such opponents, nor had they seen the terrifying objects in their hands. Kohuu. The nostrils of the giant pigs involuntarily made a sound representing danger. They shortened the distance between each other and began to prepare, attack or defend, even find an escape route. For the Inuit god, just as the bird people roared again, a giant pig could no longer tolerate the strange noise they made. After raising its head and howling, it aimed its fangs at them. The powerful muscles on its hind legs tightened, bursting with immense strength, and with its massive body, it charged towards the bird people. Goo-hoo! The ground trembled greatly, like a terrifying weapon that could destroy everything, the giant pig had already rushed to the bird people in an instant. It didn't want to stop, and couldn't stop until it sent the enemy flying and pierced them with its fangs. The bird people were obviously prepared for such a powerful impact. They also had well-developed leg muscles and incredibly agile bodies. Even their sparse feathers gave them some advantages. In the blink of an eye, a strong gust of wind passed by. The giant pig, charging with almost invincible force, intended to instantly defeat the enemy with this collision. However, it did not expect that this attack did not kill any enemies at all. goo o It finally managed to control the inertia of its forward charge but only by crashing into a large tree. The dizzy giant pig was about to turn its head and launch another attack on the enemy when it suddenly felt countless sharp pains, instantly bursting open on its back and abdomen. Goo! The pain made it sober in a daze, but just as it wanted to see the appearance of the attackers and launch an attack on them, it suddenly felt an endless sense of powerlessness coming from its limbs. At the same time, more intense pain came. Blood stained its pupils, flowing into its mouth along its fangs. Goo! Consciousness gradually faded away, and before the giant pig fell down with a loud crash, it finally saw the figures of the attackers, they had already rushed towards other giant pigs. Bloody slaughter. When Zhou Yu saw the birdman hunters almost instantly kill the largest giant pig, he suddenly felt that he could retract his previous disdain for them. Swift as the wind, agile as lightning. Just as the giant pig charged towards them, dozens of birdmen dodged the attack with incredibly nimble movements, immediately following the giant pig. By the time the giant pig turned around, they had already swung their blade claws wildly like golden snakes. Hundreds of dark golden lights flashed by, and the giant pig didn't even have time to react before its abdomen was cut open with countless wounds, and its back was torn apart, blood splattering like a fountain. The blood quickly turned into a pool under the giant pig's feet, becoming even more terrifying after mixing with its entrails. After the birdmen inserted their blade claws into the giant pig's throat and casually pulled them out, they collectively rushed towards other giant pigs. The entire battle lasted only an instant. The huge and tough giant pig became a dead prey. The birdman's heroic posture made Zhou Yu regret his previous thoughts. They were fully capable of killing all dozens of these huge creatures. The giant pigs were not aware of what had happened to their companion who rashly charged out, but facing the enemy, hiding and evading was not their nature. Go o a o The giant pigs, in order to protect themselves and their young, began to charge just like the previous one. The birdman seemed to be happy to see this scene. They assumed their stances, constantly visually confirming the direction of the opponent's charge, and some even climbed up the trees. It was the same as before. The birdmen skillfully danced the dance of death, slashing the seemingly tough skin of the giant pigs with their sharp blade claws, causing blood to continuously pour out from these huge wounds. The blood gradually stained the soil red, even converging into pools. The birdmen's figures kept swaying in front of the dying giant pigs, like death itself, severing their souls from their flesh. This could not be considered a battle at all. It was a one-sided massacre. The birdmen, like the wind and thunder, tireless as they were, rapidly reduced the number of giant pigs. From over 70, there were suddenly less than 40 left. The remaining giant pigs, after witnessing the gruesome deaths of their companions, also became timid. They no longer chose to charge fiercely, but instead formed a circle and gradually retreated. However, the birdmen did not want them to do so. They stealthily approached the giant pigs, using their lightning-fast speed to quickly take down one prey after another. The smell of blood became the main melody of this battle. And the other animals in the forest, after smelling the scent of blood, gradually approached. This bloody feast seemed to last for a considerable amount of time. 
Pure and one-sided slaughter is boring and monotonous, even if the bird people's combat talent is fully displayed in this hunt. Even when this bloody feast attracts the carnivorous beasts in the forest, they do not stop. Of course, they are not afraid of anything. The hungry beasts that crave food dare not approach, even though they are starving, they can only watch from a distance. No one wants to be the next sacrifice after the giant boar. The animal's unique perception of danger tells them that the blood-soaked bird people are the most dangerous beings in this jungle. Time slows down at this moment. The smell of blood permeates the air, and apart from the screams and running of the giant boars, there are no other sounds in this vast jungle. Thanks to the blessings of the Inuit god, the great Inuit god. However, after there were less than 20 giant boars left, the bird people did not continue the hunt. They shouted the name of their god loudly and let the young of the smaller giant boars return to the jungle. Zhou Yu was somewhat surprised. They didn't completely exterminate them even though they had enough power in time to do so. Could it be that they had the idea of ecological balance? Leaving behind the young ones, killing the mature giant boars, and hunting again when they grow up. Zhou Yu thought for a moment. This could also be considered a form of livestock, right? For the bird people, when to kill these giant boars was just a matter of thought. They had more than enough capacity to do so. After the hunt was over, the next thing to do was to transport the large quantity of prey back to the tribe. However, relying solely on the bird people's words, it was definitely impossible to accomplish this. Even though they had incredible combat power, transporting them. However, a bird people army of five to six hundred suddenly approached from the distant forest, as if they had suddenly appeared, answering Zhou Yu's question. The follow-up transport troops. Zhou Yu couldn't help but admire them. With this number of people, they could completely move all the fur and meat of the prey. Even if they didn't have transportation tools, their numbers made up for the lack. It didn't take long for the transport troops to arrive at the former battlefield. They gathered together, and Zhou Yu saw the figure of that priest again. So, what would be the next step? Thanks to the blessings of the Inuit god, the great Inuit god. Sure enough, these devout believers. Zhou Yu watched as they shouted the name of their god over and over again, suddenly feeling that his actions in the cave were unnecessary. It seemed that the so-called divine revelation and divine oracle had truly given them immense power. At least in terms of psychological suggestion, they had achieved significant results. After the bird people performed their routine ceremony, they, holding sharp blades, began to divide the prey. The thick layer of fat and skin was cut open, meat continuously stripped from the skeleton, and the organs were thrown aside. The bird people's movements were skilled and simple, without any unnecessary actions. At the fastest speed, they sorted the most useful things from the giant boars, the meat and fur, and discarded the remaining useless parts without hesitation. Thanks to the blessings and grace of the Inuit god, the priest watched everyone's labor from the side, holding a staff adorned with gemstones. After everything was finished, he guided the people with a loud voice. Thanks to the blessings and grace of the Inuit god, the five to six hundred bird people shouted in unison. With so many prey, their voices were even more powerful and resounding. In it god. Could it be a similar existence to a protective god and a god of harvest? Zhou Yu couldn't help but speculate. However, looking at their reverence, it could also be their main god. The bird people finally carried all the prey on their shoulders and returned along the path they came from. Zhou Yu followed their gaze and couldn't help but glance at the former hunting ground, which had now become a place of blood, bones, and entrails. It was already filled with a large number of carnivorous animals and countless insects. Suddenly, he felt a sense of familiarity. Yes, this is how the natural food chain works. It has been an unchanging law for millions of years. Whether on land or in the sea, similar scenes will endlessly repeat. The bird people's army moved slowly, much slower than when they arrived. This was probably because the harvest of prey far exceeded their expectations. However, when they reached the giant stones, trees, pits, and waterfalls they had previously worshipped, they would kneel and offer a small portion of the prey as a sacrifice, just as they did before. However, once they left, those pieces of meat became a feast for the nearby carnivorous animals, and the animal skins were torn into pieces, becoming a breeding ground for insects. Zhou Yu watched the bird people as they finally returned to their tribe. They smashed the salt blocks in the storage room and spread them on the processed meat slices, then placed them on the roof to dry. As for the animal skins, they were hung on tree branches with ropes, exposed to the wind and sun. The tendons and fascia in the meat were beaten and dried. Zhou Yu understood that they were probably used to make materials such as bowstrings. After observing the hunting process of the bird people tribe, he could understand why they could sustain themselves with such a large population. Their almost perfect combat skills and well-matched weapons made them almost invincible in hunting. 
The preserved and dried salted meat ensured the longest possible storage time for food, solving this problem. This also allowed the bird people tribe to have more reasonable hunting time, saving labor for other tasks, such as smelting and mining. The civilization displayed by the bird people was far ahead of any race Zhou Yu had seen before, and it would be difficult for them to catch up even after hundreds of years. However, this civilization was not without its flaws. The population of the bird people tribe was too large, and the vast forest covering almost the entire land provided them with unimaginable abundant animal resources. However, what would happen if their population continued to expand in the future? If consumption exceeded production, problems would arise, similar to the situation faced by human races with powerful armies in the past. However, the bird people didn't need to worry about this happening too soon because the animal resources here were much richer than those on the human side. Zhou Yu also noticed something. It was the so-called sense of crisis. As a presence that had almost no rivals in the forest, what would happen if the bird people tribe encountered an unsolvable problem? For example, if their tribe was directly dismantled, the bird people, who had powerful strength and could easily take down huge boars using weapons, were undoubtedly the most formidable race on this planet so far. From any perspective, the bird people had almost no weaknesses, and Zhou Yu didn't even need to guide them on what to do. However, with their advanced civilization, it seems that they must face something that they cannot ignore. The population has reached a bloated level. This tribe of nearly 3,000 people is already considered extremely large. However, from the range of their hunting, it can be seen that their largest sphere of influence seems to be within a radius of 15 kilometers centered around the tribe. Here, animal resources are abundant, there are also many mineral resources, and there is no shortage of clay for making pottery. Conservatively estimating, these resources are enough to sustain them for a considerable period of time. But what about afterwards? The population continues to skyrocket, and their hunting range will further expand. This seems like a positive cycle, but upon closer inspection, an excessive population will definitely cause many problems. How much area can they occupy at most? A few tens of square kilometers? Or a few hundred? But what about the entire continent? The territory they currently occupy is less than one millionth of the total area. If they wait for them to spread from their current tribe point to another point, it will probably take decades, or even longer. But what if they directly divide their existing tribe into dozens of parts and place them in other areas of this land? Will they be able to completely conquer the entire continent in the shortest time possible? Zhou Yu feels that this is possible and necessary, if it can be done. Looking at all the places explored on the entire planet, Zhou Yu has not found any race that can fully utilize their advantages and elevate their civilization to such a level as the bird people. Previously, when he saw the primitive human tribe with a force of over 500 people on the previous continent, Zhou Yu really thought that they would be the conquerors. But unexpectedly, those warlike fools seemed to lack intelligence and were too overconfident, which led to all their warriors being wiped out, losing almost all their combat power. This also makes it impossible for Zhou Yu to see in a short period of time how they will seek revenge on the lizard people and conquer the lovers of fruit and vegetable mush. Of course, unifying the entire land is not even worth considering. However, after coming to this continent and seeing the civilization of the bird people, his thoughts have been ignited once again. If the bird tribe can conquer the entire land in a short period of time and then start researching higher civilizations and technologies, will they become a more formidable conqueror? The answer is almost certain. Zhou Yu feels that even if they are thrown into some remote corner, they will rely on their strong belief in the Inuit god to generate a desire for life and then ignite the entire land with the fire of life. At this time, it is already approaching dusk. The layers of white clouds in the sky have been dyed blood red by the light of the stars. In the bird tribe, countless bonfires have been lit, and it is the most relaxing time of the day for them. Large pieces of meat are cut open and skewered with bronze needles. The bird people take out some charcoal from the fire pit and grill the meat on top. During the grilling process, they continuously sprinkle salt grains on it, which crackle on the charcoal. The meat skewers, emitting the smell of tar and fragrance, are continuously sent into the mouths of the bird people. The crispy and tender meat chunks are chewed in their mouths and then swallowed with pleasure. If Zhou Yu wasn't the consciousness of the planet itself, he would really think that he was watching earthlings grilling skewers on the spot. If they added some cumin or chili powder, it would be perfect. However, Zhou Yu has never seen plants like these on his sphere, and even if they do exist, these bird people may not be able to find them. It's already quite impressive that they can find rock salt from caves several kilometers away. Zhou Yu watched as they finished grilling the skewers and brought out round, thick meat worms the size of a wrist, as well as several meter long centipede like creatures. Indeed, these bird people are ultimately evolved from birds and have no resistance to insects whatsoever. 
The bird people seem to have a particular fondness for insects, just like eating sunflower seeds. They roasted something that looked like silkworm pupae for a while and then threw them into their mouths. Crunchy, tastes like chicken. Zhou Yu didn't feel anything special, after all, it's still meat. It's better than being vegetarian, right? Eat, eat, enjoy your meal, eat more. This is the last time for your tribe of nearly 3,000 people to eat together. In your dreams, you will be transferred to various corners of this continent and face new challenges. There, you will have a new life, new challenges, and new opportunities. Of course, all of this comes with danger, terror, and even death. While these people were eating, Zhou Yu carefully counted all the supplies in their tribe of food, weapons, tools, textiles, and even the evil bronze spears and short blades prepared as offerings to the Inuit god. After counting the quantities, Zhou Yu raised his gaze. He decided to carefully examine the specific terrain of this continent and make some adjustments. Compared to other lands, the terrain here is unusually low-lying. Dozens of not-so-tall mountain ranges crisscross the land, dividing it into relatively isolated regions. Whether it's the mountain ranges of nearly a thousand meters or the hills dotted along the mountainside, they are all covered with red, green, and yellow giant trees and tall grass, leaving almost no space for rocks, deserts, or wastelands. This is completely different from the scene when it was separated from other lands before Zhou Yu. Tens of thousands of swift and narrow rivers form a network, turning many places on the land into bottomless swamps, with numerous lakes scattered among them. Countless strange and exotic plants and animals inhabit this almost heavenly land, forming an extremely complex ecosystem. Of course, this also brings some troubles to what Zhou Yu has to do. If he wants to scatter the bird people to various places, there are many things to consider. However, before that, Zhou Yu decided to make some changes to the terrain of this land. The precipitation here seems to be too abundant, which is unsustainable. With a thought, the underground rocks continuously rise to the surface, bringing the soil and forests high into the air. After a deafening sound that lasted for a long time, hundreds of thousands of square kilometers of land became a plateau. As for the mountain ranges that are less than a kilometer, Zhou Yu let them grow to three or four kilometers in a short time. As for places like volcanoes and swamps, Zhou Yu didn't want to make any more adjustments. All that's left for him to do is to wait for the people of the bird tribe to welcome the night, and then move them thousands of miles away. After a series of adjustments, Zhou Yu quickly transformed this flat and undulating land into an area with rich terrain. He moved countless drifting rain clouds to the center of the land, where the peaks towering above the plateau will likely be covered in snow due to precipitation in a short time, giving birth to more rivers. And between the continuous mountains, due to the elevation, there are many large basins and deep canyons, which will gradually have unique natural structures in the future due to the sudden change in terrain. After completing all of this in a very short time, Zhou Yu finally shifted his gaze to the bird people. When he adjusted the terrain, it was inevitable that there would be landslides, rockfalls, huge vibrations, and noises, which made the bird people think that the end of the world had come. They were scared and dared not come out of their houses, not even making a sound. Countless bonfires swayed under the strong airflow, some even extinguished directly, and charcoal was blown away. After everything was over, the bird people came out of their houses and gathered together. Great God Caligula, please forgive our sins. We. The priest raised his wooden staff again and knelt down, and all the bird people knelt down together. Damn, can you guys not do this? Why does everything have a god? But this god called Caligula is probably in charge of disaster blessings or something? Do they think they did something wrong, so this kind of thing happened? Joe, you couldn't help but sneer in his heart. The bird people are really a strange race. I wonder if they will still show respect for various so-called gods after being thrown into various locations on this continent. However, do I have to wait for them to fall asleep? Zhou Yu couldn't help it anymore. After all, the stage was already set, and all that was left to do was wait? It would be great if he could directly control them to fall asleep. He suddenly remembered something. Last time, he used his ability to make the leader of a human tribe say things that were fundamentally impossible to say. What was the principle behind it? Zhou Yu still didn't understand it until now, but thinking about it now, Maybe it was because his ability carried the effect of a so-called magnetic field and disturbed their minds? If this explanation could be used, then even if these bird people were put to sleep, Zhou Yu had a thought. We, the great. The priest suddenly threw away his wooden staff, lay down on the ground, and closed his eyes. The rest of the bird people who were kneeling on the ground also fell into a coma. It worked. Zhou Yu found that it seemed that as long as he wanted, some things could be completely changed. As he pleased. Do whatever he wanted. However, he also had to think about it. After confirming that all the bird people were completely asleep, Zhou Yu began to act. He counted the specific number of bird people, even including the eggs of the unborn bird people. 
3,515 people, quite a lot. The male to female ratio was roughly 55 to 45, with more males than females. In terms of age, there were roughly equal numbers of adults, young adults, and eggs. Without considering other issues, a simple calculation, with 50 people as a unit, could be divided into 70 portions. In each group of 50 people, considering various factors, the male to female ratio and age ratio had to be taken into account, and even the eggs had to be included. Tools and various necessities, such as food and salt, had to be evenly distributed. As for weapons, the claw blades had to be evenly distributed for sure. Zhou Yu looked at it and there were nearly a hundred pairs, so each group would get two. As for those decorative weapons, they should also be evenly distributed. Zhou Yu believed that these decorations could become useful weapons again in the new environment. After calculating for a while, Zhou Yu used his ability. This bird tribe was located in the deep inland of the northern part of the entire land, with complete facilities in all aspects, and there was no need to worry about food sources. Zhou Yu decided to leave the fewest number of people and the most eggs here. The remaining bird people were sent to various coastal beaches, secluded valleys, upstream of turbulent rivers, fertile floodplains, and deep dark forests. Of course, all tools, weapons, food, etc. were distributed evenly. In terms of food, it was no problem for each tribe to have enough for at least 10 days. After completing these tasks, Zhou Yu once again used his abilities. The bird people scattered in various places opened their eyes and woke up. After that, Zhou Yu felt that he couldn't do anything else to help these bird people. Any further actions to assist them would have completely unpredictable butterfly effects. Whether they would be able to conquer the entire land or become dust of the era due to drastic environmental changes would depend entirely on themselves. The sphere continued to rotate, and a new day quickly arrived. The bird people also began to act on their own. Survival or elimination, it was up to them. Zhou Yu raised his gaze. He shifted his attention to the space. While adjusting everything on the sphere, he had been distracted by the emptiness of the universe. Compared to the overly peaceful sphere now, the vacuum in space was extremely dangerous. Passing comets and various small rocky celestial bodies suddenly appearing from the shadows would test Zhou Yu's nerves. However, perhaps due to good luck, Zhou Yu had been watching those small celestial bodies pass by one by one from a distance, heading straight towards the stars. Some of them directly collided with the former mother star, the green gaseous giant planet. Zhou Yu felt that they either became magnificent fireworks in the atmosphere of the gas planet or were captured and became second-class citizens. Thinking back to when he was a second-class citizen a long time ago, revolving around that gaseous planet, it seemed like it happened just yesterday. He revolved around the star a few times. Suddenly, he noticed something. The visual system had unknowingly evolved a lot. The neighboring planet, which used to have an orange hue, could now be magnified several times, revealing layers of orange-yellow rocks, winding giant mountain ranges like folds, and vast low-lying areas covered in dust. Turning to the big dumpling, the strange-shaped satellite that was lonely beside him, he could even see every speck of dust on it clearly. Zhou Yu was not sure why this sudden change had occurred, but he felt that his abilities had been continuously growing stronger. While he was marveling at these changes, he suddenly noticed a small rocky celestial body in the far distance, as if it was attracted to him, rushing towards him at an unimaginable speed. Even without calculating its orbit, Zhou Yu knew that this little guy, which seemed to be even smaller than the big dumpling, was about to collide with his sphere. If it really collided, all the intelligent life on the planet absolutely cannot happen. Zhou Yu unleashed his thoughts. The asteroid, about one-third the size of the big dumpling, approached Zhou Yu at an incredible speed, as if it had been fired by a giant cannon. Seeing the dark giant rock approaching rapidly, Zhou Yu was also extremely surprised. According to the normal laws of celestial bodies in the universe, the appearance of such a small celestial body itself was extremely strange. Even if a celestial body of this mass approached here, its speed would never be this fast. However, there was no time to think about these things now. Even if it grazed against him by chance, it would be a catastrophic disaster for all intelligent life on the sphere, no, for everything. If it really collided with the surface of the sphere, everything would be over. Zhou Yu felt that he might be instantly pierced and shattered by it, completely becoming dust in the universe. This is absolutely not allowed. It concerns the survival of the planet, and Zhou Yu cannot allow any probability of such an event happening. The asteroid doesn't seem to be slowing down, and Zhou Yu can't understand why its orbit is so strange as if it hasn't been affected by any gravitational force flying from the green gas planet. Zhou Yu doesn't want to sit and wait for death, and what he can rely on is not the dumpling that has been silently enduring various small meteorite impacts, but himself. Specifically, it is his incredibly magical and omnipotent power of thought. 
He uses his power of thought to concentrate it all in one point, the orbit on which the asteroid is heading straight towards him. Compared to waiting for death in one place, Zhou Yu prefers to choose to fight, even if there is only a one in a hundred million chance, he will give a hundred percent effort. Moreover, he has almost omnipotent willpower. The asteroid gradually approaches and quickly enters Zhou Yu's gravitational field. It is not very far from the dumpling. Can I let you succeed? Zhou Yu's power of thought continues to emit. The ugly asteroid, which was originally rushing towards him like a bullet, suddenly shakes gently, and because of its excessive speed, the frequency of this shaking becomes larger and larger. Zhou Yu knows that his power is working. Continuing to use his power of thought, the amplitude of the asteroid's oscillation continues to increase, and its speed gradually decreases. The orbit that was originally heading straight towards Zhou Yu also deviates. Nevertheless, it still successfully enters the dumpling's orbit and continues to attack Zhou Yu. However, after advancing a short distance, it suddenly stops instead of shaking, floating in space. Zhou Yu finally breathes a sigh of relief. It seems that the closer it is to him within his gravitational field, the stronger that strange power of thought becomes. It is precisely relying on this power that the asteroid finally stops its forward movement, captured by him and becoming a satellite. However, Zhou Yu doesn't want this thing to become his satellite at all. After relieving the tension just now, he doesn't even rest for a second. Instead, he immediately uses his power of thought again to throw it outwards. However, perhaps this power is too strong, and the asteroid suddenly splits into countless fragments. Influenced by the planet's gravity, they begin to fall. Zhou Yu chuckles in his heart. Gathered together, I can push you all away, but now you've turned into small fragments of tens to hundreds of meters, and you still want to continue? What a joke. All the fragments are once again caught by the power of thought, and then thrown outwards one by one. However, coincidentally, one of the fragments that is closest to a spherical shape is directly thrown towards the orange planet that happens to be revolving on the line closest to Zhou Yu. Due to the enhancement of his visual system, he can clearly see the appearance of that piece of debris hitting the neighbor of the orange planet. That small thing with a diameter of less than 5 to 600 meters directly creates a giant impact crater. In an instant, a dazzling red light emanates from there, and then the shockwave lifts the surface crust of the orange planet, enveloping the entire planet in an instant. Zhou Yu looks at all this and feels a bit sorry for his neighbor. Unexpectedly, this asteroid didn't do anything to him, but instead caused a huge mess for this guy. With such an impact, if there really was any life there, I'm afraid half of it would be instantly wiped out, right? Finally, the situation is resolved. Thinking about the assassin who has completely turned into fragments and disappeared into the deep space of the universe, Zhou Yu also breathes a sigh of relief. However, the confusion did not disappear completely with the resolution of the crisis. This is really strange. Even if the speed is not that fast, even if the orbit is not a straight line, even if the size is not that big, Zhou Yu wouldn't think too much. Even if only one of these conditions existed, Zhou Yu could understand. However, when these three conditions, which cannot be explained by common sense, come together, something is definitely wrong. Why would such a large celestial body be attracted to this side? Instead of being bound by the gravitational pull of the green gas planet or influenced by its satellites, it is heading straight towards us as if it was predetermined? Zhou Yu has learned a lot about the laws of celestial bodies movements in the universe through many years of observation, but none of them have violated so many rules like this asteroid. If everyone was like this, not only Zhou Yu's planet, but the entire star system and even the whole universe would be in complete chaos. The fact that only one special case like this exists proves that there is definitely a problem. Unfortunately, just to prevent it from becoming a satellite and changing the tidal forces of the entire planet, causing disasters like tsunamis, it was thrown away and turned into fragments. As a result, there is no opportunity for observation at all. Otherwise, we would be able to find some clues from it. With various doubts, Zhou Yu finally regained his composure. This time, he didn't come back empty-handed, and now he understands how powerful his abilities are. Now, Zhou Yu has the confidence to face attacks from various small celestial bodies that may suddenly come. With his strong telekinetic power, he can completely avoid all risks, even if the opponent is as big as the one that was just shattered. However, Zhou Yu still has another question. When he captured the big dumpling in the first place, his telekinetic power was not that strong. So what happened now? Could it be that while adjusting the terrain on the sphere and even controlling those intelligent beings, he improved his proficiency in telekinetic power or increased his experience level? Zhou Yu suddenly felt that compared to all the mysteries, his abilities were the biggest mystery. Where does this power come from, and how far will it develop? Will it get out of control? Will this ability ultimately be detrimental to himself? Zhou Yu fell into contemplation, continuously observing the revolution of the star. 
After the crisis was resolved, Zhou Yu should have been excited, but he couldn't be happy now because the existence of this asteroid was just too strange. Regardless of its size, speed, or orbit, it was extremely bizarre. However, the incident has already passed, and there is no evidence left after the asteroid was torn apart, so this matter can only be left behind. The only one who suffered was Zhou Yu's neighbor, the only victim of this incident, the orange planet with a bad temper. After being hit by a spherical fragment thrown by Zhou Yu, storms continued on the surface of the sphere for a while. Zhou Yu approached its orbit several times, but unfortunately, he found that the surface of the sphere was almost completely covered by orange-colored dust, showing no signs of recovery. He felt a little guilty but couldn't do anything to help the orange planet, so he can only watch it suffer. Zhou Yu shifted his gaze and decided to relax by observing the small lives on the sphere. From the asteroid incident until now, Zhou Yu has been counting the number of revolutions he has made, and it has been over 30 years. He is not in a hurry to see how the Birdman tribe is doing, but rather, he is concerned about the human tribe. Last time he saw them, one was farming with vegetable and fruit paste, and the other had lost all their young and strong laborers. At that time, Zhou Yu did not interfere with their affairs, but watched their development coldly. I wonder what changes they have undergone after so many years. Zhou Yu focused his gaze on the human continent and took a considerable amount of time to finally find a familiar place, the bottom of the volcano where the group of purple-red lizardmen were located. The situation here was almost exactly the same as last time. Dilapidated wooden fences, steaming hot springs, lizardmen busy soaking in the hot springs. Piles of dried meat, randomly placed stone spears. It was as if time had never passed in this tribe, there was no change from last time, not even a slight one. Zhou Yu counted the total number of lizardmen, and it seemed that they had increased their population quite a bit over the past 30 years, now totaling 600 people. Just as he was about to shift his gaze and search for the tribe of the primitive people according to the direction here, he suddenly noticed something unusual in a location very close to the tribe. It was a group of more than 10 lizardmen emerging from the bushes, holding blood-stained metal guns and long swords. The dark golden light, it was indeed bronze. Just like the Birdman tribe. Covered in blood? Were they out hunting? But where was the prey? Could there be more behind them? Sure enough, a group of people carrying animals covered in blood and dirt appeared. However, no matter how you looked at it, these were the primitive people. Were the primitive people working for the lizard men? No. How could this primitive civilization have such advanced consciousness? Could it be that they were their slaves? Have the primitive people become like this? It's hard to believe. But looking at these primitive people in front of him, who look like skin and bones, with no spirit at all, carrying pieces of meat much larger than themselves, with a pained expression on their faces, it clearly confirmed this speculation. Zhou Yu counted them, there were a total of 23 primitive people, judging from their physique, they should be from the tribe that once had a legion. Could it be that there has been another war between them? Are these people prisoners of war? With doubts in his mind, he looked behind these primitive slaves, where there were also several lizardmen holding guns and swords, seemingly to prevent these people from escaping. This group of people gradually approached the tribe, and the lizardmen guards opened the gates of the tribe. After the primitive people entered the gates, they came to the center of the tribe where a bonfire was burning, gently placing down the prey and pieces of meat in their hands, and then all prostrated on the ground. The lizard men opened their mouths wide, squinted their eyes, and made a gaga sound. Zhou Yu understood, they were laughing. Were they laughing at the bountiful harvest of the prey, or at the cowardly and ugly appearance of the primitive people? However, at this moment, a lizard man waved his hand, and all the primitive people stood up again. What are they going to do? Are they going to be imprisoned in some small huts, or go back to work? However, the primitive people walked straight out of the lizardman's tribe and disappeared into the vast forest. Ha! Huh? Zhou Yu was puzzled. Aren't those lizard men following them? Aren't they afraid that these slaves will run away? He looked at the tribe, where the lizard men had already started to roast the meat, and some were preparing to air dry some meat. Watching their skilled techniques, Zhou Yu knew that there had been at least some changes in these decades, they knew how to use fire and eat cooked meat. Then he looked at the primitive people who had disappeared into the forest. Zhou Yu watched as they moved along a seemingly well-trodden path, gradually moving further away. They weren't slaves? They still had their freedom? What was that scene just now all about? After thinking about it, Zhou Yu understood. Primitive people seem to have become subservient to lizard people. Perhaps the previous battle stimulated the lizard people's nerves and made them have the idea of fighting against primitive people. Maybe the battle at that time was not too intense, and the primitive people without much fighting power were conquered. The lizard people did not kill them, but used them, making them become subordinate tribes and contribute the food they hunted? This is just the most likely speculation. Besides this, there should be no other explanation. 
Zhou Yu raised his gaze to find the location of the primitive tribe in his memory. It is useless to just speculate. He must go there to see if it is true. Soon, he found the tribe of primitive people. However, something seems off here. The originally tall and sturdy wooden fence is now in ruins, and many places have been completely broken, with traces of being cut by sharp weapons all over it. The once beautiful and majestic gate is now completely destroyed, and several yawning lizard people are standing at the door, holding metal spears and chatting. Every dirty primitive person looks malnourished, skin and bones, but they are still doing what they used to do, weaving and smelting. Whether it's adult men and women or toddlers who have just learned to walk, they are all working non-stop. However, no matter what these primitive people do, there are several lazy lizard people with weapons standing beside them, occasionally scanning them with their intimidating eyes. As long as they see a primitive person stop, they will walk over and knock them down. It's just as expected. This speculation is true. The primitive people here have been conquered by the lizard people and have become their vassals, even slaves. The so-called conquerors that Zhou Yu previously thought of have now completely reversed roles, with the lizard people becoming the protagonists. 